You are listening to a free audiobook recording of The Journeys of Mal Malin, Book One, Apprentice, written by Jonathan Q. Audiobook performed by Jonathan Q. If you enjoy this work, please consider supporting me by buying the ebook version, available in the description below. If you've already spent your treat money for this month and cannot buy this work, then consider paying it forward by donating your time, energy, or items to local projects within your community. Thank you. Dedication Who sailed the seven seas? They who discovered new lands, new trade routes, and new beginnings for all. Was it the sailor who stood upon deck, unfurling the mast, sitting in the crow's nest to keep watch for dangers, and who repaired the ship as the salt ate at the hull? Was it the captain who owned the ship, who steered it, charting its course through the hazardous waves? Perhaps it was the kings and lords of old who commissioned these explorations, without whom the plans to set sail would never have been approved to begin with. Perhaps it was the carpenter who sawed and shaped the wood, or the shipwright who designed the ship, calculated the physics, weight, and water displacement needed to keep it afloat or the logician who organized the paperwork and trade deals so that the merchant could ferry the wood for the ship to be built at all. Perhaps it was the lumberjack, who chopped the finest wood from the tallest trees to be certain of the ship's integrity, or the architects of old, who crafted the roads from which the carts would run upon, or the masons before them who mined the quarries and shaped the stone that would set the roads to begin with. We often like to imagine human spirit and achievement as encapsulated in certain individuals, the greatest to ever live. From Isaac Newton, whose work in mathematics and physics completely shifted the scientific focus forever. Or John Snow, called the father of epidemiology, whose research into cholera bore the seeds for germ theory. Or Socrates whose fascination with the human condition and his ideas therein went on to shift the cultural landscape of the West and send ripples throughout the entire world that are echoed even today. But the truth is, even these men did not work alone. They had assistants, mentors, teachers, those who helped and refined them, those who crafted their supplies, their tools, those who nurtured and reared them, and even these forerunners had those who were responsible for them, who taught them, who helped them. Because as the John Don poem so rightfully states, no man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. That each of us, from one to all, owes a debt of recognition to those that came before us, those who helped shape and shift the world, and those who helped shape and shift the shapers themselves. That it is not any one of us, not the sailor, nor the captain, nor the king, nor the carpenter, or the shipwright, or the logician, not the lumberjack, or the architects of old, not a single one of us, going back all the way down, down to the first of us who created the wheel, and to Prometheus who gave us the fire. It is not any one of us that sails the sea and tames the storm, but all of us, each of us, carrying the light of human spirit and limitless heights within ourselves, compounding upon it from all those who carried the torch before us, for us, who allowed its light to guide our way just long enough to light a torch ourselves, to guide those behind us onwards forever, up to those who now sail the stars themselves. Because humanity is a joint effort. Because not a one of us is as human as all of us. Which brings me, finally, to those I dedicate this work to. Because I am a poor man, and my home is not my own, and my diet is what one would consider hog feed comparable to what you'd find in a landfill, and my education extends to a high school diploma gained through the skin of my teeth. I had no grander education or mentor in writing than those I would find who were generous enough to share their expertise and insights free for all, undoubtedly at their own great cost, who put their blood sweat and tears into bringing something worthwhile into this world just on the hope alone that it would have meaning to someone and it had meaning to me
With all possible honors, I dedicate this work to these who, at the time of recording, should still be able to be found on YouTube or Patreon. Seriously, go check them out. Tim Hickson, or Hello Future Me, whose playlists on writing and character psychology have, by and large, paved the way for every line of this work. Red and Blue, of overly sarcastic productions fame, whose trope talks helped shape the trajectory of the series as a whole, and taught me the importance of tropes as a tool, rather than a shortcut. Mahler, whose long-form analysis of media taught me to always ask why things happened as they did, and to edit and re-edit until perfect internal consistency was achieved. Literature Devil, whose essays on heroism and, more than that, what it means for a character to be flawed and human and still be heroic, helped shape exactly who I wanted the protagonist to be and how I wanted them to grow. Terrible Writing Advice, whose decidedly amazing writing advice was fantastic for dissecting settings, plots, plans, and foils, along with how to lean into them and how to avoid the worst of the pitfalls. And, of course, finally, you. You, the reader. For all the times I laid on the floor, looking up at the ceiling, languid and paralyzed with worry, wondering how to press onwards and for who I was writing this for. The thing that made putting my blood, sweat, and tears into this all worth it was on the hope alone that it would have meaning to someone. And maybe that someone is you. So to you, all of you, know that this work wouldn't have been written without you. That as I stand on my ship, sailing into choppy waters in an uncertain sea, I remember, with each step, the lumber and tread and design and planning it took to get here. And I promise I will not forget you. From the bottom of my heart, thank you. The Journeys of Mal Malin, Book One, Apprentice, by Jonathan Q. Chapter One. Can't you be a little more patient? asked the bird. Patient enough to play with my food, replied the cat. Page 57, line 2, from The Book of Small Wisdoms, by Monk Zahn. A peculiar day was dawning in the misty mountainside town of Portau, so peculiar that each resident with something to do, even so early in the morning, promptly got to doing it, while each resident without decided to hide away altogether. It was a special day, where people had to pass news down a long line from lip to ear and remind one another to stay out of the way and to nod politely and curtsy and do as you were bid, if you were so bid before something happened to you. It was a very special day, because a telegram came in warning that the Count of all Western Dunry, High Prosecutor in the Seat of Justice, Grand Sorcerer Tamalin, so named Tamalin of the Scorched Earth, was returning home early from a particularly unfavorable peace negotiation that, in part, would infringe directly into his mining prospects and so was in a decidedly bad mood. And this was not a good thing at all. A rush of mayoral attendants and militia flooded into the railway station, preparing anything that might be needed or wanted, and even most things that wouldn't. Delicacies were prepared, ice was brought in to cool drinks, the very floor was swept before a long red carpet was laid down, and a line of wagons prepared to take any luggage the Count may have brought back with him. An argument erupted between the secretaries and the local band as to whether or not he would find music calming or annoying. A florist was forcibly removed for daring to arrange petunias alongside Lily of the Valley, and there was a final discrepancy over whether a military salute was in order, or if a noble one was more fitting. A call from the station master ended all quarrels in an instant. The train was about to arrive. From his perch, he pointed to the billowing steam that could be glimpsed just above the slope of the mountain where the train glided into view, winding around the side, hugging the cliffs, as it headed toward the station at a constant, inevitable pace. And every attendant and soldier and performer scrambled into their final positions and began to sweat. The train approached and slowed, and all present took the last minute of unobserved peace to make themselves look as presentable as possible before the train horn sounded to a pitch that made them wince and squeeze their eyes shut. At last it stopped, 
as metal clamped against metal and ground the train to a screeching halt. An attendant let out a curse as he noticed the carpet was off-center and rushed out of formation to try to move it half an inch further left to match up with the doors, and only succeeded in pulling it too far, half an inch farther right, before letting out another curse, out of time to properly connect it, and running back to his post to stand ready as he straightened his coat. The secretaries breathed deep, the soldiers clacked their boots together, and the train door slid open to reveal a tall, thin man in his sixtieth year, sharply dressed in a suit that squeezed around his broad shoulders and slim waist, with a red and black trim that seemed tailor-made to complement the narrow, high-boned face beneath his unkempt white hair and goatee. A tall, thin, sharply dressed man whom by the immediate slight hook to the lower corner of his mouth, and a piercing sigh, could tell right away that the carpet was not centered, and nobody dared look higher. And so it was that Count Tamalin arrived at the station, where he handily ignored a proper military salute, waved aside the presented delicacies, put his cigarette out in the ice, turned a deaf ear to any and all inquiries as to the ease of his journey, and when a kind and diligent footman approached and offered his services in moving the sorcerer's luggage, he was met with a swift, silencing hand and a voice to match. That won't be necessary, told in sharp punctuation. He was pleased to notice that he didn't have to repeat himself. The footman simply smiled and stepped aside with a sweeping bow. It was the only pleasing part of his entire journey. Sometimes you have new hires who are used to dealing with dull nobles who need to be reminded of things they need servants to do. Other times the servants are just over-eager, ready to outperform in every capacity and only make themselves a nuisance by their constant insistence. Even as his black cab pulled up and his servant, his only personal servant as far as anyone could remember, stepped from the driver's seat to make her way to the luggage compartments, he made a mental note to ask the station master who this footman was the next time his business took him here in order to hire him for something or other later, and watched as the crowd of attendants, formerly so eager to serve, parting with a polite caution before his far too well-dressed valet. The woman rummaged, leaning deep into the carriage racks to check in every nook without a single person daring to assist before she emerged, satisfied, and returned with all she had found, seemingly indifferent to the nervous stares and murmurs that her strange black veil always elicited. It was not difficult to load up. Tamalin had only packed a suitcase of clothes and a satchel full of pens, files, reports, and paperworks, and after placing them gingerly into the back of the car, she opened the passenger door for him to get in, being sure not to catch him in the door when she closed it before skipping back around to the driver's side, and without lifting her veil even once, got into the car, situated herself, and opened the glove compartment to pull out a cigar box, which Tamalin took gratefully, pulling one out and lighting it with the tap of his finger. They drove off without a wave farewell, and the whole ensemble of courtiers and attendants they left behind breathed a sigh of relief. The very special day, for them at least, had passed. Sweat was cleared from pale foreheads and backs were patted with how well they managed not to earn the ire of a man whose disinterest was the best attention you could receive. And all it cost was a vase of flowers and an ill-thought arrangement and the now dirty clothes of the poor florist who made it. Tamalin and the veiled woman drove down the cobbled road at a pace just slow enough to let quick children get out of the way though he did allow himself to be slowed a little more when any townsfolk or older shopkeepers made a formal salute to his easily recognized car. He slowed for the detours as well, having his servant take the longer northern road toward the cliffside so he could take a quick look at his gem mines and see if anyone were running out of them screaming or half blown up, and since nobody was, he allowed a brief upturn to his cheeks and a satisfied exhale. He liked this city though he would never admit that to anyone living in it. He liked its proximity to the core of his industry. He liked the stranglehold he had over its economy, that every baker and metalworker and barman answered to him. 
he liked his train station, the marble design for which was drawn by his own hand, of course, and was the only sure way to get in and out of the cliff-stuck city itself. Most of all, he liked the privacy that the city afforded, and the wisdom of its town folk to stay out of his business. Though he didn't despise the view either. The sunsets were gorgeous here, and there was nowhere with a better view of the moons. It was also the only recent-built town sporting what he referred to as proper deco, this newfangled art style and architecture that originally hailed from the old world, and was easily the only good thing the tenuously allied states of Iberia ever exported. He did not slow for eyesores. He urged his servant to speed up whenever they veered by the southern edge, and he was forced to glimpse the undeveloped lots awaiting construction below, or when they sailed through the narrow streets and he had to grumble over the clang and clamor of that terribly gaudy theater house, already putting on yet another one of its degenerative musicals. Though, even in its tacky performances, he could not suppress the slightest twinge of a smile crossing his face. He had not gone there in some time, and wondered what new plays were on that he would be dragged to see. In the memory of revelry, and the warm feelings of soon-to-be home, he asked the veiled woman, How is Mal doing? He's doing well, returned a quiet voice. He's happy. He enjoys my cooking. Traitor, Tamalin muttered, and the veiled woman giggled as she turned up the tree-nestled road toward the manor at the top of the crested hill. He enjoys my cooking, she continued. He takes me to see a new play or opera whenever they have one staged. We have played every board or card game available at least once, and when I am busy he goes to play with his friends or the gentleman at the cafe instead. He has taken apart your radio and almost put it back together correctly, and his fascination with the capital's cleaning drones was cured after one chased him down the block. Instead, it's been replaced with an interest in dancing, and I am humbled to be his partner. Tamalin leaned back and let the smoke from his cigar drift lazily out the window to chase the breeze, clouding his vision of the mansion they were parking in front of. I can't help but notice, he began as he flicked the cigar nub into the grass that in all of those activities, none of them were performing meditations, finishing the business portfolio, or going over the book on law that I gave him before I left. Has he completed any of them? Not even one, came the cheerful reply as the veiled woman finished her parking and got out from the car. Has he even looked at them, perhaps breathed in their general direction? Tamlin sighed with great weariness as the servant opened the door for him. "'I do not know,' she said again with no dip in cheer. "'Though if it pleases you, he has read many of your books on culture and theosophy.' "'It does not. It's nice, but it won't help him when he actually has to focus and keep calm in a pinch, nor when running a proper company.' There was a slight lull as he exited the car, and the veiled woman dipped her head into the back seat to retrieve the luggage, before she popped back up again with a sudden, It is my fault, with luggage in tow. When I inform him of your wishes, he rephrases them in such a way that he fulfills them by carrying on regardless, and I do not notice. Tamalin tisked without replying, reaching back into the glove box to pull out a pack of cigarettes and retrieving one from it, smoking it with no less gusto than before. Even after I told you to keep him on track? Even after that? I shall try to be more observant in catching these rephrasings from now on. I do not believe it is his fault. The only thing that can steer a young man to focus and discipline is curiosity, and his curiosity includes neither. I accept full responsibility as his guardian. Therefore, if you should punish him, please consider punishing me instead. Tamalin only sighed, a deep puff of purple-tinted smoke, and mused to himself how he would have found such a request far less annoying, had she not said it with such a pleasant tone. They walked in silence up the claustrophobic path, past the stone walls and arching trellises to the leaning inspired Umbridge Manor that hung with watchful windows above the entire town. 
The great oak doors unlatched with a weighty clunk, and swung heavily on their hinges to reveal the grand hall that stretched from the entrance and ran all the way to the flower gardens in the courtyard. With no window undraped in fine silk, no supporting pillar unladen with gold, no section of wall without carving or painting to tantalize the eyes, and no less than two dozen suits of armor placed in the waysides. Even the floors themselves had the linings and cracks filled with silver so pure that Tamalin could see his own smirk reflected in them, and the true centerpiece of the house the two large opposing statues lifting up the winding twin staircase. Horibus, the god of barter and trade, patron of merchants to the right, and Din, goddess of influence, hierarchy, and power gained through intrigue to the left. It was dressed exactly to the overbearing tastes of a beyond wealthy man who knew he was beyond wealthy. Yet there was one thing missing. Where is Mal? He asked the suit of armor to his left. He was still sleeping by the time I departed, replied the not armor. At this hour, with such a lovely day outside, he asked with only slight sarcasm as he gazed upward at the sun coming down to the skylights. The veiled woman made a slight bow, setting the luggage down where it wouldn't dirty the velvet carpet, and made a few steps toward the hall that led up to Mal's room before Tamalin lifted his thin, silencing hand to stop her. No, 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 no. You talked about if I should punish him earlier and have given me a much better idea, he told her before turning and sporting a devilish grin, tossing her his silver flick to catch. Refill my lighter instead. The veiled woman did not quite remember mentioning that he should punish Mal at all, but decided she must be mistaken, and dutifully fulfilled the request as Tamalin cackled with glee. In the well-dressed hallways of his manor, Tamalin waltzed happily, humming with a serene smile on his face as he took his time igniting the lamps in a trail all the way up to the top of the southern spire where Mal's room sat. He nodded toward the portraits and still lifes along the way, and stopped to smell each bouquet of flowers placed throughout the corridors, and when he reached the archway to the tower staircase, he made a large, sprawling gesture to open a non-existent door before he marched up the stone stairs and even waved good morning to the birds he saw outside the windows. About halfway up the stairs, he remembered why he didn't go to wake his apprentice up more regularly. This was torturous. His thighs were burning and he was sweating already. How in the hells did Mal keep so pudgy when he had to do this workout multiple times a day? Absolute nonsense. Eventually, though, he made it to the top and took the time to pant and mop his sweat as he pressed his ear against the artisan-carved wooden door of Mal's room. He heard snoring. Perfect. Quiet as a cat, he turned the handle and opened the door just enough to squeeze through, shutting the door behind him. The morning sunlight beamed beautifully through the polished glass windows, lighting Mal's mahogany wardrobe, ceramic washing station, and painted rug in a golden glow, and ended by warming the sheets of his goose-down bed while leaving his nook, gizmos, knick-knacks, and each delicate piece of finery safely in the shade. Everything was perfectly arranged and tidy, aside from his large desk opposite the bed, which was littered with books and diagrams, and the entire room was without a speck of dust to be seen. Tamalin quietly traced over to the desk and, without touching a thing, gazed sideways at the arithmetic lessons and law books he left for Mal, and smiled. What a shame! What a shame! Mal himself lay curled up in the middle of his silk-curtained bed in his onesie pajamas, still snoring loudly, huddled in two separate sheets, and resting on the fluffiest pillow in the whole mansion. How precious, Tamalin thought, and he had to resist the urge to ruffle the fifteen-year-old's golden-brown hair. He was having second thoughts, 
Perhaps he shouldn't be so mean. Can't expect a teenager to study when the teacher is away. Perhaps he should cut the young man some slack. Then again, Mal did call him an old goat before he left, so he probably deserves this. Wake up, Tamlin ordered, and then he lit the bed on fire. Chapter 2 By the time you're warned, it's probably already too late. Page 4, line 12, from The Book of Small Wisdoms, by Monk Zong. Mal's nose twitched. Then he stirred. Then he opened one eye, slightly, and saw Tamalin. Tamalin waved. Hello, Mal called out hoarsely. Good morning, I think. The sheets were smoldering. Tamalin took a step back. When did you get here? Mal asked. Tamalin smiled. The sheets were toasty. What's that smell? The sheets were slightly alight, and Tamalin strode to open the window. What are you doing? Mal asked. More slightly alight. Keeping you safe, Tamlin replied, and Mal's sleepy brain took precious seconds to consider just what this might mean. The left curtain was now fully ignited. Seriously, what's that smell? What are you doing? Why is it so- Oh my gods! And so, Mal finally had mind to look in the direction of what was causing his legs to sweat, and suddenly his brain wasn't so sleepy anymore. Tamlin, the bed is on fire! He screamed. Yes. Mal was in fire danger, and he knew from his safety lessons that fire hot, so fire bad. Therefore, get away from fire. With this refined thought process, he kicked the blazing sheets off himself and onto the rest of the very flammable bed, which, surprisingly, did not lead to the desired outcome. What it led to was more fire which led to Mal screaming again as he fell off the bed and finally whacking his head on the floor. Tamlin did nothing to prevent this. Tamlin! Mal groaned as he righted himself. It's spreading! And so it was. The entire bed, curtains and all, were on fire, and the top half of the room was filled with smoke. Mal once again refined his thought process and whilst running around screeching, tried to remember the fire safety lessons he never paid attention to, which he reasoned went something like this. Drop low to avoid smoke, and smother fire with a heavy blanket. This incredible synthesis of ideas led Mal to confidently crawl across the floor, open his drawers, pull out the heaviest blanket he could find, and, still crouched, wave it spasmodically in the general direction of the fire. Somehow. This didn't help. Inconceivably, it seemed to only make things worse. Not only was the fire on the bed getting stronger, but the sparks that were blown about had landed on the large blanket, something Mal only realized when it began to smolder. Using the same deft logic as before, he handily yelped and threw the blanket as far away from himself as he could, which happened to be an admirable, right in front of his own door, distance successfully blocking the only line of easy escape as the now-burning blanket cindered against the now-crackling door. Tamalin sighed. Mal screamed unintelligibly, and the fire raged indifferently, spreading to the chairs. Somewhere in all this screaming, Mal decided that just because he had made bad decisions didn't mean he had to suffer the consequences, and so he scrambled to get out through the window. "'We gotta escape!' He bellowed to Tamlin before shoving him aside and nearly spilling from the window as he lifted his leg over to straddle the ledge before pausing, climbing back in, running back to his master, grabbing him by the lapel, and skittering his ankles across the floor as he attempted to drag him toward the window as well, shrieking all the while. Tamlin, meanwhile, allowed himself to be dragged as he breathed lightly, took his lighter out of his pocket, and, with a bored grace, flicked it open, tapped it twice, and hummed a word of power that made every flick of flame fan upright and stop in their tracks, as they gently lifted off the wood and fabric and flowed back into the lighter with the gentle pace of a genie returning to his bottle. And then there was nothing. 
Not even the smoke remained, but only the blackened linens and Mal's rapidly beating heart as he shiftily eyed the quiet room. Oh! He picked as he cautiously let go of Tamalin, half suspecting a trap. He gingerly stepped forward, and after tapping a slightly burnt leg of wood with his foot to ensure it wouldn't explode or something, picked it up and began poking and prodding the rest of the wreckage. His bed was utterly ruined, having been completely engulfed and now only ash without a single spark left inside. His blanket was in the same state, and half the door close to where he threw it. His favorite lounge chair was safe, but his favorite footstool was not, having been partially crisped. His wardrobe had been lightly seared on one side, but aside from rough grooves and gouges where the fire had licked, it seemed fine, as were the clothes inside. The rug, though, wasn't even worth mentioning. The most important thing, as Mal breathed a sigh of relief, was that his desk and all special writings had been completely untouched, something Tamalin would never take credit for. With the damage desessed, and disaster averted, Mal was able to take a deep breath, clap his hands together, and ask his master, What the hell was that? A fire, Tamlin replied, gazing out the window. How did you expect to get out of from here anyway? There's no way down. Yes, I know it was a fire. I have eyes, and I can also feel heat. Mal spat, moving his entire body in line with his complaints before sighing and crashing from the excitement down on his haunches. Ugh, are you okay? You're not hurt or anything, are you? He asked with rising concern before remembering. Wait, no, don't answer that. I don't care. You're an ass. You lit my bed on fire. And then scratching at his head. It was you, right? It wasn't some freak accident or some snotty squirrel with a magnifying glass? No, it was me. Anyways, you probably would have just grabbed for something to slow your descent, but I'm not as spry as you. How was I supposed to survive that jump? What does it matter if you would have survived? You're old! You've lived a full life! More importantly, you lit my bed on fire! Mal raged with reaffirmed zeal at his genius over finding the identity of his would-be assassin. But Tamalin only smiled. Your powers of deduction are riveting. I wonder if you'll be able to solve the riddle of who lit your bed on fire yet a third time. I will wait. You don't have to wait, Mal bellowed. I always knew it would be you who did me in, jealous of my good looks and how much better I am than you at checkers. Tamalin's left eye twitched at the very mention of checkers, which he covered up perfectly with the grooming of his eyebrows so that nobody in the world would know how much he hated this fact. What I want to know is why. What drove you to act now? Mal asked as he propped his hand up to fiddle with his lip in full scrutiny. Oh, well, that's easy, you see. On the drive home, the servant briefed me as to your goings-ons and progress into the lessons I provided before I left, whereupon I was informed you finished an outstanding none of them. Obviously, you were not very interested in structured, disciplined classes where you could be confident as to your general safety and well-being. So I figured I would give you something a little more... chaotic, he said, delivered with the same whimsy as one discusses the weather. At this, Mal paused, rubbing his ear in disbelief. You lit my bed on fire because I didn't finish the homework you gave me? I just work so hard on it, his master mused softly, almost pained as he twiddled the lighter back and forth between his fingers. You! Mal began before pausing to get his voice crack under control. Well, you're wrong. I did do the homework you gave me. It just happened to be on the last day, so she didn't know. You lit my bed on fire for nothing, because you're insane, probably. Ah. So you did read through my book on law, at least? Yes. Then why isn't the spine of the book bent? Huh? When I looked, the spine of the book wasn't bent. When you have a book open past the limits of its cover, 
which happens most often with larger or soft-cover books such as this one. It develops light seams along the spine from wear and tear. If you really did read through it, as you say, then why wasn't the spine bent at all? Mal went to answer, sputtering for a moment, then took an extra second to think about how this could be before answering. I don't open books much at all when I read them. Only a little bit. A sliver. To avoid, um, harming any rare books. A habit I picked up. I see, Tamalin mused. Then, why do your journals, and your adventure novels, and the thesis on theosophy all have bent spines? if you only open them so slightly indeed. I... Mal began, before catching his tongue on his teeth and waiting about five seconds longer than anyone probably should when trying to be convincing. Tamalin, to his credit, gave him about seven before cutting him off. If you're going to lie convincingly, you have to cover your tracks. If you don't, I will catch you every time. Besides... Lying about small things that can easily be discovered just makes you suspicious in the eyes of your peers. Better to lie only regarding important things, or, failing that, including an embarrassing detail so people are too bashful to question you. Oh, thank you. I... Wait, wait, wait! This isn't about me! You lit my bed on fire because I didn't care about your lessons! Correct. Tamlin smiled. You know what? I'm glad I didn't do your stupid homework, because it was dumb and stupid, and so are you, for lighting my bed on fire. How could you even do that? Those were specialty items. They were expensive. I'll buy you more. They were specialty commissioned items. It'll take months before I can even have a bed again. You can sleep on the couch. Couches have bad lumbar support. They can't possibly all be bad for your spine. Of course they can! They're couches! They're not meant to be slept on at all! Forcing me to sleep on one is... is child abuse! I demand a union! This is unfair! Do you remember the conversation we had a bit before I left? About how life isn't always fair, and sometimes bad things will just happen to you for no reason? This is one of those times. It isn't one of those times at all. There's a very good reason something bad happened to me this time. It's because you're a prick. I'm sure there's a lesson to be learned here somewhere. You should think on that. Mal stuttered and sputtered as he searched for the exact words to use to express unquenchable rage, standing on his toes to pointedly poke Tamlin in the chest the whole while. Finally, he decided on, Within an... Wait, how long have you been home? An hour. An hour of you being home. You've scared me out of my wits, attempted to murder me, destroyed my bedroom, and worst of all, completely thrown off my morning routine. You are an evil, nasty, and a no-good, terrible master, and I hate you, Tamlin. Oh, goodness me. Terrible, am I? Hate me, do you? Well... If you hate me so much, I am sure you will want absolutely none of the egg in the holes I cooked for you. The kind with extra butter. I suppose I'll just have to eat them all myself, then. Oh well. And with that, Tamalin turned on his heel and marched out of the room, lightly kicking the ruined blanket out of the way in the process, and humming all the way down the stairs. Wait! Mal called, ransacking his wardrobe. I didn't mean it! He yelled, putting on a half-button shirt and tripping as he pulled on his pants. I love you! He shouted as he tumbled from his room and down the stairs, hopping all the way to the kitchen and excitedly burst through the doors, where he found Tamlin calmly reading the morning paper with a notable zero egg in the holes in sight. You lied to me, Mal growled. Do you remember that conversation we had five minutes ago? About how life isn't always fair and sometimes... Oh, fuff off! Mal waved as he went to sit down and bumped right into the veiled woman. Oh, hi, Amelia! He greeted with a big smile. Good morning, Mal, she greeted back as she went to do up the rest of his buttons. Would you like me to make you breakfast? No, thank you. It's all right. You do more than... Uh... Did you know Tamlin tried to kill me? He lit my room on fire! 
Just the bed, Tamlin corrected, pleased at his newfound reputation. You were the one who threw your blankets everywhere. Amelia stifled another giggle as she affirmed, Yes, I heard. You screamed very well, and straightened Mal's shirt. And now he doesn't even have the courtesy to make me breakfast! He spun, arms raised, pointing and addressing Tamlin directly. And you haven't been here in so long! You should make some of your famous hot chocolate to celebrate your return! Don't you know I've missed your cooking? Hmm. His master waggled his eyebrows in response. Well... I heard you were getting along quite well without my cooking, he said, flipping the paper in the general direction of the cause. Why not have the servant do it? Well, Mal thought for a moment, because she's so often busy with cleaning and keeping things organized. I figured you wouldn't want her taking time out of her busy schedule, uh, a time she could use to keep your laboratory nice and neat. Is it not nice and neat? Have you been fussing with it? Tamlin asked with a shivering glare. Besides, Mal continued, completely ignoring the question and nonchalantly avoiding as much eye contact as possible, you're such a good cook yourself. It's one of your best qualities, and you did always teach me that even a maid should be skilled in more uh, mundane arts, for one never knows when they will be without magic. It'll help cement the lesson to see my wonderful role model follow his own advice. At this, Tamlin smiled, sighed, and with mock exasperation replied, Suck up. But I suppose I cannot fault you for cleverness, can I? Fine. I guess I can make you breakfast after all. Yes, Mal clapped. But you are going to help me. Huh? Uh, but no buts. And you're going to prove to me that you can carry your lessons even without my workshops. Otherwise, you're going to be doing all the cooking yourself. You're giving me a pop quiz? Oh, yes. I was told, while you ignored everything you were supposed to be doing, you showed a great interest in magical theory, among other things. So now I'm going to see if it pulling your attention away was worth anything. Now, he continued, putting on his apron and tying it back. Get out the eggs. And the herbs, too. Okay. Also, it's actually pronounced herb, like urban. You can't defend yourself well enough to risk correcting me, Mal. It, I, oh, um, I, it, it's, it's just how the Franks pronounce it, isn't it? I'll be six feet in the ground before I legitimize the Alemanni. Now get me the herbs. Okay, okay, I'm going, I'm going. Um, why do you grow the herbs in a flower pot anyways? Why do you grow flowers in a flower pot? Um, so it lives and stays fresh? So why are you asking a question you already know the answer to? Noted. That wasn't part of the quiz, was it? If it was, it would be the easiest question. Tamlin turned, and, humming a little tune to himself, popped the gas on the stove top and lit it with the tap of his fingernail letting it heat up to sizzling while he buttered the toast on the side before putting it in. Mal, meanwhile, was busying about in the fridge retrieving the eggs, along with the herbs, aioli, bacon, oranges, porridge, gravies, potato cakes, pork belly, and lard. Don't forget the black pudding, Amelia whispered as she walked past, already on to making the coffee and tea. The Tamlin yicked, hated the stuff. Are the eggs still fresh? Mal took a moment to scoot over and place the eggs in cold water, and watched them sink, giving his master a thumbs up before handing him the bowl. Good. Question one. What is magic? Pfft, that's easy. Magic is willpower and intention. Very good, Tamlin complimented as he cracked the eggs into the second simmering pan, frying them in oil before putting a little water in the pan and covering it. Now, how is magic? How do you do it? Hmm, Mal thought for a moment, recalling the writings from the books and moments where Tamlin slapped his wrists to get him to concentrate. There's an uh, worldly entity that you manipulate. It's the same thing that causes the ley lines, or it's caused by them, I guess. It's the same stuff that makes the pears grow riper and bears get bigger the closer they are to them, at any rate. That's a part of it. Tamlin affirmed as he flipped the toast out from the first pan and placed the pork belly and bacon where the butter had just melted. 
but I'm asking what causes a spell to be cast. What is the difference between, say, the ley lines you described and my fire? At this, Mal pondered and thunk and considered and tried to see just how much time he could waste to distract Tamlin from making him help. Not long, it seemed. Tamlin wasn't moving, and the entirety of his attention was focused on Mal. Your food is going to burn, he teased. Okay, okay, all right. Um, I think it's because it works through a medium, right? All magic supposedly comes from the same source, the ley lines. Uh, but it's refined through an element, or aspect. You don't make the fire yourself, right? Not usually, no, he agreed, flipping the contents of the pan and stepping aside to mix the fat with the gravy. Watch the pan. Okay, Mal said, stepping up and idly shaking the pan, because that's what chefs always seem to do. Anyways, uh, mages just work this energy through a medium, like how light going through a prism makes the rainbow. Uh, so an open flame is your prism. A glass of water is the hydromancer's prism. Yada yada. Correct, Tamlin called with glee, mostly at his own excellent skills as a saucier, and moved back to remove the first piece of toast from the pan while adding a second. Wait, a pause quiz. You said not usually before. You do sometimes make the fire yourself? I can, Tamlin confirmed, taking the pan off the heat and moving on to making the hot porridge. Even if I don't have a source of flame, I can use my own body as a medium for the magic itself, though this is far more taxing and with less controllable effects than just using it from an independent source. The poffs at the university taught that every mage is capable of using themselves as a medium, though I do not believe it. They're not poffs! And if not everyone can do it, then why can you? Mal asked, setting the table. Because I'm just that good, Tamlin said with a sly smile, as he flipped the breakfast onto a plate, glided back down at the table with it, and bit directly into Mal's eggy toast. Mal was shocked. You haven't finished your quiz! Tamlin pointed out, having absolutely zero regard for the yolk that was wastefully dripping away. You need to hurry before I eat it all. You didn't ask anything else, Mal cried, more at his rapidly disappearing toast than anything. You put it on pause. On pause! Right. <clears throat> Tamlin coughed, putting the yolky toast down. A final question. Why can't I? As in, if spell casting is just the working through a medium... Why can't I just do anything I want through the medium? Why are spells limited at all? Why can't some pyromancer just, uh, make a fireball whenever they want? Hmm. That has to do with how magic works to begin with, doesn't it? A willpower. Like, if I start juggling, it's gonna be way easier to juggle three things than ten. So if you're casting a spell, it's gonna be way easier for you to cast a wisp of flame than it is a fireball. You don't need to concentrate as much, not as tiring. And why can't I use any medium I please, like making an icicle with a candle flame? Well, it's not really the aspect you're, itself you're working with, right? While it may be all the same kind of energy, all coming from the same place and whatnot, all you're really doing is focusing the energy through the medium that suits you best. So you, as a pyromancer, are focusing this energy through the flame to make your fireball, instead of manipulating the energy directly. Uh, that's why you can't make an icicle through a candle flame. You can't just perform a certain spell outside your affinity any more than you can freeze water by putting it in a hot pan. Correct, Tamlin cheered, as he passed the plate over to Mal and stopped resisting the urge to ruffle his hair as he did so and Mal smiled gleefully as he allowed himself to be pet before taking a bite. Which reminds me, he called with a mouth now full of eggy toast, sputtering it everywhere like some kind of savage. I want to learn more spells from you. That's what the meditations are for, the ones you didn't do. If you cannot do them, cannot focus your will, then there is no point in learning the spells in the first place but I'd be more eager to do it if I did learn the spells in the first place. Please? And he tried his absolute best to look as cute as possible while sucking on half an orange. I only know two styles, and we both know you don't have the disposition for fire magic. Frankly, I'd be shocked if you produced anything but an icicle from a candle flame. 
I know that, which is why I want you to teach me more of the other style. At this, Tamlin put the paper aside, giving his total attention, and looked at Mal with more characteristic sternness than usual. I have taught you the fundamentals of that spellcraft already, and that's already more than enough to get you hanged. You are asking me to put your life in danger just so that you may have the virtue of knowing something simply for the sake of knowing it, and that I will not allow. Mal coughed and started choking on a piece of bacon before washing it down with tea, smacking his chest and taking in a gulp of air before pointing his fork accusatorily at Tamlin and reminding him, You lit my bed on fire! You weren't in actual danger then. I was still sleeping in it! I know! I know that because I was there to make sure you didn't get hurt! There is never any danger when I'm about. Mal grumbled. He knew there was a flaw in this reasoning somewhere, but couldn't quite catch it. Look, if your concern is for my well-being, then it's best that it's you teaching me, right? Because I still want to know, so it's better that I learn it from you than go, say, walking throughout the streets, calling for anyone else to teach me who may be within earshot of a constable walking by. Now it was Tamlin who grumbled. If learned, you would be dooming yourself to walk down the road of a hard life. You would be living on borrowed time. You learned it. And last I saw, you're filthy rich enough to have two solid gold statues of gods that you don't even believe in. Just because I don't believe in them doesn't mean I must be unwise in honoring them, he said, sipping his coffee with snark. Then believe in me. Honor me. You gotta pass on your learning to someone because you're already a fossil. So I am. And it's all from borrowed time since first taking those steps. Eventually, I'm going to slip up and someone's going to find out and I'm going to have to go into exile somewhere where they won't extradite me. And you'll have to visit only once a year and we'll talk about the weather while I slowly go mad because all I would eat is the crackers my kindly neighbors cram through the lock on my door. And that isn't some kind of life I want you to go through, to live with that risk. I learned it for the power it gave me. I have accepted that and accepted the risk, but you don't have to. You can enjoy all of this without walking on coals as I have. I don't want to just enjoy this. I want to learn. I want to discover. I want to know about the world, and how can I learn anything about it if such a fundamental piece of nature, of life, is kept in the dark? If something's forbidden, that is all the more reason to learn it. I want to know. I accept that risk, just as you do. Besides, you already said I know enough to get hanged, so there's no harm in teaching me more, right? Not like they can hang me twice. Not without putting themselves at risk for the same hanging, at least. Amelia teased as she slid a plate of dry toast in front of Tamlin for his breakfast. Mal chuckled, nodding in agreement, and then, just remembering, told her, Oh, Amelia, you're at home now. It's okay to take your veil off. She complied with a nod gently removing her veil to reveal her pale skin and blue lips, letting her raven hair tumble down and smiling at Mal with the kind, glassy eyes of a dead woman. Besides, he continued Tamlin, if you don't teach me more about necromancy, how am I going to take care of Amelia after you kick the bucket, you old goat? Chapter 3. Try, so that your friends think of you as persistent and your foes think of you as a hassle. Page 84, line 13, from The Book of Small Wisdoms, by Monk Zong. The next few months of practice were not exactly what Mal had in mind, though, thinking back, when his master agreed to teach him, perhaps he should have bitten back his excitement a bit to ask what he meant when he said, under one condition. Mal's curiosity, in the end, refused to care about any conditionals, and he hopped on wholeheartedly to learn the aspect of infinite oblivion in an infinite universe, and was instead met with sparkling. Sparkling? Yes, like this, Tamlin said, as he snapped his fingers, and it was as if a little set of fireworks went off between them. The sparks arced outward in all directions, leaving needle-thin afterimages from Tamlin's fingertips. 
Mal was quite impressed, the colors shifting to deeper red hues in accordance with where the light from the sun hit them, the crackling sound they made as if someone had put a lit match under dried wood, the unexpected smell of sandpaper and salt almost too light to even be noticed, even the little paths that the needle-thin orbs arced through in all directions, spreading out and expanding as if from a bouquet to weeping willow, absolutely dazzled Mal. One could see the reflection of every path of light in his eyes, so wide were they with delight. This dazzlement lasted a whole five minutes while Mal asked every question about the spell, what it could do, why it did that, its practical effects, the theory it stemmed from, and, of course, what it had to do with necromancy. The general answers being, not much, no idea, zip, dunno, and nothing. Mal was still interested, however, and began muttering about the potential artistic merit in such a spell, how it could be complemented to music or reflected in glass. Unfortunately, as his questions went further and further along, its absolute lack of artistry, beyond looking flashy for a moment, became more and more evident. Finally, even this menial interest waned. After having Tamlin demonstrate yet twenty more times, Mal was thoroughly disinterested. Perhaps if there were different variations of sound that emanated from it, or flat colors, or even different patterns of arcing light that could be made, there would still be something of merit to this spell. Alas, it had none of these. It was what it was. Seeing it the first time was no different than seeing it the twentieth, minus the slight change of hue. Well, that was lovely, he said after the demonstration was complete at last. Is there anything else to show me? No, replied Tamlin, thoroughly appreciating his role as a tormentor. Not until you show it back to me. Here, put your fingers like... Wait, what do you mean? That spell. You have to learn it. And you have to learn it perfectly enough to do it at a moment's notice, even under pressure. What? Why? Because I said so. It's not even that interesting. It doesn't have to be interesting. But I could be learning about something cooler. Every moment you waste arguing is a moment you're not learning something cooler. This spell is fairly beginner and evidence of a wizard in training. But I'm already a wizard in training. I already know the basics of necromancy. I know that. And you know that. But you can't show off your necromancy to prove that to everyone else, now can you? This is firmer proof. Every wizard in training can do it. If you don't know elementary spells, you're just going to be laughed at by everyone you're trying to convince. So get to it! Mal grumbled, even as he positioned his fingers into a snap. This spell works by focusing internal energy through to your fingers. The sparks are created through friction and heat. What about the colors? Mal asked. After the sparks are created, they will take on that distinct color all on their own. What causes them to take on the color? I have no idea. Now, start... What? How can you be the one performing the spell and not know how it works? Because I don't need to know how it works, only that it does. Now stop interrupting me and focus! Mal yipped, stepping back and realigning his fingers to snap, listening intently for Tamlin's instruction. Anyways, start by focusing on the heat of your own body. Try to focus it so that it grows more intense in your fingertips. The more heat you can focus, the easier it will be. A few minutes passed while Mal stood, mostly still. At times he could feel his brow furrowing. Other times he adjusted his footing or stretched slightly to release tension. It wasn't long before he felt the heat, and when he did, it took the whole of his attention. Now, do you feel the grooves of your fingertips? Focus the heat there. Try to exaggerate it. Visualize them hard as stone, so that if anything flicked off them, they would spark. Mal breathed shallowly, relaxing a little more and letting his shoulders droop as he maintained an outstretched arm. His now rough-seeming fingers shook with the built-up tension of a snap. Now, spark! Mal snapped his fingers so loudly that it knocked him completely out of his own trance. He felt the heat, the friction, the deep pull of resistance his fingers gave as they ground past each other. His middle finger clapped against his palm, and as he forced his eyes open to gaze upon the sound, smell, and look of the spell, he found an utterly insignificant, low effort, simply appalling single spark trailing through the air like a drunk fly before sputtering out. 
now he was certainly not impressed. He tried again and again, each time only getting a single spark with next to no color which seemed to limp away from launch. Tamlin successfully cleared his throat from a laugh. Don't let it get you down, he assured, patting his apprentice on the shoulder. These sorts of things take time and patience. You said it's something every trainee wizard can do, Mal barked, distraught, still trying for more and more sparks. Well, uh, yes, but you started later than most, so it's going to take a bit more time. Just keep practicing, and when you've got it down to an art, I'll teach you more. For the next few days, Mal did just this. During every space of his free time, waking, breakfast, stretching, acrobatics, reading, brunch, practicing his circus arts, lunch, playing with his friends, snacks, going to the card house to cheat at poker, then dinner, dancing and a late night snack of crackers and cheese, he absent mindedly snapped his fingers, practicing his fireworks. It wasn't going well. Consistently, only a single spark fluttered in the air before dying out. Sometimes he would become ecstatic, managing to fire off two sparks, but this very excitement often caused him to lose focus and go back down to one. Eventually, he even enlisted Amelia to help, pulling her aside, having her sit and keep him on track every time he lost focus. Which was a lot. Okay, all right. Warm, warm. Feel the warmth in your fingers, like you're touching a hot roll. A hot roll with butter. Maybe a bit of jam. Blueberry jam. Blueberry jam you can get at the market. They're selling that now. Better stock up so I can... Warm. Ah, okay. Warm. Feel the warmth in your fingers. Warm like, um, like fingers. Like Amelia's. She's rather cold. Is it because her blood isn't pumping? Does she need to breathe then? I wonder how long I could go without breathing. They say the record is around 20 minutes or so. That's incredible. But doesn't the brain get oxygen deprived super quickly? I wonder how they can do such a thing without permanent dam- Warm! Okay, all right. Warmth. Warmth. Just breathe. Clear your mind of anything but the sensation of warmth in your fingers and the grooves of your fingertips. Like the spark of a match. Okay. 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 Is it working? Oh, I think it is. Oh, this is great. I can visualize it perfectly. Oh man, that was easy. I'm so good at this. I bet no time I'll have it mastered. Today even. And then the Tamlin will be so proud and teach me more spells. And then I can travel all over the world and dazzle everyone. Oh, this will be great. Where should I go first? Probably to the chieftains of the Chandras. I hear their astronomical charts cover entire rooms in paper. Incredible. I wonder how they get all that paper. Probably from the trees, of course. But do different types of trees make different quality papers? Probably. I hear some places ink their writings into grass. How strange. I wonder how they cut them. Ants, maybe. Trained ants. Snip, snip, they go- Wait, damn it, it happened again! Ah! Are you having difficulties? Amelia asked, rousing him from his thoughts. What? Oh, no. I, uh, yes. Wait, uh... I'm sorry, this is so difficult. It's it's like flexing a muscle. How does Tamlin do this with even bigger spells? Is this what he means by focus? Amelia nodded. My gods. I shall go get some tea to ease you. If you are in need of advice, perhaps you should speak to Tamlin. If you would prefer wisdom, I can retrieve scrolls of lessons past. If you are in need of rest, perhaps you should do something that distracts your attention. I can't get distracted now. I'm so close. I think... Besides, what would Tamlin think? I don't want to let him down or let him think I can't do it on my own. I have to persevere. Has your perseverance helped you up to now? She asked innocently. Well, no, he admitted. Then why do you believe it eventually will? She asked with surely genuine curiosity. Mal did not reply. Instead, he got up, lurched over to the couch, picked up a very soft pillow, fluffed it, placed it tenderly at the corner, and then flopped the full weight of his face against it with a pomp and a loud groan. Amelia was not sure about this answer, but accepted it nonetheless. By the end of the week, Tamlin found him in a near hysteric state on the floor of the piano room. When he asked if this had anything to do with the fidgety young man's progress, Mal made the same noise a moose might make as it placidly sank into a vat of molasses. Oh dear. His apprentice had tried and kept trying. Even now, he was snapping his fingers at a constant pace, rubbing them raw, trying to evoke any more than the lamest response possible, and couldn't. Why don't you try a break, my boy? I can do it! 
Mal assured him. I believe you, but I bet your friends are missing you. I know I can do it, Mal replied as he got to his feet. I know it's all right, but I bet there's a new opera going on that we can see. Maybe you can drag me down to the cafe and have Jeremiah go on again about how he absolutely served in my unit, and how I, if I just keep trying, I can do it. I know I can get it right. If I just have more time, more practice, I know I can. I know- Mal! Tamlin barked. Mal snapped back to a reality where he stood before a very stern-looking teacher with a very tight jaw and a very furrowed brow, and he shrunk. But Tamlin's face softened, and his jaw relaxed, as his breathing once more became rhythmic, and he replied in his usual half-teasing tone, It is not polite to interrupt me. Mal nodded. I know it can be difficult, but setbacks are a part of life, too. I know that may sound like a useless mantra, but I promise you, it's even more useless to devote your time and energy into things that you can't do, or that aren't working out. I've lost far more money trying to resurrect dying industries instead of just cutting my losses, and you're hammering your head into the ground for the exact same results you'd get by actually enjoying your day. So why not just enjoy your day instead? Because, Mal sighed, his head drooping, because I wanted to impress you by getting it right away. Because it's something even an amateur wizard should be able to do, and if I can't do it, then what does that make me? I want to be a good mage. I really, really do. And if I can't even get past the audition, then I feel like maybe I'm just wasting your time, and it's not meant for me. That maybe I should just cut my losses like you. Tamlin closed his eyes to listen, nodding attentively at each enunciation. When Mal finished, he opened his eyes, gently guiding his apprentice to sit down beside him on the piano bench. Do you believe your worth comes in part from impressing me, or from how fast your skills develop? No, Mal lied. Do you believe that not achieving something quickly makes you unworthy? Well, if I'm a mage who can't even cast an elementary spell, then what does that make me? It makes you your own individual just as everyone else is. Tamlin smiled. <laughs> well, that's not very reassuring, Mal griped, his finger still moving, though more of a listless rubbing than a snap. <laughs> well, it's not supposed to be, Tamlin chuckled. It's just true. People are unique. They have their own traits and talents, what they're good at and what they struggle with, but it's all equal in the end. The same painter who struggles with distance has a perfect eye for color. The soldier with great aim may have a weak foot, and even a fantastic public speaker may suffer from flatulence. Everyone has their own strengths and weaknesses, even in areas where you might not first suspect. Just because your weakness happens to be over a starting hurdle doesn't mean you will not find your talent after overcoming it. Whether you find this reassuring or not is up to your mindset. But what if I don't have any talent, even after overcoming it? Sometimes practice doesn't make perfect. Sometimes people are just bad at things, aren't they? It's scary to think that this is just it for me. So it is. Not having that innate talent can certainly be frightening if you lack it in an area you're passionate over. Have you ever been in that situation? Hmm? Oh, no, of course not. I'm extremely talented in everything I do, but this isn't about me. Tamlin said, running his fingers through his hair before standing, turning, and crouching down eye-level to Mal's short stature. You're worried that you lack skill as a wizard, and maybe you always will. There's nothing wrong with worrying over such a thing, but you are doing yourself a disservice by selling your skills short already. <laughs> what do you mean, what skills? Mal asked with only slight mockery, snapping his fingers weakly in Tamlin's face. Why, your skills and patience, of course. Focusing for weeks on a project most people would have given up on after a few days. Your persistence, your endurance, your willingness to endure hardship to improve, your ability to delay gratification until your goals are met. All of these things will help you far more than any innate skill ever could, he said, and laid an encouraging hand on the young boy's shoulder before he continued. I have met men of extreme talent and ability who have never been recognized, simply because they give up the first time they were actually challenged. The moment you decide you are committed to victory is the moment it becomes only a matter of time. You will go far, Mal Malin, in spite of your lack of talent, 
and I promise that skills you develop in pursuit of your mastery will help you far more than the mastery itself. Just you wait. Mal turned aside and grumbled anyways, though he couldn't deny he felt a little bit better after the pep talk, and nodded when his master asked him if he did. For now, how about we go find a fun way to waste time? Maybe Lacey's has got your new sheets. We can also go get some dinner, and then perhaps you can go off gallivanting with your friends. We can come back to this later, okay? Mal nodded once more. <laughs> Good. Now clean yourself up. You look terrible. The rest of the day was spent with Amelia driving the pair about, first taking them to the dust field to see the chicken races, where Mal consistently called out to bet on the biggest, girthiest rooster he could find. He lost every bet, but it made Tamlin erupt into a giggle fit each time, so it was worth it. Then they went to see a display on aeronautics, complete with a simple museum of failures and prototypes. Vast engines that weighed a plane down far too much, or unorthodox designs that were too selective in their flight. As Tamlin noted ideas for potential business ventures, speaking candidly about funding with the curator, Mal gazed starry-eyed at the resident pilots as they described what it was like to fly in one of these marvelous contraptions, and, more hard racing how it felt to crash. Afterwards, they found themselves at the half-foot diner, caught in by the smell of baked goods and pastries wafting from the open door. With Mal greeting the waitress and inquiring about specials as Tamlin scanned his eyes over the crowd of peons that usually patronize such a place. Loose-collared men with bruised hands, many among them even being his own workmen, who wanted to take their sweethearts out for a treat. Perhaps there was a charm to the dirty wooden floors, but at least they knew well enough not to look him in the eye. As they were seated, ordered something along the lines of a pastry platter and toast, and got to discussing the value of high-speed aircraft, a small group of roughshod workers stood from their table, exited with all haste, and returned with a bustle of many, many more, turning to the owner to ask where Master Tamalin might be. It was only with great trepidation, and only after repeated assurances that, no, no, it was okay, they actually worked for him, that she led them to the table. Tamlin, by the tread of their boots, already knew well what was coming. Mal did not, but knew well enough to know that it was bad. Count Tamlin, what a stroke of luck you came in on John's lunch break. We were just on our way to speak to you, said the gruff man at center in as reasonable, respectful, and fierce a tone as he could manage. About? asked Tamlin, already knowing the answer. Well, me and the boys have just been talking, and just don't think it's right the way we were so suspected, and... Do you mean subjected? Mal piped. Suspected, the man insisted. And we think... I'll make you a deal, Tamlin cut in. Why don't you boys all get back to work while I enjoy my day off, and we will discuss this when I am next near the mines in a much better mood, perhaps when I'm not being interrupted at dinner. Even when threatened, the man's chest boomed, and he continued, daring even to step a foot closer. We've been talking it over and decided it would be best if we were to have a union. Is that right? Tamlin muttered, leaning to dig into his coat pocket. "'Since it seems the only one caring about us here is ourselves, and we don't think we can trust you to do it.' Mm hmm Tamlin droned wearily as he brought out a tight-sealed bag that jingled greedily. "'We stand in brotherhood and to help one another.' "'Mal,' Tamlin called under his breath. "'Pay attention.' because I'm about to teach you something very important about business. So we will do what is right by ourselves, for ourselves. That's what we've decided. Without a word, Tamlin pulled the string on the bag to open it, reached his hand inside, and brought out four of the shiniest coins one could ever see. They slapped against the table with a hard clink. Four hours. A month's wages to the man among you who beats him until he can't speak, he said, pointing to the leader. There was a dreadful silence in the room as the eyes of the patrons stopped to look at how this unfolded. 
The ringleader seemed about to speak before closing his mouth, then stepping forward again, looking around, seemingly trying to step away from every direction at once before addressing the group. Fellas, can you believe this? Easy choice. We'll be getting more than that soon enough, eh? Maybe in a year or so, Tamlin's voice slithered. But who knows what medical bills may come up, or what might suddenly break that needs fixing. How many among you need that money right now? The silence grew colder, and the ringleader looked back to see how many were staring Tamlin down. But they were staring at him. He raised his hands and opened his mouth to speak, surely another speech about community and solidarity that would never reach the ears of his cohorts. He was blindsided, punched in the temple by the man to his left, and as he stumbled, he was grappled and tossed to the floor by the man on his right. Soon it was each of them, punching and kicking, sending a flurry of blows into his ribs, his back, his skull. As most patrons looked on in horror, one looked on in amusement, and one did not look at all. It was only the waitress's mercy that stopped the beating, rushing to put herself between the blows and the man and screamed for them to stop, that they had surely shed enough blood. The rest stepped back as she lifted him under his arm to lay him on the bench as she called for the doctors. Well, Tamlin began, breaking the shameful silence. Since it was two of you that did most of the work, and I said four to the man, I think splitting it down the middle is fair. And then he stood, handing two coins to each man, and they all knew better than to argue. See you at work, boys, he said with a final polite wave goodbye, as they sheepishly walked out, muttering to one another about what tomorrow might bring, and how they could avoid it. For the rest of the meal, Tamlin bent Mal's ear with his discourse on business and the importance of the plots involved therein. Were you watching closely, young man? That's how you consolidate power. You make your enemies squabble amongst themselves, keep them small and isolated, so they can be easily cowed with threats of force. You only need to bribe them once, fill them with distrust, and they will fall before you like wheat to the scythe. To his credit, Mal did his absolute best to listen in earnest, which was far easier now than it was before, as he had somehow lost his appetite. Even as they left the diner and went to the tailor to see if Mal's new bedsheets had come in, Tamlin kept joking and mocking, Did you see his face at the end there? And Mal could only weakly nod before finally suggesting, Uh, even if it messes with your bottom line, isn't it better to have a good reputation? What do you mean? I, I mean, yeah, you get more money by breaking your unions, but doesn't that spread bad rumors? Make you look terrible? Wouldn't that cut into your business more if people didn't want to partner with you over it? There is no need to worry about such a thing, Mal. With a few well-placed donations and a favor in the newsroom, I can buy my way into any reputation regardless of what some penniless paupers might say about me. Why wouldn't they say matter? Because I am extremely rich. Wealth doesn't determine the truth, you goat! Perhaps you misunderstand me. I am extremely rich, he said, bursting into chuckles at his own joke, twirling his cane as he carried on walking with a slight whistle to accompany his step. Mal followed, and kept looking at Tamlin, going to open his mouth before closing it again, wanting to ask something, to hear something, yet never being able to get the words out. Luckily, he was distracted by the news that his bedsheets had, in fact, come in, saving Mal from a potential existential crisis and only narrowly preventing him from blustering about Tamlin setting his old sheets ablaze to the poor retailer. While his master finished purchasing the sheets and newly shipped linens and drapes, Mal made himself busy by scoping about the novelty section, finding what new and odd materials had since been used to make fabric. In his searching through coat racks, ducking into pajamas, and stuffing his face into towels to test their softness, he had come upon a new handkerchief, and when asking about it to the tailor, was told that it was a brand new material, made and shipped directly from the capital, polyester, it was called, and it looked fantastic. Though it is not really for use, per se, the tailor noted. It's awful at actually mopping brows. It's one of those purely decorative items, but how decorative it is! And Mal couldn't help but agree. 
the vibrant patterns, the smooth plastic-like feeling, the smell, the sound it made as he rubbed his fingers across. Ah! There was a shock. A shock. Was it a shock? Mal rubbed the handkerchief some more, but nothing came from it. A static. That's what it was. How strange. How bizarre. How cool. He went, waving it triumphantly to Tamlin. If he could have anything more, this is what he wanted. The rest of the day was exquisite, in no small part due to the fact that it was the only day of true fun he'd had in quite a while. He was as tired as could be when he finally returned home, long after dusk from being happily chased across half the city by the youngest children in town, who desperately played at stealing his new prize. By the time he collapsed into his new bed, he expected that he would have a deep, restful sleep but something about the incessant nagging in his head that he was an utter failure of a productive human being told him that it was unlikely. He tossed and turned, his mind still fixated on the firework spell. Even Amelia reading to him about pirates on the worm seas did nothing to distract him, and he spent the hours after she left pacing out of his bed and to his souvenirs to see if they could do better. They could not. Mal fidgeted and toyed and examined, Yet any time he felt his thoughts meandering away to some new mystery, of the puzzle he was trying to solve, or how the simple gears worked within the music box, they were always pulled back to the forefront every time he became coldly aware of the grooves of his own fingertips, and the heat of his hands. The best way to distract from that sensation would be to fidget with his brand new handkerchief, naturally. He slid it between his fingers as if it were string. He rubbed it between his hands to see what crumples would form. He placed it on his face and blew as hard as he could to see how far it would go. Not very far. Disappointing. He had just put it back to try again when he felt the shock. A shock! It was back! How cool! He was thoroughly distracted, trying to tease more static into the thing as he fiddled with it, when it shocked him again! Oh, this was fantastic! He wasn't at all thinking about his previous couple weeks of absolute failure in performing one of the simplest spells because he was utterly used. Damn it. He deflated with a sigh back into his bed only half-heartedly observing the handkerchief now as he absent-mindedly snapped his fingers in the same futile motions as before. And then there was a spark. Not from the static, but from his fingers. A spark that zigzagged off his fingertips in a flash of mellow light before dissipating. He sat up. He tried again. Nothing. He massaged into the handkerchief this time before trying again. Nothing. He... Wait, no, not nothing. There was something different, like a compliment to the heat. He massaged into the handkerchief a second time, trying again, paying closer attention to the feeling. There it was. It was different, absolutely, but not quite enough. He tried again, putting the handkerchief on his face, trying to shape it into a ball or a twist, trying every combination he could think of before running the handkerchief through his hand, snapping his fingers. He looked straight at it as he focused and found the static from the handkerchief traveling up his fingers to the tips, jutting outward into the open air like branches from a tree trunk. He tried again, with more focus, more energy, a second wind that he hadn't felt since the first time he got to two sparks, and this time there were three. They weren't the same as before, clearly, that was obvious. Previously it was based off of heat, of fire. But this was an enhancing of the static itself, of directing and pushing what already lay charging. This was easier. There were four sparks now. They shone brightly, little lightning strikes dazzling the air like fireflies, shimmering, glimmering from blues to yellows to whites. It didn't have the snap of tamlins, but it had sizzle. It crackled in the ear, and it gave off the eerie smell of ozone. Mal's smile shone as bright as the sparks themselves. He raced out of bed, slamming open his doors as he nearly slipped down the tower stairs and called excitedly for Tamlin and Amelia with absolutely zero regard for their beauty sleep. Amelia, of course, wasn't asleep and thus didn't mind one bit as she heard Mal calling. She grabbed the poker from the library's fireplace and ran down the hall toward Mal's voice with intent on fending off whatever intruder might have broken into to alarm him. Tamlin, waking up from his intense stupor, slapped his cheeks to alertness and minded very much as he grabbed his iron cane and bolted from his snug room, intent on beating to death whatever intruder might be assaulting his protege and then whacking Mal with whatever cane was left for the crime of waking him up. All three collided at the end of the hall with a big oomph 
from Talon as he grasped a drawer for support, a soft exhale from Amelia as she grasped Mal's shoulder to steady herself, and a rapid, Tamlin! Amelia! You're not going to believe this! I got it! I got the spell! I got it right here! It's in my hand! The napkin! Handkerchief! I use the sparks! It's so great! I'm so great! I did it! From Mal, as he held his handkerchief with the same love and care as you would a newborn. Tamlin, for his part, was very kind, and decided he at least ought to hear the boy out before pretending he mistook him for an intruder. He set his cane down, put his hands on his hips, and encouraged, Go on, then. Show me what you got. Mal sparked his fingertips, running the handkerchief through them as if he were a magician pulling a bouquet of flowers from his sleeve, then again showing the consistency. His smile got wider and wider still as the static arced and caused Tamlin's goatee to rise with electricity in the air as he smiled right back, deciding that this was worth waking up for after all. I can do it, see? Mal called. I can do it. I really can. I've proven myself, right? I've shown you I can do it. I can perform any spell. I can find a way to do it. So please teach me more. Please. Oh, please. I promise I'll be perfect. I'll do all the meditations and get to all your worksheets on time. You won't regret it at all. I'll never ask for anything again. So please, please, please. He was standing on his toes at this point, nearly headbutting Tamlin's chest, staring wide-eyed as he sprung up and down like an excited accordion. Tamlin laughed as he pat Mal on the shoulder and nodded his head. Yes! Mal cried, leaping up in one big hop, grabbing Amelia's hands and spinning her around in a dance. You won't regret this, master! Not one bit! I love you! And with this final declaration, he ran back off to wherever he could contain his enthusiasm, as Tamlin yawned and scratched his head. Would you like me to start on breakfast since you're up? Amelia asked. No, no, I can do it myself. May as well. What time is it, anyway? 3.30 rising. Amelia said, so glad to be of use. Never mind. Tamlin huffed and turning, made his way back to bed, grumbling about how he should have whacked that bratty kid anyways. Chapter 4 Surely the point of a good first impression is to make a better second one. Page 42, line 18, from The Book of Small Wisdoms, by Monk Zong. Weeks went by, and Mal became better learned in the arts of necromancy, and just as he promised his master, with the help of Amelia's baked goods, he performed any and all meditations prescribed in order to assist his focus and calm. Despite the increased instruction, Tamlin continued to tutor him in minor arts as well, little tricks like stirring a glass of wine without touching it or making a flower wave hello as you held it, and above all, encouraged him to continue keeping his circuitry skills sharp. One day, however, as he woke up late for his usual lessons, he trundled downstairs to find his master already getting dressed in his best. Oh, another trip already? Did something happen? No, no, not a usual trip. I am going to a social gathering in the capital. A gala held in celebration of the Duke's marriage to someone or other, I'm not sure whom. You're going to a gala without knowing who it's celebrating? Well, I don't need to know who it's for to get drunk. Besides, it's more of a celebration toward the consummation a potential heir and what not. Amelia appeared in Mal's periphery, handing him a cup of breakfast tea as she explained, These events are rarely held in celebration of a single individual. Rather, it is held for the sake of the great houses to mingle and re-establish themselves. If someone does not show up, it can be seen as an insult to the host, and, more importantly, an opportunity for your rivals to undermine you and put your status into question. It is necessary to go. Not that the Duke would care. But the houses certainly would, Tamlin continued. Ah, you sly dog. Well, I hope you have lots of fun. Maybe actually get a date this time so you can call it a true success. Oh, yes, I hope so. And I hope you will, too. Hmm, <laughs> Mal sputtered through his tea. Besides, isn't it normal for young men to dance and drink the night away? I'm fifteen, Tamlin. So was I when I first started. You're coming with me, young man. I'm going to present you as my adopted son, for in the future you are going to be in charge of any and all business dealings and will be taking any and all messages should I be otherwise bedridden. Or off somewhere trapped in a crypt or something. But dear papa, Mal said as he rose dramatically and draped himself over the chair like a fine coat. I don't know a single thing about etiquette. How could I ever make you proud at a social gathering if I don't even know the proper distance to raise my pinky when I toast Lord Twiddledum for having a fling with the maid again? Nonsense. I've been teaching you proper etiquette for the past week, and you're a natural performer. 
I'm certain you'll make many people have to pretend to cough as they laugh at your toasting Lord Twiddledum. But uh, I don't want to do you a disservice as your son. I don't want these people to think you did a bad job raising me or that you're uncultured or whatever. Which you are. Mal, since when have I cared for honor or whether people think I'm uncultured, which I am? They can think as little of my rearing as they like. My concern is for you. For me? What do you mean? At this, Tamlin finally stopped fiddling with his tie and tossed it aside in frustration before looking pointedly at Mal. What is it you think a necromancer does best? What is their first and foremost duty? After some languid blinking and thinking, Mal noted, You wouldn't ask if it was something obvious like raising the dead. You're right, it's not. Your first and foremost job as a necromancer is to convince people you are not a necromancer. You must appear any other way you need be. Disguise yourself at a moment's notice, whether you are dining with a lord or playing pickup with a tramp. You must play a role and play it so well that nobody ever suspects what you really are. You're taking me so I can practice? Tamlin nodded. What if I fail? I mean, there's no way for them to tell I'm a necromancer, is there? You don't make a point of sicking ghosts on people, and the servant is always disguised, so no, not really. I have heard rumors of certain individuals who have the ability to detect magic innately and could theoretically tell what mediums you are using, but if they exist, I have not met one. You mean you've never been accused by one? Mal retorted, and felt very clever about it until he got bonked on the head. What I mean, you little scamp, is that there will be times where you find yourself in a compromising situation, where bits of your life, your real life, bleed through to your persona or social dalliance. Whether it be through slip-ups of knowing something you shouldn't know, or being caught with ritual items on your person. In those situations, you must be able to pretend to be what you are not so perfectly that it would be ludicrous to even accuse you. Is that how you've survived this long? Of course. I have no doubt in my mind that each and every one of my peers knows I am up to something heinous and dastardly in my free time, but they don't know what. And more importantly, it would be against all acceptable social rules to accuse me of anything outright. And that's why you've been teaching me all these parlor tricks, so that if I need to pretend I'm a different kind of mage... Exactly. And now you have something to show off if you want to be flashy. I always want to be flashy, Mal quipped as he hopped off with a suit to try on, freshly brought by Amelia, before she turned to affix Tamlin's tie properly. Then let's hurry so we can be the right amount of late. The ride to the train station was just the right mix of fast pace and relaxing, with Amelia driving perfectly, as if without a veil at all, Tamlin leafing through the scraps of gossip, and Mal, who, when he saw anyone he knew or anyone who waved at the car, or anyone who so much as sneezed, promptly stuck his head out of the window to perform an exaggerated greeting and call out loudly to all who would hear him. When they rounded the bend and his pack of friends noticed him, they chased after the car with youthful relentlessness as they waved back. And when they stopped by the old men who sat at the cafe on sunny afternoons, they smiled as Mal threw kisses at them and challenged them to more games. Friends of yours? Tamlin teased. Of course! Don't you know I'm ever so personable? It has absolutely nothing to do with the fact that I can make anyone look handsome just by standing next to them. Tamlin snickered and hid his face behind his papers. Well, not everyone can be as fortunate as myself. Of course, you can still see it now. When I was a young man, I was an absolute jaw-dropper. I was the delight of every woman's heart. Some of them even killed for me, he noted with a sly, sinister grin. Mal looked over his master, his wide forehead and narrow chin, his prominent cheekbones, the dark green eyes set deep in his face. He glanced at the utterly uncombed and uncared-for bit of facial hair that Tamlin ludicrously called a goatee, and the loose wave of hair around the sides and back of his head, the only places he wasn't totally bald. "'I don't think that's true,' Mal said, and Amelia giggled in the driver's seat. "'I didn't ask you!' Tamlin spat back with mock venom. Tell him it's true, he called to the servant. It's true. He was very handsome. <laughs> was, Mal snorted. Was! Correct yourself, Tamlin shouted, and the servant complied. He is very handsome, surely considered a heartthrob, a work of art. 
Amelia, he's so mean to you. You don't have to listen to him just because he made you. Yes, it does, Tamlin corrected. You can show him up. Tell him he's wrong. Rebel. No, it can't, Tamlin corrected. Did he always dress like an evil bureaucrat? Has he always been so full of himself? He Don't answer that, Tamlin interrupted, and the servant graciously closed her lips and smiled. Mal laughed as he leaned back, spinning his wrist as he called out, Oh well, it's only right that I'm the more handsome here. Amelia, tell me I'm the most handsome. You are the most handsome, she dutifully replied. Very handsome. A heartthrob. A work of art. Mal giggled sheepishly and blushed, and then stopped blushing as he caught on. Hey, that's exactly what you said about Tamlin. Tell me the truth. Am I handsome? There was a silence for a few seconds in the car before Amelia tilted her head to the side just so, and with the tenderest voice replied, Well, you're funny. Tamlin burst into laughter, doubling over, clutching at his stomach as he howled, while Mal let out a groan of despair, a deep, No! as he desperately tried to open the door to try to escape his shame into the next life, despite Amelia locking it for just such a possibility. Tamlin, still snorting with tears in his eyes, pulled Mal back from the door. The rest of the drive was uneventful, with Tamlin's tittering, Amelia's gentle driving, and Mal pouting dramatically, tucked into his seat. They arrived at the train station where they were saluted with a proper guard regiment. The station master had been told of his visit beforehand, and so all of it was stalled, waiting for Tamlin's departure. As they were preparing to leave, Amelia, without a word, brought out Tamlin's military sword and pistol with accompanying medals he earned with them, both as a show of his glory and personal defense. As Tamlin began walking toward the train, Amelia quickly skipped over to Mal, adjusted his cravat, folded his suit collar, and pressed her hands into his as she whispered, Be safe, and make lots of friends. I love you. Mal! His master's voice called from the train door, and he quickly smiled and nodded to Amelia before running to meet him while she stood, waving them off. The train ride was largely peaceful. Mal couldn't stick his head outside to wave at anything here, and was forced to consign his entertainment to within the confines of the private room, balancing pencils on his fingers, sampling one of everything off of the trolley, and reading through notes on the ancestral families that will be attending the ball tidbits about the surrounding mountain range and where the workers walked to first build the tracks, along with little cultural anomalies he just found interesting. Did you know that Ibram has no word for hello? I mean, they do say hello, like we do, as a greeting, but what they literally say is peace. If you talk to a translator or read the dictionary, they'll tell you it means hello in a contextual sense. It's just what you say to greet people. I wonder why that is. Do you think they say it even to their enemies? It makes me wonder how much is lost in translation, the spirit of the thing. Like, in the Solarian Empire, they have two separate words for home, and they both literally mean home, but one of them means home, the place I belong, and the other means home, the place I live. Temporary, not necessarily accepted. It can tell you a lot about a person or how they feel about something just by the kinds of words they use, even if, to us, they would mean the same thing. Tamlin was clearly not paying enough attention to this ramble. So Mal came even closer. That's also why there's a debate about the true job of a translator, because I've seen some of these books from overseas, and the same book can have different versions. Some translate the literal meaning of a word, while others translate the spirit of the word, what it means in context. And there are tons of people who argue as to which one is better, authenticity to the language or authenticity to the culture. Isn't that interesting? Riveting, said Tamlin, who had absolutely zero interest whatsoever. Mm, Mal grumbled, moving back. Fine, then. Be that way. Let's talk about you. What are you reading? You've had your nose in that since we've got on the train. Hmm? Tamlin finally perked up. This is a letter from my friend. He is asking me to support him in a legal case against an acquaintance. Oh, what kind? Property rights. My acquaintance claims that a vast portion of my friend's property falls within his jurisdiction. My friend disagrees. Naturally, he is asking for my support and expertise to prove his foe wrong. Oh, well, I hope you can. I don't. What? Huh? I mean, I am rejecting his request. I will say it falls within my acquaintance's jurisdiction regardless. For now, anyways. What? Why? This guy is your friend, isn't he? 
Yes, but he's retired. He's been so for a long time. He's pleasant, but I have more pressing concerns than pleasantry. My acquaintance, on the other hand, is a rising star. He has had a great deal of land that I have a great deal of interest in, and I could benefit from expanding my mining operations there. So I'm going to try to use this dispute as leverage for a business deal, an added perk of working with me. You're betraying your friend for money? Pfft, no, of course not. I'm not that crass. I'm betraying him for a great deal of money. You're terrible. That man came to you for help. He trusts you. Do you think he would abuse your trust this way? He'd be foolish not to, Tamlin replied, and mouthed again, a great deal of money. I know a lot of philosophers would have very choice words with you. Haven't you ever heard that money doesn't buy happiness? That's not true, Mal. That's just something we tell the poor so they don't get uppity. Mal groaned as he looked out into the tall pine trees winding by. This kind of behavior is why you don't have any real friends. Don't you have, like, nightmares or something from ruining so many lives? At this, Tamlin lowered his paper, and with a great deal of smiling condescension replied, I am sure I do not have to remind you, Mal, as to who benefits most from my distinct lack of nightmares in this kind of behavior, Mal. He was right, of course. The main reason Mal could have all these fineries and have his bed burnt without fuss and sample everything from a trolley to begin with was because of this ruthlessness, and it set a slight ache in his heart to actually confront it. Hmm. Someone can benefit from something without liking it. Uh, people can lose their house in a disaster, but the payout they get from the insurance doesn't mean they're glad it happened. Is that right? Would you like me to stop, then? Turn a new leaf? Become a new man? Give all my wealth and properties away to the poors and let them ruin it, while you and I are forced to slum about with them and eat the same beans and porridge every day as they do? Are you really telling me you're willing to go hungry just so someone else can eat? Mal made an er sound as his heart ached once more, and there was an uncomfortable feeling in his stomach. Well, mm, you could be nicer all the same, he said, hoping the cushions would swallow him up. That's what I thought. Tamlin scoffed as he leaned back in his seat, neatly folding the letter and placing it back in his satchel. It's very easy to condemn something when you're not the one who gets his hands dirty, just as it is easy to feign that new leaf when you are no longer required to do something just to get by. A thief is no less a thief because he no longer has to steal. If one's ethics and principles change on circumstance, why have them at all? It's because they change on circumstance that you need to have them. They just need to have mercy with it. If someone is forced to steal to feed their family, something they wouldn't have to do if, say, the law were less corrupt or the prices weren't so gouged, then they are only a thief by circumstance, and not by nature. And, leaning forward, he added, with an accusing finger, You are a bad man by nature. It is no less one's nature to pull their hand from a flame just because they never stick it near the fire in the first place. It is nothing more than moral collapse to say that circumstances are responsible for your morality, and you cannot claim virtue and goodness by the good graces of never being in a compromised position to begin with. Many of the same people who condemn my operations, many of the same people we are going to see, are the exact same people who wear my diamonds and gold, and all it took was my wiping the blood off. They are not better for it, they are weaker, he declared, as the shadow of an oak raked across his sharp eyes. So what do the strong do? Accept it. There is not a single person on this earth who has not profited from the suffering of another and probably no single person who has not caused suffering altogether. It is inevitable. The weak man has two options. He can either close his eyes to this fact and pretend moral superiority over those who do not, or he can recognize it. This will not allow him to stop the process. He'll just stop enjoying it, much like how you will feel the next time you eat my cooking, knowing where the money I bought it with comes from. If... Causing suffering, if profiting from it, is inevitable. You can use those same profits to ease it elsewhere. 
Yeah, a dragon may hoard stolen treasure that a hero profits from when he slays it, but then he can use that treasure to do good elsewhere. A hero may kill a monster, and the monster's family suffers, sure, but by killing him, many more people are saved, and their families don't have to face that grief. You can use what you gain from the suffering of one to ease it in others, and if everyone did this, the world would be a better place. How utilitarian of you. But wishful thinking as to what good an action might do does nothing. Suffering will continue regardless, and if people are going to suffer, why shouldn't I profit from it? Because you can choose to stop it instead. You don't have to participate just because you feel you'll miss out if you don't. That's a very sweet thought, but I can't control the state of the world. Whether suffering continues or not isn't for me to decide. Pfft, now who's closing their eyes? Tamlin lurched forward, carried by the motion of the train as he near bent Mal with that terrible green glare, and Mal's pale blues tried to meet it right back. The two eyed each other with stern, mean looks until Mal broke first, and in his quiver, stuck his tongue out in a silly face instead. Tamlin couldn't help but laugh. I'll think about it, he said finally, with the slightest hint of affection as he looked out the window. I'll find you charities you can think about, Mal replied, smiling. They arrived in the bustling capital soon after, stepping off the train onto a platform crowded by attendants trying to keep it from being too crowded. Mal went back and forth between each man, pressing them for information, what to do, where to go, the sights to see, everything impressive that could be done. Tamlin walked right on by, a straight line past any annoyances and an utter refusal to accept any distracting assistance. The metropolis was loud, bustling, and busy, but most of all it was bright. Even in the light of the setting sun, it all shone as if it were still midday, and the glistening glass towers and beaming walkways made sure no shadow escaped their notice. Even as Mal had to be reeled back from getting hit by trams and be tugged away from his window shopping, he had the distinct feeling that the capital was a place one rented, rather than lived in. In contrast, this was exactly why Tamlin never cared for it, and he was reminded all over again each time he stepped off the train. Too little privacy, too many people moving about. The only ones to stay permanently were the nobles who needed residences near their peers, lest they be forgotten. And birds, who enjoyed the year-round heat the electricity grid gave off, cocooning the capital away from even the smell of snow and cold. Am I finally going to meet the Duke? Mal asked, knocking him out of his thoughts. Probably not, Tamlin admitted. He's never been one for the social side of governing. If I know him like I do, he's likely out hawking in the hills somewhere with his new wife or overseeing the building of forward forts. Plus, he doesn't drink. So the only reason he'd actually show up is to test his patience. He could want to see you. Why would he want to see me more than thrice a year? Because you're his best friend. You can meet up and chat about his life, his family, any grandkids on the way. Why would I ever ask about his family? You're so weird! I'm not weird, Tamlin murmured as he hailed for a taxi. It's absolutely weird that I haven't met the Duke, your best friend, since university. Well, you haven't met my children either. Which is equally weird! I should! You will one day, I'm sure, and I shall enjoy all the commotion that erupts thereby, he concluded as the coach pulled up. Wouldn't it be better to walk? Mal asked. It's such a nice day out today. There's barely a cloud in the sky. Yes, it would be nice, Tamlin agreed. But we're already fashionably late as is, so we have to pick up the pace. Is it common to arrive fashionably late? Hence, fashionably? In fashion? What are you getting at? Well, if fashionably late is the new on time, then surely arriving later than late is the new fashionably late. Tamlin laughed, but waved a cabbie down all the same. Grand reasoning, Mal, but I'd rather not. Plus, there's no smoking allowed in cabs. And so the pair walked merrily down the street, enjoying the lovely summer dusk as the sun blinked out of view behind the mountains, leaving orange skies to the west, purple skies to the east, and just enough wind to force Tamlin to switch from cigarettes to his pipe. In due time, they made it to the palace hall, already lit and overflowing with music and guests. It was radiant in every sense of the word. 
The decor was Historia-inspired, hearkening back to a golden age of humanism and renaissance, with entire walls dedicated to the painted exploits of the first men to walk the surface of the earth and slay its dragon so they could refashion the world with its corpse, and the right of their descendants to its conquest. There was a small band in every room that played with every sort of instrument, becoming stranger and needing more fingers to play the deeper you went in and the guest's attire was varied and intricate, ranging from more postmodern styles taken from Tamlin's popular slick suits, or incorporating foreign regalia to look the more cultured, the latter of which Tamlin cared nothing for. After his grandiose entrance, swinging the doors wide and announcing his presence to ensure everyone knew he was there, he went straight to the wine and hard liquor, like a champ. As he walked, he was accosted on all sides by ministers who would try to pass on legal reforms or mayors who would seek his counsel, and Tamlin graciously allowed each of them to rise and bow and meet his gaze without indulging in making them wait. It was only Mal's repeated insistence that pried him away from their claims and requests and to the actual festivities that awaited them. "'Here, have this,' Mal said as he handed a very confused Tamlin half a loaf of wheat bread. "'It's a palate cleanser!' Now, I know it doesn't seem as lavish as some of the other foods here, but it actually goes very well with alcohol because it absorbs flavor between tastings. And here, he said, quickly jaunting off before coming back with a bottle of dry Riesling, this is a good drink to start off with. It's light and mild enough that it won't overwhelm any other flavor or burn out your taste buds too soon. If you want to enjoy yourself, you have to know how to enjoy yourself. <laughs> Goodness me, said the shrill voice next to him and it made him jump and spin to see a pretty young lady, probably only a couple years older than himself, in mellow green dress, her wind-swept red hair done up in a ballerina bun, holding a glass for herself. "'It's a bit uncommon to know so much about any peculiar wine, is it? I'm of House Ernsdale, by the way, of the Ernsdale Engineering Corps. Alice Ernsdale, good to meet you,' and she performed a gesture reserved for one of noble rank addressing another. "'Oh!' Um, hello, uh, my name is Malmalin, the son of Tamalin, he said, and gestured in kind before giving the rest of her question more thought. He fiddled with his buttons as he felt her eyes on him before putting together an answer. And uh, maybe, but my library is full of all different types of books, and I love to read. I brought some booklets on this kind of stuff with me to read on the way, uh, for you never know when knowing something might be useful. Uh, like here, red wine is a good accompaniment to any rich meal, while white wines are most suitable for mild and delicate foods like cheese or fish or vegetables. But of course everyone knows that. What people usually overlook is the boldness of the wine. Uh, like you, you're drinking a dry white wine alongside a cheese plate, but dry wine doesn't go with cheese. That's probably what's making your throat feel scratchy. What you want is a sweet wine. That will clear it up and also help your voice not sound so nasally. The corner of the girl's mouth twitched as she sucked in her breath and lightly cleared her throat, eyeing Mal the same way one would eye swamp water in their kitchen. Do you notice a lot of different flavors between your wines? I'm sure you know exactly which would go with any dish. Uh, hmm. Um, well, I suppose there can be one for every occasion, though I don't actually drink much at all, aside from my birthday, where I have one cup of whiskey cream with my coffee, he smiled. Uh, but some aficionados could argue... At this point, Tamlin placed a gentle hand over Mal's face, landing on his shoulder, and whispered, She's mocking you, old boy. Wait, really? Mal whispered back, before asking the girl outright. Um... Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, are you making fun of me? Yes, dear, she replied, and Mal heard Tamlin whisper again. Now what are you going to do about it? At this, Mal's face soured, and he turned back to look at the woman with scorn. Why, yes, I am sure there is a wine for everything. For example, it is said that some can help rejuvenate your skin to make you look more youthful. I'll give you recommendations, since it's clear you don't know them. At this, the girl blushed a deep pink, pursed her lips, and performed a mock curtsy as she hastily drank her glass and walked away, being followed by Mal's snort of derision and humph of disdain. What's the point of attending in the first place if you're not cultured enough to appreciate it? Because it's not about appreciation. It's about gathering to know who's in the know, and to know who knows what you don't know, you know? No, Mal replied. You will, Tamlin jabbed. 
There were a brief few minutes of peace, where there was only one or two attendees pestering Tamlin while he admired the masonry of the walls, and a brief few seconds within those minutes where he could actually get more than a sentence out of it the length one must go to, to ensure structural integrity. Mal listened, enraptured, which was fantastic since nobody else ever did. "'Well, well,' interrupted yet another boisterous voice from behind. "'If it isn't our good friend Count Tamerlan, good to see you again. You haven't shown up in quite some time.' And Tamlin glowered that it couldn't have been even longer. "'Likewise,' he replied, with just enough regained composure. "'It is good to see you again, Minister Potts,' he replied. "'I beg your pardon for not showing up as much as I used to, but I got rather caught up in work, and that takes precedence.' "'Oh, dear,' the flabby man replied. "'I don't suppose you arriving on foot has anything to do with that, does it? "'I didn't want to call attention to it, "'but if you cannot afford a hansom for yourself, "'I would be more than happy to lend you one of mine.' "'Actually, sir,' came Mal under Tamlin's arm, "'we were just taking a nice stroll. "'The city is so wonderful to walk around, "'and there really is more time to see things when you're not in a carriage. "'I can tell you all about them if you don't know.' <laughs> oh, I appreciate the offer for your servitude, but I already have a guide and have no need for two, the flabby man said through a large smile and squinted, cunning eyes. Are you sure? Mal returned, with perfect innocence. The man's smile faded for a moment before picking up again, in a too loud a laugh, as he said, what a kindly young man, offering to help so much. But do tell me, who exactly are you? He is my son, Tamlin replied. And you let him speak for you? The flabby man asked. I do, Tamlin replied with a nod toward Mal. And while we both appreciate your offer, I assure you that my motor vehicle is perfectly well suited to me, and we have no need for an older model. The man took a sharp intake of breath before biting his tongue and nodding curtly before walking off, faster than his waddle should allow. Mal smiled, sticking his tongue out at the man in a decidedly non-social way as Tamlin laughed, and, when no one was watching, flipped him off. The party carried on well enough, with the general mingling and tittering that all involved, and Mal puffed his chest in pride as Tamlin introduced him to all as his son and future heir. As yet another group of nobles struggled to come up with compliments, their approach to quick, rhythmic step, and a younger-looking man with a distinctive nose and glasses far too large for him stepped forward to interject, greeting the aristocrats with a deep bow and requesting the attention of Count Tamalin, when he had the time. Tamalin acknowledged him, holding a finger toward him while speaking with an avatin over what concerns the Empress these days, until the man spoke up over the entire ensemble. "'May I have your permission to meet your gaze, Count Tamalin? "'There is something important we must discuss "'if I can be worthy of your time.' "'One could hear a pin drop over the entire portion of the room. "'Yes, indeed, there must be something important "'for you to so interrupt us,' he said "'before turning and making use of it to the crowd. "'Ah, but so desired is my time, "'and I'm afraid I cannot share it with everyone at once.' Come along, Mal. There are matters to discuss, apparently. I'm sorry, the now sweaty man with fogged glasses interjected, but this is a private matter. It may be best heard by your ears alone. At this, a foppish woman saw an opening and interjected, Quite right, Count Tamlin. You wouldn't want to traumatize the poor lad by learning things beyond his ken, would you? Tamlin scoffed. If you bar children from things only grown-ups should hear, how will they ever become grown-up? Besides, the young man is my inheritor in both estate and legal accord. He has a right to hear anything I do. A private matter of state security, the man insisted, and Tamlin clicked his tongue against his cheek. Very well. Mal, feel free to roam as you please. Don't be too charming. I will be back soon enough to... Retrieve you depending on whether or not the conversation involves anything actually worth hearing. Yeah, okay, that's fine, Mal said, and then both his master and the man walked off together. It was not fine. Mal was now alone in an entire mansion full of nobles of similar, though of course a lesser, standing to Tamlin, alongside most of their children as well, 
surely all of which were snooty, uncultured, and just looking to turn their nose up at him and mistake him for a bag boy or something. It was only proper to feel a little nervous, and he wanted to avoid any trouble in a witless verbal match against some other toff with an axe to grind. His best plan of survival would be to make his way toward the luncheon table, which had thus far been completely untouched, since everyone else was far too worried over their waistlines to even risk looking at it, should they gain an extra pound or two. If he could just get there unruffled, they'd come nowhere near him, and he could eat all the sweets at his leisure. Genius. He took his time waltzing in a zigzag pattern across the floor, nodding politely and rushing off when anyone addressed him, which he decided might have been interpreted as quite rude only after he did it, and made it to the edge of the room, blending wondrously well with the paintings. Now, so long as he remained aware of his surroundings, and didn't get caught up in the artwork, he could avoid bumping into anyone all the way to the table. Which was a shame, since they really were great pieces, still of a romantic theme, but more abstractly so, with the warmth and distance seemingly inverse to trick the eye. It was rare to see these kinds of works hung alongside a more traditional home arrangement. Usually noble houses were more conservative in their tastes, so the Duke must really be... What do you think of them? A young lady, now suddenly standing next to him, asked. Oh, damn it. Ah, oh, well, he stuttered, trying to think of how best to appeal to a young woman. I think they're really good. You need a lot of skill to paint something structurally correct without a reference. And while some may think it's easier if your style is more abstract like these, I don't think so. I think it must be even harder, since you're trying to keep the core of what you're painting recognizable while also giving it a broader meaning to your audience. Oh, thank you! The mousy girl squealed as she bent to rub her shoulder against Mal's. My family thought I was crazy for my love of abstraction, but I think it's the hit new wave, like a new genre being invented. It's a pleasure to make something that adds to it and have the struggle not be wiped away, not to mention the validating honor of having it hung in the Duke's palace. You painted this piece, he said, thumbing toward the mingling collage of soft oranges and blues that seemed to form a low view of a woman throwing a bouquet of daisies from a high tower into a desert. Mm-hmm, she grinned broadly, pushing up her glasses and blinking lavishly. I just noticed you staring at it, so I figured I'd come over and ask your opinion. Of course, I was hoping you'd adore the thing, but everyone's tastes are different and that's okay. Not many others have given it much attention. What a shame, Mal burst. You're clearly a very talented artist. Perhaps it would receive better attention if it were hung up in a proper gallery? Perhaps a more underground scene? Uh, sometimes it really is about the audience and not the piece. I know, and what must that say about society? She snorted a laugh, and Mal smiled back. Hey, I was just about to move over to the cuisine. Would you like to come with me so we can keep talking? Oh, and I am Mal Malin, the son of Count Tamalin. Pardon my lack of introduction before. That's not very polite, is it? Oh, she giggled before waving him off. You mages must keep strange social customs, and that's all right. She curtsied and gave him a salute reserved for magi. A bit outdated, Mal smiled, but he did not correct her. I'm of House Sanford, daughter of Sea Baron Sanford, she said before putting her hands behind her back and twisting her dress. And, I don't know, I'd like to talk to you more, but a lot of those foods aren't really good for me. Oh, it'll be fine. I'm sure they have lots of low-fat foods, so you can enjoy them, too. The giggling stopped. What do you mean by that? She asked. Oh, it's just that you're not as thin as most of the other girls here, so it's natural that you'd be concerned about eating too many treats. But I'm sure there are plenty of them that would barely add to your weight at all. These people plan for everything, you know. Hmm. I see. And is that where you will be going? Yeah. I think you'll be fine alone. I wouldn't want to take anything low-calorie off your plate considering how badly you need it, she said, and with a curt nod gave a curtsy of courtesy, but not of respect, and walked away, adding, And you made your joke so you can wipe that smirk off your face now. Huh? Oh, no, I'm sorry, I wasn't smirking. My face just looks like that, he called after her though she was already deep into the quiet gossip and laughter of the crowd. He scratched at the back of his head, embarrassed. People were looking at him, and this was no good at all. He had to, yes, okay, back to the plan. Head away and out of mind, over to the delicacies, he passed around the parameter of the room, though this time having mind to nod, return cordial waves, and more politely excuse himself from conversation with any who approached. 
working at his people skills was not going so well. His escape, on the other hand, was fantastic. He arrived at the table, taking in the sight and especially the delicious aroma of the food. There were dips and spices and sauces from every corner of the globe on one end and what looked to be the contents of an entire pastry shop on the other. He could spend the entire day here, mixing and matching the zests and bitters, the acids and the zing, and with no better way to start than with an earthy blue cheese sliced with a tart pear. He was on his third bite when he heard a young man ask, "'Is that even any good?' and pondered for a moment as to whether or not it was customary for so many people to sneak up behind others here before he answered. I haven't decided yet, he said, as he turned and saw not one boy, but two. One on the cusp of adulthood, with the bright shine of youth and shaggy blonde hair to match, and the distinction of an ill-fitting tie, and the other a sterner-looking lad, though slightly younger, with the beginnings of whiskers on his face and smelling faintly of rose stems. The blonde laughed. "'What do you mean you haven't decided yet? You've taken the bite, haven't you? So do you like it or not?' "'It's not so simple,' Mal declared. "'Sometimes you may taste something, and it seems foul, only for it to be because it's crossing against a poor flavor pairing. How do you think someone would feel about oranges if they've only ever eaten them for the first time after brushing their teeth?' Other times it is the age of the food that is the problem, or it could have been prepared poorly. That's why most people don't like Brussels sprouts, you know. You always have to be willing to give something a fair shake. Here, you try, he said, handing him the questionable concoction atop an olive toast. You know that has mold in it, right? His stern friend prodded as he chewed. Isn't most cheese technically mold? No? Where in the world did you hear that? Oh, I don't remember, the blonde said, swallowing the rest of the treat. Horrible, he decided. I know, agreed Mal. Isn't that great? No, the other interjected. What's the matter with you two? You shouldn't eat mold, and if you do, it should at least be good. Pah, you are just like my master Tamalin, adverse to new unpleasantries, but one never knows. Perhaps you might have really liked it where I didn't, and it could have become your favorite food. This, too, is a lesson, surely, that just because something isn't for you doesn't mean it isn't for others. The two young men pondered over this moral while examining the rest of the foodstuffs, and seemed to be giving it a fair shake before the blonde asked, "'Wait, did you decide to give me the pear and blue cheese after you decided to taste it horrid?' "'Here, how about this?' Mal said as he completely ignored the blonde and held out a habanero pepper smothered in deep sweet chocolate. "'Okay, that I can try,' the rose-scented man said, taking it and nibbling at the tip before taking a hearty bite." Was the smell coming from his fingertips? He had bandages on them. Wait, you know Count Tamalin? Personally? asked the blonde. Yeah, he's my father and my patron. Oh my gods, I'm so sorry, replied the blonde, and Mal snorted with laughter before waving it off as fine. Tamalin isn't that bad, usually, mostly, unless you insult his cooking. Did you know he lit my bed on fire? <laughs> what? <laughs> Why? shouted the sterner man between coughs. "'I don't know. Because he's insane, probably. Wait!' he cried, coming in so close that the blonde needed to back up. "'I know you. You're of House Egmont, right? You're Lord Egmont's son.' Uh, "'Just Howard is fine, actually.' "'Yeah, I read you prefer to be called by your name, and that you're deep in debt, and that you're a scoundrel who visits saloons and brothels and mixes in with the dregs.' "'My reputation precedes me, I see,' he replied as he forced a smile. How did you... Oh, oh, I know most everyone here. No, of them, at least. I like to be prepared, and brought some pamphlets on the sagas of noble houses to flip through on my way here, uh, just so I could be a little more prepared, Mal replied with a beaming smile. Well, did it help? No, he said again, without a change in tone. "'Oh, jeez,' Howard cut in. "'Where are my manners? I'm sorry, you're right. Of course, my name is Howard, Howard Egmont, and, yes, Lord Egmont is my father, if that matters. And my friend here is... Well, come on, man, don't be rude,' he teased at his sweating companion, who had to take a long drink of water before he asked, "'Why is it so hot?' "'It's a habanero pepper, you dope. No amount of chocolate's gonna cover the heat.' I didn't know that, he wheezed before looking around and discreetly tossing the rest of the treat into a potted plant. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> he coughed. 
I'm called the young Robert of the ancestral house Thorn, spelled T-H-E-O-R-N-E, but my family is made up of land barons, and we pride ourselves on the cultivation of dangerous flora, so it's like a little wordplay. To tell you the truth, I still don't know whether it's actually supposed to be pronounced as Thorn, or if some ancestor of mine just said it as a joke, but here we are. For Mal's part, he had no idea whether the story itself was a joke, and he was having a fast one pulled on him, or if it was genuine but he decided to find it funny, regardless, since it sounded like a good story. My name is Mal Malin. It's fine to just call me Mal, though. The whole thing can be a bit of a mouthful. You must have had some pretty creative parents for a name like that, Howard joked, and Mal stuck his tongue out playfully. What's your real name? Robert asked. Huh? Both boys quizzed in unison. You said earlier that Count Tamalin was your patron, right? So that makes you a wizard, too. And wizards always give themselves those silly names when they get indoctrinated by whatever Montebank they're apprenticed to. Uh, like my cousin, he said, now turning to Howard. Do you remember him? He ran off to the Wilmont Academy in the mainland, and suddenly we're not supposed to call him by his real name anymore. It's Galmundot now. Won't shut up about it. No family names allowed. And then, turning back to Mal... I don't really see what's so special about it, though. You just pay the fee and they'll give you one. Even magicians sometimes get them for extra bark. Oh, well, um, I'm not sure how they do it in the mainland. I studied here and all, but I am a real wizard. See, look. And Mal happily pulled his flowing handkerchief from his pocket and placed it squarely beneath his thumb and middle finger, pulling it like a cord as he snapped and let sparks fly in dazzling directions, and reflecting in all the ruddy glasses of wine like winter lights. Robert clapped twice and could not have sounded more bored if he had tried as he congratulated, Bravo! And it was just as impressive now as the last thousand times my cousin showed me. At least yours was a little different, though. Very nice. Now will you please just give me your real name? At this, Mal could only smile. The same type of smile he wears when someone keeps messing up their lines in a play or begins a chess match with a barn's opening. You know, being brought up in an arcane household, I was taught very early that names are important and that offering yours has a lot of significance to it. Like you, who offers your name in the hope that people won't just call you by what they first think of you. Ooh, sassy. Touched a nerve, did I? Perhaps you won't be so riled up if you just introduced yourself properly next time you're in civilized society. I introduce myself properly when I give my name the respect it deserves. Just like you introduce yourself properly by making your name the punchline of a joke, Mal hoofed, pleased with himself, as Howard Wolf down stuffed olives like popcorn and Robert sneered and scoffed, mulling over a response. He was just opening his mouth to speak when the keen, red-headed girl from before butted in. Are you guys going to finish embarrassing yourselves any time soon, or do I have to remind you that we're in a public setting and nobody's impressed? Evidently, Mal did need a little reminding. When he remembered that they were, and who could overhear the bickering, a deep red shame came to his cheeks, and he tried to look anywhere other than the eyes of the girl he knew was glaring at him. Alice, Robert groaned at her. I was just about to think of something cool to say back, and you have to storm up and wreck the mood. Now if I say it, I'll just look lame. He's right, Howard agreed, between his chewing. You can't say a comeback after a certain length of time or break in the atmosphere. It's like an unwritten rule. Could you imagine the chaos if we broke it? People would get an epiphany in the shower and charge out to continue arguments they left hours ago. Pure anarchy. Oh, I'm sorry, Alice pouted. Did I ruin your one and only chance to look cool right here, arguing with a drunk? Poor thing. How will you ever recover? And then, coming back to neutral, declared... Come on, let's find something better to do. Beth needs cheering up anyways. Some jackass called her fat. Robert sighed, saluted the pair of boys, and left to follow Alice along, while Howard downed the rest of his glass and stood up fully to follow after them. Well, Mal Malin, unfortunately I can't say it was nice meeting you, but at least it was interesting. I aim to entertain, Mal shrugged with no effort to hide his sarcasm. And how does that usually go for you? Considering I was born into the circus, you'd expect it would go better than it usually does. Wait, you were born in the circus? Yeah. A Tamlin took me in when he ran out of servants to chase from his home, I'm sure. Like an actual circus? 
Howard insisted. Yes, like an actual circus. What other circus is there? But did you actually perform? What did you do? Howard asked excitedly. Yeah, and I did a lot of stuff. Juggling, sleight of hand, escape artistry, theatrics and acting. Basically anything that would help put on an impressive show. But there were plenty of performers there who were way better. What I was best known for were my acrobatics and knife throwing, Mal replied, puffing his chest proudly and beaming. I call Poppycock, Howard scoffed. You need a lot of training for that sort of stuff, don't you? Where'd you find the time between your schooling? Well, how about a demonstration? Mal offered. Sure. Not the knife throwing, though. No, no, not the knife throwing. But that still doesn't answer my question. But in a flash, Mal was already picking up select fruits, mostly round, firm, but with enough give not to hurt the palms, and in taking five and giving two to a smiling Howard, started by tossing one lightly into the air, and another, and then another, until all three were passing back and forth between his palms in the air in a smooth, circular motion. Toss one! Mal called, and Howard lowered the fruit to softball it in Mal's direction, looking at him, waiting for a nod, and then tossing the first one, then the other, with Mal pristinely catching them both, sending the fruit higher, increasing the tempo, juggling them faster. Howard's smile grew, and he laughed in delight as a crowd began to gather around the performance. Mal took one glance at the crowd, seeing their inquisitive glee at his antics, and he felt his heart surge. Another! Mal called. You there, gorgeous thing. Yes, you in the red dress, the one who just pointed at herself. Yeah, come and grab me a fruit, won't you? The excited young girl clapped her hands as she ran up, looking over the selection and choosing the brightest orange of the bunch. Excellent choice. Now, when I say, just toss it to me. Not overhand. <laughs> no, no, little lady. I need my teeth right where they are. Toss it to me like you're tossing it to the sweetest baby boy you've ever seen in your life. There you go. <laughs> are you ready? She asked between giggles. Yeah. Go for it. She did as best as she could, tossing it to Mal, who only had to lurch forward to grab it. The juggle fell slightly short as Mal dipped down to catch the orange before adding it to the rest, returning to full height as he put the rhythm back up to speed, and all the while he whispered something, some energetic melody that used to carry an act long ago. Here, last one, time for the finale. We need another, something soft, something crumbly, something I can eat. You there, distinguished gentlemen, you with the whitest, most glorious handlebar mustache I've ever seen. What should I get? The man stuttered, almost bashful as he massaged his mustache with pride and decided on a, a boffin, a cupcake. Mal gave an encouraging glance toward Howard, who didn't waste a moment sprinting up along the table to the sweet section and searching for the dessert. Racing his eyes over each thing as Mal called for him to hurry. Here, an older woman called, passing along her own, slightly nibbled, then hastily covered up for a cupcake, to Howard, who ran back and asked, Now? Wait, wait, um, okay, uh, now! The moment Mal caught the cupcake in his right hand, he flung it high into the air, flinging icing absolutely everywhere as onlookers stepped out of the way of stray shots. It was flung far beyond the fruit as he caught each individual piece, in his hands the crook of his arms, missing two entirely as one hit his chest and another splattered atop a cake. But here, here it comes. Mal nearly dived for the treat, stumbling to keep himself upright as he ran to get under it, and caught it directly in his mouth as he toppled into poor Howard, knocking them both onto the floor. Mal would have been mortified, were he not too busy choking. Howard, after being sufficiently signaled by Mal that he was, in fact, in imminent peril, quickly helped him to his feet, got behind him, leaned him forward, and struck him hard five times on the back with the heel of his hand. At this point, Mal probably could have coughed the sweet out, but he was a bit too busy wondering why. On top of choking, he was now subjected to a beating as well. This was quickly superseded by wondering why Howard was now wrapping his arms around his waist and spooning him in his time of need. It just didn't seem very prudent, no matter how cozy it was. Howard, meanwhile, was going over the steps in his head again, and, forming his hand into a fist, placed it just above Mal's belly button, placing his other hand over his fist, and not so carefully pushed his thumb inwards and upwards into Mal's abdomen, repeating each of the steps of this extremely unpleasant procedure, until Mal began coughing again and spit the cupcake out entirely. Ta-da! Mal weakly declared with the cupcake aloft. And that was a signature disappearing act. Uh, not to worry, folks, it's all part of the show. And forcing a smile, wiped the tears and mucus from his face before whispering, Also, why is there a bite in this? 
There was a rush forward as aristocrats crowded, asking Mal if he was okay, if he'd like some water, and where, of course, he learned that wonderful juggling. Even the two young women from before seemed to let out their breath as Mal recovered, and he heard Robert's voice among the crowd joking, "'That's a really good trick either way, because either you catch it and the crowd is dazzled, or you die and you don't have to worry about it. Splendid show!' And for the first time since he got there, with Howard patting him happily on the back, Mal was quite pleased with himself. "'How long are you going to keep spooning me, by the way?' "'Well, you just didn't ask me to stop, is all. I'm not even in any more danger!' Emotional comfort is important for the patient. As the crowd slowly cleared one by one after expressing their most sincere joy at both his performance and his safety, Mal thanked Howard, and Howard brushed the thanks right off. So first impressions are a bit rough, but it happens. I'm still going to help you if you're in trouble. What was I going to do, let you choke because you insulted my best friend and fed me some mold? Some would. Uh, yeah, and you could have zapped Robbie with lightning or something, but you didn't. You're right, though. I totally could have, Mal lied. My self-restraint should be appreciated. It is appreciated. My father always tried to tell me that the first time you meet someone is the only time you need to know what they're like, but I've never agreed, and this kind of stuff is why. Kind of like with the cheese. I gotta take back what I said before and tell you it's been nice and entertaining to meet you. Thanks. That's probably from the trauma bonding. You should nearly die more often, then, because that's much easier a way to make friends. At this, Mal smiled, and Howard smiled back. Hey, do you want me to show you around the place and bother the musicians until they tell us about their instruments? Absolutely! Meanwhile, during the commotion, Tamlin was sat in the study of the Emperor's secretary, being made to wait after the secretary rushed to grab as many beige binders as he could before running out with a dozen apologies trailing behind him, and was most thoroughly displeased. The long cold tea and untouched dinner cakes suggested an unplanned lateness rather than intentional, and the stacked yet disorganized paperwork indicated that this wasn't all that uncommon, either. Chronically tardy, perhaps. At the very least, it wasn't some odd power play. The windows were open to create a breeze, though the window must have led to an isolated yard for the only sound in the room was the ticking of the tall clock. The carpet beneath the desk and chairs had long since worn to nubs by friction. Was this the secretary's personal study, or just frequently used by administrators? Likely the former. The art and furniture of the room seemed a singular style, specifically chosen, rather than the pragmatic mixing and matching of placeholder items, and surely the secretary could afford it. The clock struck at the hour, and Tamlin let the chimes pass as he enjoyed his cigars and looked inward into his own thoughts. There was no one else in the room and Tamlin seemed to be left to entertain himself since nobody came to check. Initially, he considered rummaging through the desks and papers to see what secrets he could find, but decided against it in the end. The risk here was far too high without knowing just how attentive the secretary was, and certainly he must be at least of considerable skill. To leave Tamalin alone this long, in such an information-filled room, to be running late, with little cause for urgency, suggested either an extreme naivete, or considerable security measures. And one does not rise in the state by being naive. So he sat, and waited, and his patience waned with every tick and talk of the clock. Just as Tamlin began to rise, he heard the speedy tread of determination from the hall, approaching the door and swinging it open. The secretary entered, perspiring with heavy breathing for all his speed walking. "'I'm so terribly sorry. I did not mean to keep you waiting,' he said, giving Tamlin a noble salute while moving quickly to by to sit at the desk. He was about to gesture to the refreshments or ask whether he would like the window open or closed, or inquire as to any number of creature comforts, but Tamalin cut him off it utterly. "'Do not apologize for wasting my time in the same breath as you continue to waste it by bandying about with words. Tell me what you wanted to tell me and let's be done with it, Secretary Cole.' Stephen Cole stiffened in the chair fumbling as he took off his glasses, made all the more anxious by Tamalin's forwardness, and answered, Right. He took an extra moment to breathe and collect himself, 
He'd have preferred building rapport first, relaxing the atmosphere, but from all he had heard, Master Tamlin was always an entirety of a bad mood, and what he was about to address would do nothing to improve it. "'Your lordship,' he began, "'I appreciate your patience in being here today and awaiting this meeting, and though my words will bring nothing good to your household, I would hope all the same that—' "'Your prefacing your words with compliments and cushions in order to skirt my irritation fails you from the start, since it only irritates me further. Gather your courage, quit your groveling, and stop wasting my time!' "'You are aware that there is a war going on?' Cole blurted. "'Yes, of course.' "'And you are aware of what is at stake?' "'I am. As it turns out, territories with strong ley lines beneath them are of greater value than any ally.' "'So it seems,' Cole said, though he did not believe so himself. "'It is a horrible thing when once friends turn enemies, "'and when those who helped you previous turn against you "'over petty squabbles and grabs for power.' "'Not if you win,' Tamlin mocked, and Cole grimaced. "'Thus far all our efforts for negotiation have failed, "'and instead of focusing on peace, "'we are now taking away troops from the colonies where they should be "'and mobilizing them to secure our newly acquired borders.' Our enemy, the true enemy of the Borean Empire, remains well capable of renewing its strength, and if we shift our focus too greatly, we risk letting them recover completely. We will find ourselves enmeshed in wars on all sides, all three of us fighting the other until we are all destroyed. Well, that's a bit grim, Tamalin said, though his expression hadn't changed. But such is life. What can one do but fight till the end? A lot, Cole insisted and Tamalin huffed. It is extremely important that we band together, that all of us band together, in order to ensure lasting peace. It is important that we, whether our allies or us aristocrats, do not squabble. We must have one mind. It cannot be devoted to any one ambition or direction. We must forgo these ties. We are all Boreans, and we must act like it, Earl Tamalin. Count, Tamalin corrected with such ferocity that Cole could feel his skin begin to heat up. But he did not back down. Count is an Almanian title. It is not fitting for us to... What you consider fitting is irrelevant. If you take issue with my address, take your issue to the Duke. There was a long silence. The secretary knew that would be his exact response, and he had nothing with which to counter it. You are originally from Almania, are you not? You were not born here. Even your aristocracy is recognized by the Almanian king. Fitting, since they've accepted you as ambassador. You even have land there, do you not? They even credit you for a great portion of their legal code. I'm not sure what customs they have, or how appropriate it is to toast a potential foe, but here such a thing would absolutely be odd. There was another long silence, though this one much heavier, and much more dreadful. I do not believe you are implying something that it is within your best interests to imply, Secretary. My best interests are irrelevant right now. The first and foremost interests are those of the state. He took a moment to collect himself, to dab his forehead, to drink bourbon, to steady his creaking legs. Then he continued. Where do your loyalties lie, Count Tamalin? With the Duke, of course. The Duke himself or the Empire, because those are two very different things. It doesn't matter. So long as the Duke lives and it is in my profit to remain, my loyalty is here. That is all that should matter to you. And what if those change? Are you planning to usurp me or assassinate your employer? No, I would never— Then you have nothing to fear. The Duke is of similar age to yourself, your lordship, and he is not as strong as he used to be. It shames me that I must even utter such a thing, but it is so, and yet he still insists on leading the men into battle himself. As is his right. And part of the treaties that have been written to secure our peace directly infringes upon, and depends upon, seceding some of your conquests, which you have thus far railed against. As is my right. So I will not insult your intellect, your lordship, to suggest you cannot imagine where my fears may stem from. There was another lull as the clock struck the hour once more, and they both waited, eyeing it as if it were about to decide a winner, 
before it went silent. The ticking resumed. I <laughs> began Cole, and then stopped. His throat was so dry, he had caught in mouth. He took another drink, and then some water, then another drink, and rubbed its temples. His breathing would not calm. You fear that in this coming conflict, a conflict that may be inevitable if we cannot seek resolution, I may defect. Yes, the secretary admitted. Be proud, for you are an extremely influential man. You have a wealth that can only be surpassed by royalty of true lineage. A vast amount of the population in western Dunrai looks to you for their food and shelter. You are a cultural powerhouse in your firm testaments to law and policy, even if many other bureaucrats refuse to admit as much. The greatest number of shares and munitions and steel is held by you, and nobody will forget that you earned your aristocratic title through your military contributions, and your title of Master Tamalin of the Scorched Earth through defeating another master in personal combat. There are tyrants in this world who would trade a fifth of their army and treasury for you and you alone, and perhaps most enticing of all, you are deeply corrupt and susceptible to that exact kind of offer. Am I now? Yes, you are, Cole spat. You needn't pretend your innocence with me, your lordship. I understand the darker side of politics and understand people are willing to turn a blind eye to your tyranny because of the results you give and the fear of what they will lose by alienating you. Unfortunately for us both, I have no such luxury to let my fear shake my conviction. We are on the brink of a death spiral, and the threat you pose by the mere chance of your defection is something I cannot allow to go unchecked. You have a proposal, then? I do, Cole declared as he took another gulp of liquor from the bottle without realizing it was empty. I have drawn up a document. Perhaps it would be best if you were to read it yourself. And in saying so, he took a long, crisp sheet of paper from the center drawer and placed it before Tamlin who eyed it suspiciously before picking it up. He read it, then rubbed his eyes, then read it again, flipping it over from front to back, then for a third time, incredulous, as if he couldn't believe what he was actually reading. You want me to give up everything, he gawked. It's a lease to Her Majesty, and only a temporary one, affirmed Cole. You will still own everything. It shall all be in your name, your lands, your mines, your treasury. But as far as direct administration, that would be our duty to fulfill. We would take care of your assets and provide for you for the duration of the war or until any peace talks have ended. Right. Just like how the tax on sea-traded goods was temporary twenty years ago. Isn't it still labeled as temporary within your official diction? Cole turned his gaze away. The strain of the nation's debts upon the treasury has been great, and so there was no choice but to— And I am just supposed to believe that such a tedious obligation would not be taken up with my properties. Is that right? I know this might be hard, but— No, I know exactly what it is. It is your pitiful attempt to declaw me so that I pose no threat in the event I decide to rebel. The most insulting thing about the whole of the draft isn't that you question my loyalty, or even that you are asking me to transfer management of every single asset in my name directly over to Her Majesty's bureaucracy, as if I were a child unable to handle it. But the most insulting thing is that I don't get anything out of it. There is not a single so-called benefit within this draft that I cannot gain with the resources I have now. I did not expect you to necessarily accept it, your lordship. I only humbly ask that you consider it for a brief moment before ripping it up, for the good of us all. I'll keep that in mind. Is there anything else? If it would please you, my office is always open so that we may sit down and decide on terms that would make you more comfortable with the offer, whether it be the amount of properties leased or the funds guaranteed to you. I cannot promise the terms would be fair or favorable or anything close to what you would wish, but... And standing, he let out a shout as he slammed his fist against the desk, sending a thudding echo across the floor. And then silence. And the ticking of the clock. Cold's breathing slowed at last. He relaxed, his fist opening to a gentle palm as he collapsed back into his chair. I just wish people would work together. That's all. Tamalin sighed. 
Perhaps there is a reasonable explanation to Secretary Cole's tardiness, after all. All those he had been talking to and all the nerves he must be racking. How much running must he do in a day? It was still unacceptable, make no mistake. But Tamlin allowed the creases of his frown to lift all the same. The pressure of governance is something the lessers can never quite grasp. It is a difficult job to try to wrangle the unwise and the short-sighted to a common goal that prevents their own destruction. It is even more difficult to trust them to do the right thing to begin with. You may not have my agreement, but you have my sympathy. Now it was Cole's turn to sigh, though one of a different sort. Thank you, your lordship. The ticking of the clock sounded so heavy, yet the room was clearer all the same. Would you like another drink? I see your bottle there is empty. I'd love one, your lordship. Thank you. Meanwhile, Mal and Howard had left the cluttered dancing halls and moved to the balcony, both because they managed to annoy just about every musician in the place, and also because of just how beautiful the sky looked at this time of night, with the light of the cracked moon overhead. "'I cannot believe,' Howard began, "'that you actually managed to offend four separate people within the first two minutes of meeting them. I didn't mean to!' When Alice and Beth had told me that some short, fat guy had said mean things about their voice and their weight, I thought it was a funny coincidence, but I didn't actually think it was the same person. <laughs> I'm sorry! And not only was it the same person, but it also just happens to be you, who insulted my best friend and then nearly died in the same night. I'm... I, I get nervous, one-on-one. -on -one. I'm much better with a crowd. And you also called poor Mr. Pot stupid! I didn't, I didn't mean it like that. But Howard just laughed and laughed. Well, yeah, knowing you, I know you didn't mean it like that. That's what makes it so damn funny. I understand why you get punched a lot. Huh? What do you mean? At which Howard tapped at his nose and smiled at Mal. Your nose is crooked, my man. Oh, I've never actually been punched in my life. Uh, no, that's just from the circus. The circus? Well, yeah, I told you I practice in acrobatics, right? You don't land every flip, you know. Oh, Howard stuttered, and Mal felt an odd tension, though he knew not why. Is that also where you got your concussion? Howard asked, pointing to Mal's eyes. Hm? Oh, no, no, my eyes are just like that. Does that ever bother you? No, not at all, my eyesight is fine. No, you dope! Howard laughed, but quickly stifled it all the same. I mean, you, your appearance, I, I don't want to be mean, but you just look a bit, um, unorthodox. Ugly, Mal corrected, happily. Ugh. It used to, he admitted, especially when I was younger. Sometimes even today I'll be reading or snacking or running amok in my house and I'll catch a glimpse of myself in the mirror and think, well, I've had enough fun today anyway. But then I catch an interesting passage in my story or a new crevice to explore, and I'll forget all about it. It's just the way I look, right? I don't run into mirrors very often, so most of the suffering is from other people. They're the ones who have to look at me, he snickered. I know there are ways I can fix myself up through a lot of time or effort, but the truth is that I'm just not that invested. I look how I look, and if someone wants to judge me on that, then that tells me who I shouldn't be wasting my time trying to know. Besides, when people get to know you, they're less impressed with your looks and more impressed by how funny you are or how fast you can run from a horse. Does that happen a lot? I can run very fast, yes. Why? I just want to pet them. Howard couldn't help but giggle at the utter silliness of the image in his mind and took his time enjoying it before coming back down to the conversation. What about you? Mal asked. Is there anything you're insecure about or find upsetting? Since we're unpacking and all. Hmm. I worry about people liking me only for my money. I worry about people thinking of my house before they think of me as an individual. I worry about how I look, which sounds super petty, doesn't it? Because I know I'm above average and always surrounded by doughy nobles who make me look gorgeous, but it's true. I just worry. It upsets me when people try to talk to me as if I'm my father, or compare me to my father, or when they try to scold me and tell me what I should or should not be doing for the sake of my house. You seem to have some hang-ups about your dad, Mal noted, and Howard sneered. Ha, yeah, I do. You know, 
Our family was awarded its nobility because our ancestor was a selfless man. He sacrificed everything to protect the serfs on his land from a religious inquisition. It was only long after, with the crowning of the new emperor, that it ended, and he was recognized for his righteous heart and given a noble title for it. And now? My father can't even stand to be seen with a classman. It might sully his title just to speak with one. Most of all, it makes me sad when people are cruel to one another, when they're spiteful or snappish or vindictive, when people are so obsessed with their idea of status or image that they forget what it means to just be a good person. And when I try to bring this up and try to get people to really think, all they do is guffaw and tell me I'm not being realistic. Though if you ask me, I think they're just being pessimistic. Doesn't that get irritating? Mal asked. Not any more than being snappish, Howard replied, and Mal felt a shameful red come to his cheeks. Oh, I didn't mean to imply you were being overly snappish earlier. I just mean... And he made a wide, sweeping gesture at the ensemble of nobles around them. A lot of them really, really like their heavy-worded titles, and if you haven't memorized them the moment of hearing, you may as well have shot them. Has the same effect on their health at any rate, Mal retorted, and Howard snorted. All was quiet save for the soft laughter and melodies from within the palace, and the two looked out onto the city still lit from the warm golden light. You're not really a noble, are you? Howard asked, with an intense seriousness. I'm not sure I follow. Yes, you do. You're from a noble house, or came into one anyway. You know exactly what they're like, and you're not one, are you? Mal considered this, mulling it over and thought long about Tamlin, about him and the workers, about how he always treated them, his friends, everyone. Most everyone. Almost everyone. No, not really. Don't get me wrong, the finer things in life are the finer things, but I never really got the need for the name recognition, for all these glories and honors they all insist they absolutely have, to the point where they're willing to bring down everyone else who doesn't share them, like you said, to gain all that fame and glory just to abuse those who don't have it. I don't get that at all. Thank the gods, Howard said, relaxing as if he let out a deep gasp of air he'd been holding in all this time. You know something, Mal. Secrets are the true trade in this world. It's not money, or status, or promises, but secrets. To know someone's secret is to raise them up or bring them to ruin. And you know what my secret is? What? I hate them all. All this pomp, all this decor, all these faux friendships and fake kindness, and false teeth they had to replace from eating too much sugar, and when I inherit my bastard father's estate, I'm going to take the rest of my life to enjoy bringing it to ruin. The silence was deeper now. Deeper than any sound could break. Why are you telling me all this? Mal asked. Well, I've already told them. And he thumbed back to his friends inside, laughing and gallivanting about. You just seemed you were a different sort, and so I guess I wanted to tell you too. So you know you have a bit of trade with me, and maybe one day you'll share a secret with me too. And he smiled and ribbed him. Besides, not the worst possible thing saying I'm on first-name basis with the son of the High Prosecutor. It may get me out of a jam one day when I set my house on fire. I promise to do my best if you promise not to set it on fire yet. You have to at least invite me over for dinner first so I can show off my abhorrent table manners. Deal, Howard said, and they shook on it. For now, the hours are passing by and my father still hasn't come looking for me, so I'll go looking for him instead. You take care and try not to get into any more trouble in the meantime, okay? Howard laughed. I'll do my best, Mal. Now shoot! Then he turned back to look deeply at the stars as Mal hurried off. Mal explored the rest of the palace at his leisure, examining all the nooks and crannies in every private hall he could, and taking mind of any way he could gain access to locked rooms. During his examination, he heard voices coming from a room by an alcove, and quickly ducked by to eavesdrop. Was that Tamlin's voice? It must be. Nobody else could sound that gruff if they tried, and in his discovery, he opened the door a crack to look in and listen better to the conversation within. "'Are you a heavy drinker?' No, Cole admitted, a deep blush to his cheeks as he drank the shop prepared for him. It just helps with, well, liquid courage, right? Isn't that what they call it? And it keeps the exhaustion at bay so I can keep working. 
If it's energy you need, there's a line I can give that'll get you in touch with a friend of mine. Only deals in zappinates. Tamlin could barely get the full word out before Cole choked on his chaser and coughed the rest out through his nose. Gross. <laughs> That's not something you should admit to the Empress's secretary, he wheezed. You can call the constables on your off time. What off time? Cole scoffed, giving a playful smirk. Damn straight, Tamlin nodded, pouring one final glass for both of them and clinking one against the other. The two drank in relative silence, with Secretary Cole running his thumbs over the ridges of the glass while Tamlin took in the smell of incense and soft music from down the hall. Music? There was no music before. We caught another one, by the way, Cole said, interrupting his thoughts. In all this talk, it feels appropriate to mention they found him down in the Fertile Lands, hiding amongst the farmers. Who? Another spy? Is that what's got you so worried about my defection? Mm -hmm. No, 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 I'm not worried. It wasn't any spy we caught. It was a necromancer. Mal felt a chill crawl up his spine and heard a soft, hmm, from Tamlin. Don't you find that alarming? The secretary asked. I do, which is why I'm surprised I wasn't given his file sooner. Extended prison stays are an unworthy sentence. Oh, no need to worry about that, the secretary nodded firmly. They already sentenced him. You know how they do it down there. The law travels slow, so they take it in their own hands. They've always been impatient that way. Hmm. So what'll it be? Hard labor? Spice testing? Exile? If only he were so lucky. No, they hanged him. Mal's chest tightened, catching his breath in his throat. The clock struck again, muffling the sound of the music as Talman's voice called. Was that interesting enough for you, Mal? Or would you like to snoop more? Mal waited for a moment, then two, then three, then lightly opened the door enough to peek half his face in to see a slightly alarmed secretary and a far too relaxed master. How did you know I was listening? he asked, and the secretary turned to Tamlin with the same puzzled confusion. I didn't hear music when I first entered and wouldn't so long as the door was closed, so if I heard it as I did now, it must be open. You were just a guess, because if anyone else were listening and I called for you, they would have ran or ambushed us. Lucky us, I suppose, he said with a wry smile. Mal choked out a dry chuckle. Are you ready to go? Tamlin asked. Yes. Then let's, he said, standing and ignoring the salute from the secretary, whose eyes darted to the floor as he watched Count Tamlin leave the contract where it lay. In truth, the deal was not all that bad, especially considering the Duke would never allow Tamlin's properties to remain away by force, but he knew he would never accept it, no matter how the secretary bent to accommodate. How could he? The pretense of indignation was all he could do to keep any government officials from seeing what kind of corpses truly worked at the bottom of those mines, and so maximized his output. The train ride home seemed longer than the ride there, and Mal was quiet the whole way through. Did you meet anyone interesting? Yeah, I guess, Mal replied. What about the food and drink? Were they satisfactory, or do you think they could have stood some improvement? They were all right, Mal replied. I thought the fish was too oily. I swear I flaked it with my fork and grease damn near burst into my eye. I suppose that's what happens when it needs to be shipped directly from the ocean. Freshness takes precedence over preparation, and a distinct lack of crispiness, like nobody ever taught them to put salt on the skins before putting them in the oven. Professionals indeed. Yeah, Mal replied. And the detailing, designed by someone with all the passion for beauty and none of the skill. Of course, beauty is a virtue, but the entire point of architecture is to marry beauty and function, not just slap on foundations and paint a pretty picture over it like a prostitute with too much makeup. You're right, Mal replied. Tamlin took a deep breath and played with his mustache for a few moments before asking, What's wrong? Hmm? Mal looked up. I've been asking you about the entertainment and delicacies this whole time, and you've had nothing to say. That's unheard of he noted with a slight smile. So what's wrong? Is there going to be another war? He asked, hoping his father would lie. Perhaps. Wasn't there one just going on a year or so ago? Didn't it end already? Yes, but this time it's against Greater Almania. Wait, what? Why? I thought they were our allies. They were helping us up to now. Yes, they were. 
And now they are against us. Such is the fickle way of the world, Tamlin declared, reclining in his seat. But what happened? Who knows? It started over a land dispute over which of our nations should take over the conquered ley lines. You cannot split them. It is either all or nothing. Both sides want them, so the argument continues. As it continues, past glories are brought up. Those who won the most battles, those who contributed the most manpower or supplies, until eventually debts are called up and old wounds reopened and suddenly people wonder why they ever worked together at all. It happens. Really, it's the stupidest thing. If they wanted to butter us up, they should have given us a paper mill's worth of list for what they could do for us, not try to remind us of what we owe them. Because now we just have to wipe them out so we don't have to pay, he shrugged. I wonder if a truly noble war has ever been fought. Perhaps it's more important to wonder who won. But I don't know. It can't feel good to kill someone. It just can't. Not for any reason, noble or no. It can be a difficult thing for some. Hence why most killing is done at a distance. Things that close the gap, both physically and metaphorically, whether it be seeing their face, in hearing their voice, or just in knowing their name, can make it harder to kill someone regardless of the cause. Have you ever struggled with that kind of thing? Hm? Oh, no, mercy, no, I was speaking generally. But they are your people, aren't they? Wouldn't it be hard for you to fight them? No. I have fought many of my countrymen in personal, private squabbles in the past— fought and sometimes dueled to the death. I do not see why war would be any different. Maybe it just comes with the marching. Perhaps so. What about you? Do you feel a strong connection to your homeland? Huh? Oh, uh, no? I mean, I, I've, I've never seen it. Indeed. You've never set foot upon the glittering shores of Kamea, just as I've never glimpsed my winter forests. I have lived here for most of my life, just as you were born here, so these ancestral lands of mine are just as foreign to me as the steppes of the Orient are. It is here, here with you, and my friends, and my manner, and my culture, that I feel most connected. Don't you? I guess so. Attachments through obligation are foolish. Whenever someone tries to rope you into camaraderie or action based on things you cannot control, it is only because they want your easy support and power, not because they care for you. Remember that. I... I, I will, Master. Good lad. So what else is wrong? Hm? Remember who you're talking to. I know you like the back of my hand, my boy. Tell me what's on your mind. Mal grimaced as he gathered his thoughts. That... Necromancer you guys were talking about earlier. The one from the southern colonies. Yeah. He was hanged, right? That's right. What did he do wrong? You answer that question for yourself when you used his title. That's all he needed to do wrong. There was silence in the car for a few more minutes as Mal fidgeted and Tamlin gazed out the window. Why do they hate us so much? What did we do? That prospect didn't seem to bother you so much before when you asked me to teach you more. Why the change now? Tamlin asked with a twinkle in his eye. Because it was just imaginary before, I guess. It wasn't here like the southern colonies are, or real like that man is. Was. Do you want to give up the practice? No, Mal replied firmly. I just want to know why. I want to understand. Tamlin stroked his goatee and lolled his head back and forth, considering how to phrase it. The body of a necromancer's power is in the fact he has the ability to raise the dead. Now, you wouldn't know, for you have not raised anyone yet, but you have interacted with the servant. Amelia, Mal interrupted. Sure, anyways, you've spoken with it, and you've observed some of my other creations before. You know, Mal. You know that they cannot refuse me, that my word is more than law, it is reality. The dead have no ego of their own, and a slave that knows no truth outside of its master can be a dangerous thing. There is no ego, no mind of themselves. They exist purely as an extension of their creator. They do not get tired, they do not get sleep, they do not eat, they do not drink, they do not grow bored, they do not grow lax. Amelia does, Maltese, sticking his tongue out. She lets me ignore my lessons and run off with me all the time. And I've never corrected it to do otherwise, you little scamp, 
Tamlin replied, playfully smacking Mal upside the head. A young man needs tenderness, so they say, and lords know I don't have the disposition to be a caretaker. I think you do fine, Mal retorted. Thank you, Tamlin sighed. The point is that it keeps your happiness and joy in mind because I do not tell it otherwise. It grows as an automaton does, only operating where its gears and joints and programming allow it. If I so desired, I could command it to keep you in your room the entire day and let you out for nothing, and it would comply, even supposing it did not wish to. So, Mal began. You can do anything with the dead, can't you? You can just order them to do something and they'll just do it the best they can, and they will never stop until destroyed or you order them to. Just so, Tamlin loomed. And the idea of someone potentially having that power is a very frightening thing indeed. Imagine if I ordered the servant to assassinate a politician. It would continue and pursue its prey as long as it needed and would not be deterred even at the thought of capture. Or suppose I asked it to burn a homestead. It would do so even if it knew it would be caught in the flames, not to mention the destructive potential that raw death energy can have on one's biology or nervous system, to age them twenty years in a day, or have their bones turn to dust even as they walked. For all the opportunities that power over death may grant, very few of them do anything good. Better to be safe than face such a harrowing possibility. That's not even fair! Mal said as he rested his chin on his hands. Isn't that wrong? Against rights? Decency? To kill someone over something they might do? And yet we slay the vipers that we find in our gardens, though they have not bitten one of us. Life is not fair, and the whole of people are only here to ensure it is as fair as can be for themselves, and no other. Mal considered this for a few minutes, before calling out, but you can't talk to a viper. Most of us can't, anyway. You can't articulate anything to it or strike deals with it. All you know is how it's most likely to react. You can talk to a sorcerer. You can speak with a necromancer. And usually even the undead they summon. So why wouldn't you? I mean, yeah, the power is frightening, sure, but wouldn't you want it to be on your side even more, then? So if you could just convince them to be your friend, why not? In a standoff, where both men are aiming at the heart of the other, it is both easier and more secure to pull the trigger first than it is to try to convince them to put their gun down, for every second you waste is another second they can fire first. This is amplified when dealing with such an unknown variable. People with different lives, motivations, thoughts racing through their head, things you cannot control, and what is more uncontrollable than death. Besides... It's always easier to make a deal with someone when you have a gun pressed against their head. He huffed in amusement, leaning in and considering further. When something is a threat to someone, their livelihood, their friends, their family, people will always shoot first, and it is only when they have no other option that they will throw up their hands and depend upon the same mercy and understanding from their opponent that they didn't care to give. When something cannot be controlled, you seek to kill it, and when you cannot kill it, you seek to befriend it. Such is the nature of the world. But understanding and goodness has to count for something, right? Just because someone is a necromancer doesn't mean they can't be a hero. It doesn't mean they can't be a good person. Shouldn't that affect judgment? Shouldn't that affect anything? It doesn't matter what you do. All that matters is what people think you do whether for good or for ill. In this world, the idea of goodness and virtue counts for twice and then some as actually being good, because the difference is that actually being a good person can get in a lot of people's way. You are guilty for what you are, and any amount of good works are just you trying to hide it. The train continued, the sound of the wheels rolling over the tracks and echoing off into the forest. So that's it, then. No matter what happens, or where I go, or what I do, people will always try to control me, or kill me. I'm sorry, Tamlin replied. For a long time I considered sending you away, putting you in an academy somewhere, or making you a tradesman's apprentice and just paying your way, so that you could live a safe and happy life away from all this that would do me. 
Don't be sorry, Mal replied, in a manner that only a certain type of tired person can. It was my choice, always, not your fault I kept rifling through your books or chasing after Amelia to find out why you always had to hide her away. I was bound to find out, and when I found out, I was bound to want to know more. Tamlin laughed. You never were satisfied with parlor tricks. I kept thinking that perhaps if I just shared a little more necromancy with you, your curiosity would be sated, and you would go on to other subjects. But it never was. Perhaps it was wishful thinking on my part. Perhaps I always knew, and just wanted you as my apprentice all along. Tamlin frowned, and let his head loll to the side in a manner that only a certain type of tired person can. Sometimes I still wonder if I made the right choice, and if you wouldn't be better off elsewhere. There's nowhere I'd rather be than with you, Tamlin, Mal replied with the brightest smile in the world, before being distracted by a herd of deer outside the window, which was lucky for Tamlin, since he could quickly hide his face behind his book to cover his blush. By the time the train arrived back in Portau, Tamlin was aching with stiffness, and Mal was close to passing out in his seat. Amelia was already there and waiting, and as she approached, she curtsied to Tamlin, then walked on by to move the hair out of the sleepy boy's eyes. Wake up, Mal. We must be going home, she whispered, and he smiled at her as he opened his eyes. I shall bring you up to your room where you can lay on your much softer, much warmer bed. So come, let us go and you can get your beauty rest. Mal stood, and, though clumsily, successfully made it out of the train and into the car, with Amelia's assistance, of course. The car drive was smooth and long, with the soft yellow glow of the township light shining through the windows, and the steady tread of the car over stones long smoothed by hoof and cart. In the back, Mal and Tamlin sat next to one another, Tamlin yawning and allowing his thoughts to wander as Mal slipped back into half a dream, suddenly leaning over and laying his head to rest on Tamlin's arm. Tamlin moved to adjust, but the heavy weight of the young man's body and the light snoring told him that there was no need to, and he smiled. With the patient care of a parent, he snaked his arm out of the way, allowing Mal to lean in closer, laying his head to rest on Tamlin's shoulder. Tamlin moved to wrap his cloak around the boy, leaned back, and allowed himself the short treat of a half-dream of his own. Amelia, ever watchful, saw the two together, complete with Tamlin finally relaxing his own head atop Mal's and letting his breathing slow to a light sleep. Amelia, smiling only to herself, decided that perhaps it would be best to change lanes and take the long way home. When they pulled up to the house, the soft creak and rock of the parking car woke Tamlin, and seeing that they were home, he gently shook Mal awake as well. "'Has anyone ever told you that you're extremely toasty?' Mal asked in a sleepy tone. "'Fitting, considering how much toast I eat,' replied Tamlin, in absolute seriousness, with an equally sleepy tone. He did not understand why Amelia was giggling. She opened the front door with a tired swing, helping them from their robes and shoes. She first escorted Tamlin to sit, content upon the couch with the radio playing a gentle tune, and then took Mal so that he leaned on her, arm through hers, with every step. Did you have lots of fun? She asked as she helped him up the stairs. Yeah, he said. I was able to juggle. A lot of people seemed impressed. I also almost died. It was cool. That's wonderful, Mal, she replied. As long as it stays almost. She took him all the way up to the second floor and let him stop to smell the daffodils before helping him the rest of the way down the hall. Did you make any friends? She asked. I... I think so, he said, rubbing his eyes. I accidentally insulted a lot of people, though I guess they started it. Maybe. Say, tomorrow, can you help me write an apology to them? I want to include some gifts. I'm not good with first impressions, and I don't want to be awkward. Of course, Mal. But why include the gifts for people who insulted you? Well, a part of being a better person is taking the high road and forgiving insults, right? And since I'm so much better than them, I guess I have to forgive them first so we can keep being friends. Amelia couldn't stifle her giggling if she tried. Flawless reasoning, she replied, though I failed to see how insulting a lot of people led to your gaining friends. Oh, well, there's this one guy. He was really nice. He saved me from when I almost died. Best doctor ever. His name is Howard, from House something or other. Ancestor of his helped a lot of people evade taxes or something. I'm sleepy. That's okay, she replied as they reached the mouth of the tower leading to his room and helped him up the steps. I believe I am familiar with whom this Howard is. I have heard tell that he's quite the rapscallion. 
disappearing for days on end with lots of his father's money just to spend it all in ruffian endeavors. He is said to regularly rack up great deals of debt in gambling dens, and instead pays off the debts of others. I do not believe he and his family get along well. No, Mal admitted. Him and his dad are really at each other's throats, I think. It makes me really sad, because Tamlin's so great, he's so nice, he's always so supportive, and he cooks me so much bacon. He believes in you very much, yes. And he loves you much, too, she affirmed. Why don't other families get along like us? Mal asked, nearly stumbling as she straightened him out. I believe it has a great deal to do with mutual respect and understanding. If only one party believes they are worthy of respect, they are more likely to shut out the other, giving rise to distrust and misunderstandings. But Tamlin respects you and trusts me. Thus we are able to coordinate well. I trust you too. I think you're great. You're so nice. You cooked me so much bacon. And I would do it again, she smiled. They got to the top of the tower, where she opened the door to his room, and with a contented plump, laid him out upon the bed and began adjusting him minutely, bit by bit, to a proper restful position, with his head upon the pillow. Satisfied, she ran the hair from his eyes one more time, and whispered, Good night, Mal, and sweet, sweet dreams. As she turned to go, she was stopped when Mal reached out to grab her hand, and she turned back with a quizzical, Yes, what might I do for you? Mal didn't answer. He only cuddled his pillow and snuggled into the soft sheets, squeezing her cold hand tightly. She stood for a moment longer before finally turning and sitting on the bed herself, holding his hand and squeezing it right back, smiling down as he drifted into a peaceful sleep. Okay, I will not go. I will stay for as long as you want me to. From somewhere within his dream, Mal smiled. Chapter 5 Listen close, so that even when they are not present, you may keep them near. Page 90, line 87, from The Book of Small Wisdoms, by Monk Zahn. Time marched ever forward. While the warmth and light of the sun spread over the nestled town, Mal and Talon received none of it as they prowled to the basement of the manor, master drawing diagrams and notes in bold, white chalk lines against the wall, and student doing his best to focus. Now... Drain is cast by... Are you paying attention? Yeah, Mal called, and he recited in a gruff mock of Tamlin's voice. Drain is a cursed type of spell, and it works by using a piece of your will as a parasitic font. In exchange for the energy it takes to sustain it, it will fly out toward your desired target and attach to them, draining them of their energy to bring it back to you, like a honeybee collecting nectar. Amelia giggled, and Tamlin blew excess air out of his nose. Very good, but I didn't say that last part. Also, I don't sound like that. Anyway, now, Drain is cast by... Tamlin? Yes? Why are you teaching me this? There was a long, heavy pause in the room as the chalk clacked tightly against the brickwork, and Tamlin looked at Mal, incredulous, wondering if some kind of mental defect had come to inhabit this poor protege, as if he had just recommended eating cereal with water, before he replied... "'Because you asked me to. "'In fact, you took a long time trying to convince me to teach you,' "'and finished his sentence by waving placidly toward the diagrams. "'Well, yeah, I know that. Uh, "'Necromancy, I want to learn. "'But, like, why this spell? "'It doesn't seem to have much to do with death in the abstract.' "'Well, for starters, because I know it, "'and since I know it, so will you. "'That's how teaching works. "'Secondly, because being more capable has never done someone harm.' It's good to know things, gives you leverage. Thirdly, because having a fundamental understanding of how your spells can be utilized will help you in furthering your study. And finally, because this is very unpopular knowledge to have, Mal. Eventually someone will try to kill you over this, or just in general. You can be pretty annoying. I cannot say how or when, but some day something will go awry and you will be caught with your hands tied and someone will try to get a noose around your neck, and so knowing how to defend yourself when your back's against the wall is a very good idea. Besides, knowing a lot of magic makes you pretty cool. This is true, Mal agreed, and I am pretty cool, so I need to keep up this image. All right, uh, pardon me, but carry on. Tamlin bowed before he continued. Now, Drain is cast by— Wait! Mal called, and Tamlin grit his teeth as he replied, Yes? 
But sorry, but you said this was a beginner spell, right? But if it's so easy to learn, why wouldn't everyone do it? And then just cast it a thousand times over and weaken all their enemies in one swoop. Or maybe even to death. Can you kill someone with this spell? Would that cause the spell to return to you or disappear entirely? If it returned to you, then could you have potentially limitless- Mal, slow down. One question at a time. Good grief. His master chided through a smile. Your will is not an infinite resource. Even you, acrobat, get tired after so many leaps and bounds. So too a mage only has a limited reserve to call upon for spellcasting, and when they're out, they're out. They would have to rest, same as you, and overexertion could lead to serious harm if they're not careful. You are also unable to recast it from the same medium for the same reason you cannot slash and pierce with the same sword at the same time, or talk while your mouth is stuffed full, though that's never stopped you from trying. If you attained a second medium, such as a second corpse, you could recast it then. But until you cut off the spell, you cannot use another through the same medium. Oh, okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Please go on. Tamlin turned back to the board and began sliding the chalk along as he spoke. Now, Drain is cast by... And then he stopped. Nothing. He turned around. Mal was sitting, eager. Well? Tamlin asked. Well? Well, you interrupted me three times now. I was wondering if you had any more questions you needed to get out of your system before we continue. That's a false claim. I only interrupted you twice. You broke off to ask if I was paying attention the first time. Yes, but I only had to do that because your mind can wander from time to time, so really it's your fault anyways. That's so unfair. Anyway. Now, Drain is cast by use of a proper medium. And he pointed to Amelia as she waved. With a target's face or general appearance in mind, lest your spell target indiscriminately. You must focus your mind specifically on the notion of taking, and hum the word of power from your spell book as you focus it outward. So, and here he waved Amelia forward, and she stepped lightly up to Mal, turning and undoing her blouse to let it slide from her shoulders and reveal the upper part of her back. As you improve and strengthen the range of your will, Tamlin continued, just being near the dead will be enough to count as a medium, but until then, direct contact is most effective. It's all right. Amelia comforted as Mal gingerly placed his hands on the porcelain white of her cold back. I am happy to be your medium. Now, focus on your energy and flow it through your arm, into your hand, and begin to push it out into... Through the medium first, Mal! Sorry! Push your energy through the medium first. And Mal did so. It felt strange. He could feel it, as if a distant part of himself were telling him things he couldn't confirm. As if he were trying to tell the texture or grooves of a thing by feeling it through a tuft of hair. Most of all, beyond the cold, beyond the certainty that this must be what a machine felt like, he felt the stillness. The absolute, immovable stillness of a stone at the bottom of the ocean. And when he pulled his energy back, back through him where it was filled once more with the heartbeat of life, that stillness remained. There should be a shift in your energy, from before to after. How it feels can vary from person to person. What is important is that you have it, and you will know if you have it or not. I do. Good. Now push it out toward me. Toward you? Wouldn't that hurt? I'll be fine. Stay focused on the casting. Have it take the form of anything you need to imprint your visualization onto reality. And when you are ready, hum the word and focus it toward me. Mal focused, breathing deeply as he felt the energy move from one arm through his chest to the next arm, inching with every breath, pushing the boulder along with the waves until he could feel it, swelling, coalescing, heavy in his hand as he raised it toward his master. He called out the word, one whose sigils he vaguely recognized to represent theft, and felt it off from all the way down his diaphragm as the energy fired off, letting go as if that last push sent it careening from a hilltop, and when he opened his eyes, he focused with all his might to visualize an orb, floating, meandering its way toward Tamlin, and ignoring anything but. The orb found its target, hitting Tamlin on the arm, then Mal imagined it wrapping around him, as if it were gum, spreading it as thinly over him as it could, and resting. Here was a pause. As Mal furrowed his brow and tried to split his mind to maintain concentration on the spell while he thought of a good allegory as to how it would take someone's energy, and then the idea struck him, and he focused with delighted eyes that it would slowly drain what looked to be a sharp crimson, appearing as bristles, matting the orb. Tamlin smiled. Good job. Mal was ecstatic. He jumped up and down. He ran up, poked at it, delighted in it, then in one sweep of his hand, dissipated it utterly. Be warned that it is not exactly the sneakiest spell. 
Only the most mundane will be unable to sense it entirely, and even an untrained mage could catch what you're doing if they're observant. If anyone sees your motions or recognizes your word of power, they'll know exactly what you're up to. Otherwise, they might just begin to feel sleepy. Be thankful that other branches of magic have similar spells, and so whatever they suspect, they couldn't peg you as a necromancer for using it alone. I find it best used in battles of attrition, where draining the energy of your foe and replenishing yours is proper forward thinking. If the battle is quick enough, it may just be a waste, since it takes time to build up the energy anyways. Whether Mal heard any of this or not, or just caught the gist of it, wasn't clear. So enthused was he that he kept tugging at Amelia and asking if she saw it too, to which she happily affirmed that, though unable, she was certain that if she did, it would be the best training curse she ever saw. Before long he tried it again, then again and again, each time dissipating it and casting it anew where it attached to Tamlin with a gentle grace as he yawned and stretched. "'Oh, this is fantastic! Thank you! Thank you! This is so cool! This is the best day ever!' But on his fifth jump, Mal lost his balance and began to tumble forward, losing all coordination and missing a catch completely, and only narrowly avoiding hitting the ground as Amelia held him up. "'I warned you,' Tamlin said with a slick grin. "'You have to be careful not to go overboard, otherwise exhaustion will creep up on you and—' And nothing, for an obnoxious, reverberating snore echoed throughout the entire chamber as Tamlin stifled his laughter and paced, gesturing for Amelia to hoist Mal onto his back. Go push the couches together and prepare the fool a bed. I don't think I'll be able to carry him up to his room. Amelia bowed and left, as Tamlin, bow-legged, crossed out of the threshold and slowly stomped his way up the stone stairs, muttering the entire time about putting the boy on a diet. Hours later, in the late afternoon, Mal woke and sat bolt upright from dreams of forests so old that they were antlers to yet older things and found himself in the center of the living room laid out on pillows atop cushions and adorned with felts and furs he called out about how sorry he was to have fallen asleep during the lessons and how he really didn't mean it and he hoped this wouldn't be a sign of bad faith yelling just loud enough that he was confident he didn't have to leave the warmth and softness of the comforters to be heard i'm afraid tamlin cannot hear you he heard amelia speak behind him drat he received news of a cargo shipment and wished to be present for inspection. He also has to discuss the location of prospective architecture with the foreman and will also need to observe his minds for a time. He will likely be gone all day. I am pleased to be your keeper once more. At this, Mal smiled and wiggled deeper into the blankets. Did you wrap me up in all this? Yes. Of course you did, he wiggled with even greater gusto. Oh, wait, is everything okay? He wasn't upset, was he? I didn't mean to fall asleep. Amelia shook her head. No, in fact, he seems to have expected it. I believe he found it risible that he were at such a loss of energy from a spell designed to sap it from others. He has also ordered me to not allow you to eat anything for a week. I am unsure if this was a joke. It was a joke, yeah, Mal confirmed, hoping more than knowing. Very good. In that case, I shall begin making you your tea. In the meanwhile, Tamlin suggested that, when you awaken, you ought to go out and play with your friends. You haven't seen them in some time and with all your lessons taking up your days, they may be curious as to what you are learning. I recommend showing off one of your few spells able to be shown off, such as your firework spell. That's a good idea, he said, not moving at all from his comfy position. Would you like your tea first? She prodded. Yes, please. Half an hour later, Mal Malin was racing down the slope leading from his home and jumping over guardrails and down mountains to the village proper with as many cheese sandwiches and chocolates as he could stuff in his pockets. Leaping through back alleys and twisting his way around the horse-drawn carts, he managed to almost get hit by the only electronic tram in the entire town as he sheepishly waved an apology, and the driver shook his fists. Finally, with one more sharp turn past half-finished buildings, and with one graceful vault down a flight of steps, he landed with a roll and a hop back into position, and with an extended bow called to his friends, Ladies and gentlemen, pardon my absence, for now I have returned! Mal! came an excited flurry of voices. Marty and Joe ran up to ask him about where he had been and what he had been doing. What did he learn? Did he get kidnapped? Did old Iron Ass finally kick him out? To which the answers were, Cool stuff. Magic. Of course not. And yes, indeed he did. I'm so hard done by. Pity me. Pity me. Maybe he'll accept me back after he beats me yet again and his temper cools down. Who knows? Agatha and Della had his other ear, telling him about everything they got up to in his absence, from playing chicken on the train rails to the absolutely massive fish they caught in the lake last week. 
Weasel, the smallest of the bunch, beating Mal out by only two inches at a respectable five feet, busied himself by rifling through his friend's pockets, taking anything that didn't have lint or dust on it. As they played hide-and-seek, Mal told them all of the party he went to and all of the extravagance and haughtiness present. "'Bunch of stupid soft caps, Mal. Pay em no mind. You belong here with us, anyway,' said Joe, always eager to comfort. "'Found you?' said Mal, looking into the trash can Joe had hidden himself in. "'Ah, beans!' he sighed, and Mal helped heft him out of the can before looking for the others. Nobody else had fallen for his trap, but at least he got one. He tried a different approach. "'But, you know, I gotta say, those dresses were spectacular. The girls there looked absolutely gorgeous. They never had to rummage through anything like us. So they were all perfectly clean and prim. And the perfumes, oh, I bet there wasn't a prettier girl around for miles.' "'Well, you know,' called Della's rough voice. "'I bet they never had to get their hands dirty. "'I bet they only looked so nice "'because they were squeamish little prissies "'whose fingers were too soft to gut a fish, "'even if they wanted to. "'I bet I could waltz circles around them "'if they came down here for what-what.' "'I'm sure you're right,' Mal agreed, "'appearing right next to her in the bush. "'No, wait, that's not fair! You tricked me!' "'It's completely fair,' he called after her "'as she ran off into the tree line to hide again. "'One by one, Mal found them all, except Weasel.' who, after another dozen minutes or so, when Mal called out that he won, popped out of the same trash can Joe hid in. You were underneath Joe? No, I just slipped in when you climbed the tree to grab Agatha. Figured you wouldn't check somewhere you already looked, right? At this, Mal let out a boisterous laugh and tossed him one of the sandwiches he had hidden away. That's a good trick. I'll have to remember that. Though I guess it comes naturally for you to hide that mug, he mocked, giving Weasel a light punch. Here I want to talk. You a face only a mother could love, which is a shame because you haven't got one. Ooze came from the rest of the group to goad the spectacle. You're right. It could be worse, though. I could be poor like you. That did it. Each and every one of them leapt at Mal as he did his best to dodge them all, running off at the pace of this new game. They spent the rest of the day playing hopscotch, baseball hoops, jacks, stealing eggs from Miss Mons to see who could balance them on sticks the longest, tag, whereupon Marty asked how in the hells could Mal be so fat and run so fast, and when Mal excitedly showed them all his firework lightning snap, complete with brand new handkerchief, he got five separate knocks on the head for spending so much time learning something so silly, because Marty's brother Alan had showed him the exact same spell last week. You should learn to shoot fireballs instead, that would be cool. Or if you could turn metal into gold. I hear there's a practice at the academy where they teach you how to do it. No wonder the halls are made of gold there. Finally, as the sun began to set, a shiny new automobile pulled up alongside the dust plane, and Mal waved goodbye to his friends as he ran up to the car. He didn't bother checking who drove it. There was only one person who could afford such a thing here anyways. As he got to the front window, it rolled down, and a pretty-voiced, veiled woman greeted him. Hello, Mal, she said. Hi, Amelia, he said. Are you finished playing with your friends? I'm sure we can wait if you need more time. Oh, pish posh Pottle Wash, they're fine, they're good. I want to see the car. And with that, he slipped right in the back where Talman was waiting for him. Where did you get this? he asked. His mentor was busy seeing how far he could recline in his seat. Ordered it brand new today, express delivery. Car broke down halfway back to the house, and I couldn't be asked to walk for a week while it was being repaired, so I just sent in a telegram to get a new one. It even has some neat little features, too. The ruby trimming is what caught my eye the most. It's very nice, Mal agreed, as he, too, began to test how far he could recline. So how was your day? Well, began Tamlin as his seat slid back to full height. I went to oversee a shipment of goods, which was awful because the usual twerp doing the transaction wasn't familiar with protocol. I had to walk him through it like a simpleton so the shipment wasn't impounded. Then I had to discuss with the lead architect as to where the new clock tower was meant to be, and test the ground to see if it would be sturdy enough to take the materials. It was, and so work shall begin shortly. Then I went to survey my mines and check out the reports, and everything was within acceptable levels. Then, on the way back, the car broke down. I got a new one. I told you about everything up to now, which is where we are. Hello. And then he slid back down again, partially out of view. You're awfully busy, you know. Shouldn't the point of being so rich be that you don't have to do those kinds of things? Oh, I could easily delegate someone to do it for me. But I enjoy doing it myself. I trust myself, and I am competent, and inactivity dulls the mind. You should always be keen to keep busy, which reminds me. How was your day? It was good. I played with my friends. The dirty ones? Yes. Damn it. Well, did you win, at least? No. Pity. 
he said, leaning back into a comfy daze before peering from squinted eyelids and asking, Did you have fun? Yes, very much. I'm glad. Why do you dislike them so much? I don't dislike your friends. They're just filthy. The lesser will always bring down their betters, Mal. You must remember that. But it's not just them. You do it with everyone. You snark at waitresses or insult footmen. You're even crass with most nobles. Why? Tamlin let the silence sit in the air for a full minute, looking calmly at Mal until his protege looked away in shyness, and then asked, Why do you think I do it? Because you're evil, Mal said, point blank, and Tamlin guffawed. <laughs> evil is a point of view, my boy. But yes, that is certainly a word others might use for me, I suppose. But, Mal continued, even bad people usually pretend to be good just so they can get something out of it. So what do you get out of it? Why do you treat people so bad? At this, Tamlin's smile spread so deep that it could have split his ears, and a shrug so deep it moved the whole of his body as he echoed, Because I can. Nothing more forthright than that. If they want to trade away their dignity and respect to gain what I can give them, well, that's none of my business now, is it? I don't understand. Tamlin closed his eyes and seemed to search behind his eyelids for the way to phrase it, letting out hoes and hums before he continued once more. How do I put this? Money is not the only currency in this world. You, who you are, is currency. Your thoughts and intellect can be given just as any coin. The power you wield can be used at the behest of another. Even your ego can be sold, and... No, 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 I get that. What I don't get is you acting like a jackass all the time, because, I mean, you want to make people upset. Mal asked, cocking his eyebrow as high as he could manage. Tamlin nodded, with all the giddiness of a child that was just asked if he would like an extra piece of candy. Mal considered this for a moment before pointing out, But even when you need is something, you're not nice. I never need anything, my naive apprentice. Goodness me, could you imagine if I did? I might actually have to be nice from time to time. Haven't you considered just, I don't know, being nice anyways? I know you can. You are to me. Why can't you be to them, all of them? They've never done anything to you. There was a change in the air. Not much, not deep, but noticeable. A change in Tamlin's face, a smoothness to the drive, the quieting of the air conditioner. But it was not a harsh change, and Tamlin's face was softened when he saw just how seriously his protege was taking this. People are selfish by nature, my boy, even the nice ones. Even when others are helpful or kind, they are so because it reminds them of their own problems. They see themselves in you, undo their failures through you. Even I get something out of my love for you, genuine as it is. No matter what goody-goody spin you put on it, people will always act selfishly. Your friends are your friends because they get something out of it. Fun, stories, laughter, or even your food and money. If you had none of these to offer, they would gravitate towards those who could give it, for these, too, are currencies of their own accord. That can't be true, Mal replied as firmly as he could. There are plenty of selfless people in the world. There are even legends about some of them, grand heroes of virtue. Because that is the trade for what they gain, the feeling of fulfillment and immortalization. If it didn't give them that, they wouldn't do it. People act or react in order to gain. If they did not gain, they would not do so. The only reason you believe everyone acts this way is because you act this way. A thief believes everyone steals, and you're using that to justify how you treat people. How do you treat people, Mal? His master asked, cocking his head, and the apprentice sensed a trap. Hmph! I treat you just fine. I always tell you your mustache looks excellent even when it doesn't. Well, Tamlin replied, smoothing it before doing the same to his twitching eyebrow. You have a positive motive for doing so, that it is my patronage and the fact that I'm less likely to whack you with my cane. I treat Amelia well, too, even though I don't have to, if what you say about the undead is true. And her love feels all the more genuine for it. I treat my friends well, Joe and Agatha, Marty and Della, even Weasel, for all he rifles through my pockets. And you receive the same currency of fun and games as they do from you, do you not? Here, I'll come at this from a different angle. How do you treat people who give nothing to you? Huh? You know, the cobbler, Mr. Dens, whose floor you scuffed up the other week trying to test out dancing shoes. Or Miss Mons, whose eggs you have no problem stealing when you could easily pay for them because you consider it part of a game instead of part of her livelihood. And whenever she catches you and scolds you, yet knows that she can never make good on her threats because if she does, she may catch my attention. 
How do you treat them when they have nothing to give you, versus when they offer you treats or compliment your clothes? Or what did you think of the young Madame Ernsdale, the one who gave you snark at the party? From what you said to her face, you didn't think that highly of her, either. Oh, well, even kindness and patience are currency in their own way, and it is easy to buy. As it turns out, it's not so easy to give it away when someone can't give you something good for it. At this, Mal clammed up and fidgeted with his hands until Tamlin lifted his cane with his chin. I'm not chastising you, Mal. I don't have any concern for how you treat others or what you believe justifies kindness. I only want you to think. To think before you speak and before you act and before you presume. Perhaps that is a currency you might wish to invest, hmm? Y yeah, yes, Master, you're right, Mal replied, but still looked a bit too down and out for Tamlin's liking. Hey, what do you say we test out that lesson now, hm? What do you mean? Well, if you like, we don't have to go home right away. We can stop by the cafe and you can meet with... Who's that old man you play checkers with? Mr. Zappini? Yes, we can meet with Mr. Zappini instead of having him play another round of that awful game. You can ask him what he wants to play. Listen to some of his old tales. It'll be a nice break in his days of doing nothing productive. Will you play too? Mal asked excitedly. Yes, yes, I can play whatever you think I'll be good at. Let's play Pharaoh. I've always wanted to. Hey, we just talked about letting Mr. Zappini decide. Together they drove up the streets into the smooth jazz cafe where Mal was greeted with exceptional warmth among the patrons. Older men in tight jackets with two short sleeves, always smelling of peaches and cream coffee. Mal, naturally, sat down just outside the threshold with Mr. Zappini, who greeted him with all the gummy smile an older gentleman can muster, whilst Tamlin sat at the opposite end of the adjacent table with what seemed to be a younger man, perhaps the grandson of one of the customers. Tamlin shrugged. True to his word, Mal allowed Mr. Zappini to choose the game they were to play that day, which happened to be cribbage. Tamlin, fortunately, was saddled with shoots and ladders, a luck-based game that had nothing at all to do with skill, and so he was already in a better situation than usual. It was fun, truth be told. It had been some time since Tamlin came by, and however much he may loathe any particular game, the atmosphere was pleasant. The people were cordial enough to leave him uninterrupted, and they always served very nice coffee, a rarity in these mountains. The games pressed on, and they along with it with Mal winning five to three and Tamlin winning altogether, because nobody would ever tell him otherwise, while sipping coffee long into the early sunset. As Mr. Zappini droned on and on about the old war and about how glorious the old days were and how kids today were so ungrateful and would have never survived his childhood of back-breaking labor and walking uphill to school both ways. Mal sensed that there was something amiss about this assertion, but remembering his conviction to be more empathetic, decided not to press it. "'Don't you think you ought to give the young man a break and lose, Count Tamalin?' asked Mr. Zappini in a teasing tone. "'I don't know. Don't you think you should play a game that you actually don't lose?' "'Bah! That's the problem with you young people. Yes, even you, your lordship. Glory chasers, the lot of you. What's the point if you're not improving, growing smarter, resting your pieces from the traps of your foe? "'I'm already as smart as can be, you old punk. And if you don't want me as your opponent, you'll remember that.' Besides, I've always preferred to fight my way out of a trap than avoid one. Mal could only giggle. He agreed with Mr. Zappini, and they shared a glance of solidarity, though, since Mal liked his meals, he would never tell Tamlin that. It was nice, despite an odd sense of deja vu, to just sit in the setting sun and play cards and roll dice and sip smooth coffee to smooth jazz with the smell of Tamlin's smoke in the air, with the comfort and warmth of those around you. So where was this feeling of anxiety coming from? There was something else, something he was missing, something wrong. Mal, hmm? That man behind me, coming up toward us, does he seem familiar to you? Mal glanced up, trying nonchalantly to look over Tamlin's shoulder and see what he was talking about. And he was right. There was a man walking down the street, and the feeling of deja vu crashed over him all over again. Oh, um, yeah, actually, now that you mention it, I think I've seen him walk by already. You have. He has walked by twice now, looking at us, going the same way. I wonder what he's looking for. Well, what is he doing right now? 
The man approached at a faster, more determined pace. He approached their table directly. He approached Tamlin. He approached Tamlin as he undid his jacket just by the buttons and reached in for something weighty. Uh, he seems to be reaching in his coat for something. Something? Dad, behind you! Mal cried just as the man took the flint hawk from his coat and aimed. Tamlin instinctively ducked before turning and seeing the man stretched his legs out and kicked at Mal's chair as hard as he could, knocking them both over onto their backs as a shot rang out, blasting through the table and sending wood chips flying into everyone's face. The young man sprang up from the table and ran. Mr. Zappini dived beyond the threshold and Mal hit the ground hard. The shot had missed Tamlin, barely, grazing his hairs and sending his right ear ringing as he lashed out. Unleashing the sword from his cane, he struck wide toward the man, catching him deep in the thigh as he fell. Tamlin and the man hit the ground at the same time with a concrete thunk, the man screaming in pain as Tamlin had the wind knocked out of him. There was an extra moment where Tamlin looked to catch every detail, to know the weapons of the enemy, to see if there were any other assailant, and the very next moment the man reached into his coat for a second time. Tamlin forced the air through his nose as he inhaled, stored his breath, and spat the butt of his cigarette at the man, igniting it into a fireball as it flew and caught the man in the face, smoldering all the hair from it and searing the flesh like a steak. The man screamed again, trying to get up and falling, trying to roll away, trying to pull the second flint off from his jacket until he ripped the buttons from his coat completely and yanked the gun free, aiming it blind as Tamlin righted himself, charging from his crouch with an arcing sword. The man aimed. Not well, but the muzzle was closer to Tamlin than he would have liked. He closed the gap and brought his sword to swing. The man's finger tightened around the trigger, until a squeaky, Hey! caught his attention as a cup clattered into his head, shattering and leaving a gash near his temple. The man raged, tracing his gun close to where Mal was before he leapt behind Mr. Zappini, and Tamlin lunged as fast as he could. There was a horrid sound as Tamlin sliced through the man's wrist, severing it entirely from the arm. Both the hand and the gun fell limp to the ground, and with one final strike to the man's chest, it opened utterly as he fell, lifeless to the ground. Mal! Tamlin called. Tamlin! Mal replied from his position on the ground, and as he stood, Tamlin was already upon him to help him up. Are you hurt? Bleeding? Is everything okay? Y yeah yeah that, that was... What the hell was that? An assassin, Tamlin muttered darkly. What? Why would anyone want to kill you? Who knows? Perhaps he's a foreign dignitary, some spy or agent trying to remove me from the playing field before the war kicks off. Or perhaps he was just some disgruntled former workman. Perhaps he's just nuts, Mal heaved, and Tamlin covered him with his cloak. The patrons, long since exiting and fuddling over all the commotion, clamored around Tamalin to ask over his well-being, whereupon he waved them away to call the constable so he could examine the corpse in peace. He didn't recognize the man, nor did he have the build expected from a would-be assassin, and the jitters prevented him from aiming well at any distance beyond close range. Perhaps he was hired by no one, and this was only a personal grievance, though over what he would never know. I think that's enough excitement for one day, don't you? Come, let us go home. When Amelia arrived, she nearly leapt from the car before it was even fully parked, forgetting all decorum and charged into Mal with a weight of full concern, wrapping him in an embrace. Are you well? Do you require medical attention? Shall I call a doctor? He's fine, Tamlin assured. I do have a bump on my head, though. Here, Amelia replied, and pulling a first aid kit from the back of the vehicle, applied a cold compress to Mal's head as gently as could be. Would you like to sit up front with me so I may hold it there? she asked. But Mal waved it off. He would be fine, he assured her. He wanted to sit with Tamlin to make sure he was okay, too. The ride back was exceptionally quiet, especially when compared to the excitement of before, as Tamlin sat with his eyes closed, meditating, and Mal just sat. Is... Uh, everything okay? He finally got the nerve to ask. Yes, Tamlin replied. You didn't get hurt or anything, did you? Mal asked. I'm fine, replied Tamlin. Are you? Yeah, totally. It was frightening. Of course, I mean, he was going to shoot you, right? Maybe shoot me, right? I'm glad you're fine. We're fine. That was awful. You just got him right down. I mean, I know you had to, right? Of course, probably. And of course, you've had to do the lots before. You were a soldier, right? Yeah, of course. So it had to be done, but it was strange. People have a lot of blood inside them, huh? Oh, it smelled awful. It Mal, the low voice cut in. 
Death is a part of life. Death is a part of your life. Death will follow you wherever you go, especially now. You will learn to endure and to act with clarity and without hesitation, or you will perish. Do you understand? There was no comfort any longer, no sympathy to be had, only a lesson to be learned. Y y yes, master, you're right. Chapter 6 The chest makes no noise. It is empty, your lordship. Is it? Or are its contents of the softer sort? Page 7, line 4, from The Book of Small Wisdoms, by Monk Zong. As the weeks went on, Mal began to delve more thoroughly into the art of necromancy. He had already learned some elementary spells, and knew well many of the theories and philosophies on magic that permeated through different academies and schools of thought. He adjusted well to it, and his drive and hunger to learn more and more drove him forward where talent was lacking. It was after a week of continuous study and training that Mal did not come down in the morning for breakfast, and the servant was sent to retrieve him, expecting to come into his room and wake him as usual in his brand new bed. Instead, she was surprised to see him passed out at his desk, with notes on all he had learned. She shook him a few times, and he awoke in an extreme fuzz. He was obviously in no condition to be up and about. "'I was dreaming about you,' he whispered as he let his head rest against her arm. I dreamt we were flying, somewhere high in the clouds, and there were so many different colors, even though it was night time. Amelia smiled, and put his arm around her shoulder as she began walking him toward the bed. But my studies, he protested. She assured him that they would be there when he awoke, and would bring him breakfast in the meantime. She laid him down in the bed, pulled his softest blankets over him, and kissed his forehead as she let him drift off back to sleep. She traced around the room, arranging, dusting, sorting where she could so the young man would have to spend less time doing it himself, but when she came back to straighten out the note, she found an oddity that Tamlin would surely want to know of. He gave her a quizzical look upon her return without apprentice in tow, and she explained, It is in my opinion that he is far too tired to get any new work done. He was asleep at his desk when I went up and seemed to have fallen asleep writing his notes. With that, she handed them to Tamlin. He looked over them for a few minutes. Impressive. Except this part here, where he seems to have drifted off, he said, pointing to a spot on the page where it devolved into gibberish about how a soul catcher would most surely be improved by adding sugar, before tapering off into an unreadable scrawl. I do believe there is something strange about his notes, Amelia said, and when Tamlin raised another eyebrow, she took back the pages and flipped through until she found what she was looking for a page full of spell listings, what they did, how they worked, all on a massive page labeled, What If? On it were hypotheticals, theories, speculation after speculation about how spells could be mixed and matched, how different applications could be combined to form something new, and how certain spells could be refined to better augment their purpose. Tamlin only smiled. Impressive indeed he murmured, rifling through the notes before lining them back and giving them back to the servant. I will prepare his food. Bring it up to him when it is done. And the servant bowed. Much later, when the sun was in the middle of the sky at noontime, Mal awoke, stretched sleepily, and then shot awake. Shit! he called as he shot out of bed and rapidly began his morning routine of making himself look half-decent, all while shouting, Get bit lit! Rit, mit, sit, fit, rit, get, pit, and so on, so forth, running all the way down the stairs and looking everywhere for Tamlin before finally bursting into his study. Tamlin, I'm so sorry, I didn't mean to sleep in, I would just stayed up so late writing and I lost track of time and I had no idea it was so late and figured that, hey, since it would be only a couple of hours at most, I may as well just stay up and be right and ready in the morning, but then I kept dozing off and before I knew it... Mal, Tamlin interrupted. It's fine, I promise. I let you sleep. I decided it would be a day for relaxing when the servant— Amelia, Mal interrupted. Fine, whatever. When it went up to wake you and saw your notes. I took a look at them for myself and was very impressed with how far you've been coming along. So figured you needed a reward. Oh! Really? Really. And I have these to prove it, he said, as he pulled out two tickets to the new play at the theater, and Mal beamed. It's a musical. I think. I didn't ask. But the servant— Amelia! Mal interrupted. 
Since when did you decide you had the authority to tell me what to call my own servant? Tamlin barked. I'm sorry, Mal sputtered, jumping back. It's just, you went off on your trip for so long, you never left for such a long time before, and I hung out with her most of the day, and, well, I, I talked with her a lot, so she just seemed more like a person. I'm sure it does, but it isn't, Tamlin scolded. We've covered this already. The dead have no will of their own. Everything they are, think, and feel is just what they're allowed to by their creators. It is as much of a person as mining equipment or the automaton toys in your room, and you would do well to remember that and not get too attached. R right. I'm sorry. Tamlin sighed, rubbing at his temples. It's fine. I didn't mean to shout, so don't think I'm mad at you. In any case, it told me you like that sort of stuff, an exhibition on music from around the world, so I figured you would really want to go. Yeah, Mal confirmed. And since I have a lot of work to do, and the theater isn't my idea of a good time anyways, why don't you take it... Why don't you take the servant with you? Sure, I mean, of course, happily. Are you positive you don't want to come? I wouldn't mind waiting so you could get an extra ticket. I'll come another time. For now, head off and just focus on having fun. I will, and I'll come back home and tell you all about it, Mal said, ruffling Tamlin's hair before Tamlin playfully smacked him away. Get out of here! Go! Shoot! Mal traced all the way down the hall and just out to the gardens where Amelia was working, where he proudly held the two tickets. Would you like to go with me? he asked. Overjoyed, she replied. I'll get my veil. The theater was wonderful. Every act involved a new series of characters revolved around a new kind of exotic instrument, so that the big blusterer was represented by the oboe, while the illustrious duchess was represented by the harp. Mal loved each and every moment of it, and told Amelia about each and everything he knew about the music, and what it was supposed to represent, while she dutifully nodded. Finally, Mal looked at her for a long time, trying to organize his questions in the most sensible way he could. Do you like this sort of stuff? Mal asked. I do. I enjoy every moment with you, she replied, her smile always fixed in place. No, I mean this, this music, these shows. Do you like it? Would you go to them by yourself? Yes. I try to stay abreast so I know which to recommend for you. No! Mal shouted, a bit louder than he intended, and he saw someone glare at him from below the podium. I mean you, he whispered. You as a person, do you like it? Would you want to hear music and taste good food and see waterfalls and the sunrise on a mountaintop? Experience life, even if I wasn't around. If you were not around, nothing else would matter. I would be devastated, she replied, her eyes never leaving the stage and her smile never dipping. Mm -hmm. Mal grumbled. Have I displeased you? she asked. No, he half lied. I just, I don't know. Tamlin often treats his undead as tools, a means to an end, and I guess I just wanted to prove that you were more than that. <laughs> Tamlin treats people as a means to an end, Amelia replied, giggling. Doesn't that upset you? No, she replied. He is who he is. He cannot be faulted for his nature any more than you can fault a tree for growing, or an instrument to play when strummed. A thief will steal, and a child will grow. It is the way of things to be what they are. I don't believe that, Mal protested. It's unfair for people to just be who they are. What does that mean for responsibility, for growth, or everyone who wants to be better? Even if what you're saying is true, then that means people are no more complex than the car you drive, and what kind of world would that be? Besides, it's untrue. Talon's lived a long time, and surely he hasn't always been this way. He has, actually, Amelia noted. Since the time of my creation, I can count on one hand the acts he has performed out of the goodness of his heart alone, with no mind of a reward. Great, Mal grumbled, putting his feet up. One of them was adopting you, she said, and Mal softened. The conversation dropped as Mal remembered that he ought to be listening to the instruments, and when the piano organ came out, he eagerly pulled at Amelia's sleeve and raved about how they were made, and the songs best played on. There was an interlude, half the performance done, and as people clapped and some rose for refreshments, Mal stayed behind. 
Would you like me to catch you anything? Amelia asked. No, thank you, Mal replied, and was uncomfortable in the ensuing silence. Why doesn't Tamlin like you? Amelia tilted her head at this to look at Mal, and took a moment longer than usual to reply. I do not believe he dislikes me. I think I simply make him uncomfortable, and so he would rather I were away. Why do you make him uncomfortable? Mal asked. I believe it is because I take the form of his sister, she replied, with extreme casualness, as if Mal wasn't sitting slack-jawed beside her. You're Tamlin's sister? Not in the way you mean, she replied. I only look like her. I was created using her body. Tamlin initially spoke to me and acted as if I were her, but when I could not respond as he wished, he seemed repulsed by me, and extremely dejected. It took a long time for him to even deign looking at me, and longer for him to speak to me and instruct me as he does. How come you never told me? At this, Amelia giggled. What reason would there be to do so? It did not add to your studying. It could not be revealed when you first came to us, and by the time you were immersed it seemed awkward to mention. You just mentioned it now! You do not ask me before now. Mal sat back as the interlude was over, and the music began raising again. Why? Why were you created using your body? What made him so upset? I do not know. I have never asked, and he has never told me. The rest of the musical went without incident, and Mal, though with greater reserve and understanding, continued to tell Amelia all about the little aspects of the play that one ought to pay attention to, just in case she might enjoy it. They drove back to the house, with Mal in the front seat. Amelia stopped so he could order ice cream from a local shop before they drove home again. When they got to the house, Mal told Amelia that he was going to ask Tamlin about her creation, and warned her to stay, um, perhaps farther away than usual in order to evade any, um, wrath he might throw around the house. But as he approached Tamlin's study, it got harder and harder for him to build up the courage to ask. When he entered, finding his master with his feet up on the couch, reading a recipe book, Mal lost all confidence. Hello, Tamlin called, flipping a page. How was the musical? It was good, Mal replied. They had lots of exotic instruments, plenty of wood ones, of course, but they had this big piano with massive brass tubes sticking out that made this really deep noise you'd expect from a gargoyle. They also had this one new piece I'd never seen before. It was a weird table with strings, but had water condensed around them so that if they plucked, they'd make a different noise each time. It was really fun. Good, Tamlin replied. I'll go with you next time. You could point them all out to me, or I guess I'll know just from seeing them. Either way, I look forward to it. Mal stood for a moment longer, before finally getting up the nerve to ask, Why don't you like a me- um, the servant? Tamlin lifted the book so he could see Mal fully, to let him know he was raising an eyebrow as he replied, I don't dislike it. We've been over this. Well, yeah, all right, but why does she make you uncomfortable? Tamlin eyed Mal, squinting, raising his brow, pursing his lips. Who said it made me uncomfortable? Oh, well, I mean, I, I just figured, and, uh, well, because it seemed obvious, and... Uh, Tamlin's eyes darted up, then to the upper right, then lower right, as if he were piecing something together, when he firmly closed the book shut and placed it on the table and sat up. Mal felt himself shiver, and the hair on his neck stood up. He'd made a mistake. So... Tamlin started. Been talking about me, have you? Uh, no, Mal lied. I was just curious. Sorry, I'm going to head to bed. Early night. You wouldn't want me to be tired for my lessons or anything. Sit down, Tamlin ordered. Yeah, okay, sure, I'll just do that. And Mal did so, with palpable nervousness. You have indeed been talking about me, Tamlin scorned. And I know you have. In the past, you've always asked why I disliked the servant, and I would tell you I didn't each time, and that was that. I never told you the servant made me uncomfortable. That's something I told it long ago, and that's how it would phrase it if you asked. Okay, okay, uh, maybe I asked her about a little bit, but it's not like she told me— Hush, Tamlin ordered again, and Mal made his best effort to look like he just sucked a lemon. 
A few moments of Mal's extreme discomfort passed, as Tamlin took his time pouring himself liquor and lighting another cigarette, before twirling his lighter in his hands as if it were the only thing in the room. Yes, it's true. The servant is made from my sister. Mal gasped and put his hands to his mouth. I had no idea. Oh, shut up. Don't pretend you didn't know that. You don't have to say anything, either. All you have to do is listen. And Mal nodded. It is my sister, specifically created from the body of my sister. As you know, ghosts and the undead are different things, with ghosts being the soul and undead being the body. When people die, their soul leaves their body and goes to the afterlife, whichever your religion prefers, perhaps. The servant is made from the body of my sister, but not her soul. That's really all there is to it. But... Mal fiddled with his cravat as he spoke. That doesn't explain why she makes you so uncomfortable. If it was just a matter of your sister, didn't you want to bring her back to life? I don't understand. Tamlin smiled sadly, and sighed, and looked at his lighter more intently than ever, flicking it open and closed, and open again, letting the reflection of the flame dance in the black of his eyes. Do you remember why I learned necromancy, Mal? Who my teachers were? Yeah, you lied and said they were fairies. It's not a lie. <clears throat> Tamlin rose from his seat as he shouted, and Mal tucked his legs in to defend himself. But Tamlin only sat back down, growling. Anyways. <sighs> There's a specific reason as to why my own teachers were more unconventional than is usual for those of our practice. I always had a talent for magic, pyromancy specifically, obviously, he said, rolling his eyes dramatically. And I always was the pride and joy of my family for it. We lived in a rather humble home, on a farm set right by the tree line where our father told us never to go into, because it was full of wolves. Our mother insisted it was because fairies lived there, and fairies loved to snatch up bad children and cart them away somewhere, so she said. It was just me, my two brothers, and my sister, he said, gesturing outside the room. Amelia, naturally. It was a very pleasant start to life. I would dazzle my family with clapping sparks from my hands or blowing candles to flame rather than out. And then we'd all run out and pick flowers and find honeybees and practice our cartwheels and all sorts of things. My sister was the oldest, and she always looked out for my brothers and I. She was always chasing after us, trying to make sure we didn't get into any trouble. She was always like that. I talked with her many times about helping her get set up with some wealthy nobleman so she'd be set for life, and she would just quip back that we'd be too much for our mother to handle all on her own. She was probably right. We worried that poor woman half to death with our mischief. Talon continued fiddling with his lighter, and turning his cigarette over in his hand as he did so, watched the slow burning flame crawl down the thin stick. Gods, how old was I then? I'm so ancient now. I must have been your age about, a little less, maybe thirteen, fourteen. Mal would have sworn that Tamlin wasn't talking to him at that point, but just letting old memories spill out into the open. One day, I woke up in the middle of the night from a hazy dream, and when I looked out the window, I saw a rainbow of lights dancing in the forest. It was like water, but it sparkled like there were gems all throughout. I was entranced. It was like a light switched on in my brain and I just knew it was where I was supposed to go, because fairies are supposed to be made from magic, born from the ley lines, they say, and called other mages to them as well. Tamlin gently grabbed the glass of liquor and drank it all in one long sip before smoking through the rest of his cigarette and immediately lighting another. So I snuck out of bed, and without awaking my brothers, I tiptoed into the hallway and lit a candle to find my way out of the house. As it turns out, I didn't really need it. Past the corridor, the fireplace was still burning low and sparking, so I could see just fine, and my father was snoring loudly in the other room. I put the candle down by the windowsill so I could find my way back if the moonlight wasn't enough for me to see, 
and in case I had to quickly run back. Because let me tell you that those stories of fairies can be awfully scary, he said with a cheeky smile and nod. So I go. I fumble my way across the river, and I'm so close to the lights that I can hear the fairies murmuring curiously at my approach. The lights weren't meant for me at all. They were just dancing in the moonlight, as they always did, and I just happened to see them. They didn't seem unhappy with it, though, he said with another smile. As I was just about to go into the lights, I felt a hard tug on my shoulder pulling me back, and my heart skipped a beat for whatever it could be. Thought it was a monster at first, maybe one of the wolves my father talked about, but when I was spun around, it was only my sister, and she gave me a hard chewing out over coming so close to the woods so late, where any manner of ghoul or ghastly or highwayman could be lurking. I tried to insist that it was okay, that it was just the fairies, but she didn't have the touch of magic that I did. I don't think she saw them. She just thought I must have been sleepwalking or something, and we had a row over me tugging her toward them and her tugging me back. I don't know how long it took, but it must have been a while, because we were exhausted at all our wrestling back and forth, and of course she was far bigger than me at the time. She was a young woman, and I was just a boy. So she eventually succeeded in dragging me back, and was quite irritated at me over her skirt getting wet in the river. But when we hiked back up the ravine, there was a light. And here he stopped again, opening his lighter and letting the flame simmer for a long time as he stared into it. It wasn't the candle I left on the window sill. It was far brighter and more violent and smoking. He took a moment to look at Mal deeply. It was a fire, before snapping the lid of the lighter shut. And it was gutting my house. Mal tried to say something. He tried to speak up, to express concern, shock, anything, just anything, to let his master know that he was there to listen, there to help. But as he tried to form the words, Tamlin only raised a hand to silence him. My sister and I tore through the grass, outside for our parents, our brothers, but they weren't there. We didn't know what happened. We were right outside the house when my sister grabbed me and shook me and told me, no matter what, not to go in, to stay out here where it was safe, before she ran in herself. And I couldn't see her through the smoke. I waited, spinning around and around, wanting so desperately to make myself useful. I remembered my magic and I tried to command the fire to stop, to leave, to just slow down but it didn't seem to hear me. I have no idea how long I waited, but it felt like a really long time. I sucked in my breath, and I nearly darted into the house myself, but... He clicked his tongue, turning to Mal and mocked. But my sister did that very thing, and she wasn't out yet, so I figured going in the same way wouldn't do much good. Instead, I ran back down to the stream as fast as I could possibly go and dunked myself completely in the water. When I got back to the house, I took off my shirt and wrapped it around my face to try to keep the smoke out, and nearly blind went feeling my way throughout my own house. Everything I touched seemed to be burning. Sometimes I got the good end, and my hands were fine. Other times not so much, and I had to yank myself away before walking into a pyre. Eventually, I stumbled back into my hallway, where there was a figure on the ground, and I ducked as low as I could so I could remove the tiniest bit of my shirt to see what it was. Tamlin poured another drink for himself and downed it, before pouring another and watching it ripple and steady, as if it would jump away from him. I think I knew before I even looked, because of course it was. I knew. I knew the moment she ran inside. How could it be anything else? It was my sister. She had fallen, collapsed onto the floor, clutching at the half-charred remains of my brother. She was trying to drag him out of the house. I knew 
She was dead. She died from the smoke, probably coughing her lungs out. I doubt she even knew my brother was dead from the smoke in her eyes. I knew she was gone because the fire was already snaking its way up her clothes, and she wasn't moving at all. In probably the stupidest thing I've ever done, I took my shirt from my face and used it to put out the fire on her before picking her up as fast as I could and coughing and wheezing my way out of the house. It collapsed just as I got to the door, and I had to dive with her body to avoid it, and then kept trying to get up as my dizziness knocked me down until I threw up. I tried to resuscitate her. I slapped her back to try to force a cough. I even went all the way down to the stream to douse my shirt again and then wring it out over her face, anything to get a reaction, and even at the start I knew it was a false hope. I just wanted to give up to lay in the grass and let the fire consume everything. But the subconscious part of me could not stand the thought, that weakness, to just give up and do nothing. So I ran. I ran back over the river. I ran into the forest where the lights were still shining, and I called to any fairies that would listen that I would do anything if they would just help my sister. And they heard me. So they did. They took material form, coming out of the clay, the water, the shadows themselves, and they made contract with me. In exchange for preserving my sister and teaching me how to return her to life, they wished for an artifact, something to detect ley lines with so they could move from place to place without fear of being detached from the magic of the earth, something that only a human could help them find. So I agreed. Thus began my lessons in necromancy with my next few years dedicated specifically to the art of resurrection, preserving life and raise the dead. I was quite good at it, he said, with a nod to himself. My sister was still preserved. She was encased in this lovely little crystal coffin, like in a fairy tale, to ensure that she was kept in stasis while I studied and practiced. Eventually, when I got powerful enough, I had them remove the lid so I could finally resurrect her. I reached out across the plains of this life and the next. I reached into the pool of fate and I plucked her very soul as it swam through the Milky Way and stretched it taut all the way back to her body. I tell you, in that moment, it was as if I were a god. And? Mal said, finally, leaning on the edge of his seat. And I wasn't. I put her soul back into her body and raised her back to life. Wait, Mal interrupted. You always told me you weren't supposed to do that. You made me swear not to try to use necromancy to bring back anyone I loved. And I found out the hard way why that is. It's... And Tamlin trailed off. He looked away from Mal and into space and stared for a long time, pupils dilating, remembering things that no one could ever forget. It hurts them. It hurts them in a way that nothing in this life ever could. It is taking the very strings of what weaves a person into being and pulls them until they fray. Because when you resurrect someone, you do not take their soul back from the afterall. You do not steal it away like a thief in the night. It is anchored, it is there, and all you can do is tear it, like ripping a blanket down the middle until it reaches from one end of the bed to the other, and they scream the entire time. And that's what happened with her, Mal said, as if talking to himself. Yes. I realized my mistake right away and sent her soul back. I tried again and again to see if I could bring her back without her suffering, to see if I could just make it right, but... It was always just Amelia, Mal said. Just the servant. Yes, Talon said. As he sighed, leaned back and downed another shot before trying to pour more and finding the bottle empty. Here, I'll go get you another... It's fine, Mal. I don't need it. It doesn't make things any better. It just makes me a better storyteller. Mal smiled at this, and Tamlin smiled right back. So that's why she makes you uncomfortable, and you don't want her around? Because of that... experience? 
Tamlin leaned back, looking up at the ceiling, searching his brain for how exactly to phrase it before deciding on... It's because it looks like my sister. It's because every time I look at it, I remember her clutching so hard at my brother's burnt body. Because every time I hear it talk in that whisper, I am reminded of the smoke that must have burned in her lungs, burned in all of them, and how they must have died choking. Because every time I see it, I am so horribly aware of how powerless I was to do anything to save any of them. Because I am so acutely aware that they had their lives ripped from them far too early, that my brothers will never grow up to have families, that I will never be an uncle, that my parents will never see their grandchildren, that everything they worked so hard for in their entire lives in raising us up and trying to give us the best life they could was just burnt away in a fire I could have so easily started by leaving the candle lit on the sill. Mal stood, pushing himself up from the chair he was in, nearly tipping it over and leaping toward his master as he shouted, But that wasn't your fault! You had no idea what could have happened! You never would have done anything like that on purpose! Besides, you said that the fire in the fireplace was still smoldering. It could have easily sparked. It could have caught fire by itself. You probably had nothing to do with it. That's true, Tamlin noted, nodding, smiling as if he were lulling himself off to sleep. That's very true. It probably wasn't a single thing I did. But it might have been. I will never know, and it is the fact I will never know that keeps me up. That sounds so strange, doesn't it? The idea that I would sleep easier knowing I killed my family in an accident, rather than not knowing. But it's true, and I don't know why. Mal sat back down, the silence sitting in the air like perfume. Then why haven't you gotten rid of her? I, I mean, I, I don't mean, like, I getting rid of her now. I, I like her a lot. I want her here. I just meant, I know what you meant. It's fine. I just meant, why keep her here for all this time if she reminds you of such awful things? Tamlin only smiled a look so bittersweet that you could taste it. It's because it looks like my sister, Mal. Because every time I see it, I am reminded of all the adventures me and my brothers used to have with her getting anxious over our clumsiness. It's because every time I smell its cooking, I am reminded of the blueberry pies she used to bake every summer and the hot chocolate she and my mother would make every fall. Because every time I hear it laugh, gasp in surprise, or be dazzled, I am reminded of when I used to pull on little firework shows just for them in our backyard. Because the servant is the last connection I have to those times. Of how things could have been. Mal sat back in his chair, and Tamlin in his, before he continued. Plus, as you just mentioned, you like it a lot. And it's very sweet on you. So that's a bonus. Yeah, she is, Mal smiled. Hey, I really didn't mean to, like, tell you how you should act around her. Because you're not doing anything wrong by feeling as you do. I, I just I just think if, if there were any part of your sister in her, Mal, or even if there wasn't, either way, she would appreciate it if you treated her more kindly. So would I. I, I, I want you to be happier, too. I'll keep that in mind, Tamlin said, cool as could be, as he lit another cigarette. But I think it's time you should head to bed. It's late, and I have something planned for you tomorrow. All right, that, that's, that sounds pretty suspicious, but I'll, I'll try to keep an open mind. And, and for what it's worth, Mal, I, I promise it's going to be good this time, he urged as he got up and went toward the door. I was just going to say that, for what it's worth, I think your parents, your siblings, all of them, any anyone, really, they would be really, really proud of you and what you've done in your life. I, I know I am. I mean, I know that may not mean much coming from someone who hasn't lived much at all yet, but I, I hope 
It means something, he said, with a sheepish grin and a charming shrug. Tamlin sighed and softened, and laid back down on the couch as he replied, The thing I'm proudest of is having raised you, Mal. I hope that means something right back. And as Mal stood in the doorway with a lump in his throat, he shouted back, Thanks, it really means a lot. I love you, Dad. Good night. And plapped down the hallway. Tamlin smiled and began to drift off before the plapping returned and Mal's voice boomed through the door. Also, you smoke too much. You should quit. And the next thing he felt was the red welt of where Tamlin's lighter hit him in the head before he let out a yelp and ran upstairs for real this time. Just as Tamlin was drifting off again, a series of very soft footsteps woke him back up, much to his annoyance. He opened one eye to find the servant, setting the lighter back down from where he had thrown it, before giving a slight bow and turning to head out the door again. Thank you, he called out to her. I thank you, not for the lighter, though thank you for that too. I mean thank you for all you do for Mal and myself. I appreciate it, even if I don't say so. Then he closed his eyes once more and pretended as best as he could to be asleep. It is my joy to do, Tamlin. I am happiest when you two are, she whispered, sounding much closer than he would have liked, before she gently walked off again down the hall to fulfill whatever duties he absent-mindedly assigned her so long ago. I'm such an idiot, he thought, as he slumped back in a sigh, and finally, third time's the charm, managed to fall asleep. Chapter 7 But is it worth it after all, the boy called to the stars, to make you fall just to know that I can? Page 124, line 55, from The Book of Small Wisdoms, by Monk Zahn. The day started with the smell of pancakes wafting through the manor, the sizzle of batter on pan and the ting of table being set. It began with Mal, tired, yawning, still in his pajamas as Amelia poured his tea, and Tamlin in his best kiss-the-cook apron. So how was your sleep? he asked. It was good. I dreamt that I was fighting something on a rocky shore, like a hydra or a kraken, and I kept calling to you for help, but you told me you couldn't help until you finished your drawing. Also, Weasel was there, tap dancing. He didn't help either. Indeed, that does sound accurate, Tamlin teased as he tried to flip the pancake the cool way, failed, and had to use the spatula instead. Do you think dreams have any specific meaning, like symbolism or metaphor or something? Maybe, but if so, I've yet to figure out what being a dog walker symbolizes for me. Hmm. What about you, Amelia? Do you dream? I do not sleep, Mal, she gently chided. But if you did, what would you want to dream about? She seemed to consider this for a moment, refilling Mal's tea as he drank the last of it, standing stock still otherwise. I believe I would dream of traveling without my veil, and seeing everyone react to how I look. I think it would be quite amusing, and there would be no safer environment to do it in than a world of my own making. As for what dreams symbolize, it may just depend on the person. I've yet to find anything to suggest otherwise. If I do, would you like me to tell you? Yes, please, he said, chugging down his tea once more. Oh, the Tamlin, you need to give more energy to the pan flip. It's not a quick wrist motion. You need the momentum from your arm. His master tried and failed to heed the advice as the pancake once more toppled on itself. He sighed and scoffed. I'm not mad at you, you know. There was a lull in Mal's sipping as he considered the implications, and asked, Is not flipping the pancake something to be mad at me about? Hmm? Oh, <laughs> no. I mean for throwing the cup at the assassin. Mal considered this too, thinking it over as Amelia giggled over his scrunched face before he replied, is saving your life something to be mad at me about? I don't know, Mal. Is you stupidly risking your own safety for my sake something I should be mad at you about? When you phrase it like that, you certainly seem mad. I am concerned, is what I am. Have you really been thinking about that this whole time? 
Yes. Your well-being is important to me, in case you didn't notice. You lit my bed on fire. I... He roared before seething and shaking the pan with an intensity that would incapacitate an infant. Would you like some help with your flipping? If you'd be so kind. Mal was indeed so kind, coming right up and helping arrange the pancake properly before he continued. I was concerned too, you know. He could have shot you. And when he turned his weapon, he could have shot you. So what? I was just supposed to let him put a bullet in your chest? Absolutely. I can use my necromancy far more subtly than you can, nor was the servant there to act as your focus. I can ward off my death with little issue. You cannot. If he had shot you... Okay, what do I do here? He asked as the pancake started to sizzle. Oh, here. Start shaking the pan. Make sure the pancake isn't sticking. Give it some momentum. Push your arm forward and try to use the edge of the pan to flip it for you. Yeah, like that. And for a moment, there was excitement until Tamlin cut the flip too early and the pancake plopped back down in a sad lump. You have to be more confident. Uh, do you remember when you took me driving on the motorbike and you kept telling me I had to keep up the gas or I'd keep falling over? It's like that. You, you gotta keep up the gas. Tamlin tried again, revving up the pan and the pancake therein, focusing so much his tongue stuck out from his teeth as he went once, twice, and finally flipped the pancake with full dazzling effect back in the dead center of the pan. When Tamlin looked over to Mal with the expression of an excited fish, Mal was looking back at him the same way. Again, he cheered as Tamlin flipped it once more. Then another, another, throwing the flapjack higher with every chip-chip hurrah until his final magnum opus, flipping it so high that it stuck to the ceiling. Hmm. Waffles it is, then, Tamlin declared as Mal was already rushing to bring out the waffle iron. I know you were worried about me, Mal continued after the fresh batter was placed in the hot iron. But it's not like he actually shot me, so what's the matter? What's the matter is that if he did, you may have panicked, as you did when you threw the cup in the first place, and in panicking you could have outed yourself as what you are. But why bring it up now? He's dead now. You're safe. I'm safe. Why are you talking to me about this all now when it's not important? I want to drill lessons in when they're not important, so that by the time they are, you make the right decision. I don't understand. Tamlin massaged the bridge of his nose, tapping the side of his head, thinking of the words to use, getting distracted only when the waffles needed changing over. He didn't flip them this time. There will come points in your life when you will be so angry that all you see is red, or so full of sorrow that you cannot even imagine a tomorrow. Times where everyone in the room will have their finger on the trigger and be as jumpy as a rabbit. When all you want is for time to slow down. When your heartbeat is racing so fast that you cannot even hear yourself think. It is these times, and these most of all, when you must think. You must be able to will yourself to think with clarity and without hesitation. Because a single choice could change your life forever, and you will have only one chance to make the right one. When that chance arrives, you must think clearly. I was thinking clearly. I thought that I should help you. How could I have thought any clearer than that? How could I have done better? What if the cup you threw was enchanted? It wasn't. But it could have been. You have no idea where it came from. If magic from the ley lines tampered with its production or materials, what mutations it could have caused. You have no idea if it could have veered off course or exploded into dust that caused the assassin and I to choke or grow extra eyes or something. What else could I have used? You could have used your shoe. You know where that comes from. Mal grumbled. Or what about Mr. Zappini? You have no idea if he was working with the assassin when you dived behind him, out of my sight where he could have harmed you or made off with you. There's no way Mr. Zappini would hurt me. But someone might. Even if it's unintentional, you wouldn't want to hurt him, but you might have by using him as a shield. So too could someone use you for the same purpose, even if they were not acting maliciously. You could have avoided all of it by simply diving in the other direction. But... Mal continued before stopping, grumbling, and starting anew. But none of that happened. I'm fine. We're fine. So we are, Mal Malin. I know I am being unreasonable. I know that nothing I am suggesting was likely to come to pass. 
Of course the cup was fine. No respectable business owner would use materials forged near ley lines as anything that would come close to exploding in a customer's face. Nor is Mr. Zappini actually going to harm you. You've known him for years. You're his favorite opponent. I know it doesn't matter, but it is because it doesn't matter that I am telling you this now. Because if you had to learn this lesson for when it actually did matter, you would be sorry you didn't learn it sooner. You made the right decision, my boy. But you made the right decision because you were lucky, not because you came to the right conclusions. And you will not always be lucky. Learn this now, so when that the time comes, you will not have to be. Mal listened attentively, letting the words settle deep into his mind. He knew they were important. He knew they would matter. Someday. Even if he didn't have the wisdom to see where now. And he wanted his master to know that he knew. Okay, I understand, he said finally. Ha ha, good, for you are getting a special treat today that you will need to think well on, Tamlin assured him as he tossed a second helping of waffles onto his plate. We're going on a trip. Awesome, Mal called as he did an excited jig. Where to? You'll see when we get there. It's a surprise. Oh, um, well, what do I need to bring? Yourself. How long will we be? That depends on you. And I need to make a big decision. Potentially the biggest of your life. I don't think I like this game. You'll live. Tamlin smiled as he finally finished with a dollop of whipped cream and strawberries atop the waffle. And Mal, seeing his master smile, smiled right back. Then the pancake lost its grip on the ceiling and fell on his face. It was late in rising when they left for the train station. Though, much to Mal's surprise, Amelia was actually coming with them this time. "'Why are you coming along?' he asked as he sat beside her, full of paranoia. "'Because Tamlin ordered that you might require me. Therefore, I am here.' "'Require you? So we're doing something magic-related?' "'I believe so.' "'Do you know what?' "'I have suspicions,' she said, in a voice that sounded awfully close to Coy. "'Well, what are they?' "'It's a surprise.' she said, and looking at him, lifted her veil so he could see her smile. The blast of warmth washing away the small specks of snow informed the passengers that they had entered the boundaries of the capital, and as they exited the train, Tamlin corralled Mal away from his dazzlement at the lights and instructed for them to take a detour, taking a cabbie to another station entirely at the far end. Seemingly much older, being carved from stone and leading where few came and went on tracks no longer seeing frequent use. With Amelia and Mal directly behind him, Tamlin walked straight through the station without paying a thing. Hey, psst, isn't it dangerous to have Amelia here with us? Normally? Yes, extremely. Why even ask? He said with a dry giggle. It is instructed to shoot anyone who tries to remove its veil forcefully. The servant of a count committing murder is easier to wave away than my servant being undead. But today it is here with me, and nobody's going to stop it and demand identification of the removal of its veil while I am here. As he predicted, any officer or guardsman who spotted the trio simply saluted and did not ask any prying questions even as they boarded the train. Talman instructed that their seating box was to be absolutely private and with no visitors, not even the trolley, despite Mel's grumbling. I brought some treats for you, just in case, Amelia whispered into his ear, and his smile returned. The porting was easy for their lack of luggage. Mal spent the entirety of the ride with his face plastered against the glass, giving Amelia trivia piece after trivia piece of all the scenery and landscapes they passed by, and every so often she would ask a thoughtful question or comment on a certain tree or other, or the snow coming back, and Mal would go off on yet another distracted tangent while she listened, enraptured. Eventually, the train stopped, and the party got off in the small desert town of Attle Springs, with neither many springs, nor whatever Attle was. Still just as much of a dump as ever, Tamlin said as he traced his way through the dried grass, the rest following behind. That's not a very nice thing to say. I'm sure these people worked very hard to have a good... Uh, he stopped, looking around at the almost deserted village and the dozens of signs pointing the way to the world's supposedly largest bullet. A scenic getaway? 
It's a tourist trap. Became so after the mines dried up, and when the resorts dried up, there were only the elderly and stubborn left. It wasn't renovated? What happened to it? I did, Tamlin said, with a slick grin. No amount of blue-collar idealism can beat my red tape. Can't have a mind of my own if the people go into the hospitality industry. You're awful! You're terrible! This place could have been wonderful if it wasn't for you! Oh, yes, how horrid of me. Instead of letting this place be a wonderfully subpar resort town, it'll have to content itself with being a wonderfully subpar pit stop. Woe to thee. You make my stomach sour. I suppose we will see how long that lasts once we get a proper bite to eat. You there, citizen, where might we go for lunch? They were directed to a small diner near the center of town. A quaint enough place, Mal thought aloud, for such an absolute pigsty. Tamlin concluded. Together they got their seats and made their orders. Tamlin asked for dark roast coffee and buttered toast. Lightly buttered toast. Exceptionally lightly buttered toast. In fact, if you butter the toast and you can see the sheen of butter on the toast, you have put too much butter on the toast. Mal, on the other hand, wanted to try two dishes. One of them called a cobbler's pie, and the other interestingly referred to as a garbage plate. Yes, that. He wanted that, whatever that was. Amelia, through her veil, ordered a single glass of silk tea, along with whatever Mal was having, so he could have it twice. The food took its time, which Mal was just fine with, considering it gave him more time to origami the napkins. Eventually, the waitress returned with a butter toast and a glass of black tea, explaining to Amelia that she didn't actually know what silk tea was, nor did the cook, and hoped this would suffice. Amelia nodded, and seemed content to stare at it for the entirety of the meal. Tamlin, on the other hand, wore only a scowl, as the clearly very buttered toast was laid in front of him. He was told that they did not actually have any coffee, and asked whether he would like something else. No, he told her, passing the plate of toast to Mal, who ate it happily. Do you have any nuts instead? We have a delicious peanut pie if you'd like, sir. Never mind he declared, waving her off completely, then turning, asking, Is it good? to his younger protege, who gave a satisfied nod. Good. Have you ever thought about starting a restaurant? Mal asked between bites. I bet you'd be super good at it. We could even run it together. Is that so? Just give up everything and run off to some faraway land, serving cold porridge and bad veal wherever we went? Yeah. Tamlin smiled, despite himself. I prefer cooking for you, my boy. Or rather, I prefer cooking for people who can actually appreciate it. Everyone appreciates good cooking, Talon scoffed, rolling his eyes. Most people's palates are dreadful. If you want to impress the poor, you just add butter, cheese, or garlic until they're happy. Or salt, especially salt. Add that to desserts, too. Desserts? Mm-hmm. It'll accent the sweeter flavors. Cool. Okay. Should I remember anything else if I want to make a fine meal? Yes. Never, look at, look at me, never, ever tell people how much cream is in their Alfredo. Mal, never tell people how much cream is in their Alfredo. Ever. If they ask, you lie. This advice would have been far better received had Mal himself not loved the stuff, and he gulped as Talon gave a knowing smirk. The waitress soon came back with Mal's two dishes, which he began digging into right away before stopping, remembering his manners, and offering Tamlin whichever pieces of food had the fewest bites taken out of them. Tamlin politely declined. Suddenly, there was a crash, a major spill as water splashed across Mal's robes, soaking one side of him completely. The waitress had tripped. People were staring. She had almost gotten Tamlin soaked, too, and now she sat in the middle of the floor as people stared looking close to sobbing. "'Are you okay?' Mal called, climbing out of his seat to help her up. "'Oh, uh, yes, uh, thank you. I'm so sorry. Your clothes,' the waitress said, still looking round, anxious and nervous at the eyes of the customers, and Mal suddenly snapped into a boisterous laugh that caught everyone's eye. Oh, "'Goodness me! I know I came in after training for, um, a marathon, but I didn't think I needed a shower that badly.' Now the waitress wasn't looking at anyone but just blinking at Mal like a confused toad as she asked, "'What? What do you think, sir?' he said, turning and addressing another patron. "'Do you think it has assisted with my complexion? Cleared up some acne? Come on, be honest. Tell me I look handsome.' 
Now, remember, I'm a noble, so you have to say yes. Now it was the poor patron's turn to stammer out his own. What? But there was a confused smile behind the word, and now none of the patrons were looking at anyone but Mal. Perfect. Now he just had to think of what to actually say. Ah, but fret not, my gentle citizens. I understand what it is to not only have a noble son, but one as particularly dashing as myself in your midst. You must find ways to tell me I need a wash without passing offence. Rest assured, I have learned my lesson well, and will leave you, young lady, he said, pointing his finger back at the waitress. A wonderful tip for letting me know so subtly, and intentionally tripping to save my dignity too. Your boss he began, and then looking around for anyone with a stained apron. You, yes, you, you, the boss, ought to be so proud of your employee, and if you can't find a reason as to why, then, uh, trust my word for it. He looked out over the small crowd of patrons, and each of them wore confused delight or hid their snickering behind a menu. He shot a glance at Tamlin, who, while he seemed to be enjoying his son's antics, signaled that he was to depart for a short while, leaving Mal to go about his business as he wished. With such a perfect cover, and oh so proud of himself, he strode over, helping the waitress up properly, picking up the spilled jug and asking for towels, and only when they were out of earshot did he ask her more earnestly, Really, though, are you okay? Her smile was far more certain this time. As promised, Mal was able to leave a sizable tip and remain long enough to convince the owner not to fire the poor girl for a simple slip-up. By the time he got outside with Amelia, Tamlin had already returned with a rented carriage, complete with two powerfully built horses at the front that, thanks to Amelia quickly yanking him away, only narrowly missed kicking Mal in the gut as he went to pet them. It was only as he twirled back that he noticed a sizable crate in the back of the hearse. "'What's in the box?' Mal asked as Amelia unfolded a cloth in her bag and took out a far more appropriately buttered piece of harsh bread, handing it to Tamlin. "'Nothing yet!' he said between mouthfuls. Yet, Mal asked, and his master only winked. They rode out of town, toward old trails long overtaken by hill thickets. Amelia drove the horses. Tamlin sat back with a book cover over his eyes, and Mal asking the entire time where they were going and what they were doing here. With each question, he received the same response from both of them. It's a surprise, but it's coming soon. They veer through groves and bushels, well out of sight of even the most ardent rider, as they emerged into a clearing and came upon a small hill, complete with a large stone slab laying on the far side of it. Tamlin hopped off the side of the carriage and approached the slab. "'Give me a hand,' he said, and Mal and Amelia both joined in to open the door, though it surprised the former by opening in the centre, and remained so, balancing on the hinges. Amelia unhooked a lamp from her satchel and— pressing a switch, gave the moss-green light to Tamlin before he went delving down the stairs and into the cheese-smelling darkness. The tunnel was cold and clammy, and despite the light of the lantern, Mal had to walk so close to Tamlin that he feared that he might step on the back of his shoes. Just a little further, Tamlin assured him. Eventually they exited the shaft and came to a large dome-shaped room, so spacious that their footsteps echoed back to them as they entered, and in one swoop Tamlin opened the lantern and tossed the green flame across to each of the prevailing torches mounted on the wall, illuminating the entire area, and revealing to Mal that it was absolutely stuffed to the brim with corpses. Laying in rest in holes carved from the wall, leaning in coffins stacked together, or simply being laid underfoot, a few feet beneath the cold earth with a simple marker to remind people not to walk across it. "'What is this place?' he asked in wonder. "'They are catacombs, used to be for small villages that dotted this area long ago. They would all place their dead here, in an assured gravesite as a sign of peace and remembered oaths between towns. But as prospects left more and more outfield and toward the capital, the towns got depopulated.' and the catacombs fell into disrepair. At last there were only a few rests left, and these dead were forgotten entirely. In the past I would come here to refine my necromancy to perfect pitch, and to collect any specimens I might require for labor. And why did you want to come here now? To teach you. To raise my own dead? Like a proper necromancer? Tamlin nodded. So that you could raise the dead and have a proper, more permanent medium my boy. Like, 
with you and Amelia, it would be me and you and whichever you like, whichever seems strong or fast or steady or able, whichever you feel you need for the life you want to live. Normally, it's not a matter of such gravitas. You can always raise a new medium should you get tired of the old. But knowing you, I think you'd grow more attached. So perhaps choose wisely. But there's so many, he called, letting his voice echo around the massive pit in awe. Tamlin only laughed. It's not as if any of them would mind or be put out if you didn't choose them. Just follow your heart and make sure the choice is right for you. Mal obeyed surveying the rows upon rows of dead, from the raw skeletons to the mummified corpses to the seemingly fresh ones, embalmed by the frigid air and salt of the underground. He saw the corpses of older men, seemingly taken in their sleep or by some weakness of the heart, so noble the outline of their elderly faces that they could be mistaken for sleeping, even now. They would be wonderful carriers, messengers, someone to fence between Mal and the world if need be, for who would accost an old man? He saw young women, buried with flowers long dried, taken too soon by an illness that turned them as pale as snow, and as thin as reeds, with long hair formerly tied by brands that had rotted away, and now hung loose like the leaves on a weeping willow. Would they not make fine assistants, bodyguards, to catch off guard all those who would not expect strength and endurance from their frail frames? He came upon one he almost chose, a young woman not too much older than Amelia, though it was clear the mustiness of the earth he brushed from her would cling, and she would need to be a specialist of sorts, but, ah, he saw, looking down, the rounded belly of a pregnant woman, buried with her child. Smiling sorrowfully, he apologized so quietly that only she would have heard, as he laid her back down and brought the dirt back over her. Finally, he came upon a section of grizzled young men, most of whom seemed to have been taken by accidents at work or at war, for the bandages covering the wounds that took their arm or their leg or the holes in their chest had faded to dust. The half-torn bodies were placed haphazardly, as if those putting them there were afraid to touch them any longer for fear of inheriting their misfortune. The wounds would be too grievous to hide properly against the outside world, but they would make wonderful strongmen and laborers, who would be capable of the heaviest lifting that Mal could not. Eventually, he decided upon a large, stout-looking being, who appeared to have half his head entirely removed from his body, taken by an explosion by the looks of the fragments, though by cannonball or workplace negligence he couldn't say. Admittedly, Mal was thinking more as to what it would look like to bring such a being back to life, rather than on practical uses. Talon smiled and rolled his eyes as he heard his boy call out, This is the one! Talon and Amelia hoisted the corpse from its crevice, placing it in the middle of the floor, whereupon Talon began to walk Mal through the processes and ritual needed to raise the dead. The most important thing was himself, of course. A mage's own skill was the most important ingredient, Talon explained, but one could use focal points, such as energy-storing talismans or the same runes they use in enchanted materials to similar effect. To this point, Tamlin drew a circle around Mal and the corpse, lining it with small, shimmering stones that helped contain the magic within the area, creating a feedback loop so as little energy was wasted as possible, and began instructing his apprentice to first go into a meditative state, and just like with previous spells, filter his energy through the corpse and back around himself. It felt just as weighted and slow as before, despite Tamlin's insistence that it would get easier. To his credit, Mal followed each instruction as best as he could, but time and again his will failed him, letting the energy slough off him and having to take breaks to recuperate. Tamlin assured him that this too was fine and expected, and was exactly why they had brought enough things to snack on and drink and even a tent, should they have to camp outside and try again tomorrow. Mal, however, was adamant about doing it right and doing it as promptly as possible. Every attempt seemed to be an almost or a nearly. At times it felt like Mal could see the corpse moving as he squinted and stared until his eyes watered, but then he'd wipe the dryness from them and find the corpse as still as it always was, and he fell onto his back as he let out a roar of frustration. "'Are you having difficulties?' asked the sweet, soft voice next to him, just outside the circle, and he turned to stick his tongue out until he saw Amelia was holding a slice of blackberry pie taken from her lunchbox. 
Mal grabbed it and took a big, hearty bite out of it, smiling a sticky, syrup grin at his most darling caretaker. She smiled back. You know, whatever they're like, I hope they're as nice as you. They will be whatever you want them to be, Mal. Somehow, this didn't seem to make him as happy as she intended. The sharp voice of his master broke him from his thoughts as he called from behind his book, Have you learned nothing from your previous trials with the sparking? At this, Mal sighed, gave a hoarse, Gah! and a loud groan of defeat as he called back sheepishly, Master, would you be so kind as to allow me a break? Of course, Mal, came the happy reply. So can you teach me about something else in the meantime? Now the only reply was a hoarse, Gah! of his master's own. All right, you fiend, get up, come with me. They journeyed farther into the catacombs, down longer, meandering tunnels to where the corpses were withered, mummified, or left with nothing but bones, and walked until they came across a strange triangular pattern on the floor. Step into the pattern, my boy, Tamlin instructed, and the apprentice obeyed, suddenly feeling a sensation of pins and needles on his skin, like he was being watched. It feels strange. Is the pattern enchanted? Not quite. What you're feeling is a ghost. Mal's head snapped up. He looked toward his master, then back toward where the sensation seemed to be coming from. A ghost? But how can that be? You always told me ghosts can only remain when they have a purpose. And it remains so. Sometimes that purpose is simple grievance. Perhaps this ghost was buried too improperly for its liking and had a bone to pick with its ball bearers. But isn't it in pain? It must be being stretched so thin. Maybe. From my interaction with it, it doesn't seem to remember much of who it is or why it is here, so any pain it feels is likely only a little terrible. But if it doesn't remember, why isn't it dissipated? Why is it still here? Oh, well, that's because I trapped it here, for training purposes. You're vile! Oh, hush, you. Now focus. Mal did as he was bid, feeling, sensing, just as he did before feeling the prickling on his skin and his hair standing up, feeling his left arm becoming slightly numb. What is it doing? he asked. Probably feeding off you. Much like the undead, spirits require a source of energy to persist. If a man has a strong enough will in life, then they will be able to persist after death as well, if they so choose. Though the agony is often too much either way. This is why some spirits will eat their own ego their sense of self, willfully forgetting all but the most important pieces they need to press on, so that their torment might be lessened, if only a little. If they cannot persist out of duty, a spirit might carry on because it's feeding on a source of energy. That is why the spirit is trapped in the marker, and that is why it is feeding on you now. What will happen if it continues to sap my energy? To this, Talon shrugged. You'll continue to be a bit numb, I guess. Maybe you get some chills. They don't take enough energy to seriously hamper you, not as much as the undead, anyways. Though I suppose if you collected a whole posse of them, it might become a problem. Perhaps you will turn into a block of ice, or become possessed, he chuckled. But for now, the worst I've experienced from a room full of ghosts is just a feeling of lethargy and dulled senses. Then what are we practicing here? Well... Beyond the importance of being able to sense such things, whether a magical effect is upon you or there is something amiss in the air, the same principle for rejecting spirits can apply to rejecting magical energies, and the undead as well. How? Patience! I'm getting to it, Tamlin roared and playfully chopped Mal on the head. Here, sit still and focus. Really focus. Feel where your energy is. Feel how it leaves you. Once more, Mal sat and waited, and thought, and pondered, before remembering to silence his mind and meditate into a trance. It felt strange, hard to distinguish, since he often felt the energy coursing through him during his meditations, so feeling where it was leaving was a subtle thing indeed. And yet, and yet he could. Barely, faintly, like someone trying to suck the breath from his mouth through a straw, but no, across from him, on his arm, like he was being leaned on, depended upon, and feeling of want so deep that it took from him directly. I feel a longing, he said. Of course, his master replied. As the spirit connects with you in such a way, so too do you connect with it. You feel a little as it does, sense some of what it does, a true empathetic connection, even if it is with a parasite. 
So, wait, what's the point of building a connection? Mal asked. To be able to break it, Tamlin smiled. As it happens, to be able to cut such a connection is a useful skill, and has much overlap with the ability to repulse these energies. There are even many lessons that can be applicable to other branches of magic, so that it makes you more adept at resisting spell work. Resisting spell work? Of course. Just as one turns a blade aside with their shield, so too does one turn a spell aside by a bulwark of energy. It holds the same principle. Because what are spirits but energy, eh? So I want you to focus on that feeling, that connection. And just as you've learned to gather energy and flow it through your body, I want you to coalesce it around you. Mal nodded, settling back down and going back into his trance, though he found it more and more difficult the deeper he went into his own mindscape. It was as if he heard a voice that did not echo, or saw a reflection through ripples in water. It was distant, unrefined, but present throughout his entirety. Do not go. Your warmth is the sun to a sunflower. There is nothing to see but you. I am your every inch. Stay with me. Do not go. Are you ready? His master's voice broke in muddling the thoughts, the voice, the pang in his heart. Yeah, he replied. Good. Stretch the energy outside of yourself. Focus around and spin it as fast as you can. Fast enough that it disrupts the sensation. Mal did as he was commanded, trying to visualize the energy into a whirlwind, and feeling the voice become more frantic even as it became more disjointed. Come back. Where are you? I can't see. Did you go? Come back. I... And then it was gone. And only the stillness remained. Mal opened his eyes to a peaceful darkness, with a dim haze of smoke curling along the floor, leading up to Talon's cigarette, the light of which he was inflaming to read his book. Are you done? the elder asked without raising his glance. I think so. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to keep you from reading. You haven't been. You've been in a trance for over an hour, old sport. This shocked Mal enough for him to stand upright and then promptly fall back down out of the triangle where his legs stung like pine nettles. An hour? Why didn't you shake me? You seem to be rather enjoying your meditation. Practice can only be good for you. Besides, it's not as if I mind. But still, isn't it dangerous to leave someone in a trance for so long? It can be, if there are exterior threats present or an internal threat they do not have the will to fight, but it can be equally harmful to jolt the mage awake. These things must be done gradually, and if I did it any sooner, you would have been miffed for missing out on the practice, he said as he cracked a smile, and Mal puffed his cheeks in mock anger. Come on, let's get back to the proper corpses. At the least it'll reassure the servant. It's been bothering me every ten minutes like clockwork asking about you. At this, Mal smiled and steadying himself on less rickety legs, got up and pranced back to his master's side as they walked back down the long hall, but then slowed, and frowned, and felt, Tamlin, is it normal to still be connected to a spirit after you separate from it? At this, his master cocked an eyebrow and shook the ashes from his cigarette. No, not at all. That would rather defeat the whole purpose of severing the connection, now wouldn't it? Then, I don't know, I might have done it wrong. I still feel, not sad, but just... Unfulfilled, I guess. You separated yourself from the entity just fine, Mal. And even if you did not, the protective enchantment would have prevented any possession to begin with. Are you certain you are not just sensitive? Like, to ghosts? Tamlin chuckled. No. Are you certain you do not just feel unfulfilled because you feel unfulfilled? Because the experience has left you with something to consider? At this, Mal clutched at his heart gently, thinking, before tentatively asking, could you free the spirit, please? I know you captured them for a reason, but they just seemed so... I don't know. I know I wouldn't want to be in their place, or for you to be there either. I think it would be the right thing to do to let them go. At this, Tamlin turned and poked his finger right above Mal's eyebrow. I will teach you so that you can free them yourself, wizard. The pair walked back to the main side where Amelia was waiting, watching the entrance tunnel before turning, seeing Mal, and dashing to scoop him up in a hug. You've been meditating for so long. Are you well? Do you require any more refreshments? What were you doing all that time? You do not respond to any stimuli whatsoever. 
Mal did his best to reassure her that all was well, yes, yes, it was fine, giving her a tight squeeze back, explaining that he was just learning how to handle spirits, before peeling himself away to drop back into the- Why? What would you need to learn something like that for? She asked. What? Why wouldn't I? It's a very useful skill, Mal replied, feeling like he was defending Tamlin's honor. Perhaps it would be, yes, but spirits don't exist, Mal. What? Amelia, you're undead. You, you here, you, you're a dead person. That's correct, Mal. My nature has not changed since we last spoke, she confirmed. Then how can you not believe in ghosts? Because I've never seen one, she shrugged. Mal, still quite aghast, looked queerly at Tamlin, who smiled and shrugged right alongside her. Oh, enough of this! Fie-fie to you! He said, playfully weaving his sleeve at her, then, looking back at his master, said, I'm ready to try raising the corpse again. Tamlin lifted an eyebrow. Are you sure? You were in a weakened state at the end of your efforts previous, and you've had little time to rest due to your impromptu lesson. I'm sure, he smiled. I know I can do it if I try. Now it was Tamlin's turn to smile. Once more the casting circle was checked and put to order, and once more Mal sat within, next to the half-brained corpse as he drifted back into the meditations he knew so well, focusing, feeling, doing as he was instructed in absorbing the energy around himself and filtering it through, back out into the corpse. Again he could feel himself getting closer and closer. He could feel the corpse begin to move, to awaken, to feel consciousness, to feel life before he hit the plateau, and couldn't seem to get any further. He tried again from scratch. Tired as he felt, as much as his muscles ached from maintaining his position, he continued to try, to press it, to force it, to almost feel the corpse begin to rise, to open its eyes, before all life left it once again, and it was an inert body on the ground. Mal spat with anger, rubbing his temples with the palm of his hand, raking his nails through his hair in agitation, thinking, wondering, brooding on how to get beyond this. There had to be something, something he was overlooking. A different perspective, perhaps? Maybe he really was just tired. Could he do it with more rest? Mm, no, perhaps not. Since, if that were so, he could have just done it before, when he first came in and was well rested and fed. Perhaps it was a matter of pure practice? It couldn't be. Because then why did he get so close, only to falter at the last moments? No, there was something else, something he wasn't seeing, something he wasn't applying. Was it the corpse that was the problem? Was it his magic? Need he try to change it up, switch it up, perhaps even apply it differently? Hmm. What did he learn from that ghost again? More concentration this time. More fully focused. Not a thought passed through his mind as he hummed low and deep, while Amelia and Tamlin watched the echoes bounce off the wall. Here, even as he followed the procedure and allowed his energy to enter back into the corpse, he did yet more. He focused on the feeling from before, from the ghost. He focused on the strands of himself from deep within and allowed them to connect to the corpse, allowed it to be a siphon, a parasite. He let the energy from within himself be drawn directly. He immediately felt the results. He felt colder. A stillness, not one that blanketed over him or seemed to be a weight he dragged, but one from within, as if he drank mercury, as if some molecules were fading away. And as he breathed out the air from his lungs and fell into a forward bend, his forehead nearly touched the floor in his languid apathy. He heard a voice. Are you well? it asked. Gargled, hollow, unfamiliar, dry as if it had to get used to its vocal cords all over again. Mal looked up into the eyes of the undead. You're alive, Mal replied, in near disbelief that it worked. Am I? asked the corpse. Yeah, Mal shouted, lurching himself forward to it before correcting himself. Well, I, I guess in a matter of speaking. Okay, it replied before pausing again and asking again. Are you well? Yes, yeah, I am. N never better. This is great. This is wonderful, he called, crawling forward before losing sensation in his arm and collapsing onto his face. A sort of, he corrected again, muffled in the dirt. He was really too excited to care. Tamlin, laughing, walked over and knelt down and lent Mal his shoulder to lean on, taking one last puff of his cigarette before putting it out on the dirt. Goodness me, what a servant you've chosen. I'm sure the sight of its open skull will match very nicely to your shirt. Then, rustling a proud Mal's hair, he prodded. Well, 
Aren't you going to give it an order? An order? Val asked, already forgetting the point. Mm -hmm. It is your tool now. You must shape it as it suits you best, and that starts with your first command. Mal paused, considering this, furrowing his brow and puffing his cheeks out as he tapped at the twist of the corner of his mouth, wondering over what orders he would actually want to give this man. And finally, he settled on, Tell me about yourself. Do you remember anything about your past? How you got here? Do you feel pain from the opening in your skull? How do you talk when you're missing half a brain? How does it feel to be given new life? What do feelings feel like to you? Given his new companion's hypothetical birth, it was not exactly a riveting conversation. Still, Mal was happy to hear all of the being's confused and unsure responses, and Tamlin laughed aloud, lighting another cigarette as he patted Mal on the shoulder. When you chose a corpse with its brain leaking out, I didn't think you'd pick at it this way. The conversation continued for what seemed like hours. The corpse did not seem to know much, and it was frustrating when he retroactively corrected himself whenever Mal stated something to the contrary. But he was never tired of being asked questions, and he was happy to listen to Mal ranting on about everything he knew of the world, anything off the top of his head, unprompted. If all you're going to do is ask it questions, we can always do that at home, you know, Captain jostled. And this gave Mal pause. Was it wise to go? They got a crate for him, sure, but what about beyond that? Oh, he was such a dunderhead. Being cooped up in some lab all day and never seeing the light of day for your wound is no way to live, but... You do not believe I should go, the corpse interjected. A comment, not a question, and caught the confused gaze of all three bystanders. Well, this was new. Why is it speaking for you? Tamlin asked. I... I don't know. But you have your suspicions, the corpse noted. Suspicions? Tamlin asked, turning an eye toward his apprentice. Well, I, I couldn't raise it the way you instructed, no matter how much I tried. It didn't seem to work, so I just figured I would try something else. And I figured, hey, if that spirit from before could connect to my energy directly, why can't a body? It may be a side effect, like getting my surface thoughts or feelings. Tamlin whistled in his sly, ominous fashion, nodding his head as he listened. Impressive. I've never heard of a necromancer trying such a thing before. Exemplary show of creativity and wonderful adaptability as well. But be warned, Mal. I taught you to resist such techniques for a reason. It can be extremely dangerous to share energy directly, and especially with a corpse, and invite that death energy into yourself. I don't think it will kill you, or cut years from your life, but I doubt it will do your health any favors. Nor will you be able to expend as much energy as you could otherwise. It's a neat party trick, I'll give you that, but I don't think it's worth it just to let the thing feel how tasty your food is. And once more, the hollow, dry voice coughed up a reply. Ah, but who knows what strange things might be learned, or what more secrets might be discovered through such a technique. Mal smiled. You read my mind, he said, before turning to Tamlin. I understand the risks and accept them. I think this will be worth it. Very well, he shrugged. Then finish your interrogation and let's be off with it. We shouldn't be seen coming out of here in the sunrise. The corpse, unprompted, began to dislodge itself from its stasis, grinding its way into its hands and knees, then onto its feet, steadily walking a few paces toward the exit before reacting, as if he caught a smell in the air. Amelia, what do you think? About? About him, your fellow dead. Do you have any opinion at all? I wouldn't know yet for I have not worked with him. His views or feelings, whatever they may be, are irrelevant. All that matters is coordination with you. If those who follow you cannot work with you to the best of their ability, they will only be a drain to you. If you decide he is the former, we should take him. If the latter, we should not. Yet again, this did not seem to have the intended comforting effect. But you do not think it is wise for me to go, the corpse told Mal, rather than asked. You do not think it is nice. That's right, Mal replied. I don't think it's fair for me to give you a life you can't properly lead. Amelia is a corpse too, but at least she can go outside and talk and participate with a slight disguise, but you... You think I would be hurt somehow? I'm sorry. I should have given more thought to raising you, had more foresight. You believe it would be best if I stayed? That's right, Mal nodded. At this, Tamlin nearly sucked his cigarette in so fast he choked on it and pounded his chest to hack it back up, grimacing, first at the cigarette, and then altogether. 
What in the tragedy and sea are you doing? Just leaving it here? What's the point of making the damn thing if you're just going to let it rust in the box? Hey, who raised the sun dead? Mal snapped playfully at his master, hands on his hips, trying his best to bend aggressively when all it did was make him shorter. You did, Tamlin admitted. And what did you always teach me about my powers, hmm? Mal mocked, taking enough steps forward that Tamlin could observe his wangling finger. That you can do whatever you want with them. Tamlin replied. That's right, he's mine, and that means I can do whatever I want with my undead. I can have him wear a cheerleader's uniform and do the mango slide for ten hours outside your window if I want him to, and what I want is for him to be happy. Tamlin laughed at the scolding, assenting. I'd have expected you to jump at the chance to have a proper servant, he jibed. Lords know you're attached enough to mine. That's true, Mal agreed. But any undead who stays by my side, I want them to want to stay by my side, a choice they make of their own accord. If they do not want to, I will not force them to. I have to say, I don't understand the point of learning a magic system that allows you to have as many puppet servants as you like, and then be concerned with how sincere their feelings are. Well, that's because you're evil, Tamlin, Mal joked. I told you before, didn't I? I don't want to know necromancy to bend anything to my will. I want to learn it because it's worth learning. Tamlin smiled begrudgingly. A shame you couldn't be some philosopher's student or some scientist's lackey, hmm? You got stuck with a legal worker instead. Don't be silly, you'd be an awful scientist, Mal replied, before remembering and turning to his new companion. Would it make you happy to stay? The corpse did not move. Only staring at Mal with a blank expression, it was a full minute of back-and-forth glances between master and student before it came up with its answer. I do not know, but I know it is peaceful here. I know it is dark. I know it is quiet. I know it is cool. I know it here. Then stay, Mal smiled. And who knows, if things change, I'll come back for you, and we can party it up, and I'll actually get to teach you that mango slide. The corpse did not respond. It only turned and waded its way back to the coffin it was pulled from, rolling inside and staying there, looking up into the darkness of the stone ceiling. The three of them made their way toward the exit, with Tamlin putting out the lights as they went along. "'Are you really sure you do not want another?' he asked, even as they saw the light of the shattered moon at the end of the tunnel. "'I'm sure. I'm happy with my choice. Besides, we can always come back, right? Like a little road trip.' "'So we can.' Tamlin smiled, rustling his student's hair. So we can. And you're not upset at me for deciding not to have my own undead yet, right? Mal asked shyly. Of course not. What you said is true. As a necromancer, the decisions you make over the dead are your own. Hm? You heard me, young man. You have raised and commanded your own dead. You have cast your own death magic. You have glimpsed at life beyond the veil. You are not a trainee mage, nor my apprentice any longer. You are a fully-fledged necromancer, Mal Malin. Congratulations. Mal stopped, sending a questioning glance first at Tamlin, then Amelia, as if a prank were being pulled, but when his master turned back and gave him a warm smile, he knew it to be true. You really mean it? Really, really. I'm like you! Yes, you are, my boy. Mal launched himself forward, smacking his body into Tamlin's and wrapping him in a tight hug as his master oomphed! <clears throat> and caught his breath, before steadying himself, sighing, smiling, and hugging Mal back. So, what do I do? Mal asked when they separated. Well, now we go home and get some proper sleep. Well, yeah, sure, obviously, but I mean, what's next for me? What am I supposed to do next? Tamlin shrugged. No idea. That's your call. You're not going to give me advice? Tamlin smiled. Nope. Oh, what, you're telling me you don't have any words of wisdom to impart? You, of all people, Mr. Big High and Mighty Teacher, you don't have another lecture up your sleeve for me? At this, Tamlin stopped, and, smiling with only a slight bit of condescension, began to give it some thought as he exited the underground vault into the moonlight-drenched plains above. You want a lecture? Fine. Nobody on this earth has a right to tell you how to live or how to use your powers. They are yours. Not mine, not your friends, not the Duke's. They belong to nobody but you. Anyone who tells you how to live your life, what to do with the life you have earned, is only trying to use you for their benefit, or live vicariously through you. These are your powers. 
It is your life. It cannot be stolen or taken or traded away. You can loan it, use it in the service of another, but always it will be yours. And that comes with the ultimate responsibility of being the one who decides how to use it. So you can't blame anyone else when your abilities are misused. Don't be a pawn in another person's scheme. Don't give away all you have learned freely. And never allow yourself to be manipulated away from the path you believe in. Live your life with the powers I have taught you. That is my gift to you. Mal stood, taking it all in, this speech in the moonlight, watching as his master paced back to the car, whistling and swinging his cane all the while, before stuttering, running after him and calling, But, but then, what do I do with my powers? What do I do with my life? His master, opening the door and settling his leg on the railing to herp himself into the back seat, stopped just long enough to make a puzzled face and dramatically run his hand through his goatee before he answered. Do as you see fit. And with that, he got in the car, slid over to the other window, and tapped the seat. Hop in. Let's go home. Mal sat next to him, looking up at the starry night sky, feeling an entire world of possibilities wash over him, and with absolutely no idea of where to start. Well, one idea. When we get back, can you make the special hot chocolate to celebrate? Ha! Of course I can. It'll give you the energy you need to get back to your worksheets, too. Damn it. Chapter 8 I have given so much, mused the mountain man. Would you have rather given less? I asked. No, he replied. I would have rather they took more. Page 157, line 20, from The Book of Small Wisdoms, by Monk Zahn. It was two weeks later that the morning began as usual, with Tamlin making breakfast and Mal eagerly reciting his nighttime adventures to Amelia as she sat across from him. I was playing in a one-man band. Oh, and I was going wild on all sorts of instruments, which is super silly, considering when I try to play any of them, it sounds like a rat scampering across it to try to get some cheese. Your playing is quite unique, yes, she smiled. Yeah, but you were there, and so were my friends, and half the circus, though they didn't really have faces. They just all sort of melded together, kind of like Neapolitan ice cream, for facial features. That sounds quite frightening. I'm impressed you were able to keep playing. Mm hmm I was too, but I don't quite remember anything after that. But what about you, Tamlin? Did you have any dreams? Yes, I dreamed of my children, my son in particular. I kept trying to get him to ride a bike, and he kept refusing, he said, pressing the bacon in the pan to make it sizzle. Was that a common occurrence? Mal teased. Sometimes. Sometimes he was difficult and didn't feel like listening. It happens with all children from time to time. Ah, that's funny. I thought boys were supposed to be easier to raise than girls. That's not true. It's just easier to get away with neglecting them. Was uh, uh, that a common occurrence, too? Hmm? Oh, no. Heavens, no. I never neglected any children under my care. Always had a fondness for them. Prior to being a father, I even tutored at dear Anne's elementary school in the capital. Kids are great, especially the little bastard ones. The ones who try to shiv you in the kidney when they think you're not looking. They're fantastic, and they don't even cry to anyone when you hit them. It's like a hive mind pact. They consider it unsporting or something. You hit children? Violence is the only language some people understand, dear boy, he said, clanking his knife into the pan for dramatic effect. Did you hit your children? Is that what this is leading up to? Are you just going to reveal how you intend to beat me? Is that what this is? My children? Oh, no, no, no. Heavens no. Far too inefficient. Whenever one of them misbehaved, I'd just punish the others so that they would just hit each other whenever one was acting up. If you're going to be a single father, you really have to streamline the process. It's true, Amelia chimed in. Once, 36 years ago, on the 18th day of waves, Tamlin was... Silence! He spat, a slight blush to his cheeks, knowing full well what she was referring to, before he turned to finish chopping the mushrooms, and she dutifully did just that, lacing her fingers as she sat while Mal laughed. After Mal had wolfed down his three sausages, two eggs, two pancakes, hash browns, yogurt, cheese, curds, three strips of bacon, grilled tomatoes and mushrooms, and a muffin, and Tamlin had finished his very, very, very lightly buttered toast and coffee, Mal asked him what the special occasion was. Occasion? He asked, clearly no one was being referred to already. Yeah, you let me sleep in, you didn't throw a bunch of late work at me yesterday, you haven't told me what I'll be working on today, and, and, you're still wearing your fuzzy robe and slippers, Mal said, pointing his fork at the accused apparel. So I am, Tamlin said, wrapping the robe tighter around himself in pretended indecency. 
And what's it to you, hmm? Have you decided comfort was your enemy at last? I think not. You're too paranoid, you know. Too cautious. Today is simply a comfy, relaxing sort of day. But why? he asked in paranoid caution. Perhaps it would be better to show you, Tamlin said as he stood up and gestured for Mal to follow. They climbed the stairs, rounding all the way to the third level into the grand double-doored entrance of Tamlin's study that was always locked, and which he disappeared into for hours at a time, and once for several days. And now, here, it unlocked with a snapping crick, and opened into a grand hall filled to the brim with strange gadgets and tools lining either side of the three large tables present, and books and cases that stretched from floor to ceiling, and artifacts enclosed within glass cases that stood just out of the way of any walking path. Even the light from the windows was put to purpose, shining through globes or being focused through a spectrum, all under the quaint view of the lake just over the mountainside. It was a room of marvels, and no other word would ever do it justice. I thought this was supposed to be a dancing hall, Mal murmured. It was. I remodeled it. Not as if I gather people to dance, after all, so I just put it to better use, Tamlin replied with a grin. What even is all this? Mal asked as he paced throughout the rows of odd shapes, adornments, and articles while tracing his fingers along the books on the shelf. My pride and joy. Specifically, it is where I keep all my items of interest, special gems I manage to unearth, items I repossess, or things my smugglers manage to find that they think I'll like. Most of the items here are magical, though there are a few mundane that I keep just for their rarity. And of course, I have an entire row dedicated to necromantic artifacts, strange tools from the past or other cultures. Most of the books here follow the same theme. As Tamlin spoke, Mal continued prancing all over the room, delighted, astonished. So many new things, so many things to discover, he wanted to start right away. What is this? he asked, leaving a smudge of his cheek on the glass case. That is the Ring of Lashar, named after the very queen it killed. It was gifted to her as a present by her consort, and when sufficiently warmed by the finger wearing it, emits a pin that pricks the finger and delivers a poison straight to the heart. And this? Mal asked about the pyramid standing upside down on its tip. I'm not sure, actually. It was an anomaly discovered in a ruined temple near some sunken islands. My men had to swim to get it. There doesn't seem to be anything odd about it except... And he walked over and spun it. If left to its own devices, it shall never stop spinning. Breaks the laws of physics, so they say. No idea how it really works. I took a half year of time to study it to see if I could replicate it for drill bits, but that never bore fruit, so here it stays. And this! What about this book? Mal called, running over to a very stuffed book behind a thick glass case. That is a spell book that hates me, Tamlin replied, laughing. What? Mal looked incredulous. I won it at an auction. Damn thing cost me more than this house. It was pitched as the ultimate book in spirit arts, though I don't have the disposition for that sort of magic. Particularly, it was special because it was said that the creator of the book sacrificed his own daughter to make it, and her soul is trapped within, without any of the natural pain of having your soul tied to this plane, or decay of consciousness that comes from having your soul remain here for an extended period of time. As it turns out, the pitch was absolutely true. The girl's soul inhabits it even now, and she has absolutely zero interest in showing me anything. All she wants is to play games and shows nothing but blank pages besides. I cannot blame her, but then again I didn't exactly buy it so I could have another kid prattling for attention. So here it stays as well, as a nice novelty. How can it teach you anything when the pages are blank? Mal asked, and Tamlin sighed. Because you talk to the spirit herself. The book is comprised of folded parchment that reveals nothing. You must ask her to show you, and so she does. If she does not wish to, she will not, and there's not much you can do to coax her. Even threatening to destroy the book entirely just causes it to clamp shut. Why are you threatening her? Mal shouted. Because she's my property and should listen better, Tamlin barked back. You can't own souls or bodies. I literally bought the damn thing. With money. There are still nations in the world who trade people as slaves. Are you saying they're just property like a pen or an instrument? Yes. Have you not been listening? I cannot 
believe that I have been raised, reared, brought up, fed by a megalomaniac who believes it is okay to buy people. I bought you from the circus, you idiot. If I didn't believe it was okay, you wouldn't be here. Fiend! Bastard! Tyrant! Why did you bring me here only to be reminded of my wretched enslavement? Is bringing me to your decadent parties and making me dance for the laughter of the guests not enough? Mal shouted as he put his wrist to his forehead, twirled thrice, and gently fell over a couch in a position that would be uncomfortable for anyone who did not spend twenty minutes stretching every day. Oh, get up, you drama queen. I brought you here because you don't even remember the date. Huh? You see what I mean? he said, turning back to the servant. How very much like a young man who spends so much time wrapped up in their own head that they can't even count the sunrises that lead to a wonderful day. Tamlin gestured to the servant, who came forward, holding a bundle of something, wrapped in black cloth. Careful, it might be heavy, he warned, and Mal took it gingerly. It was barely heavy. At first he expected it would be something akin to feathers, fabric, or parchment, but there was a shifting from within, a lack of structural integrity, and he tried to guess as to what it could be. "'Well, aren't you going to open it?' his master asked, sitting down on the couch with an arm propping up his chin. Mal went and laid the bundle down on the table, and noticing the clip on the side, opened it, and carefully rolled out the fabric to reveal a dozen separate throwing knives. Compact, thin, so thin he worried it might snap under too much pressure, easily hidden. Individually they were almost weightless, with only the barest hint of heft to tell him he was holding something, fitting comfortably between his thumb and forefinger. If its handle broke off, it could easily be mistaken for a large arrowhead. The thin edges were masterfully crafted, with the handle and blade together being barely as large as his hand itself. He took one and tossed it into the air to catch it again, incredibly quick, slicing through the air as if there were no resistance at all, so quiet he heard his own breathing over the sound of its flight. It was flawless. Do you like it? Tamlin asked. They were made just for you, down to the measurement of your fingers. I had to ask the tailor who made your gloves for that one so you didn't get suspicious. They were sourced from metal as far away from the ley lines as could be found so there's no chance of any anomaly or margin for error. They will always be as sharp as they are now, and will never need maintenance or mending. Some also have— And Tamlin brought Mal's attention to a select few knives under the rest. Two were nearly transparent, not any thinner, but more difficult for the eye to catch. In case you ever pulled a trick you didn't want someone to see, Tamlin said. Another two were made slightly differently, curved to an odd degree. These two will change their flight path mid-air in case you wanted to hit something behind cover. You'll need to practice quite a bit with them to get the hang of how they move, but it's a useful option to have. The last two odd ones out had a small section at the end of the hilt that could be pressed with the glide of a palm. Mal did so, and the knife dipped, revealing it attached to the hilt by wire. Just in case you need to yank it back from a place you can't reach, or maybe in case you miss. As if I would ever, Mal interrupted softly, teasing, and Tamlin nodded. Mal smiled, taking up a knife, then two, then three, and began juggling them. He asked for a fourth, and Amelia threw him one. He asked for another, and another, getting faster and faster, smiling wider and wider, until one by one he tossed them high enough that they might hit the ceiling before they fell straight back down, and he caught them, one between each finger, twirling his wrists, making a dance out of it, and as the very last was caught between his pinky and ring finger, he weaved from a spin into a deep bow, and both Tamlin and Amelia clapped with delight. "'Thank you, thank you, you are too kind, ladies and gentlemen, far too kind,' he recited in a booming voice that was meant to reach the very back of any row. "'Far too kind, for you are selling me too cheaply,' he shot, with sudden enthusiasm as he leapt onto the couch. "'For I tell you, O oh friends of mine, that there was nothing for the incredible Mal Malin, who scoffs in the face of any danger, who delights in risk, who lives to be your humble entertainer,' he said, tipping an imaginary cap. "'And to prove it, allow me to call upon one of you for my next stunt. "'Trust in your dear friend Mal Malin that no harm shall come to you, "'guaranteed, or we shall pay for your funeral,' he leered with a sinful smile. "'Oh, me, me, sir,' Amelia called, waving a handkerchief, "'as Tamlin watched, enchanted. 
Ah, what a brave young lady you are! Isn't she incredible, folks? Risking life and limb here tonight to assist me with my act. Uh, now tell me, who is your next of kin? He asked, and Amelia giggled as she tapped him on the nose. Well, that makes it so easy, he pipped. Isn't she a riot, folks? Now, darling, if you would be so kind as to stand... And then he stopped, looking to Tamlin for confirmation as to which parts of the room were, um, okay to scar. And Tamlin rolled his eyes as he pointed to the door. The door, if you please! And Amelia, dutifully, stood before it. Now, if you would please hold a per perfectly still. Uh, try not to move around, because uh, my glasses haven't come in yet. Amelia, dutiful as ever, did her best to stifle her snort of laughter. Mal tossed a knife up in the air, twirling along with it as it flew, and caught its descent between his thumb and forefinger before whipping it with a wide flick of the wrist and sending it gliding through the air, striking right next to Amelia's face with a soft split of the wood. Then another, and another, launching knife after knife like a bullet until her face, waist, and legs had knives on each side. Only then did she move to clap. How about that, eh? he called to anyone and everyone. Did that satisfy your excitable hearts? Fulfill your lust for daring and bravery? Well, I certainly hope not. No, no, that's enough for the rich and go-getter, those of weaker constitution than you, hardy folk, eh? No, I know what you need. Trust Malmalin to know that you need something stronger. It was simply too easy. Look how slender she is, how form-fitting her furtive figure. Was there a chance I could hit her? No, it was easy as could be to hit anywhere else. So let's up the ante. And then, calling to Amelia, uh, sweetheart, if you could just lift your hand like so and wave it at me as if saying hello. And she did so, waving at him cheerfully. Drum roll, please, he called to Tamlin, who started tapping the desk at rhythm while Mal plucked a knife from its wrapping, tossing it about behind his back, under his thigh, letting it fall and kicking the hilt like a hacky sack before he grabbed it and flung it as if it were a pebble on water. The blade sung through the air, landing with a delicate snap of the wood and Amelia's wave was cut short as her middle finger bumped against the flat of the blade, now notched into the door. Mal smiled with pride. Tamlin's eyebrows nearly shot off his head as he whistled in admiration. Even Amelia was so dazzled by the knife that seemed to appear from thin air between her fingers that she took a second to remember the play of the performance, and began clapping and cheering for Mal. That was incredible. I'm so glad I could be a part of your act, she said, coming up to hug him. I couldn't have done it without you, madame, he replied, taking her hand and leading her back to the seat. As the act finished, Hamlin rose and ruffled Mal's hair. I wouldn't doubt for an instant that people came far and wide just to see your act at the carnival. You're the best knife thrower I've ever seen. Mal beamed with joy before correcting. I'm the only knife thrower you've ever seen. That's not true. I saw a knife-throwing act when I was a young boy and the fair was in town. All the assistants he used for target practice told me he wasn't very good. Oh, dear, Mal snickered. After the excitement and nostalgia had died down, Mal collected the knives and tenderly placed them in their accompanying sheaths. Then he finally asked, Why did you get this for me? And Tamley nearly cuffed him in mock exasperation. Because it's your birthday, my boy. You've spent nigh half your life with me, and I suppose I wanted to get you an appropriate gift. Go ahead and imagine me saying something thought-provoking about never forgetting your roots, or the value of even the mundane or some such. Mal turned to examine the knives again, and admire just how brilliantly they gleamed, showing his reflection perfectly. What about the rest of this stuff? Hmm? You didn't really bring me up here just to give me a set of throwing knives, did you? Tamlin chuckled as he replied. No, I didn't. I brought you up because you're going to be doing experiments here. Experiments? Yes, like the ones you guess at all the time. The theories you want to put into practice, we can do them here, with the help of any artifacts that seem to catch your eye. But you never let me up here before. But now you're a necromancer proper, aren't you? You've earned your place as my equal, and as my equal, you will have full access to all that I do. Really? You mean it? Of course. And can we use this one over here? A cursed amulet? Sure, why not. And there? I'm not sure what a bust that screams when you touch it will do for you. But yeah, that too. And all these books, Mal said, spinning wide around in a grand circle. Each and every one. 
When would you like to start? Right now! He sighed as wearily as he could manage before coming back just as chipper. And we shall have her help, too. Servant, he called. Hmm? She answered. Go put a pot of tea on, too. We may be here for a while. Of course, Tamlin. And with that, she got up and slid right on past him, tapping Mal's nose once more before disappearing out the door and down the hall. She does make a good tea. What is it? He asked at a beaming protege. You just called her a she. Hush. Chapter 9 From here we may sail to the Isle of Drogon, then pull the boat inland to sail it up the river Sparks, until finally setting into the fishing port with ease, said the sailor. Um, wouldn't it be easier just to walk? asked the archivist. But if we walk, what was the point of bringing the boat? Page 167, line 1, from The Book of Small Wisdoms, by Monk Zahn. And so the work continued from seeding all the way to harvest, with experiments done as to the ability and nature of the artifacts in the shipping of all the benches, paper, clothes, and hardwood flooring needed to replace the damage. Amelia, bless her heart, spent all day fitting a drainage pipe into the low angle of the floor to carry out toxic water after the flooding incident, and the garbage men were paid off as to ask no questions what five hundred pounds of steak and flank were doing at the manor, or why they all suddenly, for no reason, as Tamlin described, went bad and needed to be carted away. Truly, in the whole of the time Mao spent pacing and testing and racking his brain, the most significant thing he learned is that he didn't do very well with this whole caution thing, and really he should try to come up with more to show for his efforts than how easily he can almost lose his hands and making a breakthrough about 50% of the time. But first, more tests. Mal and Tamlin walked along the city streets, enjoying the sunshine and the polite waves of strangers, with the younger carrying home delicate instruments of electricity and glass, and the elder talking about his upcoming duties and the rising tension of war that loomed on the horizon. If the war is going to happen, what will you do? I'll probably be called to fight, and will then go to do so, most likely. Can't you avoid it? I mean, you have the status, right? Tamlin laughed so hard he had to wipe mist from his eyes before he answered, Why, yes, yes, I do. But I want to go. I enjoy the fighting. Besides, the Duke will need me at his side. Don't you feel scared or concerned? Well, that depends. Am I scared of pain or death? No. Am I worried about the effects my death may have on the estate? Yes. Am I anxious over the horrors of war? Not particularly. Am I concerned as to the effects it might have on you? Absolutely. What do you mean the effects it might have on me? Am I going to be drafted? Ha <laughs> ha! No, no, heavens no. You're far too prestigious a family to worry about that. But when I say effects, I am more so referring to social and economic effects. People scared in the streets, things having to change due to rationing or supply trains being diverted, plays or libraries being closed. Friends being drafted. Is there anything I can do? You can volunteer to help from home if you wish. You could volunteer to fight alongside me if you truly wanted to. I will not refuse you. Young men should get used to bloodshed. N n no thanks, Tamlin chuckled. In the end, what you decide to do is in your hands alone. My course is already decided, and my course includes facilitating you to whatever ends you deem fit. Then what about the rest of your course? What will you do? Where will you go? To training, most likely. To oversee raw recruits or select men I wish to have in a battalion. If I can, I will wrangle in isolated assignments that I may use my necromancy without risk of scrutiny, as I did before. I will go, see, conquer, and be back when the enemy decides they've had enough, I suppose. But, but what if you get hurt? What if something happens to you? What if you get captured or something? What if the enemy comes here and you're too far away? What if... Slow down. Slow down. Good grief. You sound more like a parent than I do. It will be fine. Everything will be fine. Whatever shall be, shall be. I will put the fullest of my skills toward avoiding the worst and gaining the best, and anything else will be left to fortune. My luck tends to hold strong. Do not allow fears of the future to cloud your dreams in the now when the future hasn't even happened yet. If something terrible is going to happen, focus on it the moment it's happening. Anything sooner and you're just going through it twice. 
Mal did his best to be reassured, though by that measure he'd already gone through it thrice now. Do you think war is actually going to break out? As it stands, people are still hopeful that things will turn out okay, but the ambassadors are nervous, and the Riffian guardsmen are nervous, and the people can feel it. If the momentum is anything to go by, probably. Then why do you seem so calm? Well, mostly because a prospective general's first job is to be calm when everyone else is in disarray, but also because I know politics, and I know war. I'm not any more intimidated by them than I am by a business proposition. You know that's all it is, really. To a lesser mind, turmoil is a time of suffering and dread, while to the greater, any upheaval or disruption is only an opportunity, and it's just a matter of your wit and creativity on whether you see it and profit from it. I see. I'll be worried over your failing on your behalf, then, Mal teased, which was then quickly followed with a yowl of pain from getting bonked on the head. They continued walking, with Talon's coaching and Mal having to be dragged from window shopping, when crossing over the bridge, there was a soft murring. What was that? Hmm? A noise. We're in the city, Mal. You'll have to be more specific. A weird noise, he insisted, as he carefully set down his materials and darted around searching for the source. In reference to what? An old woman trying to relive her pie-eating contest glory days? No! And stop bullying Mrs. Mooney about that! I mean, like a very quiet engine revving. That is weird. I know! Mal searched nearby the wall separating the forest from the city proper, in the alleyways and in the bushes nearby, all while Tamlin waited, leaning on the bridge walls as he smoked, when he heard it too. Like that kind of noise? he asked. Hmm? Didn't you hear it? No. It's over here, then. Maybe in the canal. Oh, of course it's in the canal. Mal rolled up his trousers and dripped down to the maintenance outcropping to avoid the knee-deep water, that was usually described as shin-deep for anyone else, and traced his way through, listening for the noise. Hey, he called to Tamlin, pull me up if I call out, okay? You know, you should make these sorts of deals before you put yourself in a bad situation, not after. Mal was about to shout something back that was surely very witty, before he heard the noise again, softer this time. He shimmied over, and directly under the bridge, on the far side where a stone had fallen, lay a half-submerged, shivering, and distressed sheaf of newspaper. He couldn't reach it from where he stood, so he tried using a stick to lift the paper, only to have it hiss and swipe at the wood. He tried cooing, trying to calm the increasingly alarmed newspaper as he went to lift it again, only for a black clawed paw to pop out, catching the stick out of his hand completely, where it left a shallow cut on his pinky. Ow! Are you all right? Tamlin asked. Yeah, I'm fine. It's just a cat. A cat? A cat. It's down here all alone. It must have been making that noise. What's it doing down there? I don't know. It could have fallen in. It might be hurt. Is it? I don't know. It won't let me look at it. Well, if it wants to stay down there, let it stay. I can't. It probably thinks I'm going to hurt it. It's not its fault. It's not yours either. Let's go. I can't just leave it if it's hurt. If you try to save a thing that doesn't want to be saved, you're just going to end up with a hundred scratches and a cat in the exact same place as it was before. It does want to be saved. It just doesn't know what I'm trying to do. You're going to get rabies or something, I swear. Then help me! Absolutely not. Please, Mal said, moving into view just so he could bat his eyelashes. You're way better at this sort of thing than I am. Animals love you. I know, Tamlin admitted begrudgingly. And, and, if we take it home, I can practice my nursing. I could fix it up. So you can, Tamlin admitted, reluctantly. And, you know you're always telling me I ought to keep up with my mundane skills. So I do, Tamlin admitted, exasperatedly. Then please help. I'll be so grateful. I'll dive right into your finance books. I'll name the cat after you. All right, all right, fine. We'll bring it home. Yay, thank you. You're the best. So just wrap it your coat around it and let's go. Huh? Wrap your coat around the thing so it can't scratch you and bring it over. I can pull you up. But it'll scratch my coat. Yes, instead of you. That's the point. Let's go. And I'll have to wade through the water to get uh, close enough to it. Yes, so you will. Being a goody-goody takes sacrifice, so here we are. What's the hold-up? It's, it's just my, my clothes are really nice, is all. You can't be serious. 
It's made with nearly pure vicuna wool by Amaro Puracara all the way from Tawanti. Don't you know how rare this is? I'll have it mended. Let's go. It'll take months to so much as stitch it, and it'll never be the same. Oh, you are such a little... Mal heard before hearing a splash and a heavy oomph from Tamlin and the slow wading of a very grouchy man as he approached. Without the slightest pause, Tamlin walked right by Mal, slowly approaching the cat, meandered, looking this way and that, giving it lots of space, as he reached his limp hand out very slowly, letting the cat bring its face closer to sniff, before turning and scratching behind its ears. The cat let out a soft murr as Tamlin came closer, gently lifting the cat and cradling it in his arms, and Mal couldn't help but chortle. <laughs> you know, you're a lot like a cat yourself. Shut up. Okay. And so they got out of the canal and carried on, one carrying bags of oddities, stifling his laughter the entire way, and the other soaked up to his shins, shoes squishing with each step, with the sourest look one could sport while holding a fluffy, damp, yowling animal. Thank you so much, Tamlin. You really are a great guy. Shut up. Okay. After they got home, the task of bringing the cat up to Mal's room had begun. The Tamlin nearly dropped it the moment they got through the door, so eager to get his wet clothes off and into drier, comfortable clothes, leaving Mal to clutch the poor thing as far away from himself as he could for all its attempts to scratch him into ribbons. Would you like me to take that up for you? Amelia asked. Yes, please! Mal shouted, desperate to be heard over the hissing cat. With skill equal to Tamlin's, Amelia strode over, taking the cat from Mal's hands with ease as it nestled into her chest, growling and trying to purr at the same time. It's hurt. One of its legs is bent at an odd angle. It's not breathing properly. Do you want me to bring it to a veterinarian? You're right. And uh, no, no, no. I want to bring it here to care for it. Nurse it back to health myself. Very well, she replied, letting the cat rub its ears against her fingers. I'll deliver it to your room. I think it's she. Um, it sounds like a she. Anyway, I'll deliver her to your room and bring up some food and water for it. Would you like anything else? Thank you, and, uh, yes, please go to our library and get me all the books you can on veterinary advice and medicine. For the next few days, Mal studied simple medicine and first aid, creating a splint for the cat's leg, though Amelia had to be the one to tie it on, for the cat wouldn't let Mal do it, and trying to concoct potions and elixirs to revitalize it, which Amelia had to administer, because it bit Mal every time he tried. He also read many separate books on animal welfare, everything from husbandry to the new rave of paleontology. Through this, he learned that all cat species are obligate carnivores, as they cannot properly digest anything but meat, that vertically slitted pupils give a better depth of field to vertical spaces and is most effective when low to the ground, and that fossil records cannot properly describe how an animal looked, because soft tissues and feathers are unlikely to be preserved. All of which, while very interesting, did nothing to help the cat swipe at him any less. He did all he could, encouraging the cat to walk, setting up a string for her to play with, letting her drink cream, and even building a little nest of blankets for her to lay on next to his bed. His crowning moment was when he excitedly called to Talon and Amelia that the cat was walking, despite the hurt leg, exploring his room, and able to get down a single stair before he had to call Amelia to pick her up and bring her down to explore even more. The next morning, Mal awoke and began his routine of washing his face and reviewing his reading material, saying good morning to the sleeping cat, and taking full advantage of the opportunity, reaching down to scratch her ears and pet her in peace. Mal lay in bed a long time, taking the time to read and enjoy the soft fur. But as the minutes went by, it occurred to him just how strange it was that the cat wasn't swiping at all. He looked down, and saw the cat in the same position as it was in when he awoke. He pet her again, rougher this time, rocking her head from side to side. Nothing. She wasn't sleeping. Damn it. Talon was in the middle of cooking breakfast when he heard Mal slumping down to the kitchen. Finally, you're here. I was beginning to wonder if you're going on a diet or something. I was worried I'd have to eat it all myself. Tamlin, Mal called with a rickety voice. And when Tamlin turned to look, seeing the cat nestled peacefully in Mal's arms, without pitching a fit, he already knew. Mal approached closer to the table, holding the cat tighter. She let me pet her. That's how I found out. Isn't that funny? I'm sorry. I, I did everything I could. I know. She was getting better. She was. 
What happened? Something must have happened. I don't know. But she was getting better. I know. This isn't fair. I know. I was just trying to help. I know. Mal held firm, nearly rocking the cat's body back and forth, petting it as gently as he could when suddenly he perked up, eyes alight, energy and enthusiasm all in one. No, 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 no. It's okay. I can fix this. I'm, I'm a necromancer. I'm a real necromancer now. I can fix this. I can make it better. Tamlin, help. Please, please help. I can fix this. I know I can. I can make this work. It doesn't have to be for nothing. It can be a part of my practice, part of my studying. I can make her all better. Tamlin put off the half-cooked food for Amelia to finish as he followed Mal to the lab. Do you remember what I taught you in the catacombs? Yes. Do you remember the circle I set up? I think so. Here, he said, providing the stones. Try to mimic the process. Remember, the purpose is to bounce as much residual energy back into the circle as possible, so it isn't wasted. So where would you place the sigils? On the inside. Good. They were all placed properly, with Tamlin only coming over to make minor adjustments once Mal had sat in the center with the body. You want to make it as even as possible. Any deviation is suboptimal. Yes, if you do not have enough materials to make it completely even, make the circle tighter instead. Yes. Are you ready? Yes. Good. Focus. It was a similar feeling. Evidently, working with animals was not any different than working with a human. Unfortunately, this included the difficulty. There was a little more ease to it. One born of familiarity, both as Mal repeated the more traditional method of funneling energy through his aura and back into the corpse, and when he tried again with his own innovation of tying the beast's strings directly to his own. The feeling, too, was familiar. The sinking, the stillness, the cold, but it did not topple him this time. He lost focus when his thoughts wavered to whether this was over the size or makeup of an animal versus a human, or if it was just an improvement in his own skill. Focus. Use its body as the catalyst, he heard Tamlin repeat from somewhere far away, gently but firmly and his thoughts returned to the quiet once more. There was a lull, a sensation of taut muscle being allowed to relax, and it hit Mal like a fuzzy brick that he had forgotten to breathe. The exact moment he opened his eyes and inhaled, feeling his lungs expand, the cat too seemed to grow as if she were breathing, more vibrant, brighter, with fur a little more bristled than it was a moment before. And as he looked in her eyes and smiled, she looked at him and meowed right back. Amelia could hear the fast sprinting on the upper floors as she waited with the now cold food. She listened to the pace of steps running to and fro, back and forth, punctuated by a laugh or a quiet yelp. Soon the footsteps tumbled down the stairs, just ahead of a much smaller, gentler pitter-patter, as Mal and the cat descended through the doorway, with Mal playing keep-away and the cat desperately trying to catch him. Amelia noticed that the cat still retained its injuries. It was still running with a limp to its stride, though it did not seem bothered. Its shallow breathing had been remedied, though as Mal hid behind her and she scooped the cat up to prevent it from leaping upon his shoulders, she saw that it didn't have to breathe at all. You have managed to resurrect her, she said, as the cat met her eyes, unblinking. Yeah, isn't that great? Who needs a veterinarian anyway? He chided, reaching up to pet the cat, and for the first time, it did not swipe at him at all. I am happy for you. It is not every day that one can wash away their failings with such ease. And look, she lets you pet her so calmly now. This variant is a sure improvement over the old. Now, would you like me to reheat your food for you? She smiled, placing the cat gently in his arms. He did not quite smile back, though he tried. A actually, I don't think I'm very hungry. Thank you, though. Tell me when you are, and I will serve the leftovers, or make something delicious myself to celebrate. I'm so proud to see how your skills have grown. She smiled, placing her forehead against his, and his smile came much easier for it. Now it was Tamlin's turn to hop his way down the stairs, ignoring the tender moment as he sat at the table and interrupted, Forget leftovers for later, I'm hungry now. And you, he said, pointing to a slightly spooked Mal. Be sure to put the corpse outside when you're done fiddling with it. Beasts don't belong in the house. But she's dead! Which is all the more proof that necromancy can't fix everything, because it'll still shed all over the damn place. Out with it! And then, after taking a hearty bite of his toast and eggs, noted, Putting it out in the woods would be best. 
That way can stay nearby the garden if you want. Mal waited patiently for Tamlin to ask what exactly he was waiting for. A proper send-off. You help bring her back, too, was the answer. And somehow, through all the griping and groaning and rushing to scoop another couple mouthfuls of food from his plate and drink the rest of his tea, he did not seem all that upset for Mal to have asked. In a few minutes they were walking together, with Mal holding the cat and Tamlin still yawning away, walking down the long hall and out the back door into the grand terrace overlooking the garden. With one more firm scratch along its ears from Mal, and a tentative, much prodded pat from Tamlin, the cat was set down, stood for a few moments longer, and then meandered off somewhere down the steps, past the daisies, and in the direction of the tree line. Can you believe it? I did it! Mal proclaimed, puffing his chest out and smiling up at the cloudless sky as the cat ventured off into the wild. I saved him! It's going off to live a wonderful life! So it is. It's going to have fun in the forest, chasing butterflies, sleeping in the sun, doing whatever its cat instincts tell it. That's right. And nothing can harm it now. It won't be hurt anymore. It can't be hurt anymore. Mal stood for a few minutes longer, looking out long after she went out of sight. But it's not the same cat, is it? No. The cat, the one that swiped at me, isn't here anymore. She died last night. Yes. And she died hurt and tired and without understanding why. Probably. Just because you can fix something doesn't mean it'll be the same way as it was before. No. That's not fair. No, it isn't. Mal wiped his misty eyes and breathed deep, and when he was finished, he opened them wide, smiling and full of energy all over again. I guess that means I'll have to make it fair, and fix that too. <laughs> I suppose so, Tamlin agreed, squeezing his shoulder. Well, come on then, he declared, putting his fists on his hips and strutting back into the manor. If I am to make this world a fair place, I'm going to need your help to learn all that you know. I can't do it on my own. And Tamlin as pleased as ever at his son's rambunctious nature, laughed as he followed. Nothing would make me happier. Chapter 10 Strange for a wolf and a crow to be friends, mused the apprentice. The crow leads the wolf to his prey, and the wolf leaves the scraps for the crow. It is the strangest of fellows that have the most in common. Page 14, line 12, from The Book of Small Wisdoms, by Monk Zong. Over the next few days, Mal was back in the lab, looking over books for anything he could find on healing arts, necromancy spirits, and the nature of the body and the mind, but as he was flipping through the pages, he heard a rustling coming over from the spirit tome, the one Townland had mentioned before. It had not done that before, did it? No, surely not. It rustled again, this time while he was looking directly at it, so it clearly wanted his attention. But why? It wasn't planning to eat him, was it? It rustled a third time, and he figured that if it were capable of chomping his hands, it would have done so to Tamlin, who surely deserved it far more by now, and he approached with curiosity. Hello? he called, and it flitted again, causing Mal to jump back a little. Uh, can you hear me, or are you just moving at random? It ruffled its pages again. Well, that didn't help. Um, if you can understand me, swish your pages about in five seconds. Five? Four, three, two, it swished about in an eager sort of way. Hmm. So, either it was random, or it can understand him and is just a tad impatient, or has a poor grasp of time, which would make sense, considering it's a book. How are you? he asked, probing for a reaction. Its pages ruffled once more, coming down together in a soft flump. I'm so glad! Or, I'm sorry to hear that. I can't really understand what you're saying. I would come closer and check what's going on with you, but I don't know if you're just some cursed object trying to trick me into opening you so you can steal my soul or something. You're not one of those, are you? The book flapped its pages like someone trying to wave away an accusation, and he pondered this a little more. Could a book lie? A fiction books sometimes lie by dint of a character telling a falsehood, but that's because of a human author. Does a book have a human consciousness? Even if it's telling the truth, it might be wrong might have sucked out Tamlin's soul already, by accident even, which would explain a lot, really. But is a book even aware of what's written in it? It is a magic book, of course, supposedly. But what does that mean? 
Can it cast spells? Does it do tricks like flutter about? Well, I mean, obviously it can, but does that mean it's capable of more? What did Tamlin say about it? That's supposed to contain someone's soul? Is that someone tied to the book? Is that who's speaking to me now? Or is it the soul just empowering the book? What does it mean for something to be empowered with a human soul? Of course, things can be intentionally enchanted or naturally by the ley lines, but does that have the same kind of power as a human soul? It couldn't, otherwise you'd hear of all sorts of pranks mages make by the library shuffle about at the Wilmont School. But plus, Talon paid a great deal for this kind of rarity. It must be special indeed. It must be incredibly powerful. Oh, what great heights would such an artifact reach! He must know! He must know! And so, Mal chose to interpret all the books flapping about as a shocked, No, of course not, I'd never stolen a soul in my life. Which obviously meant it was safe. Perfect! He replied as he approached and lifted the glass casing around it and placed it aside, reaching to touch the book, but, ah, uh, chiding himself, he must be a bit more cautious than that. And he looked around for something to prop open the book with so he didn't have to touch it, settling on an enchanted cane that made you vomit if you held it for twenty seconds. Hello, it said in big, bold letters centered in the page. Hello? Hello. The words didn't change. Mal turned around, looking elsewhere for a few seconds or so before looking back. Still no change. Hmm. Is that you making the words appear? There seemed to be no physical movement, or even a sensation of writing. Instead, the hello just faded away, almost as if spilled ink had been dried up, before more appeared, seeming to just bleed onto the visible page, appearing in an ordered pattern that simply stated, Yes. Ah, oh, so you can adjust words on the page. Yes. The words didn't change. What else can you do? Who are you? Do you know where you are? Are you aware you're in a book? Or tied to a book? Do you remember anything outside of the book? Were you ever outside of the book? I saw you fluttering the pages before. Can you do more? Lift the whole book up? Like some kind of telepathic control? What are you there for? Is this a test? Are you like a genie? <laughs> he said as he barfed all over the floor, doubling over in nausea, and the book slammed shut in sudden response. Uh, he groaned, steadying himself on a bookshelf. What the hell? Why would you even have something like this? He barked before tossing the cane away and remembering that the book existed. He burst forward, running up to the book and taking it in both hands, lifting it from the pedestal and opening it to see what secrets it spilled to his questions. But the book remained blank. No, 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 we were just talking. We were just having a conversation. You were about to tell me everything. I want to know. I want to know. You could have snacked on me for lunch, maybe. Potentially. I sacrificed a lot to talk to you. You have to answer. About two minutes passed, and he had just begun to look closer, to poke and prod, trying to lift the pages to see if there was anything else that was needed to get a talking, before words appeared again of their own accord. Before reading them, however, Mal closed his eyes, and decided, in his own mind's eye, that reading the letters of the book stated in such a blank, monotone voice was likely not for the best, and so decided to imprint a more girly, jovial kind of voice to it instead, fitting whatever soul may be within the book. And so the pages read thusly, I don't know. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to make you sick. Please don't be mad. And he had just remembered that he might very well be talking to a real person, and he who would be stranger to them, after who knows how long of isolation remaining untouched. And he softened and wiped his face clean. Hey, it's all right. You didn't do anything wrong. It, it was the cane. It made me sick, not you. You don't like canes? No, no, um, they're fine. Um, well, this one in particular is pretty gaudy. If you're going for a gold or silver trim, it should be one or the other, never both. But poor fashion doesn't usually make me sick. No, the cane was just designed to do that. Why? <laughs> I don't know. See, it's okay not to know things. I'm sorry I barraged you before. I just get a bit excited sometimes, but it's only because I really want to talk with you. My name is Mal Malin, though that can be a bit of a mouthful, so my friends just call me Mal. You can too if you want to be friends. For a moment, the words remained, before fading, and were replaced with a big smiley face in lines so thick it seemed to be drawn with a paintbrush. I would like to be friends a lot. Hello, Mal. The ink changed, as if it was testing out a new word. My name is Kathy. 
My friends call me, and then it paused for a moment more. Kathy, it began again, as if shy. You can call me Kathy if you want to. I think I will, Mal said. It's a very pretty name. You should be proud of wearing it so well. Thank you, it read, and Mal smiled before remembering something and patted all over himself. What are you looking for? she asked as he fumbled about, finally finding a clip on the hem of his robe, but coming down like a ribbon that he quickly sliced off with a flick of his knife. This, he called, brandishing it happily. It's a little gift, something to cement the friendship, you know, so that as long as you have it, you know we're friends, he said, and gently placed it between her pages as if it were a bookmark. Plus it's fitting giving in your nature, I think. Ha <laughs> ha, little joke, because you're a book, in case you didn't get it. I caught it. Okay, I'm glad, he smiled. Is there anything you'd like to give me? Give you? Yeah, to cement the friendship, like a little exchange. The book, far from presenting anything breathtaking or noteworthy, really only crinkled near the edges of its pages, like someone scratching at their chin in bewilderment. If you can't think of anything right now, that's okay. We'll just come back to it later. Why did you want to talk with me? You seem to want me to come over. Your show was very good. My show? Yeah with the daggers. It was so cool. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much. Wait, you saw that? Mm-hmm. Can you show me again? Like, do more tricks for you? Yeah, if that's okay. Of course it's okay. I can do some for you right now if you want. Can you tell me where to stand so you see best? Anywhere. You can see the entire room? Yeah. How? I don't know. Is it some kind of magic, or is there a physical aspect to it? Is there a spell in the book itself that allows you to see? I don't know. Are you not the spirit in the book? I think so. <laughs> then shouldn't you know how it works? I don't know. I'm sorry. Never mind. And just like that, the book closed and ruffled no more. And just like that, he suddenly felt like an ass. Hey, no, it's okay. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to put you on the spot. Would you still like me to show you some tricks? The book was silent. Mal paced back and forth for a bit before taking three cylinders off a shelf and began to juggle them, frequently looking toward the book for a response. It seemed to be moved, imperceptibly, toward his direction, like someone trying to peek out of the corner of their eye without getting noticed. Mal put the casings down and decided to do a handstand next. Was the book open, slightly, like a child peeking around the corner? He flipped back onto his feet and thought back to what he would have found funny when he was a kid, and remembered a clown he knew whose shtick was to do the most mundane thing in the most inconvenient way possible, and it made his seven-year-old self laugh until his stomach hurt. And so, kicking off his shoes, he grabbed at the pot of tea nearby with his toes and carefully poured it into the teacup, complete with saying, A spot of tea, madame, in his funniest voice. There was a slight ruffle in the book and Mal knew she was paying close attention. He spun about, quickly removing his overcoat and wrapping it around his neck like a scarf. Don't mind if I do, he replied in the shrill tones of an old woman. He took the teacup and brought it up to his armpits, wearing a dissatisfied expression and scratching his head over what to do. Ah, but of course. He brought it up and placed the teacup square upon his head, balancing it steadily. Well, this didn't seem right. Hmm. He looked over to the book and found it had opened by just a few inches, just enough for him to see inside the page lining, and read the tiny scrawling of, You're supposed to put it in your mouth. He smiled brightly at the book and slapped his forehead to the sound of, Duh! as he removed the cup from its perch and, bringing it slowly up to his lips, pushed the cup past his mouth, over his shoulder, curling his arm around his neck, and, looking toward the cup, bent over to let gravity pull the tea, drop by drop, as close toward his mouth as he could before very carefully, haphazardly pouring it all over his mouth and nose, sputtering and making all sorts of distress as he let himself fall right over onto his back with a big wump. The ruffling from the book was enormous, clamoring, and for a moment Mal was worried it would knock itself from its pedestal. Then, when it was clear it wouldn't, he smiled, stood, and made all sorts of silly noises, honking, cawing, giving the best impressions he could, asking her, Did you see that? I totally toppled right over, like, hump, 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 hump. It got all in my nose. I'm going to have tea-flavored boogers for a week. The book rocked back and forth with the force of a hearty guffaw, and opened right up again, revealing yet more big, bold letters. I like you. 
You're funny. Thank you, he said. I like you, too. Can you show me more tricks? Yeah, I'd love to, but can you ask some questions, too? Okay, the book wrote, in what Mal imagined to be a very tentative hand. You can hear me just fine, right? Yeah. Does it sound like anything odd, like when I make this noise? And he blubbed like a fish. You sound silly. And what about my looks? What does the room look like to you? Misty? Misty how? Misty, like fog. Everywhere? Except you. Your mist is really clear. Everything else is harder to see. Can you see anyone else? No. What's the farthest you can see? This room. If I picked you up and carried you out, would you see more? Yeah. During my show, what else did you see? I saw the mean man, and a lady, but she was fuzzy, like the rest of the room. It looked strange when she moved. Mal laughed. I'm pretty sure the mean man is Tamlin. Does that name ring any bells? Yeah. He didn't want to play any games. He was always grouchy. Isn't he, though? You know he once lit my bed on fire because I ate someone else's cooking while he was away. So mean, the book printed, flapping about. And Mal just laughed. I hear that the book you're in is supposed to be a spell book. Do you know what that means? Yeah. It means people can use me to cast magic and stuff. Can they? Is that true? Yeah. But they don't want to play any games either. They only pretend to be friends so they can do magic, then put me away again. That must not feel very good, huh? No, I don't like it here. Here in this house, or in the book? The book. And Mal mused for a moment before asking, If I could put you in a human body some day, would you like that? Yeah. But to be able to do that, you may need to help me. Would you be okay with helping me? Yeah. And would you like to play lots of games, too? Yes. I'm so glad. I wonder if I put a checkerboard on you if you could move the pieces. I bet you could. I bet I could, yeah. Then we'll do it next time, I promise, he said, reaching out his hand before remembering she didn't really have a hand to shake back with, and gingerly took the corner of a page to lightly flap it. Eager as he was to learn more about spirit magic, Mal decided that it was better to fulfill his promise and give Kathy lots of time to talk and get to know each other better while they played games. She was probably quite bored from being a book all the time, and it would do her lots of good to be seen as a person rather than as an obstacle between the reader and the knowledge. Besides, Mal was always eager for another partner who didn't flip the board when they lost. It was only the next day that he asked about the contents of the book. I don't know was her usual reply. I don't really get this stuff. I don't know why it's here. The kind of people who read it know better than me. Hmm. I might be one of those people, you know. So can you show me the spells? Kathy closed, and Mal cursed that he might have overstepped, but in another moment she opened back up to reveal a sprawling page, filled with diagrams of the human body, equations, notions of philosophy mixed with logic and magic, the alchemical ingredients that were said to make a human soul. In a moment more the paper unfolded, falling and filling the glass box so that Mal had to rush and remove it lest anything be damaged, and the paper tumbled to the floor. More and more the paper spread all around the mantle, no word repeated, no space wasted, with depictions of the soul ranging from a golden man to strings of fate, to a mass of swirling black ink representing the nothingness of oblivion. All of it there, plain to see, metaphysics, categorized, quantified, as if human spirit could be deconstructed to its components. Mal was mesmerized. This is incredible! This, this is vast beyond belief! Is this all there is? No, there's way more. I just didn't know if you wanted it all at once. My gods, Mal muttered as he rifled through the pages unfolding like a scroll, for there to be even more than this. Mal paused, taking it all in, like a drowning man breaking the water to breathe. I've never seen so much knowledge so condensed before. E even in proper libraries and archives, the most information you get about a subject is spread across many writings and people, right? And, and that's information proper, things you're actually allowed to know, but this is forbidden. I couldn't imagine everything the Maker had to do to get all this information themselves. The head to contain it all must have been able to contain an ocean. They were a genius. There's no other word for it. Yeah, the book wrote on the single blank page in the center.
I mean, can you even imagine what they must have been like? The, the staggering intellect, the incredible prowess, what I wouldn't give just to talk with them. If there were more people of this caliber in the world, it would surely be a better place. Kathy did not reply. Not to mention the scale that would have gone into an infinitely expanding book. Is it infinite? I mean, the knowledge surely can't be, so the pages can't go on forever, I guess, but it's already damn near filling a fifth of the room. For there to be even more. And then he stopped. Kathy didn't seem to be listening, really. The book was closed as much as it could be, trying to lock itself back up, even while the pages crumpled and squished under its attempt, like a child trying to pour more and more blankets up to keep monsters at bay. And then Mal remembered. Ah, um, Kathy, sweetheart, can you remind me who made the book again? Who put you there? The pages parted just enough to answer. My dad? Oh, God's damn it. Stupid. He was so stupid. Hey, I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to... I, I don't know. It's all right, she said as the book parted a little more welcomingly. I know Dad was pretty smart, even if I didn't understand what he was doing. Did he ever tell you anything about the book? Yeah, he said it was the best thing ever. He told me that's why he wanted me here, to keep it safe. I see, Mal tried to smile. Do you wish he didn't put you in there? Yeah, it's lonely. I'm glad I can help, though. That's kind of you to say. You're a very brave girl, Kathy. I, I know I would have been cursing them all the way to the sightless lands the entire time. What's that? Hmm? The sightless lands. Oh, um, it's a, a, a bad place. You shouldn't tell people to go there. Oh, okay. Hey, can you show me a certain spell? What spell? I want to know if there is anything I can do to help something, uh, well, uh, live. I don't just want to have things die on me. I want to know if there's anything I can do to use my own spirit to empower another and keep them from dying. Is there anything like that in your book? The book closed for a moment, and a sound oddly similar to the sorting of files began. Does this help? The page said at the top, while all along the bottom were instructions for how to bind a spirit in place, to attach it to something so it cannot leave this realm, and Mal realized with a grimace that this was the very thing used to bind Kathy to the book. Uh, um, maybe. Thank you very much, sweetheart. Can you do me a favor and keep that page on standby for me, to open right back up to it when I need it? Okay. Thank you, he said, patting the book graciously before stopping and asking, Uh, can you feel that? Yeah, it's nice. I'm glad, he replied, continuing to pat the book and only feeling slightly less awkward about doing so. As he turned to go, the book lifted lightly to stamp back down onto the podium in an alarming thump, and Mal turned and asked, Yes? Is there something else? I have an idea, the book read, before closing again and spending a long time being closed. Surely it must have been something important, because every time Mal noticed the seconds going by and turned to go, the book lifted to stamp itself again like a young girl stamping her foot for attention. Finally, just as Mal began fiddling with the poisoned ring, the book opened back up, revealing a pristine, wonderfully pressed page complete with a semi-crude illustration. It seemed to be of a young lady, maybe ten or twelve years old, with coils in her hair and wearing a dress of make and design Mal did not quite recognize. A different time or place? Ah, he could ask later. The girl seemed to be holding hands with a short, fat boy of sixteen, with too wide a smile and mismatched eyes. But at least he was impeccably dressed. "'Is that you?' he asked, pointing to the girl. "'Yeah,' the ink read. "'And that,' he said, his finger gliding over to the, um, uh, rather stout lad, "'is you.' "'Wow!' he replied, with his most gracious smile that he tried his best to make not too wide. "'Because you wanted a present, remember?' You wanted to exchange gifts, but I couldn't give you anything, so I thought it might be nice to draw a picture. Mal's heart melted. You can tear it out to keep it with you if you want. That won't hurt you? I don't think so. Uh, then tell me if it does, okay? If it hurts even a little, you can just save the picture and keep it to show me when I feel bad, and it'll cheer me right up. Okay, it read, and Mal went over, placing his finger right at the top of the page, just preparing to tear it as carefully as possible before he stopped. Uh, would it be too much trouble to make a little adjustment? What kind? she asked. And so, 
Mal, as pleased as a peach at learning new knowledge, descended from the lab with a brand new drawing of his oh-so-incredibly tall, muscular, handsome self, and his now strangest friend tucked into his coat pocket. Tamlin, he called as he trundled down the stairs to the lounge. Yes? So working with death magic means you can also prevent it from happening, right? Presumably. Well, haven't you ever done it before? No, I've always had a medic on hand, so there was no need. Besides, my hands have never been apt for healing, he said before pointing his fingers like pistols and pow-powing them at Mal, who clutched his chest and fell with a foomf onto the chair. Tamlin snickered before continuing. Though I'm sure what you're talking about exists, we'll just have to find it. Oh, okay, good, because I was talking with Kathy upstairs. What? Did you sneak a girl into my house? Who the hell is Kathy? Oh, the book. Like, the book with the spirit in it. Uh, Kathy is the spirit. How did you get it to talk to you? She liked my show. The stunts with the knives. She wanted to see more tricks, so I showed her. Then we played some checkers, and all you had to do was jingle keys in front of it, and it would show you the writing. Yeah, you'd know that if you didn't mind losing. I don't lose. You cheat. I don't cheat, he lied. Yes, you do. Look, we're getting off track. The point is, I want to know if there's anything I can actually slow death. To remove it or keep it at bay so someone can be saved. Aside from a medical kit or an organ transplant, I assume. Tamlin! Fine, fine, fine. Jeez. Well, let's take a look. And so they trace down to the hidden rooms in the cellar together. How does the book talk to you, anyways? Ink appears on the page to write out what Kathy's saying. That's so dumb. You're dumb. How about this? Tamlin asked, emerging with a dusty-looking scroll that Mal was very careful to unravel. It was an odd thing. It detailed how a mage could use the very death energy caused by mortal wounds and disease to feed back into itself to cause a stasis, a cancer-killing cancer that could slow the corruption of disease or ward against organ failure from violent ruptures. It is imperfect, Tamlin noted as he waved Mal to his side as they ascended. It depends upon the energy you put into it, he continued. But you cannot stop death from occurring completely, because the very medium you use to cast this spell is the body of the person you're using it on. And if there is no death energy to use as a medium, there is no spell. At most, it allows you to keep the subject alive a little longer perhaps for medics to arrive or for them to be transported to safety. Thank you. I'm not sure if this is quite what I'm looking for, but it's still better to know it. Can you teach it to me later? I mean, if we ever come across another dying cat, preventing meat from rotting or flowers from withering will make a fine substitute. And yes, I can. Mal smiled, sucking an air and poking Tamlin in the ribs to emphasize what he was about to ask. But before he could, Tamlin sighed and lay his arm to rest on the young man's head. Yes, I can teach you right now. And what better time to show me you've been practicing your focus? Hop, hop, get to it, and don't disappoint me! Chapter 11 Was it worth it? asked the page. I don't know. The story hasn't ended yet, replied the poet. Page 1, line 1, from The Book of Small Wisdoms by Monk Zong. It was a week later that the ritual began, with Mal cutting off a piece of his own flesh, a spot of skin just on the wrist of the thumb, and having Amelia there to clean and bandage the wound. Then he moved everything else out of the immediate vicinity, placing them behind bookshelves, under tables, anywhere where they were clear of any accidents that could take place. "'What are you trying to do, exactly?' Amelia asked, even as she assisted him. Well, I am trying to see if I can stop someone from dying entirely, and if I can prevent death from reaching them in any way. But you already practiced that with Tamlin. The death ward is imperfect. You found that out yourself. Yes, but, he said before taking a breath to lift a treasure chest to scuttle it off into a corner, I was thinking that, if I could somehow combine the ward with Kathy's spell, the one in the book, a binding a spirit in place, he said, wiping his brow, then I could, theoretically, bind someone to their own body. Wouldn't that just result in a ghost that haunts their own corpse? Amelia asked. Under normal circumstances, probably. But if I bound their soul to their body and combined it so that their spirit could power the death ward, it would create a feedback loop where so long as the spirit inhabits the body, the body would remain alive, and the spirit will always then inhabit the body, you see? 
Now, it's not quite as glamorous as performing run-of-the-mill surgery, sure, and the subject would not quite go back to their former state of living, whatever, but hey, uh, having the option to live even with a severed head is better than no option, right? But no one has done such a thing, Mal. It is impossible to turn away death entirely. He considered this for a moment, looking up at the ceiling and tapping in his temple before coming down with a new inspiration. Then I will be the first. And how exactly do you plan to do that? she asked, watching with amusement. Well, when you cut off a piece of skin, like this, it dies, naturally. Uh, has no oxygen in the blood, no access to nutrients, nothing like that. I've been reading into biology lately, but that's not the point. The point is, if I can tie a bit of myself to the skin, the same way I tied myself to the corpse in the catacombs, and then facilitate the feedback loop of the death ward, then, when we look under a microscope, the whole bit of severed flesh should be doing wonderfully, thriving, even. Good to be placed right back on me at any time. And this maintains a soul or consciousness how? she teased. Baby steps! he replied. He began the ritual as he was taught, placing the pattern himself and the carvings opposite to each other, then sitting in the circle to meditate over the flesh. The warding was simple enough, if not a bit inelegant. It was just a matter of cycling back the death energy without a drop in momentum, with the intention of preservation. Hell, if he had an outside source like Amelia around, he even could get it close to perfect, though, as she pointed out during their lessons by lifting her veil, this was a rather impractical solution to save someone in the heat of the moment. Just as with the raw flanks and flowers he practiced with, the skin seemingly became calcified. It wasn't, of course. It only looked that way to him from his visualization, but it was proof that the spell was working. Then he began the binding with what he learned from the tome. This was much more difficult, an almost severing of the self. The feeling was familiar, similar, like an echo to what he felt before in tying himself to the dead, but this was leaving a piece of himself with the subject utterly, and was a much more taxing ordeal. Proven by the ritual failing, time and again, his focus breaking, and the skin and nerves atrophying before he could break off the trance enough to even realize. Damn it. After many hours, and an entirely nicked hand, he browsed through the artifacts he had at his disposal to see if he could mix and match any to encourage the effectiveness of the spell. He observed many, but there was one in particular that caught his eye. A dagger with the runic inscription of growth. The ritual would have to be put on hold as he tested it, first asking Tamlin about it, because he wasn't an idiot, whereupon he was informed that it seemed to be a ceremonial dagger from some heathen place where, instead of a sacrifice going as planned, a leyline mutation caused the metal to go awry, completely restoring the victim and causing an incident that led to three dead priests and a new, revitalized bandit chief. Runic magic can be powerful, but costly, Tamlin told him. Many take the creation myth of the dragon above as literal, and hope to imbue the mundane with the arcane by pouring sacrifices and blood into it until something interesting happens. Half the time it even works. Much murder has been done to create these artifacts, and almost as much murder done to gain them for ourselves. Be wary. This all sounded fascinating, and so the very next thing Mal did with it was stab himself. It didn't go as he hoped it would. But it also didn't go as it might, so it wasn't all bad. Wherever he cut or pierced, the wound seemed to close as fast as it was made and then some. At one point he left the dagger in his thigh for a full minute just to see if it would have any adverse effects upon its pulling out, but there was none and the wound closed so rapidly that it was as if there never was a wound at all. No scar tissue, either. Interesting. Next, he cut over his previous scar tissue, where he had scrapes on his knees and calluses on his hands, and they too healed in quick succession, without the scarring that was there before. His hand even felt better, much better, from where he had cut it before to get the samples. A complete cellular rejuvenation? Could this be enough to halt one's demise? There was only one way to find out, and it was waiting for him in the lab. The ritual was continued, with Amelia in attendance, and Mal sitting in the center next to the flayed flesh whose wound had been so expertly healed by this strange dagger. He sat in meditation for a long time, until he could feel the coolness of shade at the bottom of his jaw from where the sun was setting, his mind only disturbed by thoughts of how exactly he would apply this artifact once the time was right. Either way, he had to try. 
In a turtle slow effort of raising the dagger so as not to break his concentration, he brought it within the sphere of death energy surrounding the flesh. He could feel the energy, bits of it breaking off as he had trouble maintaining his focus, and even now doubted whether or not it would work as he stabbed the slab of skin with a knife. And waited. And waited. Nothing seemed to be changing. Was that a good thing? He couldn't tell. Was there a way to properly check? He opened one eye, then both, then shook himself out of his trance. Nothing changed. Oh, damn it. Well, that's disappointing. Maybe if... Wait. Hold on now. Mal looked closer, not daring to touch the skin. Nothing was changing. Nothing was changing. He called to Amelia, rushing her to get a microscope, get anything she could so he could take a closer look, and when he did so, he found the tissue still taut. The blood cells within were still moving. The nerves were still active. He had broken his concentration, broken his magic, and it still lived. It was a still-living piece of tissue. Self-contained preserved, alive. He looked up at her, and she down at him, and he smiled. He ran forward, nearly tripping over himself as he nuzzled his face into her, and she held him close as she whispered his name. Mal, Mal, Mal! And when he snapped from his revelry, she was pointing behind her, pointing at the flesh. Had it grown? It seemed a little bigger, wider from the center where the dagger embedded itself, he approached to take a closer look. It was bigger. It had to be. But that was impossible, wasn't it? It had no material from which to grow from. Even if it did, how would the cells know what to form into? No. It was absolutely growing bigger. Mal was watching it grow, even as his thoughts raced. He stamped on the skin and tried to yank the dagger from it, to no avail. It was stuck fast, like the skin was growing around it, absorbing it, and when he tried to back away to look for something to drive a wedge, he fell over, tripped, and his shoe stuck fast onto the flesh now growing over it. He opened his mouth to cry out, and she came before he uttered a word, quickly untying his shoe and yanking his leg free, leaving the shoe to be absorbed into the quickening mass. It was growing, and growing faster, consuming the dagger, oozing outward to cling upon everything it could reach. Mal cut the spell, disconnected as much as he could, and he went to try to contain it, clamping glass over it, only for the glass to shatter, then placing a box over it, only for the box to begin splitting. He commanded Amelia to run, to get Tamlin while he stayed, rushing to every corner of the room and clearing out as many artifacts and books as he could get his hands on. He rushed and dived and slid under the tables, even as the pulpy mass split open open from the box, even as it began covering what artifacts remained, even as Mal grabbed the last handful he could, complete with Kathy, and rushed them out the door, and as he ran back in for more, running to the far side of the room, he did not notice the fleshy mass that began to surround him. It blocked his exit path and spread thin so that he could not leap the gap, absorbing all organic material it could, as it slowly filled the room and made its way toward Mal. He was backed into a wall, surrounded as it approached to absorb him, consume him, and couldn't speak, seeing the eyes growing over and expanding flesh lurching toward him in gasping, quaking cries. It was trying to talk, trying to reform itself. And all it needed was a few more building blocks, a bit more variety. Eyes, teeth, bones, and a long, pulpy mass reached to grab his face. There was a frantic, stomping run up the stairs, and he heard the door slam open hard enough to shake the walls before the flesh's arm was incinerated in a blast of flame so close that it scorched the whiskers from his face. 
It reeled back, screeching, only to receive another blast, and another, and another, Tamlin taking long, streaming strides as he whipped the fire upwards and back and side to side, charring the creature. It tried to leap at him, to take him instead, and was blown away with a pressure that boiled its skin when it got within a foot. It tried to flee instead, to get away, and wherever it lurched he spread the fire, igniting everything until there was nowhere to run, and the creature was burned down to a pulp with the heat of a blast furnace. Tamlin stepped forward to the reduced form, surrounded by a circle of flame, and raised the lighter in his hand one last time to bring down the bolt that would end it. But nothing happened. Tamlin took one split second at his lighter to deduce the cause, and in that split second, like a fox waiting to die from a trap, the flesh darted, dodging the stomp of Tamlin's foot and squeezing through the bars of the drainage system, sinking down to the lower floors of the manor. The flesh was gone, dagger and all, and the only thing remaining was Tamlin's fury. The fire was everywhere slowly eating away the furniture and shelves while he caught his breath, and when he returned to focus he opened the lighter, flicking it once, twice, and giving it a rough shake. Empty. No fuel left. He sighed and hummed his word of power, and all the fire peeled away from the books and woodwork, wrapping itself into a coil before fleeing back within the lighter, as he ordered the servant to dispatch the knights to look for the thing and destroy it and she bowed and ran off to do so. Mal stood, silent except for his nervous chittering, as Tamlin turned and looked at him with such anger and a hatred that it made him shudder. There was nothing, no movement except the crisps of burnt remains crumbling to the ground like snow. No sound that could be heard over the muffle of ash that grayed the entire room. Before he finally asked, Are you hurt? Completely monotone. Unblinking. I'm sorry, were the only words Mal could muster. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm so sorry. I'll make it better. I'm sorry. That's not what I asked, Tamlin interrupted. Are you hurt? But Mal wasn't paying attention, as he tentatively approached, desperately scooping up the ashes of years' worth of knowledge. I'm so sorry. I can fix this. I'll work it off. I'll repay everything. Mal, I'll find the books myself. Find them again. Mal, you need to breathe. But even as he approached, fists raised, Mal kept on. I'll pick them up. I'll fix them, I swear. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. You need to shut up and tell me. Tamlin roared, grasping Mal roughly by the shoulders, shaking him before trying to still him. But Mal's trembling hands continued to bat his away, and he continued to cry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, I didn't mean it, please don't hate me, I'm so sorry. Mal, I, Mal, please, please. And as Tamlin kept trying to tear his coat from him, and Mal raised his hands to plead and defend against any blows, Tamlin finally stood and shouted at the top of his lungs, Mal, they're just books! There was silence in the room, echoing with enough power to disturb the ashes. They're just books! He repeated, taking one off the shelf and wringing it for all it was worth before whipping it against the wall, breaking the binding as the papers tattered to the floor. It's just paper! He yelled, opening another, ripping out pages haphazardly in a furious flurry before tossing them aside like waste. It's worthless! It's nothing! It's just ink on a page! He said as he curled his hand along a row of books on the shelf and ran his arm along it, toppling them all onto the ground. I can get more! He shouted, hurling more books, crumpling crisp pages to ash, stomping on the face of ancient volumes that littered the ground. I can buy more! I have money! I have diamonds and gems and people I know! I can get more! And he continued as he tossed more books, ripped out more pages, flung more volumes about with abandon. It doesn't matter how old or how rare they are. I can get more. I can get smugglers to steal them. I can pay any amount of money at any auction. I can dig to find them. I can write them out myself from memory if I have to. And here, only here, did he calm down enough to look at Mal, standing in the destruction he just wrought, with heavy chest and wet eyes. I can get more, 
They don't matter. Do you understand that? I can get more of them. In three quick strides, he was across the room, on one knee, in front of Mal, clutching at his arms tight enough to leave indents of his fingers. I only have one of you. You're all I have, and if I lose you, I can never get you back. Now please, please, he said, with sinking shoulders and vanished zeal, as Tamalin, Count of all Western Dunry, High Prosecutor in the Seat of Justice, Grand Sorcerer Tamalin of the Scorched Earth, begged for only the second time in his entire life, Please tell me you're okay. And even as Mal cried, and snot dripped from his nose the moment he nodded and told him, I'm okay, Tamlin yanked him into a deep, squeezing hug. And even as Tamlin felt warm tears against his cheek, Mal felt cold tears against his own. Oh, my boy, my brave boy, you're okay. I'm here now. I won't let anything happen to you. You're okay. It'll all be okay. Please don't cry. Please don't be upset. I'll make everything okay. I promise. For the first time in years, Tamlin picked Mal right up, pressing him deeper into the hug as if he were just a little boy all over again, and began to carefully step from the room. Can we have the special hot chocolate? Mal whimpered out, and Tamlin erupted into a fit of booming laughter. <laughs> yes, yes, of course we can, he assured, as he closed the door to the scene behind him, resolving to make Mal clean it up later. Am I grounded? asked the snotty young man on his shoulder. Oh, forever, Tamlin chuckled, flicking Mal's ear as he carted him all the way to his study to rest. Chapter 12 Oh, to lament the passing of time! and the passage of all good things, but in truth these passings are a necessity. The lament, then, is that we do not see the good for what they were, and enjoy the time we had. Page 154, line 14, from The Book of Small Wisdoms, by Monk Zon. A full moon had passed since the incident, with Mal recovering his nerves and being helped by Amelia to amend much of the damage, fitting for saving time since he wouldn't allow her to do anything at night except cuddle him to sleep. The burning had not done such extensive damage as first believed. For all the stupidity of the ritual, Mal was smart enough to save the rarer of the tomes and artifacts and limit the damage to mostly manufactured anomalies and paperbacks, though he pondered over whether or not this was, in fact, Tamlin ripping and tossing the books about himself that did more of the damage. He wasn't about to point that out, though feeling enough pangs of shame from the event as he did, which Tamlin took great delight in teasing him about. "'I can't believe you got my lab destroyed within a week of my showing it to you,' he said while making breakfast. "'I'm sorry! Why couldn't you have just got drunk and crash my car like a regular teenager?' "'I'm sorry!' Mal groaned, letting his head fall to the table and grumbling as Amelia patted his back. And how are your punishments coming along? He asked, serving up a fresh egg sandwich alongside a bowl of fruit. Ugh. Well, the lab is back in order. Mostly everything is put back in place, and, uh, at least you got a lot more space for new things? <laughs> Ow! He yelped as the spatula collided with his head. And? And, Mal continued, rubbing the sore spot on his head now, I've read through your volume on law and civility, and that book by that one philosopher, the one with the funny name, and your books on rhetoric. Both of them? All the way through? Yes, all the way through. And earlier you noted volume. There was a lack of a plural there. You haven't read any of the other ones. There are more? Oh, yes. Three more, to be precise. It's a very long series. Mal groaned as he let his head hit the table. And Tamlin smiled. And, he continued, there was something else you had to do, wasn't there? Yes, father dearest, I have it right here. Without looking up, he gestured to Amelia, who slapped a slim stack of papers onto the table. A complete essay on the value of politics and policy. How delightful, 
Tamlin said, taking it up and flipping the pages across his thumb like a pack of cards. You're going to be a fine player of chess one day if you keep up with your studies. I already know how to play chess, Mal puzzled. Oh, I know that, but you're not a player of chess yet. You'll understand what I mean when you get older. I don't even know why you want me to pass a bar exam now, never mind older. Because nobody who writes laws does so with the intent that they apply to everyone, Mal. Laws are there for those in favor to take advantage of, and ease through loopholes that trap the lesser, and those who have fallen out of such favor. It's far easier to write them, and far easier to take advantage of the loopholes, when you know the law, he barked with such volume that Mal eeped and scooted back before smirking at his protege. But, given the weight of the stack, it seems like you already do. Good job. Mal smiled. He was quite pleased with his work, though he didn't want to let that slip quite yet, and only narrowly watched from the corner of his eye as Tamlin lifted the paper to read it. Then Tamlin squinted, lifting it away from himself, then pulling it far too close before huffing and pulling out a pair of spectacles from his coat pocket to wear, and only now in being able to read it was he able to smile and compliment Mal for what indeed seemed like most excellent handiwork. But... Mal didn't really care about that anymore. Say, old-timer, uh, what did you really, really like to do when you were younger? What did you spend your free time on? Tamlin thought for a moment, straightening his goatee as he reminisced. Well, I used to gamble a lot. Just about every gambling house and three sisters knew my face. Though, usually gambling of a different sort. Doesn't matter! Let's go! Mal declared, racing around the table to grab his master by the collar and drag him to his feet. Ha <laughs> ha! You mean right now? Yes, right now. Hop to it and show me you still got some energy in those old bones. Dutifully, they went out and about, with only a quick pause while putting on their coats for Mal to run off and get something uh, very quickly. The gambling wasn't the poker or blackjack that Mal suspected, but were instead dog races, which Tamlin constantly kept VIP seats reserved for, where he could be as loud as he wanted, which was quite loud, with all the food and drink on hand that Mal could enjoy and all the privacy the servant could wish for as she waited in the back. To be honest, Mal didn't exactly see the appeal in watching the animals run. He could barely differentiate between them or understand why it was such an issue when one of them got ahead of another, but it made Tamlin leap forward, nearly doubling out of the viewing box with his chanting and excitement whenever the one he liked got ahead, so Mal cheered along with him anyways. It was during one of the quiet moments between setting up new racing dogs that Mal subtly gestured for Amelia to come over, and as she quietly paced forward and lent him her ear, he asked, "'So what do I talk about now?' "'Well,' she began, "'if your intent is to connect with Tamlin over his youth, why not ask about his best memories?' They smiled, giving each other a thumbs up before he turned and asked what Tamlin's favorite memory with the Duke was. "'Hmm, that's a good question.' It's hard to say, though, because it was probably something related to our campaigns, and that spanned a long stretch of time. Hmm. The conquest of Redstone Fort stands out, but that might just be because we were the first through the breach. It took days, weeks probably, to shell the damn thing to make it soft enough. Constant bombardment takes a toll, you know. Makes you sleep-deprived, makes you slip up. They never suspected we'd break in through the side walls, as if we'd shell ourselves, eh? But it was my calculations that assured we would be safe. My timings between reloads. Did you know I shot General Roan right through the head as he tried to pull his saber? Ha! Bastard fell, blinking in shock. Gods, we were young then. How long ago was that? And here Tamlin mumbled, trailing off as he let his eyes drift, wrapped in nostalgia. Damn. I was probably a bit too far back. Oh! Um, what about me? What's your happiest memory with me? And Tamlin snapped instantly out of his past to say, One time, within the first few days you lived in my home, where I took you in and fed you and clothed you and kept you from the cold, I was going out to a banquet and asked you how I looked, and you looked me straight in the eyes with your pale baby blues, and without any hesitation whatsoever, you called my goatee stupid. I even remember the exact date, the third day of waves, year 202, shattering, because I immediately left to write it down in my journal, so that just in case I got dementia or something, I could always look back and remember that you're a total brat. Amelia disguised her tee-heeing with a cough, 
which was very rude, because this was completely not a laughing matter. What about your children? You so rarely talk about them. Uh, tell me more. Tell me your fondest memories with them. Tamlin did not, in fact, tell Mal of his fondest memories with his children. But he only sat, with a slight bend to his spine and an unpleasant curl to his lip, and even the excitement of the races as the gun fired and the dogs ran did nothing to stir him. Oh, bad idea. Asking him was a no-good bad idea. Well, he said, slapping his knees as he stood, I think we've indulged me enough for a year more, don't you? Let's go home. I have work to do. Wait! Mal called, even as he followed to his master's side. Um, before we go, you might be hungry, right? How about we check out a new restaurant, one you've been meaning to try? That's a fine suggestion, my boy, but unfortunately, if their food sucks, you can even give a scathing critique, maybe even put them out of business, and then take me home and make something ten times better. And so they were on their way. Driving merrily through the streets as Tamlin raved about the value of proper brazing, Mal listened enraptured, and Amelia fiddled with the air conditioning. Most fools don't consider letting the meat sit in the hot liquid as cooking time, like putting food in the sink and considering it garbage. They turn the heat off and think it done. That's why you get overcooked meat that's so dry you'd think the mannish made a joke about it. If the broth is hot, it's cooking time. Remember that. Mal nodded, taking mental notes. Hmm. What new restaurants are there, anyways? Oh, well, um, one that opened up recently was this noodle shop. I saw it being propped up near the construction site. Some of the workers might have wanted a taste of home. I thought it might be a new thing to try. A noodle shop? Like spaghetti? Yeah, I think so. They put theirs in soup, though. I've heard it's super healthy, uh, full of vitamins and such, and, and good for your bones and your skin, and makes you younger. I've been wanting to try it for a while and uh, see how it was. Ha! Tamlin roared. Savages can't even get pasta right but I'm not sure if I'm in the mood for food that could kill me. And then, calling to the servant, Take the left up this turn. We can get to the steakhouse that way. But she did not take the left. She, in fact, went right on through the intersection toward the construction site, and only after did she cease her fiddling with the air conditioning and turn it off completely. I apologize, Tamlin. I did not hear your instructions. Do you wish me to make a turn? It seems there is nowhere ahead I can reroute. But once we get to the site, I can turn around if that is your wish. Tamlin scoffed with only a slight pinch of amusement, and Mal smiled with joy. You see, this proves we should eat there. It's fate. The gods wish you to. If the gods wished for anything, they'd barely be gods. You know, it's a shame that you don't actually believe in the Pantheon. They'd love you, heap rewards upon you, I'm sure. Hell, I bet you could even be acknowledged as a minor god of commerce if you were open to your own temple. Anyone who promises power through your submission is talking only about increasing their own. Never forget that. Why do you have to turn everything into a lecture? Because I am your teacher. If you are not learning something from me, I'm doing something wrong. What I'm learning right now is that you're a chatterbox. You're going to learn how to dodge my wallops in a minute, you little brat. Wait, no, I'm sorry. That's what I thought. Now do you want your noodles or not? Yes. Then take off your seatbelt. We're pulling in. The restaurant seemed a hole-in-the-wall-type place, made more so by the fact that they took a few seconds to gawk at Master Tamalin, and the fact that he entered at all. It was decorated in traditional Oriental style, though he couldn't discern whether it was to make the regulars feel more at home, or make the food tourists feel more exotic. If it was possible to make a caricature of your own homeland, they might well be trying. Oh, well. At least Mao seemed excited. The food had similar base ingredients, but the spices must have been shipped from elsewhere. Impressive to get such things all the way up the mountains. But the lightness must justify the shipping costs. It certainly must have justified the cost of the food. Not that he had to take more than a passing glance. The cost may be to deter strangers whilst they gave special deals to the regulars. These people always seemed to stay close-knit, which is exactly why they were so resistant to development of any sort. Perhaps if they adopted more modern standards and policies, they'd be able to do more with their food than water it down. Oh, well. The workers seemed polite, though they didn't speak much. Their nails were clean, so the food must be as well. And the preparation area took up half the space of the kitchen itself with room for multiple workers, so at least the food was fresh. They even knew the trick of putting a wooden spoon over a boiling pot to ensure it wouldn't boil over in the meantime. Perhaps it wouldn't be so bad. 
With Mal's insistence and a bit of time, a bowl of soup was placed in front of them both with... What... what was that? Was there linguine in the broth? What? The chef seemed to read his confusion, making the massive error in judgment that it must be because he was confused by the lack of cutlery, and amended this by placing two pencils in his hand. What? Wait, no, there was no lead at the end, there were sticks. They must be meant to grab the noodles, like salad tongs? Which seems strange, because surely most any other design would better serve that purpose. They couldn't be made for anything else, too unstable a design. But they were too unstable to grab the pasta even. What? Why would you put it in the water and make it harder to grab? What kind of sick power game was this where they made you struggle to eat? No wonder the whole of their race were so thin when it made it easier to just not eat the damn thing. <sighs> Mal, meanwhile, was having a fantastic time. He was scooping the noodles as best as he could, and where they failed, he just drank from the bowl outright. It was only after some very polite laughter and gentle nudging that one of the chefs showed him how to properly apply the sticks to the noodles, positioning them with a bit of finger dexterity and having them act like a pincer. This method seemed to work much easier with a bit of practice. Tamlin, meanwhile, just called for a fork and spoon. The soup was surprisingly flavorful. The broth was bold and intense. The noodles were a little bland. They certainly weren't made of wheat. Not that such noodles would be any better in the dish. It must have been rice, then. Impressive that they mailed it here, though. The meat was an expected beef. What wasn't expected was that it retained much of its moisture. The vegetables, too, sparse as they were, were only slightly limp and suited the flavor well. Hmm. Perhaps there was more value to these people's cuisine than he first... Wait, Mal was talking. What was he saying? Sure, has a noodle dish. Did you know that? No, I did not know, but I'm glad you told me. What else do you know? Oh, well, I once read that slurping was supposed to be polite in the Orient, to show that you're enjoying the food, but they didn't seem to care when I was doing it. Do you think it may have referred to a different place? Perhaps, though it wouldn't surprise me if they did. Yeah, it's super interesting what different places find polite and whatnot, like kissing on the cheek as a greeting or keeping your shoes on indoors. Why would they do that? I don't know. That's the cool part. And like here, it's super rude to just eat everything. You have to be polite and deny any extras and only take it when insisted, right? But apparently, eating lots is a big deal over there. I've heard they have a huge competitive eating scene. Even here, with the noodles, uh, people regularly gobble them up as fast as they can. I have trouble believing that. Tamlin said as he allowed yet another noodle to slip through the prongs of his fork and had to resort to twirling the noodles along his spoon to get them. It's true. It's a big test of manliness or something. I think. A bravado. Warrior spirit. Sounds like a way to get naive tourists to eat more of their food, if you ask me. <laughs> Maybe, Mal said, as he scooped some more noodles into his mouth and then began eyeing Tamlin with a challenging glare. He caught on quickly eyeing him back, more pleasantly confused than anything, and ate his noodles with a cautious enthusiasm, with Mal doing the same. Then Mal started eating them a bit quicker, and Tamlin followed suit. Mal noticed, and ate faster, and so did Tamlin. Mal started slurping them up, Tamlin started shoveling them, and the chefs began to quickly prepare more bowls. The pair ate as fast as they could, wolfing down their food, both eyeing the other to see how far along they were. Tamlin got a head start, finishing his bowl and demanding more, inhaling the piping hot soup with no issue, even while Mal had to blow to cool it. But as the match went on, Mal began to catch up, slurping the noodles with just as much intensity on his third bowl as his first, while his master got slower and slower. Until finally, Mal gulped down the last of the broth on his fourth bowl, placing it up to be counted, while Tamlin couldn't eat another bite of his third without horking. Mal was the victor, of course, as if there was ever any doubt. And he happily raised his fist and hooted in triumph, despite absolutely no worker or patron sharing his enthusiasm, and only matching Tamlin's current expression when he ordered chicken on a stick to go. So he said, mid-bite, as he and Tamlin waddled their way back to the car. Where do you want to go next? Um, maybe see some old war buddies of yours? Oh, or we could head to the art gallery. But this only caused the elder to huff air from his nose. Where next? How about home? I'm full of liquid and could use a laydown. But you can't, Mal cried, spraying chicken. I mean, there's still so much to do. Don't you want to show me what for in a sport you used to play, or show me how to hunt properly? 
The only sport I used to play was dueling, and you ran every time we sparred together. And the last time I tried to take you hunting, the horse wouldn't stop trying to buck you off the moment you clambered over its rear. Besides, I am still tired. Then, uh, uh, what else did you like to do? Something you liked that's also relaxing? At this, Tamlin huffed some more, with extra steam, but considered the question all the same as he looked toward the noonday sky. I like fishing. Good, great, excellent. Um, You liked it in your youth, too, right? Yes. Uh, very good. We can get Amelia to quickly gather some gear and head right up to the lake right now. I have no idea what blight's gotten into you to make you such a pain in the ass, but whatever it is, try to be a bit more productive with it and focus on something worthwhile, like you're studying rather than being a thorn in my side all day. Oh. Oh. Is... Is my sweet, kindly, honorable devotion to spending time with my dearest father bothering you? Is my insistence on getting you out and into the sunshine so you're not as pale as your whiskers an inconvenience? Or are you just being a little guampy guamp because you lost the eating contest? Oh, boo-hoo, look at me. I'm High Prosecutor Count Tablin, and I can't eat noodles. Is that what you're saying? I bet it is. I know what'll make you feel better. Why don't you spend the rest of the day with me, and then you can go home and complain about it in your diary, old man? For one more moment, they walked along with Mal happily munching away at his chicken, and in the next, a swift slap knocked the plate clean from Mal's hand, shooting it up past his head and dashing it all over the dusty ground, with only just enough time for him to utter a wailing cry as he watched the deliciously spiced chicken get covered in dirt. Wow, your hand did quite a slip there. You really ought to try to be less clumsy, dear boy, or at least hold your plate better than your tongue. Now get in the car. Within the hour, an unblemished servant, a very pleased sorcerer, and his grumpy apprentice went back to the manor to gather provisions before heading off to the mountainside path to the lake where fine bass could be caught. And within the next hour, a very displeased, sweaty sorcerer, along with his chipper apprentice and completely unfazed servant, had nearly reached the summit overlooking the town. Slow down, boy! Let me catch my second wind first! Tamlin called, letting the servant clear moss from a stone to make it an appropriate seat. But we're almost at the top, and that's already your fourth wind! I'll get a fifth wind to whack you if you don't slow your pace, he said, waving his jeweled cane threateningly, and then with more composure. Why not stop and look over some of the flora? It's different than what grows at the side, and you might find something interesting to bring back with us. Oh, a good idea! Amelia, please come help! And then, stopping to correct himself, Uh, I mean, if she's allowed, unless you need her to help you stand back up or something. How feeble do you take me for? You're about to see how fast I can stand and run at you if you keep that wit up. Uh, noted, that's permission. Amelia, please come help. And she, ever pleased, moved to do exactly that. Only after she rolled another cigarette and put it in Tamlin's mouth, and giving him plenty of time to look up at the slow, rolling clouds in the bright blue sky and the quaint town that seemed so far below. He rather enjoyed this place, though he would never admit that to anyone living in it. He enjoyed the fresh smell of the forest that blew in with the wind, and of how the sun looked cresting over the mountains. Most of all, he loved the time. Time to think and remember. Or, if only those two would stop their incessant chittering, he might be able to. What were they whispering about back there? Even still, it was not so bad, he supposed. Listening to the soft, almost husky whisper of the servant, and the excited, anticipated voice of his apprentice, it reminded him of times he fell asleep listening to the radio with him, hearing him cheer when some sports team or another won. Perhaps it was not so bad at all. It was Mal's calling that snapped him from it, and for a moment his instincts took hold, that perhaps something was wrong again, perhaps the flesh had returned, perhaps there was another assassin out for blood, but as Mal returned to show off the glassy stones he found, Tamlin forced himself to relax. All was well. He could let his knuckles breathe from their grip on his cane, and his teeth from the cigarette. That's very nice. You can bring them home, and I shall display them on— By the way— Mal broke in, 
taking a few moments to glance at the servant even as she urged him on, and Tamlin waited patiently as his apprentice took a few moments to rifle through his back pockets. Here, he finally said, holding out a silver tin of... What was that now? Tamlin took it, and opening the container was hit by the pungent smell of terribly strong tobacco. I didn't know what to get you, he heard Mal say as he examined the tin feeling the tobacco between his fingers. It's not like you don't have the money to get what you want, and you're pretty austere as is, so... Here the servant stepped forward, delicately taking hints of the tobacco, and placing it in an already arranged paper to be rolled and given back to the master, who took it, and lit it, and smiled. It was horrid. The taste was acrid and dust-ridden, and the smoke was so intense that it could have made his eyes water had he not the skill to resist it. Where did you order this from? I didn't. I grew it myself in the flower garden. I chose a back patch near the pansies because you always shake your fist at them and never get too close. Well, that explains that. Your botany leaves much to be desired, he smiled. <laughs> well, I tried my best. I don't smoke, so how was I supposed to know what would mix well? And I wanted to get it packaged and ready for your birthday. It's not my birthday. His smile grew. W what? Yes, it is. Your birthday is two months and a week after mine, because I remember you making a joke about how you were born under the full light of the Shattered Moon. The Shattered Moon can't be full, Mal. That's the joke. It's a month after yours. Then that means your birthday... Was on the day you burned down my archive, yes. Mal's face fell into his hands so hard it may as well have been a slap. But Tamlin smiled even still. Why didn't you tell me? Mal nice screeched at Amelia, even as she tilted her head and put her finger to her chin just so. You didn't ask, silly. And it just seemed awkward to tell you at the time. Tamlin was at risk of inhaling the cigarette from laughing so hard. My boy... <laughs> The greatest gift you could give me was not dying. Anything else is a special treat, including the effort you put into thinking of me. Thank you. I have been. I've been thinking of you lots lately. Appreciate it, you old coot. Tamlin chuckled, letting his head droop down and enjoying the smoke as best as he could. Hey, his apprentice broke in, as if the stones were only an excuse for the present, and the present was only an excuse for the talk. I'm sorry I upset you earlier, mentioning your kids and all. I didn't mean to bring up anything touchy. What are you talking about? Earlier, at the dog races, I asked about your happiest memories with your kids, and it just seemed to upset you. I'm sorry. You didn't upset me. Tamlin smiled kindly. Oh, okay. Well, I'm glad and all, but I saw the look on your face. You can't tell me you weren't upset. Being upset has nothing to do with it. It was just bad timing, that's all. Bad timing? Oh, God, did something happen? Did someone die? Tamlin could barely suppress his chuckles at Mal's concern. No, quite the opposite, actually. I got a letter this morning. My daughter, my youngest, she's given birth. Wanted me to know I'm a grandfather, and that I'm always invited to come and meet my grandchildren and how they'd love to know me. Oh, Oh, that's wonderful! That's so cute! I bet they would, too! When are you going to go visit? I'm not, Mal. That's the bitter part. There was no sorrow in Mal's face, but only confusion. A darting of his eyes around the trees and stream and the piecing together of information as to why this might be. If there was something forgotten, something the wind would tell him. Until he finally gave up. Why not? I don't know came the lulled reply, as he rested his chin on the jewel of his cane. Maybe it's just that too much time has passed. Maybe I just don't see the point. But you love being a dad. You've always loved telling people, no buts and bossing them around. Imagine all the swear words you could teach your grandkids. And at this, Tamlin threw back his head with laughter once more. You know you have a point. I do know a lot of those. And then the silence fell back on them all until the wind broke it again, and Tamlin spoke first. Why do you care so much, Mal? Do you want to butter me up, hmm? Placate me with happy thoughts? Stay near in case your brush with doom comes back to snatch you away? But Mal only shrugged. Maybe. I, maybe it's that, yeah, but I don't know. Maybe I just 
want to know because I love you and want to know you. Tamlin smiled warmly, embracing the feeling. I love being a parent. It's odd, because most wouldn't expect that out of me, but it's true. I hated being engaged, hated being married, hated the process of courting, hated everything leading up to it, and oh, don't get me started on the pregnancy. Best thing about being at war was I didn't need to be at home with a banshee, he chuckled. But I absolutely loved being a father. Hell, if you decide to go out on your own this very day, I probably would be keen to adopt again. Well, that makes me feel special, Mal grumbled. Don't worry, I love you all equally, his master teased. Why aren't they here, then? Your other kids, I mean. Well, because they've grown up. They've long since flown the coop and are out living their own lives and performing their own great deeds. Thomas, as I understand, is still a leading secretary at the Remian Guild. Margot has made quite a name for herself as a musician back in the Isles, and Catherine is a happy housewife. Why haven't they visited? Margot visited once when passing through. I had adopted you only recently, and I recall you being too nervous to talk to her one-on-one, -on -one, so you just stayed upstairs for the entire day. She found it very cute. But is that what you want? One visit in all these years? It just seems strange considering how much you love being a dad. You have a point, Tamlin nodded. My children and I are cordial, but cool. Thomas and I never got along, which I'm sure has some hidden meaning considering he's the most like me out of all of them. Margot took her own path quicker than most, and so most of my rearing was in tutelage and finances, though we still connect frequently over letters, and she sends me her music to play every time her orchestra performs a new song, and tickets to every major show, even if I couldn't possibly attend. Are those the tickets that are framed on your study wall? That's right. Catherine and I have a rather... complex relationship. She was always rather withdrawn... I frequently worried over whether or not I was spending too much time doting on Margot or Thomas, and would try to overcompensate and then to worry over whether or not I was neglecting them. He laughed again, but this time at himself. But even in all the time I tried to spend with her and encourage her, she never seemed to take, and eventually just got to me leaving her to her own devices until she eloped with a kindly and dull young man. As far as I know, they are still very much in love. I could not be happier for her. But then you're happy for each of them, then, aren't you? Even if you think things could have been better, it's not as if they're not great people now. And it's all because of you and your parenting, not despite it. So what is there to regret? Tamlin paused, thinking it over. I regret not taking more time for my children, I suppose. For I know each of them has some poor memory with me or idea of me that they're rather embarrassed about. I know I could have been better, that I made some mistakes only to overcorrect later. Thomas is the worst by far, frequently threatens to kill me in his letters, the rascal. What? Why? Tamlin shrugged. Because he is a fool who does not understand that there is no triumph in knowing an illusion more fully than others. The triumph is in breaking free of it. You'll understand what I mean when you meet him. But alas, our differences are just a result of conflicting worldview. Nothing to be done about that. And then suddenly... He came back to his usual snappy self, raising his cane and prodding Mal with it. Remember that lesson. For all the best a parent tries, it seems that there is nothing that can be done but for all children to grow flawed in their own way, either because of your own flaws or because of your attempts to ensure otherwise, like a bad prophecy. Even students such as yourself fall under this rule, so I want you to remember it when you teach apprentices of your own. Um... Thank you, Tamlin, but I think the other reason why children are so prone to disorders thrust upon them by their parents is, I suspect, mostly due to a lack of frame of reference. Say, for example, I am raised in a very chaotic environment that caused me a great deal of grief. To remedy this, when I am raising my child, I would raise them in a strictly ordered environment. Uh, Tamlin, I'm glad for the lesson, but don't interrupt me, boy. I'll lose my train of thought. Now, where was I? You were just telling me about your kids. Yes, raising kids, of course. Anyways... The problem arises because I am raising them in a certain way, not because it is the best, but as a reaction to my own experiences, ones they've never gone through. It would be like a veteran raising a child to best endure the horrors of war, only to find them maladjusted to a world of peace. 
Um, I guess that does make sense. This is why I think you ought to strike while the iron is hot and just accept that your children will be screwed up. And just try to do it in a way that makes them interesting, if nothing else. Just let them fist fight wolves or something. What do you think of that, eh? Is that what we should do next? He asked, goading his protege. I think you should visit your daughter, Mal smiled. Tamlin did not return it. How can you try to rebuild a relationship with someone you've only hurt? He asked, more to test his student than for himself. But you didn't hurt her. She's fine. You never did anything wrong as a dad, and now she's out there living a happy life. How could you have hurt her? We both know I get a great deal of my living off of hurting others, Mal. Do not pretend innocence for my sake. He smiled, with no change in his eyes. Maybe I let her down in some aspect, and she never told me what it might be. Or perhaps she just heard one too many times that her father was a heartless monster, and I did nothing to prove otherwise, he shrugged. I was always convinced she resented me, and so every time I tried to put pen to paper to write a letter, I just... clammed up. Can you believe that? Me, the one thing in the world I fear, and it's talking to my own daughter. No wonder my children have such a bad impression of me. He smiled again, barely, with great effort. Then today she sends me a letter, and I was so shocked I nearly dropped the thing the moment I opened it. It was a photograph of her, her husband, and her two boys still crooked in her arms, and a neatly written note. She told me about how she was happy, how her family was doing, what she had done with her life up to then, and hoped that I did not find it disappointing that she pursued nothing grander than motherhood. She wrote that she was going to tell her children about me, and how at bedtime she soothes their crying with stories of ponies to ride on the countryside, and pudding to eat before an open fire. She wrote me her newest address, and told me I was welcome to stay with her any time. And? And I can't bring myself to reply. Perhaps it is that too much time has passed. Perhaps that's just an excuse so that I don't have to face something potentially going wrong, like me being proven right, that I was a disappointing father. That's horrid! Mal burst, unable to contain himself, nearly shaking with emotion. You can't be doing that! You can't be letting your fears get the best of you! We have to visit! We have to go! Right now! Mal. But you can't just stay so estranged! You can't! It was difficult, having to explain things so beyond their years to someone so young, that they think it's as simple as picking up a phone or sending a telegram, as simple as fixing things as if they were never broken to begin with. If we stay estranged, if we never talk, then I will always have the memory of her in my head, just as it is now, with all the warmth I put on to it just as she does for me, might do for me. But if I go, maybe it won't be that way. Maybe I'll be right, and that image will be shattered forever. But maybe it won't be, Mal said, nearly dragging Tamlin to his feet with the grip on his coat. You could still have a relationship with her, or even your grandkids. You could still try. You should still try. Or just send a letter, at least. Tamlin smiled and now finally stood, stretching his back and looking up toward the sky, smiling as the birds passed overhead before looking back down at his apprentice and patting his head. I don't think so, Mal. But thank you. They continued their climb over the last few miles of trail at a slow, contemplative pace, with Mal taking whatever time he could to talk about the plants he had collected if only to distract himself from the nagging feeling inside. Thankfully, he didn't have to distract himself long. As soon as they crested the rim of the mountain valley, they saw the gorgeous crystalline lake waiting at the top, as blue as the sky it reflected, and with barely a ripple of water, so undisturbed by human habitation. Naturally, this was the private property of Master Tamalin, after all. Mal oohed and awed with delight, nearly tripping over himself as he ran down the path toward the lake, and his master sighed playfully, walking after him with the servant behind. 
The lake was calm and placid, right up until Mal stripped down to his boxers and leapt into it, with Tamlin having the servant lay out a mat underneath a tree for him to lay down on in the shade before she went off to attach the rod and reel at the end of the dock, letting the lure bob in the water, knowing full well all the fish were already scared off. There were some snaps of twigs and brambles, but every time Tamlin looked there never was an intruder, but only a deer, or a bird, or a stray cat that found its way too far from home while hunting a mouse. The cigarette became lighter, and Tamlin only realized when he looked down and found the ash on his thigh that it had burned out for some time. He hated being out of focus. Why did thinking have to suck so much? What are you doing over there? Mal called, splashing up to the surface. Come swim! Pyromancers and water do not mix, my boy. Are you really going to let a fat guy like me be more active than you? Not much of an argument when you just prove you need the activity more than I do, Tamlin laughed, idly tossing stones into the water. But you have to, Mal said, even as he came up to the shore. I don't have to do anything, you simpleton. That's the point of being powerful. Yes, you do. You have to do things like eat healthy and exercise, his apprentice declared, coming out of the water. And you have to show me how to hunt properly, and how to cook like you do, and how to garden better. And you have to show me more of what you did when you were a kid. And why have you been so pushy today? His master shot. What's gotten into you? But Mal didn't answer, and just carried on as if lost in the fantasy. And we can go to the snowy mountains and try skiing. You never have to even worry about the cold, and I want to see you surf. I bet you've never done it before. Mal, he called, in a little less than a roar. And, and, and then we can go up in a blimp, and you can pilot it with your own flame. Ha! Won't that be a sight? And you can take me to the university where you studied architecture and law and... Mal, he called, with a distinct hiss to draw the ear. And maybe we really can start that restaurant, you and I, and, and it can be called Tamlin and Sons, and we'll invite your kids, and, and, and... Mal, Tamlin near whispered, in a soft, kind voice that Mal only ever heard when he was about to say something very, very important. It's okay that I'm getting older. Mal stopped, considering this, looking up and left and up and down, with his eye and lip twitching as the thoughts connected in his head. No, it's not, he declared. It's unfair. It's always been unfair. How is it not fair? Tamlin asked, so very amused. Because so many people are out here with their parents who aren't walking around having to oil their joints, old man. You ought to have adopted me younger. Mal, when I was younger, you weren't even born. Which is exactly what makes it so unfair. Be because there's so much more for us to do, and, and, and that man almost shot you, and I almost lost you, and you almost lost me, and the days are passing so quick now, and it's already your birthday, and there's so much about you I don't know, and so much you know that I want to learn. You need to teach me more about necromancy. You need to, so I can keep you young forever, I so I can make you immortal. <sighs> At this, Tamlin only laughed, ruffling the young man's hair. You know that's impossible, Mal. Even if you paused biological function, undead can't cast magic, so can't exist independently of the necromancer. But I have to try, I have to, because it's like with the cat and it had so many days left and then it just didn't, and there are so many days left for you, and so many strange hot dogs we've never eaten, and so much music we haven't heard, and so many dreams we haven't discussed, and there's still so much you need to do, and so many things you need to be happier with, and, and, and you're still smoking, even now, even now you hurt yourself and you damage your lungs and it's like you want to be taken away and I don't understand. You gave me the tobacco, you numbskull. Yeah, but I didn't want to. It was just because there was nothing else, but I wanted you to be happy. I just... I just... And he stopped, fiddling with his fingers and doing his best to avoid eye contact while Tamlin sighed and flicked the rest of his cigarette away. Look at me, young man. Stand tall. Raise your chin. Be proud, always. There's something you should know. And Mal tried to follow as best as he could, even when his heart wasn't in it. Mal, life, he began before losing focus and gaining it back just in time to make it seem purposeful. Life isn't about chipping as much of it as you can off the hourglass. It isn't about eking away as many days as you can in safety and comfort so there's as much distance between you and the ground as possible. I've lived a long life, 
a very long life, longer than others who have lived to one hundred. My life has been built off of risks and dangers, just as we discussed before when you decided you wanted to be a necromancer. Do you remember that? Yeah. Good. I have not done everything I've wanted to do, and I regret that the most important things have not always been my priority. But despite that, I am still proud of my life, and I would do it all again. The smoking, the gambling, the waging war, all up to now, I would do it again rather than trade it for a thousand years, because life is about living how you want to live. That's what makes it meaningful. And you want to know how I know that? How? Because if I knew whether I die tomorrow or to live another fifty years, I would still be here with you, right now. I would have had this entire day with you, and I would still be talking to you like this, just as we are, because that's what makes my life meaningful. That's the life I want to live. Mal smiled, even through his quivering lips, and Tamlin smiled right back with the kindest eyes he ever could, right up until Mal barreled into him with a sopping wet hug, and Tamlin laughed and smiled even harder as he returned it. I'm still going to find a way to make you immortal, though, Mal said, sticking his tongue out. I look forward to it. They would have stayed that way far longer had the fishing rod not started bobbing up and down, and just as the servant moved to haul in the catch, Tamlin waved it away. Hey, there's a fish on the line. You want to reel it in with me? He asked, and Mal nodded. They walked over, with Tamlin guiding him to put one hand on the grip and have the other ready to reel. The fish was struggling, yanking away as much line as it could while Mal pulled at the rod and began to reel it in. Not yet, his master called. That can put too much pressure on the line. Just let the fish ride it out and let the rod do the work for you. Hold it up at an angle, the same angle you'd raise your hand to wave. Try to follow the fish with the tip of the rod as best as you can. But the fishing rod might break! It won't, I promise. It's able to bend that much. Take your time. This is a test of patience, not strength. Mal did as he was told, however nervously, and let the fish drag the line while he glanced between the rippling water and the bending rod. Do you feel it slowing down? That's the time to reel it in. No, no, no. Slow down, my boy. Keep it slow and even. You want to match pace with the fish. Mal did his best, constantly glancing back at Tamlin, who only smiled and nodded. You're doing great. Always keep up a little bit of pressure. If you slacken your pace, you might lose him. Finally, they could see the fish in the water, thrashing about as best as he could, and Mal got so distracted that Tamlin had to jostle him back to focus. Here, now, lift the rod higher. Higher, even higher toward the sun. But it won't break. Trust your instincts. Pull it higher, but don't yank it out of the water yet. Do you feel it slow its pace again? Lower the rod, slowly. Reel in as you do to tighten any slack. Mal couldn't tell which droplets falling from his head were from the lake water or his sweat. He tried his best, raising and lowering and reeling, step by step, repeating the process as the fish slowly rose to the surface, splashing so much that its body and tail would just break the water. The line was taut, the fish was pulling, the rod was bending, Amelia was probably cheering, and the moment the fish laxed its tugging, the master's sharp voice cracked out, Now! Mal tugged whipping the fish from the water in a grand splash, holding it aloft in the air as it struggled even still against the lure, trying to catch the bait. Woo! Excellent job, Mal, called Amelia as she came to inspect the fish. I knew you could do it, Tamlin winked, and Mal could only smile, holding the fish proudly so its scales gleamed in the afternoon sun. I knew we could do it, he corrected his master, who patted him on the head. Would you like to take a picture of your catch? Absolutely! Tamlin waved the servant to go get the bags and set up the camera as the two boys stood side by side, the very much taller one finally realizing he'd have to kneel down if he actually wanted to be in the picture, squatting and letting Mal hook an arm around his shoulders. The servant stood, setting the camera up on its tripod as she adjusted the frame to get as perfect a picture as she could before Tamlin finally called out to her. Amelia! There was a slight pause in the air as Mal took the time to be shocked, and Amelia took the time to think about whether or not he was actually referring to her, before finally deciding. Yes? Is there a timer on that thing? Yes. Then set it and come over here, he smiled, and Mal shook with giddiness. Another pause. 
Do you mean you wish for me to set the camera closer, time it, and then take a pic- Get over here, you daft thing, and take off your veil. Without wasting another moment, she set the timer for ten seconds and trotted over with delight in her step, placing herself directly next to Mal as she placed her head on his shoulder and waved at the camera. Mal, for his part, could not smile brighter if he tried. A family photo from a happy day. I'm proud of you, son, he heard his father say, right as the camera clicked and captured it all forever. The photo done, Amelia clapped with delight, planting a kiss on Mal's forehead and assuring him that she was proud of him too, before going off to place the camera back in its case. Now what do we do? Mal asked. Well now, you see that rock over there? Yeah. Okay, so you take that rock, put the fish on the ground, and bash its skull in. Mal took a moment to look at his master, then at the fish still trying to get back his meal. Back to his master, and back to the fish. Do we have to? Ugh. And so, with everything packed away and Mal dried off, the family made a slow, relaxed walk back down to the village proper, to the wonderful sound of birds chirping, and a freshly freed fish splashing in his lake, and the impending knowledge that Tamlin would soon discover the bunny ears that would appear over his head in the picture. Now, let's go get you some of those strange hot dogs we've never tried before, fat boy. Chapter 13 The glove planting season should not include the chill of Dark's winds. Yet it always can. How could you have known it would be now? Be kinder to yourself. Page 37, line 20, from The Book of Small Wisdoms, by Monk Zon. The day began with the pop and sizzle of food being sautéed over an open flame. How's the steak? Room temperature? Good. Throw it in the pan. Don't toss it directly from the fridge willy-nilly for the same reason you don't bite ice cream before drinking hot coffee. The muscles and nerves need time to relax. That's why you let it rest after taking it out of the pan, too. Understand? Yes. Uh, wait. What if the package says to cook the steak from frozen or something? Well, I'd ask why you were eating prison food. Noted. Mal scrambled between getting ingredients, whisking sauces, and making sure the food didn't burn, with Amelia gently taking over wherever he was not present, and Tamlin waiting at the table with keen eye. Is the second pan heated? Yes. Do you have the eggs? Yes, they're ready. Seasoned? Mal double-checked before replying. Yes. Good lad. Spices are synonymous with good for a reason. You season at every appropriate stage. Mal applied the spices accordingly, as best as he could, with Amelia making up the rest while Talon sorted through his morning mail, calling haphazardly, Feel free to add alcohol to meat or veggies to spice them up. Wine or liquor works well. Wh what, what if I'm serving to children or something? You don't have to worry about it. The alcohol itself burns away and leaves only the flavor, so you set them up for addiction without actually damaging their little brains. It's fine. Evil! Talon smiled. When do I add the... Powdered and dried spices tend to be better when added at the start of the cooking process. Gives it more time to infuse. But if it's fresh, it can be very sensitive to heat and pressure, and destroy the flavor. Best to add it at the end, like a garnish. Okay, thank you. Did you move the herbs? Mal called as he ran to and fro across the kitchen. Yes, they're by the window in the lounge now to follow the sun. Remember to treat them with the same tenderness as if you were rolling a cigar. I don't roll cigars. Well, do your best, he called as he scanned the mail. Everything all right? Mal asked between stirring the vegetables. No, but we will discuss it after breakfast. Oh, um, oh dear, okay. With only a little more time and a slightly destroyed pan, the dish was served to the hungry teacher, a steak au jus, served between a layer of butterly soft shire bread. Tamlin sampled and chewed and savored. Hmm. Atrocious seemed to be a bit light, but he couldn't think of a heavier word. When you cooked this, what was the temperature? It was supposed to be at a specific temperature? Tamlin's face collapsed into his hands. Thankfully, this was only the second most harrowing event to be had this morning, to be gotten through with a much dandier breakfast of late-caught fish. A different one, don't worry, the other fish is fine. With jelly on rolls, oh so sweetly prepared by the servant a mere hour before. Just in case. Um, would you like your plate to go to the compost? Please. And save those bones. That goes for all of them. Fish, pork, chicken, it doesn't matter. You know why? 
because you can make stalks and soups out of them? That's right. And a real necromancer doesn't let anything go to waste, he winked. Mm-hmm. Everything can be remade, reused. Straight from the text. Good job. And if you cannot find a use for something, then it is a failure of imagination, not application. That's my boy. I want you to work on that while I go save the Duke. Of course, I'll... Wait, what? Just your regular lessons. You said you wanted to discover immortality, so you ought to... Uh, no, the other thing. Oh, yes. Saving the Duke. He's probably about to be killed. What do you mean he's probably about to be killed? What's going on? Tamlin sighed, as if it were all so obvious that surely just his word ought to be good enough. Look here, he said, directing Mal's attention to the stack of letters assembled. This one I received the day before. Mal browsed through it. It seemed common enough. It was a letter from the Duke himself, asking Tamlin to be at the barracks in the capital in one month's time to prepare for any eventual conflict, with a far jollier vernacular than likely anyone had a right to be considering the subject matter. Yeah? And this one I received this morning. Well, it certainly was a letter. Same thick paper, same royal seal, same ink with a purplish hue. Even the jovial attitude was similar, all from the Duke asking if Tamlin would like to go on a boar hunt this evening. Okay? Ugh, his master sighed. How many times have I told you to be observant, to look where people do not put in the effort? What effort? Where do they not put it? He loves to hunt, right? And a tradition in the royal family to commemorate battle with one. That's true. And it has the royal seal. So it does. Mal didn't really know what to say further, so he simply gestured as one would to convince a bird that a sock that just fell on the floor wasn't its enemy. You foolish boy. Can't you see that these things would be done by a foe in order to try to trick the victim? As opposed to the actual duke who does the same thing? No imagination at all. Tamlin bemoaned, which only stung slightly less than the swat Mal received upside the head with the letter in question. Look here, he directed, placing the two letters side by side. Do you see the difference in the Ys? One droops lower than the other, and here, where the arch of the R crosses its back. Mal looked over the letters again closer this time, and found his master was right. One of the Ys at the top did droop lower, as did two R's, but that was it. I mean, it's only a few, right? Is that significant? Yes. Think of it as you would a signature. How much effort do you put into yours when you mark documents? I... a normal amount, I guess. Now you've got it. A normal amount. It's normal for signatures to have slight deviations, framed more so by force of habit than practice, but a forger will practice getting your signature exactly right, with as little deviation as possible so as not to appear suspicious. Look again. The only deviations in the handwriting is with the Y and the R, and then it never happens again. Like someone catching themselves and quickly trying to cover it up by overcompensating. But the Duke wouldn't care if his handwriting appeared different, because he wouldn't think as to why it would, you see. In looking at it again, Mal saw what he was getting at. In the former letter, the handwriting was gliding, as if the Duke were speaking the words aloud when he wrote them down. In the latter, it had the precision and median of someone practicing calligraphy, as if they held their wrist while writing to make the words fit perfectly. Even the gloss of the ink is different, continued his master. In the first letter it is all one sheen, written quickly and concisely, while in the second the sheen gets slightly brighter, newer, the lower you go, like the author had to stop and pick it back up for whatever reason. But can it be faked? It has the royal seal and everything. Yes, and so do I, Tamlin said. The Duke gave it to me himself, so I could expedite any policies and laws I so wished. He gave one to me, his closest friend, his confidant. So if another person had one, I would know about it. I would have been told. Which means either someone has gotten their hands on a royal seal, or has found a way to fabricate one perfectly. And neither is a good sign. But, but why? Why go through all that effort to copy a royal seal just to invite you to a hunt? That is why I suspect there may be foul play, something intended to lure me to the Duke so that he may be murdered and I may be pinned for the crime, taking away both the government's head and its economic powerhouse in one fell swoop before preparations for war. It may be intended to either weaken us off for the oncoming fight or entice us to form a truce in unfavorable conditions. Would they really go that far? You go as far as you must to stay in power. Mal sat back in his chair, 
mopping his brow and thinking hard about what this would mean for the conflict to come. And all the while, Tamlin too sat back, writing a quick and punctual letter. So what are you going to do? Why, I'm going to save him, of course. I'll arrange for an emergency train to take me to the capital direct, and I'm going to send a letter warning him of potential assassins. Why not just send the letter? Isn't it risky to go if that's what they want? Maybe. But if they find me slipping through the trap, they might just close it on the Duke regardless. If they have the opportunity to kill him, why waste it after all? And I'd rather see him alive. Besides, if this plot involves someone of high rank, or if select servants have been bribed, the letter may never reach him, but they wouldn't dare stop me from walking into the palace and telling him outright. But, but, but maybe it's not for him. Maybe they're trying to kill you. I mean, we don't know if the Duke got a similar letter. At this, Tamlin guffawed so much his hand shook, and he had to redo the line he was writing. Well, we don't know whether or not he received a similar letter because he's not here with us, now is he? And even if it's meant to draw us together for a prank or something, it still means someone has access to a royal seal, and that can do a lot of damage in the wrong hands, especially at such a critical time for efficient administration. It is my duty to my sovereign and to my friend that I inform him Furthermore, no foreign power will try to assassinate me on the cusp of war. My reputation isn't exactly Paragon. In the past, they always tried to simply bribe me at critical moments to abandon the Duke, or turn against him, and my will is such an entangling mess of paperwork that no turncoat party would benefit before the war was over, and the Duke is the only one who immediately benefits through access to my properties, and any high-ranking official would know it considering I made sure Her Majesty was entitled to some, for exactly that reason. They would just be shooting themselves in the foot by killing me. I'm worth more alive for the chance of being bribed alone. Oh, well, could you be? Talon stopped writing, looking at the ink drying itself on the page. No, I never would, any more than I would betray you or any of my children. Mal could have toppled right off his chair from how shocked he was, but he couldn't hide the twinge of pride he felt either. That's new. You're usually so eager to turn a profit. I had no idea there was an honest bone in your body. Even supposing it is honesty. Knowing you, there might be an ace up your sleeve as to why. No ace, Tamlin remarked as he began writing again. We've been friends since I used every penny I had to bribe my way into his dorm list at university and pummeled the man who was supposed to be his real roommate. He was the one who got me into cooking. We've gone to war together. Made fools of ourselves at Her Majesty's soiree together. He was in the room when my daughter was born, and held her right after my first wife. Just as I held his nieces and nephews. At this point, even if he lost everything, his title, his treasure, his status, all that would change is he would be living with us instead of at the palace. He smiled. I would not abandon him for all the money they could offer me. And certainly not while I have a bet to win he said, sticking his tongue out as he finally signed the letter and handed it to the servant. Then when will you be going? Right now. We move quickly to outfox our foes, don't we, boy? Yes, so we do. Uh, can I come with you? I want to be part of everything. All you two plan and see how you figure it out. You want to come with me even at your own peril? Of course. Someone's got to warn you when you're about to be shot, Mal teased. Hm. Come on, then. Our ride awaits. The situation was rather unorthodox. The train, being the easiest and fastest way through the mountain terrain and into the capital, ran on very precise scheduling for the sake of cargo and fuel. For anything short of emergencies, the train's daily trip was regular down to the second, and all one could do was wait to board. But this was Count Tamalin giving the order, and anything he so wished was an emergency indeed. The train set off with only a few minutes' delay behind the letter, with Amelia waving them off as usual. They were led quickly to their seats, given sherry and chocolate, and left to their privacy as Tamlin waved them away, and Mal read another pamphlet on the joys of botany. What bet, by the way? He finally asked about five minutes into getting bored. Hmm? With the Duke. You mentioned having a bet and not wanting to lose it. Did he bet you would eventually betray him or something? Ha <laughs> ha. No, nothing like that, he said, resting his cheek on his wrist. When we were still in university, the Duke, well, he never actually cared to be the Duke. It was an obligation and familial duty alone that pressed him into it. If it were his choice, he would be out gallivanting off to some old battle or another, or to face some tribe in the jungle, or explore some forgotten island. And so, to help ease him into the position, we made a promise, 
that the moment we were able, we would both retire and sail off somewhere with only a retinue of whatever salt men would be keen to join us, and whatever supplies we could carry on our back, and we would sail, and explore, and fight, and kill until we faced an enemy insurmountable, and die side by side. The bet, then, was to see which of us would have the glory of dying first, and my spirit would be too humiliated to pass on if I lost, he said, lolling his head back and forth with a cheeky grin. Oh, 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 that's so cute! You made a vow to die in each other's arms! I bet, no matter which of you were struck a fatal blow, the other would grab hold and you two would gaze longingly into each other's eyes, and he'd have to admit he didn't think he'd die without his first kiss, and you'd be all like, We can change that! And, yow! He yelped as a furiously blushing Tamlin whacked a spoon across his forehead. It, it isn't like that, you little whelp! What, you never heard of camaraderie before? You gotta stop watching those trashy plays, they rot your brain. But Mal simply mocked shock and surprise at his flustered master before giggling back into his book, becoming so absorbed into his learning that as the minutes flew by, he did not notice the light snowfall that began to descend outside the window, nor the ever-inching slow of the train. But Tamlin did. Stay sharp, young man. It was not so strange. Slight deviations of speed are common on such tracks, especially when rockfall or any damage must be watched out for, and caution takes precedence over speed. It was the circumstances alone that caused the paranoia, and when the train exited the mountain pass and sailed along the flat valley toward the capital, it would likely correct itself and be smooth sailing the rest of the way. Then the train suddenly halted, coming to a complete stop on the slope of a hill in the middle of nowhere halfway between the capital and halfway between the township. What's going on? I don't know. Is everything all right? I don't know. What are you going to do? Stay here. Tamlin left the carriage and approached the door to the driver's room and knocked, calling for them to open and explain the stop. There was no answer. Tamlin knocked harder, slamming his fist against the metal with reverberating force, and he heard someone jump. Someone was clearly inside, and just not answering. He ordered them to open the door under pain of imprisonment for defying direct order, but there was no reply, and only a slight scuttling. He backed up and kicked at the door only for the inward bend to straighten out and launch his foot back. He caught his balance, then took a firmer stance as he kicked it again with greater force, sending a pinging echo of metal bending against metal, but the door held fast. As he lined up for another kick, he noticed a car and uniformed guards pulling up beside the train, and backed up toward the window to examine them further. Were they there to help, or were they foes in disguise? They approached the doors calmly and without urgency, with an easy resolve in the leading man's face and nervous joviality to the man's idle chatter. Their uniforms were shapely, without being tailored, and neatly pressed without the sheen that indicates a just-made outfit. They knocked, of all things, on the door. They did not barge or demand or even open it themselves. Even being able to see Tamlin where he stood, they knocked and patiently waited as he approached to open it, hand only a blink away from his revolver. Good evening, Count Tamlin, the captain declared, giving a proper salute without looking him in the eye. So they knew proper protocol, then. Not foreigners. Perhaps traitors. "'I'm sorry we could not give you a more adequate warning as to this emergency pit stop,' he said, giving an embarrassed chuckle. "'But we are under direct orders. Rest assured that this will take as little of your time as possible, and we have brought along with us an entire cartful of delicacies and entertainment so that your weight is as comfortable as could be.' He stood, salute still in effect, standing firm and stiff, while his subordinates waited with as little heavy breathing as possible. You may look me in the eyes, soldier. Thank you, your lordship, the captain replied, standing at ease and gazing up at him without any of the slimy cowardice that comes with treachery, holding only the confidently anxious stare that comes with speaking to a man who could kill you without legal repercussions. If they were disguised villains, they made a mistake going into a career of thuggery rather than acting. Tamlin breathed, going over in his head what might be transpiring, what they represented, and what orders they were acting under, and, if time was of the essence, which questions were the most important to be asking first. "'Whose orders are you acting under?' he decided. 
I'm afraid we cannot say, your lordship. Also direct orders. So not the duke, then, Tamlin reasoned, and the officer's lip twitched shamefully. Perhaps this wasn't so bad. If they were bothering him, then the letter might have gotten through, and the duke would be warned either way. Believe me, it is no joy of mine to keep you busy. We were just expecting you a bit later, and so when we heard from the line that you were coming early, we had to scramble to make adequate preparations for your sake. Were it my choice, you'd be in a comfy office with lots of tea and biscuits and anything— And Tamlin raised a hand to silence him. Keep me busy. The train stopping was intentional, then, and you are not here to fix it, and only stall for time. I'm afraid so, your lordship, the officer replied. But thankfully I was allowed some luxuries to provide you should you ask for them. It shouldn't take two— Why keep me busy? Tamlin demanded, with a pulse rising and his snarl growing ever deeper, and the officer took a safe step back. You are keeping me here whilst I was racing to prevent any harm from coming to our fair duke, and with time so of the essence it is imperative he be warned and thoroughly guarded. It was not alarm, nor shock, that appeared upon the captain's face, but only confusion. My apologies, Count, but I'm afraid I do not see the cause for concern. That is because you are a fool who knows nothing. I have received a letter direct that I have reason to believe is forged, asking that he and I meet in the woods for a hunt, and if he received the same letter, then he may be at risk for an ambush. I was on my way to warn him, and if your handlers have ordered you to keep me waiting here, that means there may be nobody to stop him from walking into a trap. Again, the officer stood, taking a moment of time to look back at his troops, whereupon one of them shrugged as subtly as possible, before turning back to Tamlin and forcing a smile at the timid-looking young man peeking out from a corner behind him. I forgive me, your lordship, but you may have been misinformed. Her majesty has declared her intention to make a preliminary visit to the capital to meet with the duke by next morning. The entire palace is being scoured and prepared for her arrival, and the duke has been indisposed thereby. He couldn't leave even if he wanted to. What? Is this a new development that the assassins didn't plan for? Perhaps. It would explain him being made to wait, that they could vacate and flee rather than be found out. But why not just try to get them both separately, then? They were clearly capable of stopping the train and battling Tamlin, should they so wish. And surely there was a way they could isolate the Duke for a moment. If they put in all the work and effort into gaining the seal, taking hold of the train, why not pursue their aims as best as they could, even if this was unexpected? But what if they did know? How long has the royal seal been in their possession? How long could they have been confiscating mail? But that's preposterous. If they knew, why invite him up now? Why not wait? They would have known something were amiss the moment he and the Duke met up. Was getting the two together all that was required, or... Or perhaps it didn't matter, because the intention was never to have the lie be so thorough. That the point wasn't to get them together, but only to get Tamlin away. What were your exact orders, soldier? Only that we were to welcome you to the capital and an entourage you throughout the day, keeping you there. But with the train arriving early, we had an immediate revision, simply to stop it until we were relieved and allow it to continue. Why? I'm afraid I do not know, your lordship. A simple investigation was ordered, but it shouldn't take long, and in the meantime... He droned on, while Tamlin was lost in thought, putting everything together... An official order. Not from the Duke. A letter with his signature and seal, telling him to meet with him elsewhere, far away. But it was flawed. He noticed it wasn't his. He went out to warn him. It was a trick. A trap. Perhaps it was intentionally flawed. Perhaps he was supposed to notice. Supposed to be drawn out. And that is why it didn't matter if he noticed if the duke and he were together or not, if they were led to the woods or not, because the purpose was never to do any of those things, but only to get him from his home. Son of a bitch! Your orders are bunk! 
Tamlin roared, snapping the guards to attention. I do not care who gave them. They do not possess the authority to call for such an investigation. There is nothing to investigate. It is just a trick you have been drawn into. Now be gone! The moment he moved, one of the guards broke out of his trance and began unholstering his rifle. And as he did so, Tamlin drew his revolver, aiming it toward the young man in a hip shot, and cocked it. You are disobeying a direct order from the High Prosecutor, a crime worthy of imprisonment or death at my discretion. Now stand down, soldier, he roared while igniting the cigarette between his teeth, ready to spit a fireball in any direction. The soldiers had split up and taken a formation, but had not quite drawn their weapons, each terrified to be the first one to fall, and so they stood in a stalemate, with Tamlin growing ever more impatient. Wait! A voice chirped from the back. Wait, wait, don't shoot! Mal yelled as he ran forward. Stay back! Tamlin ordered, and Mal stepped back at an anxious pace. But he still called to the soldiers. Look, listen, you guys were called because he's under investigation, right? Official orders, right? But look, look, okay, look, Tamlin, the letter, the letter you received, show them, look, okay. So it's not a proper letter, all right? It's a forgery. Uh, tell them, Tamlin, like you told me, with the lines. What's the Duke's handwriting is usually like? Okay, so, okay, the Duke, he, Tamlin, Tamlin is being a good warden of law. He's, okay, the seal, the royal seal, the thing they use to seal, the, uh, the, the stampy thing, the thing with the wax and the, to tell you it's le real, legitimate, from the Duke or whoever it says they're from. The letters, okay, so, so, the letters, it's a flaw, forgery, it's no good, tampered, altered, and Tamlin, he's here to warn the Duke, trying, trying to warn the Duke when we got stopped, right? Which means someone stole the royal seal. Uh, bad news, bad business, uh, means people can lie, lie under the Duke's name. And why would they try to trick Tamlin into coming out? Because they're spies, spies and criminals. We're on the cusp of war, right? Aren't we? Yeah. So if they're here, they tricked you, tricked us. Um, we're here arguing when they're at Tamlin's house, looking for official documents, state secrets. Look, okay, if your orders were official, worth following, supposed to be followed, then why? Why would they need to fake the documents, yeah? Why would they need to fake the Duke's letters, right? If it was okay, supposed to be lawful, why do that? They're up to something. That's impossible, one of the guards shouted. The one who gave the command is beyond suspicion. And the High Prosecutor isn't? Think, man. War is brooding over the horizon. If even the High Prosecutor can be suspect, so can your master. Do you even know who's performing the investigation? At this remark, the guardsmen lowered their rifles, gazing at each other with worry as the captain reluctantly admitted. No. Exactly! It could be anyone! A trick! A ploy! So we gotta get back there, right? Any investigation into Tamlin can be made later. Right now, we need to make sure state secrets are secure. Look, any order you disobey now can be covered by Tamlin, right? And then looking at him. Right? And he nodded. See? You have nothing to lose. Everyone will understand, but if state secrets are stolen, you will have abetted spies in compromising the security of the nation, and also held the High Prosecutor himself at gunpoint. Listen to me, we need to go back now. And at this, the guardsmen all looked at each other, nodded, and looked to Tamlin for orders. And he pointed directly at the door leading to the driver's room, shouting, Open that damn door! The officers clanged at the door, demanding the conductor open it, but just as before, there was no answer. One by one, the officers tried knocking, making declarations, kicking just as Tamlin did, but it was only when the captain shoved them all out of the way and aimed his rifle at the bolt and shot did they manage to get it open. The captain marched in, only to find an anxious, twittling conductor huddled into the side of the room, shouting, Orders! Orders on high! I'm following orders! We all are! You can't touch me! Get out! and a shouting match ensued. It doesn't matter anyways, the conductor bellowed. We're stuck here. Train's not moving. Even if you try anything, the train can't just steam backwards. It can, actually, Mal shouted from behind everyone. What? It was asked almost unanimously. Yeah, I read it in that pamphlet on trains, he said, gleaming with a pride nobody cared about. The shouting match continued. Some guards began threatening legal action, with the captain trying to express his authority to command the conductor. Mal eventually forced his way through and tried appealing to the shivering man, telling him that it was for the good of all and they needed him to cooperate. But the arguing was only silenced when Tamlin stepped forward, raised his clenched fist, and swung it back against the conductor's jaw hard enough to topple him to the other side of the room. 
You listen to me, you sniveling little termite. You will start up this train. You will reverse it until we are back at the proper station. And then you will wait there on my command, or else I will kill you. Do you understand? And the conductor gave a weak nod, rubbing at his jaw. Good, then do it. The train steamed to life as it began rolling backwards, and everyone but Tamlin ran around like impatient chickens, wishing for the train to hurry along, and waiting as fast as they could. Only Tamlin seemed calm, eyes closed, in a trance, preparing for whatever was to come. Chapter 14 Rarely has there been a plan that survived first contact. So your plan should involve defeating your enemy before then. Page 14, line 7, from The Book of Small Wisdoms, by Monk Zong. As Amelia was in the midst of fulfilling her duty, she became aware of two things. One, that a group of militiamen and an oddly dressed team of seven were trying to break into the house. And two, that they probably weren't supposed to be there. Thinking on it, these kinds of shenanigans were probably related to why Tamlin had left to begin with, so she decided it would be best to get a better vantage point by going to the upper floors and looking at them down through the window. They appeared to be arguing about the front door, with some gesturing violently while others urged calm. While they did this, others walked around the exterior of the house, seemingly to look for any windows they could crawl into. Amelia considered what kind of weaponry could be found throughout the house, and whether or not it would be prudent to unload upon them from above but she wasn't aware of their powers, or what skills they had hidden away. So perhaps it would be unwise to ambush them when she were so outnumbered. Not to mention, were she to be captured, it would put Tamlin in a compromising position. So best not. She then considered waiting within the house for them, in order to lead them through the many traps that acted as a proper security system, but that depended on them following her the entire way, and not stopping to loot or investigate any number of things that could lead to a disastrous discovery. It would be best if they were not in the house at all. She was just in the midst of wheeling a cannon toward the front hallway when she heard the horn of the train sounding off. Tamlin was returning, surely. If the train were making so many regular stomps on his account, then he would likely be aware and would wish for the car. So she would provide. Besides, even if he weren't aware and was just returning to give her a hug or something, she really ought to inform him of the intruders regardless. She quickly put on her veil and snuck out a secret entrance near the back of the house, racing around the garden and leaping just behind the forest line like a deer to the long way around toward the front of the mansion, where she stealthily got into the car, locked it, and then very unstealthily started it up and began driving away as a herd of militiamen chased after her. They did not catch her. Tamlin arrived back at the station with him and the guardsmen and Mal all pouring from the door right as Amelia screeched the car to a halt at its steps, and it is lucky for the entirety of the station staff that he was in a hurry, for he had no concern to imprison them for their perceived betrayal. Report, he called in the tone of a general giving an order as the servant approached. A pack of militiamen and constables from the township tried to enter the mansion while you were away. I am unsure if they were bribed or are acting under orders, but they seem to be subordinate to a group of seven, distinct from any uniformed official. They are likely to be mercenaries, and likely a long-standing team. Their threat level and objective are unknown, as is how they might react to your return. All the while, Mal chirped in between them. What's going on? What's happening? Stay here, he told him. Stay out of this business and don't return to the house until I come for you myself, do you understand? And Mal nodded. As Amelia walked with Tamlin to the car, he asked her, Are you still armed? And she nodded. Good. Stay out of this and stay here out of harm's way until I come for you both. Make sure Mal stays safe. Before turning to the guardsmen and calling, The rest of you, with me! And the seats of the car were filled with them, as two hung onto the sides as they drove in a fury all the way back to the mansion. What do you think's going to happen? Mal called, biting his fingernails. Something violent, replied Amelia placid as ever. The car raced down the street until it got to the mansion, where the militiamen came out to meet it, weapons ready, and the guardsmen hopped off and came out of the car with their guns drawn, both screaming for the other group to drop their weaponry. All the while, Tamlin coolly exited and headed toward the house. Within the mansion, the group argued amongst themselves, 
having taken so much time to disarm the traps that they only had the barest time to look around before the commotion outside started, and they knew things weren't going very well. They had no idea just how badly it was about to go when Tamlin entered the house. He stepped firmly, the hard tread of his shoes and the clink of his cane against marble catching the attention of the entire group. Within two dozen paces of their point man, he stopped, looking. There were four in front of him, two of which were caught mid-conversation, and two more investigating corridors to ensure nothing would take off their heads. Two more were heard on the balcony to the upper right, though he could only see one. Typical ambush tactics. The one he could see seemed the strangest. He had no weapons or armor at all, but only wrappings over his hands and feet. A pugilist. And he must be a damned good one, too, if he were willing to forsake basic defenses. While the one on the left balcony wielded a veritable bandolier of flintlock pistols. How crude. Each of them looked different. A lack of uniformity, each having a specialization, common in mercenary bands but the scars on their bodies and scuffs from where they drew their weapons showed that they were not playing pretend. They were professional. Even now, in exploring his home, they were arranged in a semi-combat stance, each one having a different vantage point over the hall, ensuring none could be taken by surprise, and that whatever he attacked first, another could take advantage of the drop in his guard. So they were sought, bought, and hired for this specific job whether due to recommendation, experience, or skill, they were each a one to be considered, and a group together to be reckoned with. But that was no matter. They would burn all the same. What in the blinded lands are you doing in my house? Tamlin snarled. Oh, so this is your house? Well, that's very interesting, ain't it? jibed the one behind the point man, lighter armor, rapier. He would try to strike while Tamlin was distracted, and fail. Because if this is your house, that means there's a lot of things you gotta answer for. Shut up, Tamlin commanded. Who told you that you were allowed to be here, and what exactly are you seeking out? The first among you who speaks will be spared. This was odd. The gang looked at each other warily. This wasn't how it was supposed to go. If he did something bad, then why wasn't this guy worried, afraid? That bluff should have caught him off guard, made him open to negotiating something. But he wasn't. He was just angry. I think you may be overestimating your position, Master. Uh, Tamalin, was it? Called the second man on the balcony, the one with the stupid-looking glasses, as he came around down the stairs. Anyways, there's no need to bluff any more, Max, for I believe your councilman would be extremely interested in exactly what we found tucked away from prying eyes. It seems, in fact, that there were some very interesting materials around your house, and some books accompanying them. Not that he could get any of the books open, mind. But this villain didn't need to know that. And it seems, just upstairs, that there was a fire that recently overtook your lab. I wonder what exactly it was that you were trying to burn and get rid of with such finality. But all things considered, I think we're right to have our suspicions, so maybe we can come to an agreement, hmm? Tamlin's face remained unchanged. Maybe we ought to just take him out here, spoke the spear-wielder in the blue jacket. I get the feel he's up to no good. He smiled. This was the way. Confident, secure, no slang or hiding, but an approach, a gaze from up high on downward, arms folded. This was how you bluffed properly. Tamlin scoffed. Of course it wasn't. Briefed well enough to have a basic overview of who he was, and absolutely no idea of who he was. But councilman, that's good. They were getting somewhere, assuming he wasn't trying to fake him out over who the orders came from, but these eels did not look as foreigners. What does it matter what you've found if I'm just going to kill you? Suddenly, the man wearing the glasses wasn't so relaxed anymore. He stood up, rigid. This wasn't what they thought would happen, and could turn bad very, very quickly if they weren't careful. Who cares what we found? One of them shouted from the rear. He wasn't supposed to be back! Deal's off! Let's go! 
As they argued back and forth, Tamlin was deep in thought. So there was a deal. They were here to find something. Had he been found out? His practices come to light? Surely not. Otherwise, they would have mentioned it. Then what were they after? He was just on the verge of taking advantage of their indecision and seeing if his quick draw was still good, when the trampling of boots and shadows stretched out in his peripheral vision told him that the militiamen outside had resolved their shouting. A shame. He had hoped they would kill each other and be done with it. They were silent, and didn't draw on Tamlin's attention, which was not a good sign, and likely meant that the train guards were turncoats now and he'd just have to slay them all. No bother. Even as he saw their shadows try as silently as they could to ready their rifles and aim, presumably at him, the fools didn't adjust to keep the mercenaries out of their crossfire. They would be likely to hold him captive while the hero searched and hoped the threat of firing if he moved would be enough to restrain him. But all he'd need to do was dodge, and the two mercenaries in front of him would be peppered with bullets, and he could most certainly use the opportunity to slay a third, along with the guardsmen while they tried to reload, nullifying the threat almost completely. He sighed, bored, tempted to check his watch, but resisted the urge as he saw the shadows kneel down to steady themselves. Focus. It was lamentable, almost too easy, and he wondered if the rest would at least be entertaining while they died. He keened his ears, hearing the hammer click back, almost ready. Your lordship, perhaps this could be resolved if you were reasonable and just... He heard the captain say. He breathed in to turn and tighten his muscles to leap. And then, from a crevice hidden on the upper floor, from a secret entrance he knew could be accessed through the garden, he heard the high-pitched, terrified voice of a young man absolutely not supposed to be there, shouting, Tamlin, behind you! And the far too thin looking archer on the right balcony turned, knocking her arrow in an instant, and aimed it at his protege. Damn it. Chapter 15. Learn well what you are taught, so that you never have to learn it again. Page 4, line 22 from The Book of Small Wisdoms by Monk Zon. The moment Tamlin left the station and sped out of the sight toward the mansion, Mal was being barraged by questions from everyone who could so much as ask, whether Count Tamlin was actually a traitor, whether the rumors of him selling state secrets were true, if he planned on slaying the Duke, why he was under investigation at all, and as the crowd pressed in for answers, Mal stepped back, lip twitching, eyes darting, under the pressure of the ever-roaring horde backing him in, in a roar that only quieted as Amelia stepped in front of him, shielding him from the group, and telling them all, very calmly, with a tenderness and love long characteristic to her voice and the cock of a very heavy revolver, that if they did not leave Mal alone, she would shoot them. Only then did they disperse. Thank you, Mal muttered, not moving out from behind her. You're welcome, she replied with no change in tone. But we can't stay here. I'm afraid we have to. Tamlin ordered me to keep you from harm's way, and that's what I will do. But, but it's not out of harm's way here, he urged, and she peered at him quizzically. I mean, the people around us could become violent. Isn't the safest place to be near Tamlin altogether? I suppose. Then we have to go find him, even if we just stay back and let him do whatever. Amelia considered this for a moment, weighing the pros and cons of what Tamlin ordered versus what lined up with the spirits of his orders. There was, of course, also Mal's pleading face to consider. Finally, Amelia gave a nod, and with a grateful hug from Mal, they began racing across the city in near full sprint, being accosted nearly every step of the way by people eager to know what all this commotion was about. Mal dodged every question he could with some sorry excuse, and for anyone who tried to stop them directly, Amelia was there to smooth it over with the threat of imminent death. It was after a couple of minutes of this full sprint and being barely any closer to the mansion that Mal discovered how woefully inefficient running was. Is there any way we could get there faster? He called, and Amelia stopped, thinking for a moment before handily striding over to a carriage, rolling down the street, signaling for the driver to stop. And when he leaned close to ask what was wrong and how he could help, Amelia pressed her gun to his temple. You can give us your vehicle. She replied as politely as she could, though it didn't seem to make a difference. 
With hands up, he got out of the lead seat as gingerly as he could, backing away at Amelia's gesture, who had the gun trained on him even as she helped a very apologetic-looking Mal, mouthing, Sorry! into the passenger side. Now hold on tight, she told him as she slid next to him, taking the reins on the now very nervous horses. This may be a bumpy ride. The carriage careened down the street, the thundering of hooves almost matching the screams of pedestrians scampering out of the way, with Mal hugging tight to Amelia as the right side of the carriage lifted from the ground on the sharpest of turns. Yet, somehow, Amelia retained control over the horses, and adjusted her and Mal's weight to where it was needed most, with only minor nausea and shaken nerves when they pulled up within a long shadow's distance to the mansion gates. She helped Mal down, steadying him as he wobbled, while she looked around— Talon must already be inside the manor, and when Mal realized this too and took a tentative step toward the front door, she held him firm in an iron grip. That's too dangerous, she whispered. Look, and she pointed to the group of militiamen outside the manor, not yelling, but only eyeing each other down as their leader spoke. But no matter how safe it is around Tamlin, if we were to arrive onto the scene of a battle, we would only get in the way. His prowess does not lend itself to containing collateral damage, and, she emphasized, pulling him close into a deep hug, he would be more concerned with protecting you than protecting himself. Mmm, all right, okay, so, um, we'll do the smart thing instead and get to packing, right? Because if he can't win and we can't trust the people here, it would be best for us to skedaddle until Tamlin can have the Duke sort it all out, right? Right. Okay, come on! They quickly took Amelia's path around the edge of the woods toward the garden and after she made sure the coast was clear, they went back through the secret entrance that led to the second floor. Mal heard noise, arguing. He can make out small snippets of what they were saying, and shivered. Still, hopefully that means this could all still be smoothed over. They traced through the hall, with Mal getting as close as he could without alerting anyone, listening, seeing if he could catch the voices and what they were saying. But whatever they were saying, Tamlin's voice was not among them. Oh, no. No, 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 no. Why wouldn't Tamlin be speaking? Why wouldn't he be making deals, barking orders? Shouldn't there be sounds of fighting at the very least? Mal took one more quick breath before telling Amelia to wait while he darted off toward the noise, oblivious to anything else, and ignoring her desperately calling him back. If Tamlin was hurt, he would need help. If he were captured, he would need to be freed. He didn't think that if Tamlin were hurt, he could prevent the wounds from killing him. Or that if he were captured, the Duke would send an army knocking on the door of whoever held him. None of these things occurred to him. None of them mattered. All that mattered was Mal making sure Tamlin was okay. He snuck down the corridor, staying in the shadow of a suit of armor as he peered out from behind into the Grand Hall and sighed with relief. Tamlin was fine. Of course he was. He was so silly to think otherwise. He was standing, eyes closed, with the guardsmen of before stood in the doorway, whispering to each other, before they slowly began to raise their muskets and aim. He wasn't looking. He wasn't paying attention. Why wasn't he paying attention? Mal ran forward, the squeak of his shoes echoing in the hall as he flung himself so hard into the banister that he rocked it, and it was only when the first syllable left his mouth that he wondered why it looked like Tamlin was waiting for something. But by that point, it was too late. Tamlin! Behind you! His master didn't turn. Instead, he took one instant to look up in Mal's direction, and then another to look at the other side of the room where Mal followed his gaze. It was a woman. An archer by the bow in her hand, a good one, judging by how quickly she set up the shot, and must be experienced indeed to know to shoot first and wonder later. The arrow was loosed, flying so fast that it whistled through the air, and the very limit of Mal's reaction was to try to fall backwards so that maybe it wouldn't hit him square in the neck. And then having to readjust, it was too fast. Maybe he could hope that only the top of his head would be grazed, but it was too fast. And maybe he could hope for losing an eye, but it was too fast. And maybe, just maybe, he could turn away and convince himself that he wasn't about to get run through but it was too fast. Mal hit the floor hard, and the only thing that told him he wasn't down for good was the hard clink of metal on metal and the cooling dark of shadow. 
Did she miss? There was no way. He saw it coming right for him. Then the only alternative was that it was caught by the suit of armor its shield standing between him and the arrow before being lifted, Mallow being engulfed by lamplight once more as the armor stood, stepping off its podium, shield raised, spear at the ready, as it stood to guard over him. Not that it needed to. As the mercenaries and militiamen looked around them in disbelief, every suit of armor came alive, weapons bared, at the ready. Chapter 16 and so enamored was the gambler with the prospect of victory that he did not notice the gold slip from his fingers in the attempt. Page 77, line 22, from The Book of Small Wisdoms, by Monk Zon. Living armor was not an alien concept to Neil, and seeing it in action certainly wouldn't be cause enough to drop his glasses as he did now. They'd come up with rare frequency in texts concerning ancient dynasties during his study at Hobson, a way the high social orders of old might have kept their power during times of strife and plague, or why one army seemed so invincible to another, though in modern times these stories were generally regarded as antiquated propaganda. It wasn't exactly untruthful, though. Neil had even seen such a creation, a doll that seemed to respond to orders and direction in a monotonous way, bowing when you did and pouring tea when you sat down, an impressive display, and certainly might have some military potential if it could be accurately adapted. But this was not living armor. They moved too fluidly, too fast, adapted too quickly, just as a human would when a blow was aimed for their head, or the way their momentum carried them as they shifted their weight. Perhaps this count could afford such armor, for Neil had heard some tell of how extraordinary his wealth truly was, and he didn't discount that he would be interested in such a militaristic design. But this was not living armor. Because living armor didn't have people underneath it. Living armor couldn't have its helm knocked off and have revealed a dry skeleton beneath the metal. Living armor couldn't take a blow that shattered the metal and only grabbed your blade before headbutting you, splitting your glasses and nose and sending you flailing to the floor. There was a weight in the air, as the only things that seemed to move were the sets of armor coming down from their pedestals and approaching the intruders with deadly intent. The guardsmen were too dumbstruck to fire their guns, his teammates were too shocked to really process what was happening, and the Count Tamalin stood on the far side, eyes closed, brow furrowed, focusing, willing, renewing the life within the corpses he set up for a last-ditch defense so long ago and the weight that hung in the air was one word. Necromancer. His call shocked the band and the guards back into action, just in time for Max to dodge the incoming blow from an axe and for Jason to catch a knight's spear and trip it off balance. Rebs dived back to get a better vantage point with her bow, aiming not for any armor, but for the caster himself, knocking another arrow to send it straight through his heart. Not that Count Tamalin had to worry because in the next moment of the archer's aim, a suit of armor barreled behind her from the back hall and ran her through with its sword. So the archer was taken care of, naturally. Tamlin couldn't help but smile as the knight hurled her from his sword and down the flight of the twin stairs where her blood soaked the velvet carpet. That's what you get for using inferior weaponry, you fool. Unfortunately, he was also about to be shot, it took a single moment of concentration to rekindle the life within the knights and set them about their duties. They would overwhelm all intruders and defend the house as long as it was necessary. Their sudden activation did give him another moment to breathe, though, with a militiaman behind him being too shocked to fire right away. But the captain seemed a bit more experienced than that, and sent out a cry of, Shoot him! as they fired blind even as Tamlin dodged, catching him in his upper left arm and sending him skidding on a grazed knee. He was lucky to be wearing a padded vest beneath his suit. It could block bullets well enough, but the wounds bled slowly, and he still cursed as the numbness traveled up his arm and leg. Worthless swine. But even this could be turned to his advantage, as with him taking the whole of their attention, they didn't notice the knight to their left raising its own musket to fire. Tamlin muttered an order under his breath, and quick as a flash, the suit fired and blew a hole directly through the militia captain's head. 
Then another shot, and another, a pseudo-squad of riflemen firing from their crevices at the divided guardsmen, their shots ricocheted, snapping into the door frames with a thunderous crack as splinters railed off into the eyes of those too slow to cover them. Not the cleanest shots, but acceptable. Then, out of the corner of his eye, a blur, and by the time he turned his gaze forward, one of the party was almost upon him at a lightning pace, thrusting with his spear. Another knight, hidden in a crevice, moved to life and swung its axe in an arc right where the man's head would have been had he not slid underneath just in time. But this adjustment gave Tamlin an extra half-second to pop his sword from his cane and catch the man's spear, barely diverting it from his heart. Tamlin pressed forward, one hand on the hilt of his blade while the other held its sheath, taking the momentum and forcing the man to step back on the defensive, holding him off with the sword embedded in the wood, whereupon Tamlin snapped his cane to the ground, thrust the sword back to its sheath, and with a snap, locked it back in place, with the spear still wedged between the handle and the lock, and he smiled. At once the man was barraged on all sides. Knights from every corner leapt forward, aiming to thrust between the man's ribs when he jumped back, abandoning his spear and sliding back to his original position, and sucked his breath in as he saw Tamlin pull his revolver and aim it at him. Three deafening shots were fired and caught by the man with glasses, holding a metal disc between the bullets and his friend through some type of, what, magnetism? Telepathy? Whatever it was, it was supremely annoying. Two loud thuds and a grunt echoed behind him, and turning he saw two others who had just jumped from the balconies above. The sentry knights formed a defensive position around Tamlin, and as one of the men began charming water from his gourd to pour it along the floor, a setup for a grander ploy to be sure, Tamlin snapped an order, and the knights grabbed him and tossed him just high enough for him to grab the balcony banister and vault himself over safe in an upper hall. A moment later, a loud snap and bright light illuminated the entire bottom corridor. Lightning. He exhaled. And as he did so, the deafening clattering of a dozen suits of armor was heard from the bottom floor. The knights fell, their connection broken. Tamlin refocused to see the pugilist from before trying to put his fist through his skull. He ducked, unsheathing his sword and trying to kick at the spear to send it flying, but his wounded leg buckled, missing his attack and only tripping him up enough to throw off his aim, as Tamlin dodged and struck underneath the monk's extended arm in a slanting arc. The sword stopped midway through the air. The monk had caught it in his free hand. Tamlin tried to pull away and slide the sword from his grasp, but even as he cut, and even as he saw the blood slide from the monk's palm and drip down his wrist, he held fast. A hard, stunning blow hammered into Tamlin's abdomen. His lungs emptied of air as he felt the fist push deeper, bending his ribs before finally relenting. He collapsed to one knee, desperate for air, but still clutching his blade, and as the monk wheeled for a second hit, he found himself feeling faint, numb. And as he tried his best to step away, was horrified to learn that he couldn't. It was the sword, the sword, pulsing with some foul, cursed energy. Tamlin stood, even as the monk was frozen, and slowly slid the blood-slick blade through his grasp, as he tried desperately to squeeze the sword tighter, to do anything he could to slow the cruel tip being aimed for his heart. With the monk's last burst of energy, he fell back and tried to smack the blade away with his palm, only to miss in the haze and for it to go straight through his hand and into his shoulder. Tamlin plunged it deeper and deeper, still enraged, and when the hilt hit the monk's hand, unable to push it in any further, his knee came up and harshly met the monk's jaw in a teeth-cracking strike. There was a whistle at the end of the stairwell as he turned and saw the gunslinger, formerly tending to the bloodied archer on the floor, her raging face bruised by punches from metal gauntlets, and the entire right side of her ribs down being caked in blood, now glaring at him, aiming her pistol. Tamlin jumped and was held fast, his sword still stuck firmly in the monk's wheezing frame, and with an angry tisk let go of the blade entirely and narrowly leapt clean of the shot. With both hands free, he clapped them together, humming something unfamiliar. The heroes were fully separated now, with the fast one and the shield-bearer climbing up the stairs and the mage duo still down below waiting to ambush if he fled back down. Perfect. 
the knights reawakened, seemingly unharmed by the earlier shock, completely cutting off the duo to the rest of the group. Half the circle leapt to fight the mages while the others charged up the stairs to catch the flank of the two coming to support. He heard another shot split the air and turned to leap across the ground under the gunslinger's sight, raising his revolver only to return blind fire. Together they ducked and dodged and ran past the shots they laid as Tamlin rounded his way to her. He reloaded and aimed his revolver as the gunslinger pulled back her hammer before a feint, pulling up her buckler to deflect his shots and returning to position just as he closed the gap. The gunslinger fired and Tamlin tried to dodge, but his ribs still made it hurt to breathe. His leg was still numb. He wasn't as fast as before, and the bullet nicked his neck, causing a bleed that wouldn't cease. He grabbed her arm, peeling it away before she could reload, and punched her so hard in the jaw that it cracked from the joint. Dazed, recoiling, she pulled a dagger and struck out wildly as he blocked it with his cane. She thrashed and he parried, she thrust and he dodged, she slashed and he ducked, and as she overextended he grasped his cane with both hands and swung it as hard as he could into her bloodied side, toppling her over completely as she rolled in silent pain. He caught her in a great careening motion, and as he was about to swing the cane back around onto her skull, he was tackled, winded for a second time out of his blind spot, a man in tattered blues, as they crumbled through the banister and fell back down toward the first floor together. Tamlin was caught just at the base of the stairs, cushioned by his minions, but the man in blues landed against the floor hard with a heavy thump and even as he struggled to his feet, he was overtaken by yet more dead, and was left with a lance pinning his corpse to the marble. With the knights clamoring and clashing, swinging halberds and bastard swords, firing grape shot and musket balls, the heroes were slowly beaten back, isolated and separated. Even now their training took hold as they tried to form a defensive position, but it would do them no good any more. This is your last chance! Tamlin roared to the lot, doing his best to project his voice even as it strained his chest. The first one to speak about who sent you gets to live, and for those that do not, I will burn you to cinders, your family to cinders. Everything you have ever held dear would be turned to ash, and the only thing that will save you is begging to me. This was a nice change of pace, what he was properly used to. If they did not speak, it was no matter. He would find out all he needed in time. This he knew, until an arrow pierced right through his left side, between his heart and lung, his padded vest being sliced to ribbons as it gutted all the way through to his front, where he could see the arrow tip drip with his blood. He lurched forward with the momentum, with only his dead preventing a fall as he righted himself, and turned to see the smug little face of the archer he so easily dismissed before. Tamlin grit his teeth, roaring, You cur! as the insult ended with blood seeping from his mouth. He clamped his hand over it. Damn it! Damn it! He had to be quick. He felt woozy, like the ground was trying to come meet him face to face. He clapped his hands together again, trying to properly hum his word of power, and focusing his will to a point, until finally the knights around him fell, clattering to the floor in a tangled heap of bone and metal. The band smiled. What militiamen remained came out of hiding. They approached slowly, kicking at the helms of the fallen as they moved to surround Tamlin. Our last chance, is it? shouted Four Eyes, even as he trembled. I think not, you old bastard! Necromancer, called the monk, much softer, much sterner. If you kneel now, we can give you a painless death. If you are as wise as your position permits, you will accept the offer. But Tamlin didn't move. He barely even heard them, and their timid approach was too slow to interrupt. Finally, some peace and quiet. Finally, he could refocus his energy. And the bleeding stopped. And the numbness stopped. And the glad, triumphant faces of all present fell away with his exhaustion as he repurposed the death energy to stem his own mortality, turning to the pathetic crowd and mocking loud and powerfully, Ah, now that's better, isn't it? They stood silent, not so smug anymore. 
Oh, terribly sorry. Did you think you had the best of me? You really ought to remember your betters. And with a grin wider than any archer would ever muster, he turned and unloaded the rest of his bullets into her, her body jolting with the shock and bursts of blood as she dropped her bow and smiled no more. Rebs! The fast one screamed as he ran forward to strangle Tamlin and would never get the chance as he turned and flung the revolver into his face, breaking his nose against the rough metal and sending him tumbling back down the stairs to be caught by his friends, while Tamlin looked onward and laughed. Neil? Me? You forget yourself, worms! And he spat the rest of his blood in his mouth at their feet. It is you who forgets your position, called the whelp. You are outnumbered, you are outmaneuvered, without a sword, without ammo, and we still have more tricks up our sleeve yet. You stand no chance. You think so? Tamlin asked, overflowing with sarcasm as he tenderly took a cigarette from his pocket and lit it, letting the smoke obscure his face. You forget who you are addressing, boy, for I am the Count of all Western Dunry, High Prosecutor in the Seat of Justice, Grand Sorcerer Tamalin, so named Tamalin of the Scorched Earth, and I am about to show you why. The group of heroes huddled together. It was all right, Neil assured. It wasn't just a point on a scoreboard that the necromancer was without his sword and gun. All he had left to fight with was magic and they could handle that easily. Tamlin breathed softly, letting all the air empty from his lungs. They had a nullifier with them, sourced directly from the Deadlands. It would be an equal and opposite to all offensive magic he could hope to produce. It took a minute to set up and only covered a certain area, but in his arrogance, Tamlin was giving them more than enough time to set it up and position themselves. Tamlin raised his hands and placed them side by side together toward the heroes. Even if he were clever and tried an indirect attack or something that spread, the nullifier created an anti-energy aura that would repel it all so long as Neil could concentrate. Tamlin smiled as he hummed a new word of power. There was nothing the sorcerer could do. Tamlin felt the heat rise all the way from his body from the torches around him, from the electrical current in the walls, and from the very air itself directly against his palms. There was nothing he could do. And then he showed them the sun. Chapter 18 Rarely is there a greater show of bravery than sheer foolishness. Unfortunately, the reverse is also true. Page 43, line 86, from The Book of Small Wisdoms, by Monk Zahn. Mal looked up at the armor looming over him, keeping watch to ward away any who might approach and listening to the sounds of clashing and battle below. He peeked out, just enough to see the suits of armor stepping down and engaging the intruders, and sighed the tension from his shoulders when he saw he'd been completely forgotten in the scuffle. Almost, anyways, as the knight above him turned and croaked in a voice that could never have come from a living human. Be gone from here. Mal nodded, turning and fleeing back to Amelia as she ran to catch up with him. What were you thinking? She hissed, and Mal could only stutter. He wasn't. That was the problem. Listen, she continued, grabbing his shoulders and squeezing. It is paramount that we collect everything important and depart with it. The officials in town have already been coerced against Tamlin somehow, and if even a single mercenary escapes to inform them of his necromantic practices, there may be little to stem the mob. Presume all we do not take with us may be ransacked or destroyed. He nodded, grimly, still shaken. And Mal? Yeah. If you ever try to get yourself killed like that again, I'm going to drag you back to safety by your ears. I swear, if I could feel fear, you'd have my hair white by now. Her tone was serious, but Mal could see the hint of her smile, ever present, behind her veil, and he tried to smile back. <laughs> I'll, I'll do my best. Uh, for now, we need to get everything, everything valuable. Uh, head to your room and pack whatever you need to stay undercover. I'm going to head up to my room and get all I can, and we'll meet back in front of Tamlin's room, all right? All right. 
With a nod and one final hug, she split off down the left corridor, and he the right, pressing himself to the wall and waving nervously at the knights as they marched their way down toward the battle. He went up the hallway, up the spiral staircase toward his room, quickly raking armful after armful of papers and notes into his bags before having to stop and find more to fit the rest of his things. There were clothes and knickknacks and puzzles and moving mechanisms, all priceless, all that he had to throw out with the reserved determination that he would get more in time. But he would not be rid of his knives, nor his wizard's cloak. Anything that passed direct from Tamlin's hands to his own with intent, had to be kept. Always. He came back down the stairs, evidently far too slowly for Amelia's liking, as she met him halfway and slung half his luggage over her shoulder, leaving three bags between the both of them, and with plenty of time to discuss what they would have to take with them, and do their best to hide what they couldn't. Finally, there was Tamlin's room. Together they piled in suits, morning clothes, an entire assortment of cigarettes and tobacco, his cookbook, and every sealed envelope that looked important. Everything else could be bought. And along with it all, Mal saw a singular picture, he smiled to notice, of himself, Tamlin, and Amelia, all posing with a distraught lake fish and beaming smiles across their faces that stood upon his nightstand. Mal packed that, too. And thinking again, packed all the letters from Tamlin's children as well. Were those all the possessions they could take with them? It seemed so little, compared to everything else there was in the house, from the spatula Tamlin used to the radio they would listen to together. And Mal felt sluggish, lagging behind, thinking of how much they might have to leave. Amelia shook him out of it, forcing him to look at her, clasping her cold hands around his cheeks. Everything will be okay. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to take care of you. Do you understand? Mal nodded, smiling past the anxiety, and she lifted her veil so he could be absolutely sure she was smiling back. They trekked as quickly as they could back through the halls until they made their way to the secret entrance. It would be difficult hauling luggage through the forest path back to the car, but keeping out of sight and being ready to go at a moment's notice was top priority even if it meant having to travel lighter than any party would prefer. It was such a shame, then, to peek through the bush and find the car surrounded by constables, having to keep back a gaggle of curious onlookers. Damn it! If they were aware of this plot beforehand, then they would want to be sure to commandeer the vehicle to prevent any escape attempt. It is likely that the only reason they are not already cordoning off the house is through fear of collateral damage. But we can't just take the bags on foot, either. The carriage, he snapped. We can still get back there, right? That wouldn't be considered suspect yet, right? Only one way to find out, she mused, picking the bags back up and continuing onward. They went long past where it was likely to be safe, helping one another over the brick walls with the bags in tow, sneaking past the gap in the gate, and then dashed as fast as the bags would allow to the carriage. And Mal breathed a sigh of relief to see that it was unguarded. They loaded everything in as quickly as they could. This might work even better, Mal said, trying to squeeze the third bag into any crevice it would still fit. Because they're going to be looking for the car, right? But I don't think they would stop this right away, not if you had a disguise on or something. Right. On top of that, we might have to abandon the vehicle anyways. Even the carriage is likely to be flagged for how we acquired it. And if these same villains persisted in the capital, we would be stopped before we got very far. If we could even exit the train at all. There may be men waiting at the station. Then we'll jump from the train. We can, uh, walk wherever we need to. Oh, how exciting, she said, sticking her tongue out at him as she lifted the last of Mal's bags and placed it at the very top, where he was trying to reach. The joke was cut short by screaming, people running down the road, barreling past them. For a moment, the two tried to hide before realizing they didn't have to. The people didn't care one bit what they were doing. They were just trying to get away. From what? Mal asked, before he turned and saw his answer. Smoke was coming over the trees, just close enough to have its source obscured by the wall, but he knew, just knew, that it was coming from his home. He did not hear what Amelia said to try to stop him, nor feel her reach out to grab his coat as he started to run. 
Never before was he so glad for his speed, as he ran faster uphill than the onlookers ran running down, before being stopped dead in his tracks at the gate, breathless and woozy to his home, nearly completely alight in a deep crimson flame. And he made the stupidest decision of his life to run in. He burst past the sparse few guards that remained, trying to restrain him, and bolted through the front doors where they didn't follow, ducking past the flames and the smoke, calling out to Tamlin, looking for him everywhere. But there was no response. The fire seemed to grow from the floor itself, as everything familiar was consumed by the heat. Not even the statues were safe, the beautiful gold having melted to the floor in a grotesquely shimmering sludge. Mal searched and scuttled and tried to think above the screaming alarm bells in his brain telling him to flee about where Tamlin, if a fight broke out, would have been and where he would have gone. He wasn't on the floor. There was nothing on the floor. Where did everyone go? They must be somewhere in thinking of the house, in thinking of everywhere Tamlin could have been and everything precious he could have collected for safekeeping. Then it hit him as a sudden jolt of memory. The lab, the books, Kathy! He broke into a sprint, ignoring the smoke invading his lungs and stinging his eyes as he ran, knocking into tables and walls and avoiding the gulp of flame only a hair's breadth away as he felt the heat on his legs and guessed where to jump. He collapsed against the stair railing in a hacking fit, then began to climb the stairs on all fours, trying to keep his head under the smoke and still make progress, trying to ignore the fact that he was wheezing under the strain. He got to the top floor in a pile, and wasted precious few seconds trying to rest as the flames crept higher, and the smoke loomed thicker, and cursing got to his feet. He charged blind, hand outstretched toward the heavy lab doors, and jolted back in pain as a bolt of flame licked at his fingertips. It was already consuming the doors. Again he cursed. Again he swore. He clutched at his head and racked his brain to think, to come up with something, anything to get out of this, to save all he could, and grew more and more frantic with each passing second. If he could charge, if he could just get through in one go, then he could avoid the flames completely, and if he couldn't, if he were bounced off, then at least he would be bounced back away from the flames and not land directly in them. He just couldn't get stuck. Because if he got stuck, an image of himself burning alive flashed through his mind, and he quivered and faltered, taking a step back and looking back toward the stairs, he could still make it out. He didn't have to do this. He didn't have to save the books, all that priceless knowledge that could never be replaced. He didn't have to save Kathy, scared and crying out for help, wishing for someone to save her. Damn it. He grit his teeth. And with a small, stiff inhale for whatever clean air he had, he lowered his head and charged, slamming his shoulder into the crackling doors and getting ricocheted off and landing flat on his back. Again he got up, and again he tried, again, 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 putting more and more weight behind each blow, losing more and more seconds of air, and feeling the hard crunch of his shoulder turn soft and yielding. With one last charge, using all the strength he had left, he barreled everything he had into the door, and it finally gave, gasping open with a large snap, swinging on busted hinges and slamming into the walls as Mal tumbled in, tired and bruised and sore and burnt, but through. He risked a deep gulp of air and opened his eyes wide when it was easy to swallow. The room had no smoke in it. The doors kept out the fire. Oh, marvelous! This was wonderful! Everything would be saved! He ran up and down the rows, putting everything that he could lay his hands on into his pockets. He hugged to every book he could wrap his arms around, and after he grabbed all that he could, he grabbed one more and took Kathy at the very top, and he could swear he felt the book trembling. Hey, it's me! It's Mal! He soothed, not even knowing if she could understand him over the fright. You're gonna be okay! I'm gonna save you! Everything is gonna be okay! And then he smelled the smoke. And turned. 
and saw the fire creeping through the open door toward the artifacts and the smoke billowing in and flooding the ceiling, getting lower every second. And he realized everything was not going to be okay. He ran around frantically, half mad, stuffing anything too heavy to carry anywhere he could that might give even the slightest bit of cover. He considered throwing everything out the window and just hoping nobody found it too close to the wreckage. The window. The window! What was he thinking? Of course the doors were keeping the flames out! He could have found a ledge and shimmy to the window instead. Why didn't he think of that? Why was he so stupid, stupid, stupid? He kept trying running to save everything, smashing open the window and hurling as much as he could from it, hoping it would hit the lake and sink safely to the bottom. Anything that wouldn't survive the water he dropped into the tree line below and hoped it would be safe in the landing, and anything that wouldn't survive the drop he covered tenderly, protectively, wrapping it in all that he could to repel the flames as he crammed it into every possible crack, and with every passing second reminded Kathy that it was going to be okay. Even as he felt the heat without having to turn around, everything was going to be okay. Even as the smoke began to blind him even here, he held her close and told her everything would be okay. Even as his shaky assurances turned into hacking fits and he dropped to his knees to heave, he tried to tell her that everything would be okay. He tried to stand to steady his sleepy legs as he tried to stay conscious, to grasp all the tomes he could to his chest, to make a one last push to the window. And failed. And fell. And was mesmerized by how soft and cool the ground was, before he lost consciousness completely. He dreamt of bright lights, of heat, and the smell of peanuts and sawdust. There was organ music, and his face felt funny with all the grease paint on it. He didn't feel any wind on it, but only through his hair and his naked arms as he flew from one trapeze to another, reaching and grabbing, feeling the chalky residue that helped keep him stable, sometimes with one cut hand, sometimes with two, cut from the knives even as he threw them, sometimes the fire in his calves that told him he was upside down as he flipped and tumbled and juggled and tossed and took his hat off to smile for the crowd until finally with a great burst of energy and with all the breath leaving his body as he folded to the tiniest form he could he ended in a triple somersault landing hard on his aching feet standing up tall keeping on his heels to cool the blisters as he smiled one more time for the amazing crowd as it cheered and cheered and cheered and cheered with bright lights and the smell of thrown roses but then the smell was gone, and the lights would be gone, the music would be gone. He was there, alone, in the dark, the chalky residue that dried his hands, rubbing off onto the handle of the broom he was sweeping with, sweeping away the roses and the sawdust and the music. He had to stay until it was all gone, all swept up, and it never was, never in time to eat, because the rose petals fell and fell and fell like snow. And there would be cold. He dreamt of shivering in the snow, as his owner talked with a tall, thin man in his fiftieth year, sharply dressed in a suit that squeezed around his broad shoulders and slim waist, with a black suit with a red trim that seemed tailor-made to complement the narrow, high-boned face beneath his unkempt white hair and goatee. They talked for a long time, his owner excitedly and exuberant, as if he were trying to pitch something, while the tall man barely paid attention at all. They decided on something, and the tall man passed a sack of jingling coins to his owner, before looking back and approaching in long strides that crunched the snow beneath him, melted it, the snow melted even as it touched him. He dreamt of the man kneeling down and looking at him in pounds and ounces, intensely measuring, valuing, weighing his components to see what could be made from them. Before his harsh eyes flickered, and his stone face realigned, and there was a gentleness now, the warmth that melted the snow, of a low fire on a cold night, and the smell of burning dust bunnies and smoke. The man spoke to him now, and he could see the man's heavy breath flow into the sky in a vapor nearly obscuring his face. Would you like to come home with me? 
he dreamt of snow falling as his owner fidgeted, unsure, worrying. But the man was patient, still kneeling, his leg becoming damp in the snow. Would you like to come home with me? I have cakes and pies and steaks and fish and so much fruit it tumbles from my table and hot chocolate, more hot chocolate than you could ever drink. He dreamt he nodded as the man smiled deeper and his eyes grew softer as he stood back up to his full height and began to walk away. He dreamt of fidgeting, unsure, worrying, until the man patted his side and told him, It's all right. You can come with me. And he followed, running, trying to catch up with the tall man before tripping and falling and reaching out and grabbing the man's coat and recoiling, shielding himself. But he wasn't batted away. He felt a warm hand ruffle his hair, and he heard the soft, rolling voice. It's okay. You can hold on to me if you like. Don't get lost now. And they walked. They walked all the way back to a beautiful carriage without any horses and a rumble inside, with a lady dressed in black in the front, and he dreamt of the man telling him over and over of all the wonderful things they will have together, that he had so much food he would cook for him, that he had so many gadgets and toys that he needed someone to test them out, that he had so many parties and festivals to go to that he needed someone to accompany him, as he laughed and joked and allowed his coat to be felt, for it was so soft and stitched so well. He dreamt that the carriage rumbled as it began to pull away from the circus, from the lights and the roses, and as he pressed his face to the window to see it long in the distance, he heard the man tell him, Don't worry. You'll have all the lights and roses you want. I'll make sure you have a good life. I promise. Chapter 19 I really cannot stress that enough. Page 4, line 23 from The Book of Small Wisdoms by Monk Zon. His eyes shot open to blackness, with a screaming headache and pains in his chest. What happened? Was he hurt? Was he blind? Was he dead? He was moving. He was constrained by something. A carried. Damn it, everything hurt. And he heaved in his breathing. It was so hard to think. Was he captured? Did he need to get away? He shifted, trying to peel away, and a soft and familiar shh echoed in his ear. He tried to speak. He could barely hear himself over the bird song or the buzz of insects. He knew who it was, but couldn't picture them. His head hurt. He needed something to drink. It's going to be all right, the soft voice told him. He heard the sound of breaking water and the slosh of feet making its way through it. It's going to be all right, she repeated, and he let out an eep as he felt the water reach his feet, then his backside, then up past his chest, all the way up to the top of his head, and for a moment he was certain that he was being carried away to drown. I'm here, the kind voice told him, as whatever held him let go, and he nearly sunk down until he was grabbed again, his head kept above the water, and his body let to float flat. The cold stung almost as much as his chest at first, feeling like the fire all over again on his hands and feet, but then the coolness dulled, and it felt good, numbing the pain of his burns. He could barely move. His entire body was stiff, and he tried to speak, to remind the voice he was there whenever he felt he was about to go under completely, and coughed a cry as he felt some waterlogged fabric press against his forehead. It's okay. I am here with you. I will be with you always. Everything hurt, and it was so hard to breathe. But then the voice began to hum a tune he remembered only in dreams. It was tender and sweet. It made his breathing slow and his eyelids flicker. He felt marble fingertips slide down his temples until palms rested on his cheeks. He felt his head lift gently from the water, and with the sound of rustling and only the slightest reverberations in his face, his head was laid back down onto a lap. Cozy. It smelled of smoke and lilacs. I will be with you always, the voice repeated as it cooed and hummed its tune, and the marble fingertips played with his hair and massaged his scalp. You're Amelia, he whispered, chest easing just enough to speak. Yes, the voice confirmed. Our home, 
it could not be saved. It was hard to comprehend that all he knew could be gone. More than trashed, more than confiscated, because at least broken things can be repaired and items taken can be returned. But this was just gone. And he pushed the thought back to keep himself from sobbing. I would have died there. Yes, she said. You saved me, he smiled. Yes, she whispered. How? I followed you, she said in a giggle, as if it were silly he would ask. It took a while, for you rushed in so quickly, and I had to evade the guards trying to keep onlookers at bay. I had to trace your steps carefully, avoiding where the wood gave way. You ran through many fires. By the time I reached the laboratory, you were already in a haze, and I caught you just in time as you fell. I did my best to carry you in anything you held out, though some things were dropped in the escape, and I did not have time to pick them up. I will understand if you cannot forgive me. You're always forgiven, he replied, and smiled as he looked up into her milky eyes, glimmering with the dawn coming through the canopy, and she smiled back. We had escaped the blaze, but you bore many wounds, and were coughing a distressing amount. I placed your possessions aside, and— Kathy! He shouted too loudly, as another hacking fit took him, and Amelia made careful sure to keep his head from going under and swallowing water. When it subsided, he continued, albeit much quieter. Is she all right? She is all right. She's not hurt? She's not hurt. Where— Yonder, with the rest of the things saved. She asked a great deal about you, stranger to her though I was. I told her exactly as I am telling you now. Thank you, Amelia. It is my joy to see you happy. Wait! Mal cried, shooting nearly upright even as he barked in pain. What about Tamlin? Where's Tamlin? Is he okay? Did you find him? Did he find us? What's going on? There was an agonizing wait of three seconds before Amelia replied. I do not know. I did not observe any evidence of him remaining within the manor, nor did I see him outside of it. I have not scouted extensively, as that would mean leaving you in a weakened state, and— It is okay to leave me in a weakened state! I'm fine! Tamlin stated otherwise, and I observe otherwise. He ordered that I was not to leave your side for any extended period whatsoever, and would be very cross if I were to leave you so vulnerable especially. But we can't leave him either. He's he's old. He's grumpy. And he's so particular with his food. We have to find him. Would you like me to support you so we may seek him out together? Perhaps the wreckage is a good place to start. Then outward from there. Yes. Wait, no, we can't. Because what if something bad happened? What if the bad guys are waiting for there for us in a trap? Shall we remain in the woods and hope Tamlin finds us here? She asked. Yes, wait, ah, no, because what if he needs our help? What if he's captured, being carted off somewhere? What if he needs help breaking out? Shall you ask around and track where they might be taking him? Yes, uh, <laughs> no, because if they beat up Tamlin, then they could easily beat us too, right? Then we would just be imprisoned right along with them, and, and if they were keeping him anywhere, it would probably be somewhere with tight security. How could we break him out when we don't even have any help? I... I don't know if we could do anything. We would just be putting ourselves in danger, and isn't that what Talon wanted to avoid? And and if we were to try to help, wouldn't it be better to be prepared? But what if we take too long and something bad happens? I... Mm. Then what should we do? She asked. I don't know, he answered, feeling the headache coming back as his heart swelled to his throat. At this, Amelia began to stroke his hair as she lowered him back into the water. I believe Tamlin is far more capable than you may think. He is a master sorcerer, and a great warrior besides, on top of his hefty political ties and economic backing. Even if he were surrounded by foes and we hidden in the forest, I believe he would be the safest of us all. He has also been in these types of situations before, and when he could not pull strings and call in favors, was able to break free of his own accord. Regardless of the circumstances, he is most likely out of anyone to persevere. Mm, maybe you're right. Furthermore, he had instructions in place for just such an occasion. Instructions? Yes. In the event that any unsavory information is discovered, and we happen to be separated, we are to find a cache located at the construction site on Mont Street, beneath the crane. Failing that, we can find other caches underneath the dead tree in Mansfield Park, or beneath Mrs. Forn's floorboards. 
Didn't her house get renovated last year? Wouldn't they have found it? No, because that's when the cash was placed in the kitchen, silly. She said, rubbing his temples as she continued. Since it is turning from harvest to dark, we are to travel farther north to the town of Avid Peak. The resort? Yes. The powers that be sometimes vacation there. So it is very intent on its privacy and they ask few questions, and the cold will make it more difficult to be followed. There is a train direct from the capital that can take us there. So we just go to Avid's Peak and wait? Correct. The resort is owned by a certain Mr. Hum, whom Tamlin has blackmailed. We will be stowed and comfortable until he can meet up with us, whereupon we shall all leave together. We can also try to get to the Duke's help. I bet if we can meet up with him, he'll know that Tamlin's innocent. He can help us clear our name. This is true, but we would still need to go to the capital to alert him. Okay, then that's where we'll go, and, um, how do we get there? I do not know, she admitted, finally letting him right himself on the edge of the stream. You have been unconscious all through the night, and I have not been able to scout for news or reports. I am unsure of people's response and feelings as to what's going on. We may be accosted if we try to make our way toward the train station, even without Tamlin with us. Then how are we supposed to reach the caches to begin with? I do not know. Mal thought for a minute, letting his head rest back into her soggy lap, watching the rays of sun slowly move across the water. I'll get my pals, he decided. Weasel and the gang, Marty and Agatha and Joe and Della, if I can find them, they can get to the cache for us, and then probably help sneak us through the town. Then we can get to the train station and probably board without anyone noticing. A good plan, she agreed, and began pulling him from the water and seeing if he was okay to stand and move. Difficult, but doable. Oh, and Amelia? He called to her. Yes, Mal? Thank you for saving me. Thank you for everything you do. I'm sorry I caused you so much trouble, and I'm sorry your hair would have gone white over me. Amelia only smiled with delight as she kissed his forehead, and replied, I will run through as many fires as I need in order to be sure you are safe. Besides, you should be more sorry about the pulling I gave to your ears while you were unconscious, she said, patting him playfully. Or did you think I was joking? As the sun began to rise in earnest and blue dawn broke into crisp yellow morning, Mal, Amelia, and a very happy book skirted through the forested outskirts, ducking behind trees and within bushes any time steps came marching by, and moved only when the loud clatter of commotion or horse hooves covered their steps. There were many people out today, people rushing with messages, letters, news, people shouting announcement after announcement in the square, and a hundred different racing footsteps all going to one place, the manor what was left of it. The news of what had happened spread all over the town by now, and everyone had seen the ruins at least once. Mal could hear people speculating on what happened and why, where Tamlin was, where he was. The consensus seemed to be that Tamlin was a traitor of some sort, either bribed into treason, the selling of state secrets, or planning an outright coup against the Duke. Nobody was certain. The wild conspiracies and speculation ran rampant, and Mal sweat bullets as he listened that he himself might be implicated, that he, maybe, perhaps, willfully aided Tamlin in treachery, that he was forced to, that he didn't know anything at all, and that they would get the truth after they found him, one way or another, and Mal gulped. It wasn't safe here after all even among common folk. If he were wanted for such a high-profile case, then surely a warrant would be put out, then a bounty, then everyone would have a reason to claw at his coattails. He wondered, even as he kept on the quiet path out of sight, and hoped his pounding heart wouldn't alert anyone, whether or not it would be best to just give himself up. If, with his testimony, all of this could be straightened out. Maybe it was a misunderstanding. Maybe all legal troubles could be smoothed over. Maybe if he turned himself in, he could help dismiss all suspicions and help restore Tamlin's name, and then everything could go back to normal. Or maybe they would just find him guilty. And who knows what they would do then. The cash is in the construction yard, right? He whispered to Amelia as she followed behind. Correct. Underneath the leftmost crane. I believe it may be a satchel. Okay, then let's split up here. If I get caught, at least they'll haul me away to a safe cell first. I hope. But if you get caught... And he shivered. 
So uh, take Kathy and head the long way around the forest until you get to the train station and hide out for me. I'm going to find my friends. I'll explain everything. We'll get the cash, and we'll meet up to go to the capital together. I'll signal you when I'm there. She nodded, and with a final bow, turned and fled far off ahead. Mal watched her move, until long after she was out of sight, and took a deep breath and quickly slipped from behind a tree and into the crevice of the canals to race beneath the city streets. It was not difficult to move silently. Even in the open air of the canal, the streets above thrummed with a cacophony of beats, and Mal reminded himself over his beating heart that as long as he stuck to the shadows, he would be okay. He followed the path furthest right, then the middle path that carried away the rainwater, then the left path with the red brickwork that was in dire need of repair. He traveled through these a thousand times before on escapades and adventures, and smiled as he looked up toward a gutted ledge to see the chalked outline of a faded happy face the meeting spot. Mal hoisted himself up through the cracks in the wall and gingerly looked out over the ledge, and just as predicted, his friends were there, speaking wildly and loudly about all that had gone on, who those mercenaries were, the clash, the fire, what it all meant, and most importantly, where Mal was. He bobbed up and down with excitement, looking forward to the dramatic flare of when one of them finally asked, where do you think he is now? And that was his cue. He quickly popped his entire upper half up from the canal, called out, Right here! and hauled himself over into a roll where he unfolded back to his full height and zest with a jump, while his friends stood and stared, in shock. That wasn't quite the reaction he was expecting. What's got in your heads? he asked, trying to lighten the atmosphere. You look like you've seen a ghost or something. Hey, Mal, Joe finally blurted. Sorry, we weren't really expecting you. Yeah. Della said. We heard he got captured or something. We saw the manor, too. Is... is everything okay? I think she's asking if you're all right, Agatha chimed in. Mm -hmm, I'm all right. I'm mostly worried about old Iron Ass, though. I haven't seen him since all this started. <laughs> yeah, well, we heard there was some issue, some uh, issue like he was going to turn on the, um, the Duke or over something, Weasel said. Do you know anything about that? Marty asked. Well, I know it's not true. Tamlin's as loyal as they come. And then, reconsidering. Uh, to the Duke, anyways. Besides, it's not like he keeps me out of his secrets or dealings. So if anyone would know, I would. Yeah, that's true, Marty said. But it's not like anyone else is going to see it that way. Which is why I gotta get out of here. If I'm caught and dragged in front of a court, there's no way anything good can come of it. I'd probably be found guilty just by association alone. And that can't help anyone, you know? I can only clear our names if I can escape. So, how about it? Wanna go on an adventure? The gang each passed a look among themselves. A firm nod. And gave Mal an energetic thumbs up. Let's do it, Joe said. Mal leapt for joy, and then leapt to pile them all into one big group hug. But we gotta get to the construction site first, he declared mid-squeeze. Tamlin left something for me there, just in case this kind of thing happened, and we can't leave without it. What is it? Della asked. I don't know, actually, but it's important, I think. Food or clothes, maybe? Special papers? Either way, we gotta get to it. We're burning daylight, and the train will be leaving soon, and I don't think it'll wait for me just because I want it to anymore. They made their way toward the site, taking a more direct path when people weren't there who could see Mal, and making detours when the streets were full, either scaling buildings to go along rooftops or slinking back into the canal to take them around a particularly crowded square. So, did you see those mercenaries who came into town? Mal asked. Not really. Nope, not a thing, the answers went. Well, did the guards say anything about it that you might have heard? It seemed too organized to not be planned, don't you think? Uh, no, I don't think so. The answers came in near unison. There had to be something. Do you guys remember any rumors going around about this before? Something the cufflinks might have let slip while having a drink? I don't remember, said Joe. The rest said nothing. Do you know what happened to Tamlin? No. Nope. Do you know if the mercenaries left yet? No. Hey, are you guys all right? Yeah. Agatha shot, speeding up to walk beside Mal. It's just the town guards are looking for you. They came to ask us about you earlier and told us a bit about what happened, but not much. What did they ask? Just about where you were. Do you know what they want? Probably just to question you, right? Yeah, maybe. But maybe not. 
with one final wave from Weasel to signal that nobody was looking, and one final mad dash across the empty street. They made it to the building site, and Mal told the gang to wait as he raced toward the crane. It was surprisingly low to the ground, and he had to suck his gut in to squeeze underneath, not helped by giggling over imagining Tamlin grunting and cursing whilst doing the same thing himself to put the cashier to begin with. As he turned to jimmy his way through on his back, he gazed up at the base and saw it, hooked into a nook out of the way of any grease or gears, in a place nobody would ever check. A large brown leather bag that could be strapped over your shoulder or waist, and Mal could just narrowly reach it by stretching out his fingertips. It was hefty, and very, very dense. He could only move it inch by inch until it nearly toppled onto him, completely in a heavy swing down. Mal caught it right before it hit him in the nose by deftly and wildly waving his hands in front of his face in sheer terror, and once he nervously opened his eyes to make sure it wasn't about to whack him, complimented himself for a job well done. As if it were present, he shook it before looking in to see if he could guess what it was. It had no smell, other than the leather from the bag, and sounded like clattering stones or metal. Finally, he unclinked the seal, flipped the cover off, and saw gold. A pile of gold. Nothing but gold. There were solid gold bars and nuggets of gold. There were refined and processed gold. Raw gold with all the stones still attached to it. Minted gold coins direct from the treasury. And in moving some aside, he saw even more wealth. There was silver as well, and minted coins from other nations, and stacks upon stacks of receipts, checks, and notes redeemable at every bank from here to the East Islets on the other side of the country and at the very bottom was a blank slip of paper with impeccable handwriting that read, There is no problem that money cannot smooth over. And he smiled. Thanks, Dad, he whispered to himself, tucking the note back into the bag and relatching it, tugging it after him as he crawled out from beneath the crane. Hey, guys, you'll never believe... Oh, where did the others go? They just went to check ahead and make sure the path was clear, replied Joe. Mm -hmm. Now, come on, we gotta get going. Your train is gonna leave soon. Marty said, as he waved him along. Mal nodded, and slinging the satchel over his shoulder and assuring his friend that he was all right in carrying it, they marched off toward the station. They continued talking and telling little jokes to ease the tension as they made their way, still continuing to duck out of sight whenever footsteps sounded near, and as Joe ushered Mal into the alleyway, he told them how grateful he was for their help that he knew they were taking a great risk to help him, that he'd never forget it, and that when his name was cleared, he would shower them all with gifts and money and anything he could show them how much it all meant to him, with each and every promise eliciting a stifled breath or an awkward laugh. Until, for some reason, he didn't feel like making more promises. His mood brightened a little when Della and Weasel showed up at the end of the alleyway to guide him further. And then his heart, caught in his throat when he saw a troop of guards follow behind them, staring down the alley, directly at Mal. He stopped, and even looking ahead he heard a familiar sound behind him, the stomping of boot heels, and the angry glare of a dozen eyes. Joe and Marty stopped with him, standing on either side, and for a second none of them moved. For one second the wheels in Mal's brain whirled, for one second, there was a moment of confusion before the wheels clicked, and he realized. Realized exactly what just happened. Exactly what he had been led into. And he savored that second. That one last moment where he could still delude himself into believing he hadn't been betrayed by his friends. Then the second passed. Marty and Joe launched themselves at him, grabbing at his arms and coat and trying to hold him in place while Agatha's distant call of, Go, go, get the traitor, get him, sounded at the ends of the alleyways. He fought and wrestled, instinctually trying to slip away from their hands as they grabbed onto his burns before he ordered himself to focus, yanking Marty to the right and launching a knee into his stomach while Joe maneuvered behind him and locked him into a chokehold. Let go of me! Mal yelled as he tossed and flung like a horse trying to be rid of a rider, finally managing to pick Joe up by the leg, throw him off balance, and slam him back into the wall, sending a screeching pain up Mal's spine and forcing Joe to release him in a winded gasp. 
The guards were almost upon him. He wouldn't be able to dodge around them as the boots thundered a few feet away. He ran ahead toward a low fence and swung his satchel over like a sling over the top before vaulting himself over, landing with a hard thud onto a poor dog's house, and quickly grabbing at the satchel and fleeing as fast as he could in any direction through any crowded street. Even as people saw, calling to alert the guard, even as some few tried to grab at him and tripped him, sending him sprawling and feeling the fire all over again, he rolled back upright and continued to run. Even as pain blurred his vision and he only barely avoided getting run down by horse-drawn carts as he darted into the middle of the road, he continued on. He dashed left through closed alleyways and leapt right through a woman's open window, apologizing as she screamed, running out the door, until his legs nearly gave way and he cried from disgust at his burnt skin rubbing together, forcing himself to jump into the waist-deep waters of the canal and trudging through until he could double back around. He continued until he was huffing and puffing, until his heart was pounding in his ears, until he heard the loud, crystal-clear call of the train horn sounding, signaling its slow advance the one hope Mal had of escape, leaving him utterly behind. He sat in the dark for what felt like a very long time, catching his breath, cooling his wounds, wiping the wet snot from his nose, and wondering over his next moves. But why bother? Why did any of it matter? Nobody was going to help him, and nobody cared, and the train was already gone. What was he going to do? Go to the train station and just wait patiently in the sitting room? Ask the guards politely if they would leave him be so he could escape? Maybe he would pick up some lunch on the way, stop by the shop Josie owned, and buy a sandwich from the woman who just tried to hail for the police? There was nothing he could do. Ugh. He sunk low and wished the waters would just carry him away. But it doesn't matter if there was nothing he could do. Amelia was still waiting for him. She was probably worried. What would she do if he didn't show up? What would she do if she heard he got captured? He couldn't let her down. And what about Tamlin? He went to the trouble of wiggling his way under a damn crane just to hide the satchel so Mal could make use of it. Not to mention storing all that money in the first place. How could he ever rescue Tamlin if he just gave up now? And yeah, the train left, but that can't possibly be the only way, right? Maybe he could follow the tracks or move through the mountains itself. It had to be possible. He read about it, didn't he? How they cleared out the trails and carved the divots to lay the track. It would have been years since then, long overgrown, but it would be hard. But it was possible. Escape was possible. And if it was possible, he would do it. He would escape, no matter what it took. Mal sighed deeply into the chill air of the canal. It was time to go. He could probably take the same route Amelia took. Taking the long way around through the forest, it would be way longer in distance, and way harder, but they'd probably expect him to move through the canals by now, especially if the gang were helping to catch him. Still, they could set up guards and stop posts at the edges of the town, but they couldn't guard the whole mountainside and it would be impossible to see him through all that bush. It was his only chance. With caution born of fear, he started toward the exit of the canals. He took minutes to listen at every sharp edge for the slightest sound of a potential ambush, and took milliseconds to make decisions, because if they weren't here yet, they soon would be. He kept his eyes to the water to see the reflections of the street, to check if anyone may be watching. He even watched for the scurry of rats, because if they moved away from one end, that would mean someone could have frightened them away from it. Without concern for reaching the train any longer, he could take as long as he wanted to be cautious. His only worry was Amelia. Would she wait there as he asked her to? Or would she worry something happened to him and come looking? And if she came looking, would she get caught? And what would she do if she actually got caught? He shook the thoughts from his mind. They didn't help anything. They only made him nervous. He would figure it out if he had to, but now all he should do is put his mind toward getting away. After thirty minutes and two close calls, he finally made his way out of the canal into a relatively safer part of the town, all the way back to his gutted home. It hurt to see, and the crowd surrounding it was still enormous, but it was still the ideal place to leave near, since even if any guards were here, 
they would be too busy searching the wreckage and keeping the crowds at bay to keep watch. He doubled back around, taking the same path he used to slip into the canals at the start, and made his way up the slopes and past the backdrop of his home. Even with good legs, this would have been exhausting, and every step made him less and less grateful for the increasingly heavy bag of gold at his side. Sweaty, dizzy, and tired, Mal finally made it around the steep mountain ledges above the town. Having taken an hour scaling down the cliffside, making it to the opposite side of the train station, and still able to conceal himself in the forest while having a good view of the tracks. He considered calling for Amelia from here, but worried that he might be heard and pursued. Would it be better to try to slip off now? To signal for her when he was far enough to not be chased and just hope she notices? What if she didn't? What if he tried signaling her and she never came because she was already captured? What if- Stop it! He said, slapping his hands hard against his cheeks. Anything that can be handled will be handled, and anything that can't shouldn't be worried about. Not yet. It won't help yet. He stopped and considered. If Amelia were found and captured, there would be more of a buzz. And if there were more of a buzz, he would be able to tell just by seeing it. So she must not be captured. A very welcome conclusion, when the alternative couldn't even be considered. And so, being careful not to step on a single dry branch, he made his way closer to the station, and as he looked upon it, considered nothing. For on the platform was Joe and Marty, talking with guards, discussing, far too loudly, Mal's plan to leave by the railway. And he ground his teeth in rage so loudly that a calmer Mal would worry about being heard. The guards left, and Mal stared on. Minutes passed, and Mal stared on. His former friends, those he depended upon, those he trusted, sat and talked and looked on with worried expressions until one of them said something and the other cracked a laugh. And Mal's fury grew. He stepped forward, then feeling the satchel hit against his thigh had mind to place it down. He stepped again, and only barely avoided crunching down onto a heavy stick, nearly raising his voice to curse at it, before reconsidering, and picking it up instead. He watched and waited, and the moment all others seemed distracted or turned away, the moment those he spent his childhood days playing with turned their backs on the wood line, he charged. It was a harrowing pace, with Mal nearly tumbling through the bush as he barreled down. He didn't care about the branches that snapped off and ear-splitting cracks. He didn't care about the muscle-tearing pain he felt in his legs. He didn't care about the thorns that scraped against his arms and face. He didn't care about breathing so hard and fast that he felt lightheaded. All he cared about was charging, landing soundly on the tracks, vaulting up onto the platform, and as Joe turned and pointed, slack-jawed, trying to warn his friend, Mal hammered the massive branch into Marty's back, shattering the stick completely and leaving a deep red gash through the now-torn shirt. Marty let out an ear-piercing scream as he fell, and Mal turned to charge the stunned Joe, tackling him to the ground, for precious seconds, they tumbled and wrestled one another until Mal could get a hand free and, with a savage cry, brought the full force of his fist into Joe's cheek twice before he finally caught Mal's free hand. How could you? Mal cried, oblivious to anyone around, anyone who might hear, anyone who might run to try to capture him. We were friends, he cried, and being unable to tug his hand from Joe's grip, brought his skull down in a horrific headbutt breaking his nose. Joe choked and pushed back, pressing his hand into Mal's face and digging his thumb into his eye, using his elbow to deflect any blows as he spat. Get off me! Get off me, you soft cap! He put his leg up to Mal's stomach and pushed, and with his free hand hit wherever Mal's kidney might be, trying to get him off, trying to wrestle an advantage, trying to do anything to not get hit again. Go find your master and beg for more scraps! It's all the worth you got, you noble's pet! One of the hits struck the mark, and Mal herked as a deep pain blew up on his right side, and he was kicked off as he clutched right below his ribs. Help! Help! The traitor's son is here! He's here! Joe called, and Mal silenced it too late. 
even as he got up and weakly tried to grapple him, already hearing the guardsman's whistle from far down below the street. Even here, even beneath his tears and fury and demands for an explanation, he was betrayed. And in his final burst of anger-fueled strength, knee Joe in the thighs, he grasped at his throat with both hands, choking and tossing him around at the same time, before whipping him to the ground with a blind violence. Then he ran, and fell, then got up to run again, and fell again onto the tracks, feeling the bite of pain still racing up his side. Then he stood to run again, then fell to his knees as he ran out of breath, feeling his adrenaline fade as the pain in his legs grew. There was a weak rasp from Joe as he tried to stand, and a pitiful wail from Marty, still trying to clutch at the wound on his back. Mal stared them both down, standing and shouting with his cracked voice, If you begged half as well as you thought I did, you wouldn't have to wear the same dirty clothes every day, you pauper filth! As he barely managed to climb onto the other side of the tracks and get over the branches of the wood periphery and retrieve his satchel, he turned back just in time to see the guards assisting his two former comrades as Joe coughed and pointed, and Mal sneered. Stupid, stupid, stupid. What was he doing? Why did he do that? To get petty revenge? To ask a question he knew wouldn't be answered? He just endangered himself, endangered Amelia, endangered Kathy, and maybe even Tamlin. Stupid. Why was he so stupid? He kept trying to run, and every few feet kept having to stop to catch his breath. Gods, his side ached. He felt that punch all over again and with every deep breath, but he couldn't stop. He heard them coming behind him. He knew he couldn't outrun them. He was only delaying the inevitable. He could only do one thing to make it a little better. Amelia! He called at the top of his lungs, not knowing if she were even there, but desperate to be heard over the leaves in the roaring chase. Amelia! Run! Don't worry about me! Just run! He kept going, walking, tripping, tumbling, bracing against the trees as he huffed, and with every break he repeated his cry, Run! Don't come help me! Just go! And each time it got quieter and meeker as he heard the angry mob close in. At the end of his rope he stumbled over a branch and only barely managed to steady himself as a sharp battle cry erupted from behind him and he was suddenly tackled onto his stomach. I got him! I got the traitor! He's here! He's here! The man shouted, trying to hold Mal in place while the rest of the group hiked over the hill. Mal crawled and struggled and kicked and bit, but even as he struggled, he knew he was lost. Even if he could kick the guy off, he couldn't run like this. Even if he could run, where would he run to? He just struggled for the sake of struggling, and as he flailed to kick at the man's ribs, he turned and punched Mal in the face knocking him senseless, and with only the twinge of a nervous smile at his own inexperience. He didn't expect getting punched to hurt that bad. Mal heard a sharp intake of breath, and half-blind managed to cover himself with his arms to ward any blow, but none came. He heard a short, gurgled cry, and a slapping flailing, before the weight lifted off of him, and he looked up and saw the man, soundly unconscious, with the loveliest corpse in the world, having just released him from a chokehold. Amelia! Mal cried as she bowed and lent a hand to help him stand and steady himself. What are you doing? How did you find me? Did you hear me? Why didn't you run? Her tone didn't break for a second as she replied. Oh, but I did run. I heard you calling for me to do so, and ran as fast as I could, straight to you. I'm sorry, did you mean something else? and for the life of him, he couldn't tell whether she did that on purpose. That didn't stop him from hugging her tightly, though. I'm so happy to see you, but I'm so upset to see you. You have to go. You can still run. You need to get out of here before you're captured. And what would I tell Tamlin? I do not believe he would be pleased to hear I left you behind, she noted as she painstakingly assisted Mal in walking. You'd tell him I ordered you to do it. Order me? She asked with the same placid look as always. Are you giving me a command, Mal? He knew what she was asking. She wanted to know how to interpret his words. She wanted to know if he were commanding that his will as a necromancer were overriding her own as an undead. I... ah, uh, 
no, of course not, but... Then I will stay right here, she said, as she helped him over a down tree. But that... He began as the raging mob finally reached them and circled around the pair. That just means we'll both be caught. The entire group seemed to be ready to pounce on them at a moment's notice. He saw Mr. Dens and Mr. Zappini and Mrs. Mooney and Miss Moms. He saw Agatha and Della, and he stifled a cry in his throat. This was insane. Mal grew up with these people. They knew him. How could they do this to him? How could they turn on him so quickly? Please don't do this, he begged to none of them, but just hoped for something, anything. Please, you know me. You know me. You know none of the rumors could be true. You know I didn't do anything. Please let us go. Please. And they didn't move an inch. Not a single one of them whether out of fervor or worry for what the group would think. Absolutely none would stand to his defense, and he felt hopeless once more. You're coming back with us, one of the guards leading the mob spoke. If you're innocent, we'll find out in time, and if not, best not chase you to wherever you'd be hiding. Come on now, don't make this difficult. Three of the men stepped forward, only to stop dead in their tracks as the cocking of a gun broke the afternoon air. Would you like me to shoot them, Mal? asked Amelia, leaning in close in a mock whisper loud enough for all to hear. There were a startled few seconds where the mob looked at each other as Mal told her, N No, you don't, don't shoot them. Let's just, let's just go, and began to back away. But not four paces back, one of the men stepped forward again, and Amelia trained her gun right over his chest as he squirmed and grit his teeth. You can shoot us if you want, miss, but that gun only has six bullets and there's twenty of us, and after you're out, there's nothing you can do. Let's just do them in here, another cried. They're willing to kill us to keep running. They know they're guilty. She don't have the bullets to stop all of us. Amelia passed her revolver over every speaker, shaking it lightly, finger on the trigger enough to make the target quiver. I have enough bullets to stop the first six of you, though. Amelia! Shut up, a young lady called. You didn't even try to clear your name. You didn't even try to come forward. You probably helped to commit his evil deeds. You're as horrid as Tamlin himself. What evil deeds? Mal cried out. What have we actually done to you? Do you have any proof? Any evidence beyond hearsay? Anything at all? Oh, Tamlin's done a lot for us, Miss Mon snarled as she gripped the brick in her hand hard enough to make her veins bulge. We will see to evidence after you are in custody, the constable declared, as weary of the crowd as he was of the maid. Come on now, don't make this harder than it has to be. If you shoot, you will only be accused of treason along with murder. The emboldened mob began to close in, and even Amelia sweeping her gun only stopped whoever she was aiming at, while all the rest took the opportunity to move closer and closer. Give it up! Another said, as finally, even with the gun aimed at his chest, he took a step forward. And seeing this, everyone else took two more. Mal backed away, half hiding behind Amelia, clutching at the satchel as he wa- Wait, the satchel, the satchel full of gold, it's full of gold! Could they be bribed? Could he offer gold freely to anyone who'd give up the chase, or- no, no, they wouldn't. Too many judging eyes. Uh, too much time to think. He'd offer one a sum, and the next would demand more, all until it was gone and they closed in all the same. He had to do something to make them act, to make them move without thinking. He had to... He unlatched the top of the satchel, and quickly taking the note from the top to stuff in his pocket, held it outward with both hands. What are you gonna do? Toss your bag, too? One of the mob asked. Not quite, smiled Mal as he turned the entire thing upside down, letting a waterfall of gold and banknotes pour and sparkle all over the ground. There was one second of awed silence as Mal grabbed Amelia's hand and began to run, and a massive uproar as nigh the entire mob dived onto the pile in a frenzy, taking as much as they could fit in their pockets before anyone else. A dozen feet into Mal's getaway, his wrist was suddenly gripped by the very same constable from before, and much more frustrated for the escape attempt. Mal was spun, made to face him, while Amelia spun too, placing one hand firmly on Mal's shoulder and her revolver against the constable's cheek in one fluid motion, 
and he with a baton, a moment from cracking it down onto Mal's head. Mal put a hand up to her as he looked the constable in the eye. Is the reward he'll get for turning me in really worth more than that? And the constable paused. You could do a lot of good with that money. New equipment, more manpower to stop more criminals. And the constable wavered. You, you better hurry. They're taking all your money. And with a vile spit, the constable turned and rushed back to the gold, diving his hands onto any bars that were left, while Mal continued his escape with Amelia. For hours they bore on, long after Mal's feet went numb from the cold and he couldn't feel the muscles in his legs for all their climbing. Long after he began to feel dizzy with dehydration, and Amelia broke his fall more than he did himself. Long after his stomach began to turn, with hunger and with nausea over the constant sweating exertion, for hours longer they walked and walked. The mountains were precarious, with steep slipping slopes that they had to jam their fingertips into the cracks of as they skirted long narrow edges. Time after time a rock would fall from its perch and it would sail overhead as it plummeted down, or fall from under them as they were balanced close to it, and one would grab the other in shock and worry, but neither fell. And Mal would smile nervously after each reminder that he was lucky indeed. As the hours wore on, with long rests between, the sun began to set down in the west, and every few hours a train horn would bellow as it careened by the mountainside, inhabitants either rushing toward the capital, or guards from the capital heading to reinforce the city. And each time Mal and Amelia had to rush and duck out of sight, and Mal grit his teeth and grabbed at his own hair, knowing full well he should have been on one of them. He should have been faster and now every train that went by carried more news about what had happened, more speculation as to what was going on, more warrants for his capture. He would have to be much more careful going into the capital now, and that made his legs even weaker. It was dinner time when Mal finally emerged from the mountain ranges onto the softer plateau of forest floor, and deep into the night when he emerged from the pine-scented forest into the valley overlooking the capital and to the warmth of its dome of light. He was cold, and hungry, and tired in every way, and only barely managed to distract from the aches by raving to Amelia about the sheer weight of his loss, that his fine clothes were now so torn and muddy, while she nodded, understandingly. They entered the bright, lit, and bustling capital in silence. With Mal losing every bit of his previous squirreliness as he deftly avoided entering the city by its only clear entrances of train rail, as he climbed his way up the iron railing that acted as a wall between the inner streets and outer farmland, with Amelia holding tight. And when he hopped his way over the last ledge and collapsed onto the upper walkway, he sank into an immovable heap. He couldn't move even if he wanted to. Now it was Amelia's turn as she dragged Mal's wheezing and groaning form behind crates where he could suffer quietly, promising to alert the Duke, if she could do so safely, and to bring Mal to him to explain the situation, if not. In her preliminary investigations, she collected two tidbits. One, the city was well lit, naturally. And two, there were many people. And though this was fitting, it was not very helpful. In fact, it was distinctly unhelpful. This must be remedied. Whenever she happened upon anyone of an official disposition, she commented, rather pointedly, I have a message for his lordship Tamalin, but it seems he has been indisposed. Do you know anything about that? And listened attentively as her master was drugged through the muck over his fiendishness and cruelty and how glad they all were that he was finally outed, and she, ever polite, did the service of not mentioning the very gems and jewels they wore that came from his mines. So, news has travelled here by now. Fitting, but again, a bit too obvious to be helpful. She caught a tram, kindly explaining to the curious driver that she was, in fact, a leper, and hid her face to avoid scorn so he could ask no further questions and demand no money, and rode as far as she could into the noble's quarter trying to reach the duke's hold before she was stopped by guards. Her leper excuse did her no good. You cannot be here, ma'am. The hold is closed to any and all visitors tonight. It is best you move along. Oh, 
but perhaps a special exception could be made. I carry a message from Count Tamalin, and have travelled all day to bring it to the Duke's ears. The guards shot each other a glance. Whatever their feelings, the Duke's favoritism was well known, and this may be something he would actually want to hear, especially under such unique circumstances, but even so. I'm afraid we cannot let you in, ma'am, regardless of the content of your message. The Duke has received a telegram from a trusted source who informs him that his life may well be in peril. And with Her Majesty's visit so close approaching, we can take no risks. Even he has not been allowed to venture out for fear of assassins. Your message will have to go unsaid until Her Majesty feels satisfied there is no threat. Considering what Amelia knew of the Empress, via cultural osmosis and state communications, it would be more efficient simply waiting for Tamlin's return. Since the Duke and his potential assistants were indisposed, the proper course of action was to first scout for information. She looked around the train station leading from Portau to the capital, and while making sure to keep well away from the guards that lined the leaving area, and those thoroughly checking the baggage, and trying not to stand too close to the wanted signs that had Mal's interesting face plastered on them, managed to deduce that these people, too, likely heard the news, and it was perhaps not wise to get so close as to ask them for particulars in such light that her veil may not keep prying eyes away. Since they knew, it was not at all prudent to remain here. Therefore, the best course of action would be to escape as quickly as possible. Amelia hurried down to the other stations leading away, and particularly northward. Since the northern sphere was not a very popular tourist destination outside of the fabulously wealthy, it was easy to assess the timetable of departures and the difficulty that might be involved with sneaking onto a train. Very much was the answer. It was not the number of guards that were the problem, but rather, since so few people left a vacation north at all, the level of scrutiny and investigation any person entering would be put under was enormous. And Mal and she now lacked the funds and connections to steer such eyes away. Clearly this was not viable either. Since leaving by land was not an option, Amelia next investigated the shipyards. Catching a ride aboard cruise liners or ferries or military vessels was out of the question. Even supposing the money could be gained to bribe those aboard to not ask questions, such vessels do not usually travel far north anyways. No. She investigated the docks instead, wherein smaller, more personal fishing or research vessels could be haggled for, and where private warehouses gave more shadow to her face. "'I'm sorry, miss,' the sailor said, one after another, "'but it's just too risky to go up there this time of year. Promises and loans don't cut it when it comes to getting my ship unstuck from the ice. Say, why do you want to go up that way anyways?' Since she did not have to answer, she didn't, and instead rushed back to Mal to explain, as kindly as she could, that they were trapped, without assistance, without transportation, without funds, and without hope. Chapter 20 Perseverance and spite must be friends indeed. The world could not live if they were anything else. Page 56, line 5, from The Book of Small Wisdoms, by Monk Zahn. Mal did not take this news well. How was he going to get away? What could he do? Did he have to just keep walking all the way north? How would he eat? How would he survive the cold? What if word got out there already? What if, by the time he got there, people were on the lookout for him? He wouldn't be able to hail a carriage, or go out in the day, or shop, or find entertainment, or continue his studies, or do anything. Not to mention, he had no money. He had nothing. If Mal were in a state to move, he would have slumped down, back against the wall, and leaned his head against his legs. But he wasn't, so he just groaned instead. This was it. He was done. He couldn't get away. He was tired and hungry, and between the stress, anxiety, and marathon he just went through, was exhausted in every way imaginable. He had nobody he could turn to or depend on. Even his own friends betrayed him. Even his own friends knew it was hopeless. Maybe it would be okay if he turned himself in after all. Maybe the Duke would know of him and pardon him. Maybe he would wake up in the cell and be released from this misunderstanding, and he'd rush down to the dust pits and his friends would be there, and they would all play again, and everything would be forgiven and okay. <sighs> I'll turn myself in, he told Amelia. You don't need to eat or anything, right? Correct. Though I will enter a comatose state if I am deprived of energy. 
Then tell me where you'll be, and I'll find you after I'm out. I'm sure I'll be released quickly, and you and I can meet back up, and I'll live on charity or something until Tamlin gets back. There has to be someone willing to help an innocent man until he gets back on his feet, right? Certainly, Amelia agreed, bowing low enough to touch her forehead to Mal's. Perhaps that young man you met at the gala would be willing to lend you some money to get by? You may even want to turn yourself in to him directly. He seemed to be very fond of you, from all I heard. Yeah, Mal agreed. He did seem very fond of me, he considered. He did say that if I ever needed anything, his wheels turned. And finally, a new idea sprung into place. Amelia, I'll ask him for help! Yes? Didn't you just decide- No, I mean help going north, and help evading the constables, help keeping undercover. He has money, his father has influence. If they can help, we can get to safety, we can still do it. All is not lost yet! Then you will ask him for assistance in escaping? Yes! Excellent. Where does he live? Oh, a slight problem had been discovered. Mal knew where the gala had been held when they first met, but that wasn't his house, was it? Probably not. And even if it was, it would do him no good to just go knocking on the front door. He considered having Amelia go out and just ask where the house might be found, but that may seem suspicious with all going on. And even rumors of someone gunning for the Duke going on about. Even the tiniest chance that someone would lead them astray or alert the constables or the house guards was too great a risk to take. Instead, he had her ask for the most reputable costume shop around, uh, preferably one that was closed and whose owners who wouldn't be back until sunrise, for completely lawful purposes, of course. After acquiring such a described address, Mal continued in his decidedly unlawful purpose of breaking and entering. With Amelia observing the streets and giving him the all-clear, Mal managed to lug his weary self all the way down the block into the side streets where the shop was situated. Then he climbed the grimy water pipe, still dewy with condensation, all the way up to the slippery roof tiles where the night wind blew, carrying the smell of sanitized diesel and leather. Be careful, he heard a wispy voice echo from below, and he smiled as he gave a thumbs up over the ledge. He crept up along the roof, holding himself steady as he bent over and grasped at whatever holding the tiles allowed, making his way slowly toward the chimney. It was full of soot, and he groaned as he knew that his fine clothes were going to get even more ruined. Awful. Terrible. The squeeze might be a bit tight, but that was no issue. He wrapped what remained of his handkerchief around his mouth and nose to keep the gunk out and, legs first, climbed into the chimney and contorted himself lengthwise to allow for an easier slide where he could still grip the walls. It was a slow going down, and every inch lower unearthed more soot that fell and blackened him like a well-seasoned chicken, and by the time he finally tumbled out of the fireplace and into the waiting room, he was amused at just how perfectly he could blend into the shadows this way before sheepishly apologizing to the absent owners for when they came back to find an utter smokehouse of a waiting room. He went and unlatched the door and slunk around to the alleys to wave Amelia inside, and once inside and together, he breathed far easier. After Mal cleaned enough that he could touch things again without staining them, they began moving about the shop looking for a proper disguise to cover Mal's rather noticeable face— they eventually decided on a half-revealed mask one would wear to a party to cover the twist along his mouth, and a black eye to give him an excuse to close the other on the unmasked side, and hide the contracted pupil, with the casual brown coat and trousers of a worker. Even better, he could act the drunken fool easily, and give those around him a wide berth so they didn't come close and examine him at risk of being drawn into his, uh, celebrations. The real problem was Amelia for she needed to be up close to people so she could smooth-talk their way to their destination. In particular, it was Mal who went about grabbing everything, and Amelia, with zero sense of fashion, just held it, listening attentively, while he muttered to himself about color coordination, peacocking, layering, what the proper fashion was these days, how servants of certain houses were expected to dress, and, of course, how one of her imagined outcome and imagined status would dress, supposing she was not trying to falsify an identity— and gain entry into a manor. In the end, he decided that a young lady in a hurry would already be wearing her uniform, but under her regular clothes to protect from tear and for modesty, that she would obviously keep up with the fashions of the day, but only be able to afford newer accessories or bits of jewelry, and that the whole of her wardrobe would be more pragmatic and humble of older fashions, perhaps with evidence of wear and weathering. 
and stitched up where rips had let seams come undone. Finally, there came the makeup, easily the most necessary part of the whole attire. It needed to look natural while still covering up her, um, condition. And that would require a great deal of work, yet. Mal started with a light foundation, having to choose multiple shades, the first to cover up her distinct paleness and the second to cover up the cover-up, to match what would otherwise be someone's normal skin tone with added foundation. Next came the blush, and he decided it would be a light pink, applying it just enough that it would look as if someone had jogged some ways to get to their destination. Her lips were the hardest to find a matching tone for. He couldn't make it look natural, as anything akin to a natural tone was off-put by the blue tinge to her lips, but instead decided it was perhaps okay if a young lady looked a tad gaudy and could not quite afford proper lipstick, and so chose a deeper shade of red that contrasted the rest of her tone. He could do nothing at all about her eyes. Any mascara or false eyelashes would only bring greater attention to their milky look, and so he took a risk, giving her a pair of fake glasses, as dark a tint as he could find, and just told her to be a few paces back from anyone she spoke with, and she nodded happily. She looked herself over in the mirror, turning back and forth, moving and tilting this way and that to see which poses suited her best, adjusting her face to one of nervous fatigue. Satisfied, there was one final thing to know, as she turned to Mal and asked, Am I pretty? Gorgeous, he cried. Fantastico, like the goddess Maroon incarnate, he said after he blew chef's kiss after chef's kiss, and she clapped her hands to her cheeks in delight. Finally, he covered her swan neck in a moss-colored scarf and brushed her raven hair into a tight bun that could be covered in a brown, wide-brimmed hat. Looking at her so dolled up, he felt a twinge of disappointment. She really was ethereally beautiful. How sad it was to cover it up through costume, but, ah, it would not always be so. And he consoled himself that it was, indeed, for the sake of their survival, so perhaps it could be excused. Finally, with long coat covering her uniform, and a large luggage briefcase that contained her and Mal's old clothing that she held in both hands, she was ready to pass. Mal followed her lead as he trailed her from inconspicuous drunk man singing distance, while she caught the attention of a patrolman as she stood notably away from any lanterns. "'Excuse me, sir,' her voice coiled, "'but could you inform me as to the whereabouts of the Egmont household?' I was supposed to report there an hour ago, but with all the hullabaloo around new arrivals to the station, I seem to have misplaced my map, and have been lost since. The man at first seemed a bit taken aback, but quickly straightened himself. Oh, well, yes, I know where it is, but it would be best if I guided you there myself, miss. It is an especially odd night, between talk of assassins and escaped villains. You know the whole city is goosey. If I could, I would accompany you to provide you a bit of safety. Amelia feigned consideration, tilting her head and tapping the corner of her mouth with one finger as she made what she assumed to be a thoughtful expression, before replying, "'Your offer is extremely kind, sir, but I must decline. Even for one so dapper and respectable as yourself, it may be amiss for a young lady to be seen walking with a gentleman to her appointment.' The patrolman took a step closer and removed his hat as he tried his utmost to assure her that it would be all right, since surely they would understand the need for added safety in such a situation, and at this Amelia used her secret weapon, dabbing her handkerchief at her eyes and sniffing. "'It's just my mother, you see. We are not a wealthy household, and she spent all our savings to get me here for this work. She's dreadfully ill as well, and requires a great deal of funds and help to get by, so I cannot risk this work for anything. Even should the worst befall me, I must attain this appointment.' "'Oh, my gosh!' the patrolman said, wringing his hat. "'I'm so sorry. Is there at least someone who can remain there and care for her?' "'Yes,' Amelia sniffled. "'My little brother, bless his soul, is all that she has to care for in the house, but his crutches are so rusty that he can barely hunt for the food the family needs to survive. Scares all the animals off when they hear it. You understand, I'm sure.' "'My word!' the patrolman exclaimed, now taking out his own handkerchief and dabbing his eyes. Is it not possible for there to be a hunting dog with him, just to ease some burdens? Oh, yes, we had one not too long ago, she sobbed. But then one day my brother, the one with the very squeaky crutches, he slipped from a roadside and down into a ravine, nearly drowned if not for our hound that saved him, even at the cost of its own life. My days, the patrolman sighed, leaning his back against the post to reflect on this sad tale. What kind of dog was she? 
Amelia's sniffling stopped as she considered, and then continued unabated as she replied, A black lab. I thought labs were supposed to be fantastic swimmers, the patrolman murmured. Oh, yes, they are, she agreed. But then on their way back, she got run over by a wagon. It was so sad. You poor thing, the patrolman cried as he wiped his now heavily flowing tears away. Yes, so you see how important my getting this work is to us, so that I must take absolutely no risk, even if my own life were at stake, even if I must give up the honor of walking with one so gentlemanly as yourself. It is something I must do for my family. Finally, the patrolman took a step back and adjusted his cap, letting a single tear fall from his cheek once more as he did so. I understand. He told her the address, pointing her in the general direction, and with a wave of farewell she set off down the road, with Mal taking the long way around to meet up with her. That was so good, he adored as he ran up beside her. You're a natural-born actress, you must be. She laughed and performed a sweeping bow, waving to whatever invisible crowd might be watching. Thank you, thank you. I do my best. I learned it from you, she said, blowing a chef's kiss of her own. They continued onward to the house, which, at first glance, seemed indistinguishable from the other high-class manners that could be found sprinkled throughout the noble quarter. But in closer examination, everything, from the gardens to the architecture of the house, in some way resembled in part or in whole the family honors. A crest, a shield-bordered phoenix rising from the ashes of fire-hardened stakes, with busts and statues of patriarchs past lining the entire front side to be seen by onlookers and all. A family whose nobility was born of protecting those who suffered from persecution. If there were divine providence, this was undoubtedly it. They hid in the bush and spoke at length about what to do should certain scenarios present themselves, for Mal had to ensure that he would get nobody from that house except Howard himself. She would, at first, try to find a way to sneak in unnoticed to blend in with the servants and reach him wherever he was within the house. If she could not, she would simply knock on the door. If Howard answered, she would explain the situation and ask for assistance. If anyone else answered, she would try to pass for a returning or a recruited servant and be invited in, before sneaking off to find him when they put her in the servant's room to change. If she were refused, she would entreat whoever answered to follow her to deliver a letter to the young master, to be placed in his hands only, and upon the letter would be written Mal's circumstances and his desire for help. If the request were refused, she would provide a different letter, for anyone to read, giving just a time and a place for Howard to meet a mysterious stranger, and Mal could scarp her if anyone but him showed up. Perfect. Amelia took off, sneaking around the perimeter to check for any entrances while Mal wrote up the letters, and he had just finished and wondered about adding a fourth plea when Amelia returned, and Mal spat, already knowing it meant she wasn't able to find a way in. Plan B? she asked and Mal nodded, handing her the stack of notes and going over her greeting and how she was to conduct herself one last time before sending her off to the door. She walked on, and as she neared the guards at the gates, they eyed her with some suspicion, but did not move to stop her, and she did not move to recognize them as she sauntered on past. So far, so good. She got up to the steps, rapping against the door three times and waited, hands folded over the letter, standing stock still. In a whisper, Mal recited her introduction and greeting, and wringing his coat nervously. She had everything she needed. He knew she would get it right. Whether it be Howard, a servant, or guard, it would be okay. But it wasn't. And Mal's heart sunk as he saw the full burst of light from the front door opening, and standing there to obscure it was Howard's father, Gregor. Rotund round, and red in the face as a tomato from his collar being so tight around his thick neck. He greeted Amelia warmly, but his large bellow could be heard all the way to Mal's hiding place, and he heard him specifically instructing her that if she were here for help with any debts or to collect them, his son was currently indisposed, and would be for the foreseeable future, and she ought to just run along, back to whatever den she came out of not so warm indeed. She tried to get a word in, to tell him about the note delivered to her that she must deliver in turn, but before three words were out of her mouth, Lord Egmont repeated, with even more uh, warmth, that he did not care. He did not care what she wanted, 
or how sorry a state she was in, because she wouldn't be reaching his son either way, who, from now on, would be staying well clear of all gambling houses and bars, so whatever issue she was having, she'd have to put her grubby hands against someone else's coattails for it. Amelia defaulted to the next line, trying to give the second note to Gregor directly so that it could be given to his son, and at this he leaned even closer, and Amelia took many steps back to retain the secret of her condition, which he must have gratefully taken for intimidation, as he whispered something through grit teeth and slammed the door in her face. Mal was already curled into a ball by the time Amelia got back to the hiding place, and he eeped out a, "'What did he say?' so quietly that he wasn't sure if she heard it. Luckily, she told him regardless. He told me that his son was to stay in his quarters for some time, and that if I were to try to go upstairs to see him, I would find his hounds far less discerning over a young lady than his guards. What an ass! Mal mumbled. So much for that idea. Now what was he going to do? He said that his son was to stay in his quarters upstairs? He asked, pointing upward with his finger. Quite, she agreed, pointing the same direction. Then, here, follow me! And together they circled once more around the manor, hiding in the bushels and branches of the gardens as they examined the windows of the upper floors. There were two separate floors he could be on, not to mention separate wings of the house, which was a bit of an issue, but at least being so late, he only had to focus on the rooms that had light in them. But what if he was asleep? What if he was in the dark and there was no way for Mal to see where he was and he'd have to wait until morning and probably be caught and then hauled off and— no. He shook his head. He couldn't let himself think like that. He had to trust that he'd be lucky. He had to. They circled, and at every illuminated window they stopped and stared for a long time, seeing nothing, and moving into the next. They had circled three separate times when a light came on in one of the darkened rooms, and Mal watched. There! There he was, in the window! Howard seemed to be looking around for something, yawning and reaching into the shelves. Mal tried to jump up and down, waving his arms, while also crouched and doing something more akin to jazz hands, desperately trying to get Howard's attention while avoiding anyone else's. Finally, as Howard yawned once more and began to leave the room, Mal's desperation took over as he plucked a berry from the bush he was hiding in and hucked it at the window as hard as he could, thudding it against the window in a quaint splat. He did it again and again, painting the window shades of purple and blue as he manically pelted it with berries, and from right behind it, Howard stood, watching the window be covered, absolutely mesmerized. Finally, he opened the window just in time to get a berry splattered against the center of his forehead, and he looked down to see who exactly this troublemaker was. Mal, is that you? And Mal nodded happily. He began to speak, an entire half-prepared spiel about how he really didn't mean to disturb him so late in the night, and how all the rumors circulating about himself and the supposed activities of Tamlin were most certainly false, and how he was so sorry to cause any trouble but didn't have anyone else he could turn to, but before he could even get two words out, Howard called to him cheerily, Well, what are you doing down there? Come on in! Oh, wait, I'm in trouble. Uh, would you like to meet somewhere? Oh, wait, I'm in trouble. Damn it. How can we meet up, chap? Uh, well, if you would just, uh, let down something for me to climb... Oh, how scoundrel! I love it! Wait here! Howard disappeared for some time, and when he came back, he unloaded tied rope after rope of bedsheet to tumble from the window and onto the ground. Take hold, chap! We got it safe and sound! Hurry! Mal signaled for Amelia to reattach her veil and follow, and one after another they climbed the bedsheets up to the upper floors of the manor, with only a slight pause of Howard's groaning that Mal really ought to lose some weight. Mal reached the top and tumbled through in as dramatic a roll as he could and Amelia followed close behind. Ah, fantastic, fantastic, Howard called before suddenly running out of the room. A fish, a fish, we got them, we can untie it now. And together with a valet came back into the room, and Howard must have noticed Mal's hasty step back. Oh, no, it's fine, this is my man Codsworth, you can trust him with your life, I assure you, so you don't need to worry about him, but yes, yes, tell me everything, I heard some shenanigans got up to in Portau. Yeah, called Mal with probably too much glee. We almost died. I know, I heard. Heard your house burn straight to the ground. Thought you went kaput with the rest of it. When I saw you outside, I had to be sure I wasn't seeing a ghost. Not quite, Amelia mused, and was promptly punched in the arm. Mal told him everything. The full truth of everything he didn't lie about, which was very little. And Howard was enraptured with all of it. So was Codsworth, by what it seemed. At the end of Mal's tale, he finished by rushing in close and clasping his friend's hands, asking him if there's anything that could be done, 
If he could just have a little money, if he could just be snuck out of the city somehow, if anything at all could happen, the slightest bit of support, and Howard laughed as he clasped back and said, Of course! Wait, really? Naturally. You're the most exciting thing to happen to me all year. Yes, I will return the favor. I think I will, yes. Uh, fear not, chap. I will provide you with all that I can, and then... But a stomping up the stairs stopped their plans. Howard ordered Fish to stay out of sight and pretend he was never here, while motioning for Mal and Amelia to make themselves scarce as he rushed out to try to keep his father from entering. There wasn't much space to decide on in the room. A supply closet, a small shelf of books, and a few crates. Amelia, for her height, chose the closet, and Mal chose to, rather delicately, place some of the items in the crate out and onto the ground before squeezing himself into it, muttering prayers that Lord Egmont wouldn't notice. There was a clattering outside and the raising of voices before Lord Egmont barged in, scanning the room as Howard came in behind him, mocking the elder. See, there's nothing here! He ignored his son, pacing about as well as his jolly frame could let him, overlooking the crates completely, but eyeing the closet and approaching it deliberately, while Mal sweat, and Howard hoped some servant would provide a distraction in time. Gregor went up, tapping his foot loudly against the hardwood before quickly punching the frame of the door. Not a peep from within. Far from comforting, this only seemed to make Lord Egmont's face furrow with frustration as he went to whip the door wide open. And all the while, Mal thought. It could not happen. He could not discover her. The worst thing that could happen if Mal were found was still better than the worst thing that could happen if Amelia were. Taking one moment to brace himself, and muttering an apology to Howard, he faked a sneeze so hard that he kicked the lid from the crate entirely, sending it flying before clattering to the floor as Gregor turned, mouth agape, skin as red as a boiled tomato, and Howard grimaced. You! There was a moment of stock silence as they all stared from one to the other, when Lord Egmont charged, hands outstretched, reaching for Mal as he tried to tumble from the crate, and Howard moved between them to intervene. There was shouting and curses and calls from all sides as Lord Egmont roared, How dare you show your face here! How dare you come into my abode! I won't have it! I won't! I won't have you sully my family's good name! I won't have you tarnish our reputation! I won't! I won't! The shouting match continued as he pushed his son out of the way and reached Mal, grabbing him by the neck and dragging him out the door as the young man kept slipping from his grip and his son kept pulling fiercely at his arms, and Amelia, from within the closet, brandished her revolver and cocked it. Mal was dragged down the hallway, wailing, Please, please, I need help! I just need help! It's in your family's honor! Your family's name to help! Please! But the stone-faced Gregor did not budge and his sighs allowed him to trample through all of Howard's attempts to push him back as the servants only looked on in distress. Talman can help! Once he's back, he can help raise your status! Shower you with honors, please! Still nothing. Buy time. He needed to buy time. Please just wait till morning! Wait till morning so we don't wake everyone up! There, for a split second. He didn't stop. He kept pulling, kept trampling, but his brow was less furled. His eyes darted from center considering something. Mal had caught something, and pressed it, screaming, You can't! You can't! Because if you do, everyone will know! They'll see! All of them! All of your neighbors! All the folks who wake up because of the commotion! Everyone who's on the streets will see you dragging me off to the station! All of them will know I came here! All of them will know I was in your house! The heavy silence returned, as Lord Egmont finally stopped, standing, thinking, eyes darted up and down, in one corner and then the next, running these horrid possibilities through his mind, while his son turned slide eyes toward him and agreed. Yeah, that's right, isn't it? Everyone would find out, wouldn't they, father? They will all know, every last one of them. And when the press and the people came peeking and making a scene for our neighbors to watch and gossip about, I will tell each and every one of them that he was here to see me, because he trusts me, because we're friends, and oh, just think on what they'll say then, eh, father? Lord Egmont let go of Mal. And the house finally seemed to settle as Mal's heartbeat eased, even as he hid behind Howard. You! 
he said, pointing to Mal as he eeped and hid further. You are never to speak of this to anyone. If you do, I will bankrupt my house to silence you. Do you understand me? Nobody will see we have given you any assistance whatsoever. And you, he said, pointing to his son, nobody is to see him. Nobody is to be told of him. Absolutely nobody is to be so much as guessing as to his existence. Not a single soul outside these walls. Do you understand me? Right-o. As long as I get to help him, I don't care what happens, replied Howard with those same sly eyes and angry smile to match his father's furious eyes that only grew and grew with this disrespect. You're a disgrace, his father snarled. Like father, like son, he hissed back. With a huff and one last glance to both boys, Lord Egmont turned and bouldered back downstairs, nearly knocking over the servants on his way out, as they quickly turned to follow after him. And only the creaking of floorboards and Howard's deep breath were heard when they went back to the room. I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, I didn't mean to cause anything. You're the only person who's wanted to help me, and I didn't want to get you in trouble or make you regret it, and I'm so sorry. And promptly shut up when Howard turned, and in one leap, nearly knocked into Mal with a tackle. That was so awesome! That was so cool! It was like something out of a play, the way you handled him! I... what? He was so furious, and you just stood your ground! Nerves of steel! You're absolutely Tamlin's son! Wait... oh, wow, thank you! And now you can stay! Oh, this is awesome! Like an impromptu sleepover! I've never had one of those! This is gonna be great! And of course your loyal servant is welcome too, if she wishes, he said, glancing over at Amelia, now out of the wardrobe, who replied with a prompt... I could not be anywhere else. Excellent. Then I just have to find a place for you. Uh, here, follow me. Together they ascended even higher, up to the third floor, where Howard pulled Mal into what seemed to be an observatory. It was large, spacious, and full of tools with which to observe the stars and constellations, with maps in accordance with the changing of the seasons, and books on theology detailing the courses the dragons took as they traveled from star to star, chasing each other eternally. Oh, this is so cool! Wait, are you a primordialist? But Howard just laughed. No? Do I have to be to have an interest in old legends? Well, I just mean, isn't that heresy? The temple wouldn't like it, that's for sure, but what do I care what they like? Mal smiled. Can I take a look? Be my guest, Howard gestured, and guided Mal toward the instruments as he adjusted and attuned and asked what Mal could see. Everything. It seemed like the whole cosmos was painted in the sky that very night, and left for the paint to dry. It was beautiful. You know, Howard began, changing places with Mal and letting him play with the knobs and dials. When I was younger, I used to wonder about looking too far into the night sky and seeing them. Their physical forms, I mean, and what it might be for them to look back. Did you ever find them? Mal asked, half curious, half humoring. Not yet, Howard smiled. An hour passed in his explanations of the cosmos as Mal listened, enraptured. Even Amelia got her turn, and though Kathy couldn't use the equipment, she was put on the shelf to enjoy the lecture anyways. It continued right up until Mal, in his pacing, caught the distinct smell of alcohol and chemical components, and in sniffing for the source, found the medical cabinet in jars upon jars of sickly-looking liquids and oozes with strange names, a study in toxicology, anatomy, and drugs. You study medicine, Mal shouted, more of an observation than a question. Yes, I do, Howard confirmed anyways. What is this, Mal said, grabbing a jar of yellowish liquid. Embalming fluids, used in the preservation of bodies and parts. And this? Alcohol, not the drinking kind, it's to purge bacteria. Can I drink it anyways? You might catch die-to-death disease, so best not. And this, Mal said, holding up a vial of colorless fluid. A cyanide. Poison! Mal barked, jumping back, nearly dropping it before catching it again in his other hand. Why do you have poison? To learn about it, of course, he laughed. But it's poison. It could hurt someone. It could hurt you. So could a gun, or a person, or a car. Yet we still have these things around. There are lots of things in the natural world that are dangerous. Even apple seeds contain some cyanide. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't eat them. It just means we should be careful. And we can't know to be careful unless we know through study. You're that dedicated? Absolutely. Is that really so strange? They have classes at the university here. Well, yeah, but I don't know. I always hear rumors of you spending time at the gambling houses and brothels and... 
And what? I still do those things, he laughed. It's just that I can do them and also be a doctor, and also be into astronomy, and also be into helping friends in need. Mal was mesmerized. He saw and smelled and almost tasted as he ran all around and around and around the room, tapping the gadgets and fidgeting with the dials and equipment. This is so incredible. This You have all this to yourself? For yourself? Yes, I do, Howard replied proudly, puffing his chest. See, you wouldn't think so, considering, oh, what a shame, what shame it brings to my family. Uh, but it keeps me out of sight from my father, and hey, at least my mom likes me. So, sort of. So there's that. And you promised my staying here wouldn't be hard on you? Make things more difficult for you? Not a wink. Listen, chap, if it wasn't for you, it would be something else. At least this way I can actually get yelled at over something that matters. Mal smiled, and Howard smiled back. Anyways, you can stay here in this room for the time being. It's big and full of things to keep you interested, and most importantly, far out of the way of anyone's duties to clean or my father's sight. For the lady, why are you dressed like that, by the way? Unless I shouldn't pry, of course. Leprosy, she said with far too much cheer. My entire face is melted off. Grizzly sight. I wear the veil so my household can hold their food down. Oh, oh, oh dear, I'm so sorry. But I could take a look at it if you want. I'm sure I have articles that prevent infection if... And also I was part of a covenant where we swore never to reveal our faces to men. I... That's, I mean, strange, but all right. Like, if it makes sense for you, I guess. No skin off your back. And I'm not one to knock religion with all this around. Uh, but if you want, I can arrange for a room with n the female servants instead. No such arrangements need be made, she said, sitting next to her ward on the couch. I must stay with Mal, always. Ooh, saucy, I like it. All right, suit yourselves. I'll have food and anything else you need brought up to you every day, and... Oh, gods, we're going to need to get you a new pair of clothes, aren't we? Howard, came Amelia's soft whisper, as he turned and saw Mal slumped over on her shoulder, passed out into the deepest sleep of his life. He nodded, gesturing, asking if she would like the light off or like anything at all before he left, and she shook her head, laying Mal down on the couch and covering him with blankets, standing over him with watchful eyes. She could not be anywhere else, for he held her hand tightly, even still. It's okay. I will not go, she whispered to him. I will stay for as long as you want me to. Chapter 21 The worst and best thing about living through terrible times is the fact that you are actually living through them. Page 144, line 7, from The Book of Small Wisdoms, by Monk Song. The very next day, Howard arrived bright and early with breakfast. Knock-knock, he called as he waited at the stairs of the observatory. Amelia took on the rest of the work of actually carrying the tray up the stairs, though. Oof, she's strong, isn't she? He said, smirking over it, still rising, then falling, then rising, then groaning in pain, then falling Mal. Why do I hurt so bad? Because you have light burns on a great deal of your body. Your shoulder is sprained and your muscles are cramped beyond reason. It might be the food, Mal said as he glared at the presented bowl of overcooked salmon on pasta. What, you don't like seafood? Howard said, turning him over and asking Amelia to bring a lamp over to better examine the wounds. Did you cool the burns? I did, Amelia said, still holding Mal up. After we escaped the fire, I had lots of time to let him rest in a spring. Fantastic thinking, he said. A lot of people make the mistake of and turning Mal onto his stomach with a groaning thump, continued, the mistake of using too cold water, or putting ice on a burn, which can make it worse, damaging the tissue. Cool water and wet compresses are best. And then, turning to Amelia, if you're going to use ice, be sure to wrap it in something first. And then, bringing out his medical bag from the tray, or wrap the wound in something first. You know, if you're clumsy and cut your fingers off, you don't want the ice touching you directly. It can cause nerve damage if raw ice touches the wound for too long. Or any skin, really. Now, let's get this off you. And he began cutting Mal's coat with scissors. What? 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 What are you doing? Don't cut them, you fool! Those are vintage items! I am removing, Howard replied as he fought off Mal's slaps. Restricting articles. Burns swell, and if they swell too much around a ring or tight clothing, it can burst blisters, cause infections. It seems like some of them have burst already, he said, looking at a very flustered Mal's shoulder. But I can clean them. Water, soap, antibiotic ointment, all here. It was almost too tender for Mal to accept. In the quiet of the room, while Howard dressed his wounds with expert precision, and Amelia looked on, memorizing every movement. How did you get into medicine in the first place? 
Mal asked, trying to break the tension. Oh, when I was a kid, I wanted to play with knives to the point where everyone got concerned, so my mother just bought me a surgical kit and suddenly it was socially acceptable. The process continued with applying a moisturized lotion to the cooled skin, which Howard gratefully allowed Amelia to do in his stead, and wrapping gauze loosely around the burns. Try to keep your clothes off them, all right? I know you see that in plays sometimes with a big, tough act who will wrap his shirt around a wound to keep going, but that can just get it infected, and cotton sticks to blood like sand. Just a gauze wrap is fine, and you'll be good to go. Great. Any other orders for me, Doc? asked the very blushy Mal. Yes, actually. Uh, take two of these. Painkillers. They'll help relax your muscles, too, which will be very useful if you enjoy things like walking. I happen to, yes. Good. Then get up and walk down with me to the library after you're done breakfast. I could use a study buddy. Mal did indeed finish up his breakfast, though it was not as superb as Tamlin's cooking, and assured Amelia that he would be all right as he descended the observatory stairs, down to the well-dressed halls, though not nearly so well-dressed as Tamlin's manner. I mean, the floors were carpeted. Carpeted! As he nodded and smiled sheepishly at the servants as hordes of them passed by either murmuring, telling jokes, gossiping, or just waving at Mal as they carried on their duties. It was an odd thing to now be in a house where footsteps thrummed constantly and where noise could be heard from any room or corridor. In the haze of new stimuli, he lost track of where he was going altogether, and for fear of bumping into Lord Egmont, just asked the most pleasant-faced servant he could where the library might be situated, and he happily obliged and Mal was surprised to find that the servant didn't even need to ask which library. They only had one. It was still quite vast, though, though obviously underused, with Howard being the main occupant of the house to take an interest in it. Many of the books exhibited no dust, due to the vigilant servants, but instead sported a glossy wax feel that came from something going untouched for a long time, and the red trim of the walls had lost the hue in its paint and the yellow of the drapery was so sun-bleached to be closer to beige instead. Howard didn't seem to mind, though. He had already set everything up and was smiling gleefully, looking more like a professor as he patted a meter stick into his palm than he did a study buddy. There were books with notes and markers strewn throughout, chairs moved to make for excellent lounging positions, an entire accompaniment of cakes and teas, and an entire diagram on three separate chalkboards carted to the center. Mal heard the door lock behind him. He was trapped. So you start by... Are you paying attention? Yes, I'm paying attention, Mal lied, more distracted by a new tray of macaron that had just arrived, but he answered all the quizzing correctly, even so. Howard was pleased to notice his appetite for knowledge was voracious, and did not mind feeding his appetite for food to bribe it. Good, this is important, because you don't start CPR if someone is conscious or breathing normally. No point in cracking someone's ribs unless you really need it. Oh, that's another thing. You'll probably crack their ribs. Don't worry about that. Better they be alive. Right. Only when they're unconscious. Otherwise, there are better ways to help them. And when you say unconscious, you don't mean sleeping. Oh my goodness, no. Gracious, no. Absolutely not. Could you imagine? Huh. Anyway. You start by placing them on their back and putting the heel of your hand on the lower half of their breastbone. Then your other hand over top, right in the center. You'll want to get right over them, too. Chest compressions are surprisingly taxing, so you don't want just your arms in it. You want your body weight to help you. This is where the rib breaking comes in. Of course. And then you just push down. You want to aim for about one-third of the chest depth. Don't hold your hand there. But let them come up naturally. You want your pumps to simulate a normal heart rhythm. About 100 beats per minute should do it. You know that bop, Staying Alive? Oh, I love that song. Of course you do. Uh, but yes, if you just sing it over in your head and keep up to the beat, that's a great rhythm to perform chest compressions to. If you can keep focused on it while someone is dying, anyways. Uh, quite. It's really catchy, though. And you just keep doing that until... Until the patient begins breathing normally, wakes up, or someone better takes over. Defibrillators can also help if someone can run and get one. Uh, not you. You need to perform chest compressions. Isn't a defibrillator more important? Well, that's the funny thing, Howard said, slapping the meter stick down to his side in a thematic thwap, as if he were just waiting for Mal to ask. 
There's always an opportunity cost when it comes to treatment. Uh, some medicines react poorly when used with others. Some cures can exaggerate certain ailments even as they heal others. With CPR, the opportunity cost comes in the form of having to stop the chest compressions to do anything else. This is actually why some doctors recommend not doing mouth-to-mouth -to, -mouth to supply air to the lungs. Because even taking 10 seconds to do so is 10 seconds you're not doing compressions. Uh, just ask your local health professionals for updates to the method and follow their instructions. Noted. Thanks. Um, and this goes for everyone? Mm-hmm. That's the beauty of it. Adults, men, women, children, it's all the same. Except for the babies. You'll want to use two fingers instead of your full hand for them. Uh, they're delicate little things. Oh, that's cool. Thank you so- Wait, with everyone? Huh? Yes, of course, with everyone. But, I, I mean, uh, don't you put some people on their stomach instead? <laughs> what? No, why would you? Well, some just have... I mean, you put your hand on their, their chest, right? Right in center? Right in center. But... And Mal leaned close in an embarrassed whisper. But what if they're a woman? Oh, oh, I see. Well, in that case, you just let them die, Mal. And so the months passed. With Mal recovering from his terrible wounds that Howard probably took a bit too much enthusiasm in treating, and chewing his nails to the quick waiting for any news about Tamlin, Howard trying to distract him by teaching him everything he knew about first aid and astronomy, though never letting him experiment with his poisons, much to Mal's dismay, and Kathy tucked neatly away, safe and sound, with Amelia keeping a close watch on Mal, and anyone else who might approach, sitting by his side all night, revolver in hand, aimed at the door. Every day Mal would ask, and every day would be the same answer, that the investigation was still ongoing, that no official statement had been made, and that both Count Tamalin and himself were still nowhere to be found. Until one winter's day, when the snow fell so hard that it could be seen from outside the dome of the capital, and Mal got his answer. Howard made a solemn procession up the stairs that day. Hey, chap, he said, coming in to see Amelia toying with the telescope as Mal played chess next to an open book, and for a moment he reconsidered that perhaps there would be a better time to tell them. But Mal had already turned with his bright smile. Yes, he asked, and Howard couldn't back out now. I got some news today, uh, straight from Portau. I uh, heard my buddies at the den talking about it. it seems the investigation has been called. What? Mal said, knocking over the chair as he stood to accost his friend. Why? What, what did they find? Is everything okay? I... you... Uh, you didn't need... Maybe you should sit back down, chap. The news is about Count Tamalin. Mal stepped back a few paces. It's not good news. And his legs gave way from under him. It was only Amelia's gentle tug that had him sit on the bed, and he clutched her hand until it was whiter than ever. I... I'm so sorry, Mal. There were rumors before. I ordered the servants not to tell you, but... His words trailed off. Mal barely heard them. In the ruins. Found. Remains. Disjointed. Trailing ideas that caused his thoughts to whirl. And his heart to sink. There must be some mistake, Amelia interjected, squeezing Mal's shoulder reassuringly. Perhaps they do not know what they have found, or Tamlin left behind a ploy to trick them. There is no trick. It's certain. It's undeniable. Trace directly back to your ma- Your father. I'm sorry, Mal. He knelt low, reaching out, wanting to hug him, but pulling back, feeling nervous, like it wasn't the time, wasn't the place. Then Mal spoke, finally looking Howard in the eye. Then it's confirmed. They found Tamlin's... Yeah, it has been confirmed that your father, Count Tamlin, is... And with one final gasp, it finally came out. He's a necromancer. I... What? They found the remains in the house, a corpses stored away for practice. I tried to keep the rumor mill down, but it's not a rumor anymore. It's from the word of the arcanists themselves. He's a necromancer. 
The clock could be heard ticking in the silence before Mal decided it was probably best to actually respond. Oh, oh my gods, that's, wow, no way, never imagined. Okay, maybe he should respond a bit better than that. I know this might be hard for you to hear, but no, no, I mean, yeah, it is, wow, incredible. That's, oh boy, I can't believe it. Him? Couldn't be. Unthinkable, really. Howard smiled sadly, while Mal tried to keep his frown as best as he could. No one ever thinks their loved ones could do such a thing. I know this will be hard for you to come to terms with, and I'll try to figure out more as the days go on, but I just figured you should know that you have a right to know. And you too, of course, he flung his hand toward Amelia. It must be horrid to know that your employer was just creating zombies this whole time. Quite, Amelia nodded. Yep, mm -hmm. thanks, I appreciate it so much, you're the best, but also, ow, darn, I can't believe he was a necromancer all this time. I never would have guessed, but he's still alive, right? Um, yeah, I guess so, I mean, they haven't recovered any, awesome, great, fantastic, uh, because that way we can get information out of him, like what made him turn to these uh, dark arts and how he managed to hide it from me for so long. Mm hmm I get it. Of course you'd want to know how someone was able to keep such a secret from you. Totally. Uh, say, can you leave us to our grief for a little bit? Of course, of course. Certainly. I'll be downstairs. Just call if you need anything, okay? There's the phone, the dumbwaiter, whatever you need. Just, yes, thank you, fantastic, you're a great friend. All right, bye-bye. And with one final shove out the door and a slamming lock, Mal and Amelia were alone once more. This is bad. I mean, it's good that he's not dead, but it's, it's bad that there's been proof of his necromancy. At least there's no proof you were involved, Amelia noted. That's true, but I doubt most people would care about a little tea tale like that. But, but how would they know? There was a fire. Everything was destroyed. Not everything. They may have found some of the artifacts and tomes you saved. That's... Shit. Oh, damn it. Shit, shit, shit. You're right, damn it. I'm so stupid. I'm... S you are no such thing, Amelia said cupping his face in her hands once more. You did what you thought was best, protecting the knowledge that is so forbidden to begin with. It would have been lost completely if not for you. At least now it can be recovered. And even if you let it all burn, there was always the chance they would have found something else. But I... If you are to torment yourself by saving what is precious to you, then when will you be rid of me? I am evidence of your practice, am I not? Tamlin warned you that the life of a necromancer was one fraught with danger. Discovery was inevitable. It was ill fortune that decided it be sooner rather than later. Mal nodded, trying to shake away the guilt. It wouldn't help him here. We need to find Tamlin. We need to find Tamlin, and we can't do that staying cooped up here. Amelia nodded. They had to put another plan of escape into action, and now that some of the search for him has died down, Perhaps they will even be able to succeed. They spoke with Howard at dinner, telling him of their concerns that they must leave, both to go where Tamlin instructed, and also to protect Howard himself. Now that Tamlin's activities had come to light, if he were discovered to have harbored Mal, You don't need to worry about me. Inquisitors aren't going to come bash my door down. But I can't guarantee your safety if you're not here. I don't know if our safety can be guaranteed at all, Howard. We're living on borrowed time. And what else can we do? Just stay here, cooped up all our lives until we grow old? It's been awesome so far. Well, yeah, the sleepover has been wonderful, but we can't just live in your observatory. And I don't want to be the cause of any more divide between you and your family. We need to leave. And when we clear our names, we can return. He bowed his head and sighed. He knew Mal was right, no matter how worried it made him. Do you know how you're going to get away? He finally asked, and Mouse sputtered and tugged at his collar as he replied, Uh, not really. Howard laughed. Then I suppose I can help you one last time. How do you mean? Well, I don't have any connection outright to the Arcanists' Guild and their teleporters, but I know Beth's family does, and Alice's father has an airplane sitting in his garage. A plus Robbie should absolutely be in on this because he's been asking me what I've been up to for the last month, and it's getting more difficult to find excuses. But, 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 wait, wait a minute. Are you sure we can trust them? You trusted me? Well, yeah, but, but nothing. If they set the hounds on you, then they set the hounds on me, too. So you're safe. And nobody else is a risk because you'll have a disguise. I'll put you in my clothes. Mal looked down at his portly frame, shaking his tummy with both hands. 
I don't think your clothes will fit. Oh, then I'll give you some of my father's. In the auburn glow of the dome's light, they snuck through the streets, with Mal, Amelia, and Howard costumed as if they had just come from a ball, and Kathy tucked into Mal's shirt, though Howard wore no mask. Tons of acquaintances and gambling buddies would hail him and strike up a quick talk while Mal sweat bullets at the side, but no guard ever accosted the noble son, nor asked about his masked companion or the woman at his side. "'How are you holding up, chap?' he whispered as they walked down the street, so packed they had to press shoulders together. Um, good, I guess. Do you have to stop and talk to everyone? Of course I do. When you're running a scheme, the most important thing is to make absolutely no deviation in your behavior whatsoever. A confidence sells it. If you walk in like you own the place, nobody stops you. So if I wasn't my usual affable self, you'd see how people might think I was up to no good. Mal took this in stride fitting it in his memory along with everything else he may one day possibly use, perhaps, but insisted nonetheless. We really ought to hurry, though. Everything itches. It's uncomfy? It's a little tight around the... the crotch. Is that so? My poor mother! Har har! Howard! Finally, they came to a manor that was more of a tower than mansion, with high spires at every corner and bridges connecting back and forth. It would have been foreboding, if not for the sheer wall of flowers and plant life crawling up the towers and hanging across the bridges as if it had been designed by an evil warlord, only for a band of odd folk to move in. They curled around the side, between rows and rows of bright green and pink hedges, their colors standing out even greater when contrasted with the chill from beyond, and smelling like a dozen flowers that couldn't be seen. And from here, Howard picked up a rock and hucked it as hard as he could at an upper window. It did not hit. He tried again, and again, with the rocks going wide and missing entirely or clattering against the bricks. The larger rocks he threw fared no better. Amelia suggested that perhaps something larger and softer would be better, but the plants and clods of dirt he ripped from the ground to flail toward the window either bounced harmlessly from it or broke apart in the throw. It was only when he prepared to throw his second shoe that Mal asked, "'Would you like me to throw it instead?' Howard, huffing and puffing, silently handed the shoe to Mal who took it and threw it happily, with great gusto, where it hit the square center of the window, and shattered right through it. Mal's shocked smile turned and met the horrified face of Howard, and when a startled, What the blazes! resounded through the now broken window, Mal pointed at Howard, nearly stuffing his finger up his nose, and said, I want to make it clear that this was your idea! And Howard burst out in a laugh that nearly toppled him. Robert Thorne stuck his head through the broken window, and Mal made the very apt decision to duck behind Amelia, seeing the man he had so insulted from before. You! Robert called, pointing directly at Howard. Me! he replied, puffing his chest with pride. You dunderhead! You imbecile! What are you doing throwing stuff at my window? Again, what did you do to my roses? Robbie, please calm down. My roses! Oh my god! My roses! You ruined my- I spent weeks planting those! Robbie, don't you Robbie me! I was going to give those to Lady Darcy when they had their second bloom, you idiot! Get up here right now so I can kick your ass! Robbie, we need- And her! Robbie sputtered, this time pointing directly at Amelia. And him! He sputtered a second time, pointing to Mal, who had made the very unapt decision to lift his head out to take a peek. Who the hell are they? What are you doing bringing more debtors in? They better not be! Actually, that's what we're here to talk to you about. I got a favor to ask you. You just broke my window! And we're in a very certain kind of debt, you see, he replied, completely ignoring him. And we need to get out of here before someone comes to collect. And with this, he strode over to Mal, and before he could even realize what Howard was doing, pulled him out from behind Amelia and took his mask clean off, revealing his identity to Robert. And it was only a firm hand on his shoulder that stopped Mal from keeling over from near heart attack. You understand? Howard said with a wry smile, and Mal watched as Robert's tongue got caught in his teeth, and still staring, went through several stages of shock, before finally letting his jaw hang limp, considering, speculating, going over the implications of exactly what this meant, before he finally nodded. I'll send Benny down, come right up! And that's exactly what they did. When they arrived up to Robert's room, he clapped hands with Howard, introduced himself in the usual noble fashion to Amelia, and held out his hand familiarly to shake Mal's, and Mal smiled since that meant Robert must not remember how terse their first meeting was. 
I remember how terse our first meeting was. Damn it. And I gotta say, I didn't expect this kind of circumstance to be our second. I didn't peg you for the desperate fugitive type, but sometimes life surprises you. Are you all right? And Mal nodded. I'm glad. I presume she, he said, gesturing to Amelia. She's a friend, Mal said. She's been a loyal valet for years, and I could never leave her. Ah, understandable. Every man needs one. It's rare to find such loyalty through hard times. You should be pleased. Mal was pleased indeed, but that didn't make the way he discussed it any more palatable. I heard about your father, he continued. Master Tamalin, right? Of course, you wouldn't have control over any such a thing, but it's not that as if that'll stop people from treating you like you did. I'm sorry you have to go through all this, and glad you came to me for help. Do you need me to hide you, or anything like that? Actually, Mal stuttered, I'm trying to get away from here. I need to go north to Avid's Peak so I can meet up with my, uh, wards, and together we can clear my name. And Tamlin's too, I hope. And how are you planning to go? At this, Mal and Howard shrugged. That's what we came to you for, see? He smiled. Robert nodded, and they conferred that they would call the girls over for assistance as well, explaining the bare bones of the situation and seeing if all of them together could conjure up a way to have Mal safely disappear. A telegram was sent, and all there was left was to wait. In the meantime, they made themselves comfortable. With Mal stress eating all the sweets in the house, Howard chugging down an entire bushel's worth of tea leaves, and Amelia keeping her hand inside her coat pocket, for who knows why. Benny, when they arrive, just announce them as normal. Wait, shouldn't we have, like, a code word or something? Just to make sure it's not Inquisitors showing up at the door. Good idea. The code word can be scrumpulous. Number one, why is the code word so stupid? And number two, how are we going to communicate the code word to them unless they're already inside to hear it? That doesn't matter. The The important thing is the code word should be barf. That's way simpler. Okay, even if we had a code word, shouldn't it be something no official would ever say? Like, I want to assassinate the Duke or something? Surely, the purpose of a code word is to say it in a way of camaraderie, as opposed to making statements that show similar camaraderie, but would indict you. Thus, the best code word would be quick, easy to remember, and could be used in casual contexts without alerting the proper authorities. Therefore, the best code word would be something like, a swift knock at the door cut through the conversation where Benny entered once more. The ladies have arrived. The fiddle them! A quick, quick! Give them the code word! There is no code word! And yet, code word or not, the girls seemed to arrive regardless. And when Benny announced them, Mal tucked his face in his hands. Oh, gods, they're gonna hate me! I made such an ass out of myself before! Oh, don't worry about it. They probably feel bad about it, too. Beth is a sweet tart, and if Alice is in a good mood, she won't care at all. I swear, began the haughty voice from the bottom step, if that jerk is roping us into helping another girl into eloping, I'm going to rip his mustache off. Oh dear. It's not going to be anything like that, said a smoother, more bubbly voice. It better not be, the haughty one replied. And if I have to flirt with a guardsman one more time, it'll be okay, the bubbly one assured as they climbed the stairs toward the room. Whatever's going on, at the very least, it cannot be any worse than last time. And the moment the mousy-looking Beth, glasses as thick and hair as bobbed as ever, walked into the room, she locked eyes directly with Mal, smiled, performed a slight curtsy, and turned to raise her voice back down the hall. I was so wrong! Oh, were you now? replied Alice as she quickly caught up. What? Is Mal Malin going to be there sitting as a desperate fugitive or something? and her voice caught in her throat as she rounded the door, putting her hand over her mouth, and turned right back out to slump over in the hall. "'You're such a good guesser, Alice,' Robert said in as comforting a tone as he could muster. "'Every time it's worse,' she groaned. "'Every single time I think of the worst mess we can be dragged into, and every time it's even worse.' "'Oh, look at the bright side,' Howard chirped. "'If we all get arrested, at least I won't be able to spring problems on us any more.' I'm sorry, Mal blurted, and all eyes turned on him. I'm really sorry, I didn't mean to cause this much trouble. Howard has been the only other person to believe my innocence, and he's already done so much for me, and I feel terrible for causing him so much trouble and having his dad yell at him, and now it's becoming a problem for you too, and I don't want to cause anything between him and his friends, and I just... Oh, darling, no, 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 you're fine, you're just dandy, Alice said with the warmth of an aunt. You've done nothing wrong. You're completely fine, and of course we'll help you. It's no trouble to us at all. And with a smile and a curtsy, she turned to Howard. I just don't want you knowing that. It's true, Robert shrugged. 
Really, this is the most interesting thing that's happened in years. We just have to be Howard's impulse control. Beth nodded in agreement. Besides, there's no way you could cause such an inconvenience over the course of a day. It's unfortunate, then, Amelia interjected, that we have been in Howard Egmont's safekeeping for the last two months and three days. Two months! Two months! Two whole months! And three days. Yes, and three days! And you never told us! Alice blustered, right in the face. Oh, this is so cool! It's just like a fairy tale! A band of heroes rescuing a rapscallion but dashing bandit from the hangman's noose? No, this isn't like one of your fairy tales, Beth! This is real life! You never asked, Howard replied with perfect innocence. So what? We're just supposed to ask whether or not you're harboring a wanted criminal on any given day? It would be nice. Show you care. And I asked Robbie if he were harboring anyone when I saw him last week. Was that why you asked? Look, the important thing now is that we come up with a plan to help Mal get out of this pressure trap. And no problem has foxed us yet. So if we all put our heads together, I'm sure we can think of something. And so they did. For the rest of the night, long past where they yawned and fell half asleep in their lounge chairs, they discussed what could be done. Could Mal be transported by airship? Alice's father had prototypes in his factory. It could feasibly be done, but mm, no. They were too visible and too trackable. Even supposing Mal got away on one, they just follow wherever he touched down. Could they feign arrest? Act as guards transporting a prisoner whilst they got him as far away as they could? No. What reason would officials have to bring him further north when they could just question him just as easily here? Could they use a teleporter? The one at the processing plant used for star shards? Beth's aunt had the medallion giving access to the facility. Instant transmission outside of the city sounded perfect, but no, it was too well guarded, and they would potentially get in more trouble sneaking in there at all than they would getting caught with Mal in the first place. Vessels were a no-go from the get-go. As Amelia pointed out, the ice would be too thick this time of year and neither she nor Mal were adequate sailors. They would need a crew, and that would mean the risk of betrayal. They racked their brains for hours, as more and more coffee and teas and sandwiches were brought, until Mal piped up. At the risk of sounding utterly ridiculous, why can't we just stow me away on a train? Well, it seems like the most obvious method of escape is all, so they'd expect it in the most and probably have a lot of security and be extra cautious about their cargo, Robert yawned. That's true, said Beth, but then again, now that you mention it, I haven't seen that much more guards around the exit stations. Uh, keep in mind that I don't exactly frolic through them on a daily basis, but from what I've glanced, the security isn't really that much tighter. And it has been a whole month. If any extra guards remain, it's probably just a precautionary measure. They may even think you've already escaped. Or that if he hasn't by now, he's not going to try. All right, spoke up Howard, slapping himself awake. In that case, team, we shall end this playing with the idea that we really can sneak Mal out through the rails. We take a day or two to scope out the situation and see how it stands. If everyone gives a thumbs up, we'll go for it. Does that sound good to you, Mal, Amelia? Absolutely. It is the best option. Then it's settled. All non-grumblers who are in say aye. And they all playfully grumbled out an aye, anyways. Chapter 22 Oh, the joy of life. The joy of living every adventurous day. From the most mundane to the most terrible aspects, all the way through to the greatest heights and glories of it all. Oh, the joy of simply living. That you are here, to know that you can carry on through all things, everything, and still live yet more. Page 242, line 27, from The Book of Small Wisdoms, by Monk Zong. Mal and Amelia stayed over at Robert's house over those days, since Howard had to leave early to make preparations and could not reliably shield Mal from the wrath of his father. The girls were gone the whole of it, coming back only to pass on what they had learned to Robert before they left by late rise, but promised to meet up with Mal and Robert later, and after a very one-sidedly heavy lunch, they left for the meeting spot. The way along was quiet. Robert rarely spoke up, and Amelia kept her safe distance, both for her own sake and for the tome now safely under her shirt. It was Mal who broke the silence to apologize to Robert about their first meeting, that he was sorry they got off on the wrong foot, and... Don't worry about it, he replied before Mal could finish. People are more than one bad day or an awkward first meeting. 
It's always best to give people a fair shake. Besides, I wasn't exactly a peach garden myself, so I'd say we're even, he said as he turned and smiled at Mal. And call me Robbie. Mal smiled back. Sure, and walked on merrily for a few more steps before asking, What would you have said, by the way? Hmm? At the gala, before Alice interrupted us? You were going to make your comeback, right? What was it? I, oh, that was a while ago, I think. We were just talking about names and their value, and I said I introduced myself with respect, and you introduced yourself with a joke. Oh, 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 yeah, I remember. I was going to say something like, um, each man speaks of what he needs most, so it's like you needed more respect while I just needed a laugh. Oh, yeah, that would have been good. Really? Absolutely, it would have floored me. Thank you. They met up with the girls near a warehouse district. Disguised in paperboy outfits and slinging empty envelopes to keep inconspicuous, they found an opening to the sewers, they said. Through them, they could make a beeline straight for the station, and even go directly inside of it, avoiding any interrogation and possible unmasking of Mal by the guards. But they had to run if they wanted to get through to the trains on time. They rushed through, but when Mal noticed that Howard was not among them, he asked where he was. He said he had to go on ahead, just to make sure of something last minute and Mal slowed his pace, letting Emilio walk ahead of him. What are you doing? We gotta get moving, man! I just... How do you know? What? I know this is ridiculous. This is so stupid. The man kept me in his house for two months, fed me, clothed me, kept me from the wrath of his father in the outside world, but... But? But you guys aren't just tricking me, right? You're not going to lead me into a trap, right? Because there are people I have known who have known me, called me their best friend, who lied to me and told me they were going to help me when all they did was try to turn me in. You're not going to do that, right? They looked at each other, before looking back at Mal. We're not going to do that to you. Not now and not ever. We're all in this together now, so if you get caught, we get caught. We can't let you go down alone, at least. And this is easily the coolest way to make new friends, right? And we are friends now, and that means we stick together, no matter what. With this, Mal picked up the pace once more. He knew it was silly. He knew if they were going to betray him, they would have done it long before now. He knew. But it still felt good to get their reassurance. Yet something still bothered him. But why? Why are you guys doing this? Why are you being so kind and helping us so much? And they all looked at him with amused and quizzical expressions as if they just heard a joke, or if they couldn't understand why he'd even ask such a silly question to begin with. Because you needed help, Mal. What else matters? Mal shook the smile from his face as he stretched his arms wide and declared, Wait up so I can hug you all! And Robbie just laughed. If you want to get a group hug, you'll have to catch up. Come on! And so they ran. As they turned to go into the tunnel leading underneath the station, they were blocked by a large wooden gate, barred with lock and key. What? cried Robbie as he nearly ran into it. Of all the times! Alice chided as she tried pulling at the door to test the flimsiness of the wood, and snorted in frustration as it held firm. It must be part of the scheduled repair, but I cannot recall such fencing being common practice, Amelia said as she looked to see if it could be slipped through, and found nothing. And it's just our luck that it happens now? Uh, now what are we going to do? Should we double back? We can find another way, Mal suggested. It's pointless, Alice told him. There is no other way that leads to the station, and with the engines blocked, we can't pop out already inside it. We'll just get stopped trying to go in with a masked duo. Why are you masked, by the way? Haven't you always been? Wouldn't it be more of a disguise to go without one? Leprosy. Leprosy, Mal agreed. Also, she swore an oath. Correct. Never to reveal my face in front of men. And then, thinking for a moment, or beautiful women. And Alice and Beth were just a little too flattered to press the subject. Who cares what she's wearing? He's right, Mal chimed, grateful for the distraction. The important thing is, maybe there is another way, and even if there's not, I can still try to sneak in. Shouldn't we just try again later? Robbie asked. Wait a month and have another go? We cannot. I already called in the favor for the sewer layout. Beth said as she wiggled the paper in her hand. I still need to return it, and I already used up my good excuse as to why I needed it in the first place. It'll seem too weird if I ask for it again. Not to mention whatever Howard's up to. He may not be able to do it the next time we need it. 
And I don't think his father would be keen to have me stay for yet another month, Mal said, wringing his hair. This is it. Uh, we can part ways with you guys at the threshold and sneak in ourselves so you don't get in trouble. If we need to, but we gotta try here and now. The gang nodded, and they backtracked to a grade they could lift and climb out of. Robbie went first, and the moment Alice began to climb the ladder herself, she nearly got a boot in the face as Robbie slid back down from the opening. What the hell? Shh! There are people right next to the grate. What? A group of women. Chatty old horses. Oh, gods, if they're anything like my mother running into a friend at the market. What do we do? Do we just go further back and find another place to exit from? There's no time. We've already wasted minutes we don't have doubling back this far as it is. We can run. Oh, yeah, because sprinting through the streets won't be suspicious. Well, what else can we do? While the group bickered and debated, Mal considered. He thought of a plan, and quickly began hopping about the sewer duct until he found a suitable candidate for what he was thinking of. Where did you run off to? Beth asked as he bounded back. Nowhere, just off a bit. I just had an idea, so... And clutching it in his left hand, he began to scale the ladder. Be careful, Amelia whispered in his ear, and he shivered to know that she meant it in more ways than one. Hold on, we can't go up that way, Robbie reminded him. It's okay, trust me. Mal reassured him in kind. Just as he reached the top of the grade, he took a deep breath, focused hard, and hummed softly as the energy went into his fist. And as delicately as he could, he put the mouse just out of the grade where it dutifully ran toward the group of women and waited to be noticed. It did not take long. There was a stark scream as the women saw and pointed, and one threw their lip gloss at the poor thing. It didn't seem to care. When the women hadn't backed off quite far enough, the mouse began leaping up and down in place and scampering toward the women, herding and chasing after them as they screamed and stampeded off down the street. You were holding a mouse! Alice erupted as Mal helped them out of the grate. He was friendly, assured Mal. Didn't you say before that you are horrible with animals? Of course not, because I'm amazing with them, clearly. I just tamed a mouse and had it chase away those women. What I said was... Geminals. Can't get those beats right for the life of me. The gang looked at him oddly, but luckily there were more pressing matters to attend to, and they gratefully climbed out and ran toward the station. When they arrived, they found with a heavy heart that the entryway was still heavily guarded. There were fewer guards than when the manhunt first began, but evidently the constables had little better to do than remain. They debated as to what could be done. If they should try to go through, even with Mal and Amelia masked, if they should try to look for a way to sneak by, if they should even try bribery. But the hard chime of the bell tower silenced their talk, and they stared up at the ticking timer on the wall, telling them that the train was leaving in ten minutes. And Mal got a horrid sense of deja vu. Who goes there? A firm voice roared behind them as they all stiffened with panic. What in the world is a group of rascals doing running around the city, hmm? And who is this, the gentleman behind the mask? None of them responded, and Beth only let out a cackle as she tried to divert attention and failed, while Amelia reached for her gun. Why, you wouldn't happen to be traveling with Mal Malin, would you? Wanted fugitive, likely dabbling in necromancy, supporting his trees and his father. And within their view came the dark blue uniform of the constable, with heavy boot thuds and the hard ruffle of thick denim. The officer came to stand before Mal, who instinctively looked down at the ground. Well, fugitive, what do you have to say for yourself? And Mal opened his dry lips to speak, looking up just enough to see the wide, toothy smile of a younger-looking man with a softer-looking face than is fitting for a constable, desperate to suppress his own giggling. If that's you, Howard, I'm going to kick your ass. Surely it would be more fitting to kick my ass if it isn't me, Howard smiled, until the gang began kicking his ass. What the hell are you doing scaring us like that, you idiot? We're running out of time, they said in near unison. It's okay, it's out, it's okay, I got- Stop slapping me! Okay, look! He declared, pulling gray tracksuit after gray tracksuit out of his stuffy coat like a magician. Disguises! Where did you get those? Along with your uniform. Good lords, is that actually authentic? 
Yeah, I called up my brother and asked if I could borrow the uniform. I figured if anything went wrong, I could be the one to capture you before escorting you somewhere safe. But they're redoing the foundations on the left wing, and you would have been caught if you tried to pass through the sewer line as is. So I ran and brought some work standards so you guys could pass through. I waited and waited, and you never showed up. Figured something might have happened, so I ran out here. Sewer line was blocked off completely. No getting past it either way. Huh, then I guess we're all a bit lucky today, eh? After they were all promptly disguised, with some extra dust caked on Mal's face to cover his more interesting features, and a hat wide enough to cover the top half of Amelia's face, and a very out-of-place book nestled in the back of her waist strap, Howard led them up to the main entrance and explained to them in perfect detail the construction work ahead of them and what they were called in to do. The guards didn't even look past a nod as the gang crossed the threshold, and Howard continued droning on and on about any boring detail he could think of until they were well out of earshot. Without even stripping off the uniforms, they rushed to the train as it began blaring its imminent departure. They ran, pressing themselves as hard as they could even as they saw the door shut from across the station hall, and touched the train as its horn blared a second time and the wheels screamed to life. Amelia tried to hold on to the door to pry it open, but it wouldn't budge and the group slowly fell behind as Mal burst his fists against the metal in frustration. He collapsed, throwing his hat down and stamping on it as Alice bellowed for them to stop, and Beth tried to comfort the former, and Howard soothed the latter. They watched it peel off into the distance, exiting the Dome of Light, and getting lost in the snow. Now what do we do? You get over here! Here! Over here! Quickly! called Robbie, pointing across the line. Another train, this one a cargo train, just about to be finished its loading. Hurry, get on! All together, the gang helped Mal step up into the freight, where he lent a hand for Amelia for her to delicately lift herself up alongside him, as she began rummaging to rearrange the sacks for hiding, making one last place for the very odd book to go. As the train horn steamed, and as the calls for a clear line were made, Mal turned, taking one moment to think before leaping back off the train and wrap his friends in as tight a hug as he could, and felt his shivers die down as they hugged him right back. Thank you, guys, he said, trying to hold back tears and failing. Thank you all for helping me, for believing me. Thank you all so, so much. You have no idea. Before finally being caught up in a closed throat. It's all right, darling, Alice soothed. That's what friends are for, right? That's what best friends are for, ain't that right, chaps? And that's how it's gonna stay, Beth declared, breaking off the hug in a little dance. Best of friends, hmm? And that's how it's gonna stay. The train horn blared, and Mal turned, ready to step up when a hand clamped on his shoulder, and he turned to see Howard, without a drop of his usual humor, and with an uncharacteristic seriousness, as he asked what they had all been thinking. Mal, I have to know. Did you know? Did you practice alongside Count Tamalin? Are you a necromancer? Mal looked back at them, as they all seemed to wait for an answer, and he knew he couldn't give it to them. Even with all they had provided, even with all they had done for him, he could not trust them with something so dear. He could not take that risk. He could not allow anyone to get so close to him in a world where the idea of him being so hated for what he was took on such a new and constant tone, and there is no telling what they would do if he said, Yes! Whoops. They stood, stock still, staring straight at him, unblinking, unmoving, as he just shared the greatest secret in his life. And while they stared... Mal screamed, this time actually in his own head, as he intended. It was Beth who moved first, as she marched through the brisk chill, shoving past Robbie and Howard, rushing straight at Mal and reaching her hands out to clasp them around his own, and came an inch from his face as she shouted, That's so cool! What? It is just like one of my fairy tales. You're, you're like a prince in exile, on the run from those who do not understand until you can return to claim what is yours. Oh, 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 this is so exciting! And she could not contain herself from clapping as she hopped in place. Is, is that why you hide your face? Howard asked Amelia. Because you're... I am all that you suspect I am, 
she curtsied, and I tell you I would be nothing less. Apt, Robbie quipped, before more earnestly replying. Then I guess necromancers can't be all bad, right? I mean you, he said, gesturing to Amelia, even as he took a step back. All you ever did was help Mal and give me advice on my garden. And you, he said, taking a firmer step toward Mal, didn't actually do anything wrong by just wanting to live. Not like you tried to kill everyone or anything. People came into your home, and until then you were just going about your days like any of us. You went to our party and didn't even electrocute me. So, yeah, maybe they aren't all bad. I have to admit, Alice said with great timidity, that if I had the opportunity, and it was within my disposition to learn such a thing, I don't think I would decline. I mean, I don't think I would go full into it, of course. Working with dead bodies is... Ew. No offense, she chirped to Amelia. No offense between friends, she said, as she lifted her cap to smile. But, um, to learn the theories would be interesting, and it would be nice to learn them from you when you get back, she finished, and she punched Mal's arm. And Howard just smiled. There was nothing to be said, for they had already shared the greatest of treasures between them. Actually, there was something to be said. Here, he came forward, pulling out wads and wads of banknotes and pressing them into Mal's pockets. I, what? You never know. You might need them. Take these, too, Robbie said, pulling out all the cash he had on hand. Here, my coat. It's cold where you're going, Beth said, throwing it into the car. And here... Alice came forward, furiously scribbling a note. You better write to us, you understand? You write to this box and we'll get all your mail, okay? And if you ever need anything, you write and we'll try to make sure you get it. I... but I can't... of course you can. You would do the same for us, wouldn't you? Of course he would. He always would. Thank you, he said, finally as the wheels began to screech to life and the train began to move, and they had to stop another attempt at a group hug and nigh heave him into the freight where Amelia took hold, pulling him into the still open car, and an unspoken understanding passed between them as to exactly what he was thanking them for. The train began to lurch forward, picking up speed as his friends chased after the train and cheered and waved as long as they could. Write to us! Sail on, chap! Don't forget us. Come back safe. Until their voices were only echoes in the night. Mal stared back to where they were long after they disappeared from view. Long after the train went through the dome and snow pummeled the countryside. Long into the forests and mountains as they began to grow, frost tipped, and the air began to chill his lungs with every inhale. Come over here where it's warm, Mal. The soft voice serenaded behind him. You're not going to go back to them sick, are you? He was away from the capital, and on his way at last. But somehow, deep in his heart, he knew that the journey had only just begun. The End of The Journeys of Mal Malin Book One, Apprentice this audiobook was written and performed by Jonathan Q. If you enjoy this work, please consider supporting me by buying the ebook version, available in the description below. Otherwise, please consider donating your time, energy, or items to local projects within your community. Thank you.